Nesta Markno, Anarchy's Cossack. The Struggle for Free Soviets in Ukraine, 1917-1921. By Alexander Skirda. Forward, History Bites Back. The spectacular collapse of the so-called communist system of the former USSR, has exposed the vacuousness of the regime's historians' official theses, and highlighted the intellectual complacency of their Western counterparts, with only a few rare exceptions. For decades, their slavish pens have peddled a single-lane version of historical truth, celebrating the supposed triumphant march of actually existing socialism. They find themselves all at sea now that their phony certainties have evaporated. However, their writings remain and endure, and these carry the stamp of their aberrations. Verifying this is the easiest thing in the world, one need only take a semantic key to certain definitions or expressions. Let me cite but a few examples. Bourgeois revolution is used to designate the real Russian revolution of February 1917 which overthrew the Tsarist autocracy. The Great October 1917 Socialist Revolution, or October Revolution for short, refers to what virtually every Russian, and indeed French socialist ever since then has described as the Bolshevik coup d'état, and which radical revolutionaries indeed have described as the Bolshevik counter-revolution. Dictatorship of the proletariat means the dictatorship of a tiny caste of intellectuals actually exercised over the urban and rural proletariat. War communism means the 1921 period and in fact the systematic pillaging of the peasantry and wholesale takeover of day-to-day -day life by the party state, all of it dependent upon the most bloodthirsty terror. Let us also demystify the expression Soviet which, properly rendered, simply means council. But then we would have to explain to folk why, say, France, a country covered from top to bottom by councils, from municipal councils to the council of ministers, is still not wrapped in the quote-unquote exotic and oh-so-revolutionary whiff of Soviet. We could go on decoding many another term or expression, but for the time being let us close with Bolshevik, which simply means majority, when the Russian party of that name never achieved a majority in any election in Russia except for two obscure internal votes within the Russian Social Democratic and Labour Party at its 1903 Congress, which resulted in a split. A circumstance upon which Lenin seized in order to so dub his sectarian grouplet. This mismatch between the sign and the signified has shaped the fates of tens of millions of human beings and led ultimately to an impasse. If we are to get out of that impasse, we must return to the primary resource and re-examine everything. This is the school of thought currently in the ascendant in Russia and Ukraine. And it is apparent in the ongoing determination to recover historical memory and fill in the many gaps from the past. Since 1989 and especially since 1991, there has been some highly intensive publishing activity. In this regard, first, we have the reprinting of all the books which had appeared in Russian in the West. From surviving actors in the Civil War, White Army Generals, now eulogized by some, separatist Cossack leaders, social revolutionaries, and even, of a special interest to us here, Nesta Markno's memoirs and Arshinov's history of the Maknavist movement, which have so far run to several editions. Indeed, we are witnessing a real infatuation with the person of Nesta Markno. Over the past decade a good 15 books on the subject have appeared, the six most recent in a little over one year. He has become a popular hero in the eyes of many, a symbol of the struggle against red and white alike on behalf of the people's freedom and the defense of revolutionary gains. True, most of these books lack rigor and are of limited interest to anyone already conversant with the subject, but the point is that for many people, he represents the only bright shining light in the dark history of the civil war of his time. Allow us, however, to highlight the memoirs of Victor Belash, who was chief of staff of the Maknavist insurgent movement for over a year and succeeded Markno at the head of the movement after the seriously wounded Nesta Markno was evacuated to Romania. Captured by the Reds, Bilash's life was spared on condition that he write his memoirs so that the Red Army's strategists could finally grasp why the partisan movement in question could have held out for so long and so successfully against all its enemies. He was then released, only to be caught up in the Stalinist repression in 1937, and shot. His son rediscovered the manuscript in the archives of Ukraine, carried out protracted, 
Complementary Personal Research between 1966 and 1990 and had it published in Kiev in 1992 before his unfortunate death the following year. The whole thing represents an outstanding primary source. Happily complementing Nesta Markno's own memoirs and the Arshinov book. It is essential to a fuller understanding of the organizational and military operation of the movement. It teems with telling information and undeniably illuminates the crucial part that Maknavist insurgents played in defeating the Whites. We shall rehearse its main contributions in the bibliographical afterword to this present volume. Let us quote one particular extract that perfectly illustrates what we have been saying. It is a reproduction of the uncanny address that Nestor Markno gave at the meeting at which he bade the movement farewell on July 17, 1921 before leaving for Romania. Quote. The communism to which we aspire assumes that there is individual freedom, equality, self-management, initiative, creativity and plenty. We have spelled out our thoughts in our declarations. We have had the chance and we have striven to build a society on the libertarian principles of non-violence, but the Bolsheviks have not allowed us to proceed with this. They have turned the clash of ideas into a struggle against men. Not only has the entire state apparatus, despised by the people, with its functionaries and its prisons and so on, not been liquidated, but it has simply been recast. The Bolsheviks have proclaimed might as their only right. The foundations of the society that the Bolshevik communists have laid, after eliminating all other parties and rivals, have nothing to do with communism. They amount to a closed, semi-military sect of soldiers of Marx blindly disciplined, and with pretensions to infallibility, rejecting any quibbles, and in hot pursuit of the goal of a totalitarian state which grants neither freedoms nor rights to its citizens, and which peddles a novel brand of ideological racism. It breaks the people up into their own and the rest. In many respects, it is an absurdity. They deprive the toilers of all their dreams of a better life, and they are building the most wretched, most unfair police society from which the joys of labor, creativity and the spirit of enterprise are to be banished. Their experiments will be pointless and they will co-opt folk of the same outlook, authority will be extended through the conjuring up of unanswerable demagogues and dictators. They will rule and by means of prisons and coercion they will compel the toilers to work themselves to death for a glass of buttermilk. They will tear everything down and eliminate all who are not to the party's taste or ideologically in tune with it. They will devise an astronomical schedule of punishments. People's sole preoccupation will be with survival in such frighteningly oppressive conditions. But it cannot continue forever. The strengthening of authority will inevitably lead to a complete psychological and ideological breakdown between those in charge and the toilers. Comrades, be vigilant and do not cast aside your weapons for they will soon serve you again. Do not trust the Bolsheviks. We part with the feeling that we have done our revolutionary duty. Long live the solidarity and unity of the toilers. Long live the third social revolution. My thanks to all of you for everything. The account of this speech notes that right after it bugles sounded assembly and the farewells were very dramatic, with some shedding of tears, no one knowing whether they would ever see one another again. Allow us to remark here that Nestor Markno and the insurgents knew the real import of words, that being what they were fighting and dying for. The Bolshevik leaders also knew that but could not tolerate their existence. Victor Belash cites the case of the Maknavist expeditionary force which, having just played a crucial part in defeating Rangel's Whites in the Crimea in November 1920, was treacherously attacked by the Reds, the 700 survivors, short of ammunition and forced into surrender, were promptly mown down with machine guns. Not that Maknavists could have expected anything better of the Whites. We might quote the recently published, in Paris, memoirs of a young officer cadet from the volunteer army, who was assigned to the artillery. The author, Serge Mamontov, reveals an utter ignorance of Markno who, quote, called himself an anarchist but was only an out-and-out -out highwayman. He lived the high life, drank heavily and for that very reason was popular with the peasants who were all for him and took a hand in the fighting. End quote. At the beginning of 1919, Mamontov's unit tackled a Maknavist detachment in the environs of Guliaipoli, catching it and mowing it down. His comment is as follows, quote, 
The wounded were finished off and prisoners shot. In a civil war there are rarely prisoners on either side. At first sight this seems awfully cruel. What were we to do with prisoners? We had neither prisons nor the wherewithal for their maintenance. Set them free? But they would take up arms again. Shooting them was the simplest policy. End quote. Permit me to highlight the lack of humanity in the application of such a rationale to people who, when all is said and done, were merely defending themselves against conquerors and trying to protect their possessions and their families from exactions. That thought does not even cross the mind of the thuggish Mamontov. By contrast let us look at the different rationale of the Machnavists who did discriminate between enemy prisoners, officer personnel were shot but ordinary troops were set free once the beliefs of the insurgents had been explained to them. Austro-German soldiers were even dispatched homewards with provisions for the journey. In fact the plight of the Machnavist movement, shared by all who fought for their freedom or independence, be they peasants, Cossacks or national minorities, was that it was caught between two seemingly opposing forces which in point of fact were kin to each other in terms of their messianic imperialism, the Reds' part state, and the Whites' greater Russia, one and indivisible. Moscow as the Red Mecca, or as the Third Rome. Choice of side was determined by the supply of arms and munitions. Just add the disconnected, uncoordinated nature of their actions and there we have the explanation of their lack of success. This has been brilliantly demonstrated in his posthumously published book, The Tragedy of Peasant Uprisings in Russia, 1918-1921 by Mikhail Fremkin, a Soviet historian who later emigrated to Israel, the age-old yearning for land and liberty founded upon the hegemony of the city-state. Sooner or later, Though, nature has the final word and sets the whole thing in motion again, a community of free human beings is still the order of the day. Alexandra Skerda, Paris, April 1999 1. From the legend to the history To anyone with any interest in the Russian Revolution, Nestor Ivanovich Markno, Ukrainian anarchist associated with an attempted social revolution, is a familiar figure. The experiment in which he was an active participant took place during the crucial years from 1917 to 1921 and involved millions of the inhabitants of the southern Ukraine. Moreover, Markno and his companions were obliged to mount an armed defense of their social gains. Thus it is primarily as the architects of a vast insurgent movement that they have been known thus far, especially as their fight was critical to the fate of the Russian Revolution and, by extension, for the course of the century. Having played a decisive part in that movement, Markno has to this very day been variously perceived. To some his adversaries, he is a sort of bogeyman, a high-born brigand whose banner of anarchy ill disguised the simple lust for pillage and systematic destruction of the state in any format and of its representatives. To others, his fans, he was an exceptional libertarian militant, who sought to implement the teachings of Bakunin and Kropotkin, the Russian theorists and founding fathers of libertarian communism. By way of affording a glimpse of these different approaches, let us review some of the adjectives, epithets and labels employed about him. Denikin, the commander-in-chief of the White Army saw in him, quote, a sainted leader of anarchism, a daring and highly popular brigand, a gifted partisan all decked out in theoretical anarchism. End quote. Certain Ukrainian nationalists looked upon him as Cossack Ataman leader, a Ukrainian Napoleon, a national hero. Anatole de Monzi, a French political writer has him as a gentleman anarchist. While some of his Bolshevik adversaries label him bandit president, the uncrownable king of the partisans. As for Victor Serge, he portrays him as a boozer, uneducated, idealistic, a born strategist quite without peer. In the estimation of the writer, and historian Daniel Guerin, what one has here is an anarchist guerrillero and a Robin Hood. Some anarchist admirers present him as a second Bakunin. Finally, the libertarian propagandist Sebastian Faw praises his quote, sturdy, loyal, modest, dauntless, incorruptible figure. End quote. Let us add, for good measure, to these evaluations selected hither and thither, that Mark knows brothers in arms, by way of paying tribute to his physical panache and firmness of mind yoked to his name the Cossack title Bakko and also dubbed him the first among equals. 
Not because he was a little more equal than the rest, as some might sneer, but in the sense of team leader, in that he was always to be found in the front rank of the charges of his famous horse soldiery and that he was also in the forefront in dissemination of the ideas of libertarian communism. The legend of his military invincibility derives from the fact that, literally death-defying, he survived more than 200 attacks and engagements although gravely wounded on several occasions. Complementary to this diversity of appreciations, let us note that Soviet historians, like their leaders of the day, often talk of the Kingdom or Republic of Maknovia, when referring to the region that came under the direct influence of the Maknovist movement. That territory covered the provinces of Ekaterinoslav and the northern Tavrida as well as the eastern part of the province of Kherson and the southern portions of those of Poltava and Kharkov, which is to say a rectangle measuring 300 km by 250 and inhabited at the time by about 7.5 million people. This mass movement has been dubbed the Maknovskina from the name of its initiator and the suffix appended to that name can be half pejorative in Russian. Let us point out finally that acme of a personality cult in reverse. Markno's little hometown, the movement's capital as it were, Guliaipoli, has often been dubbed Maknograd by his Bolshevik enemies. In the biographical entry given for him in the latest edition of the Great Soviet Encyclopedia, encapsulating the regime's last word on history, we may read the following quote. Markno, Nestor Ivanovich, one of the leaders of the Petit Bourgeois counter-revolution in Ukraine in 1918-1921, during the Civil War. Born into a peasant family, he was educated at the parish school. During the 1905-1907 revolution, he joined an anarchist group, participating in acts of terrorism and quote expropriations. In 1909 for the murder of a police superintendent, he was sentenced to death this being commuted on account of his tender years to ten years penal servitude. While serving his sentence in the Buterki prison in Moscow, he completed his grounding in anarchist theory. Freed by the revolution in February 1917, he set off for Guliaipoli and founded an anarchist detachment in April 1918. This detachment embarked upon a partisan war against the Austro-German occupiers and the power of the Hetman Skoropadsky. In this way he earned great popularity among the peasants. Markno distinguished himself by his bravery and his savagery. In 1919-1920, he waged war on the White Guards and the Petliurists as well as on the Red Army. Three times he allied himself with the Soviet authorities and three times he broke off this alliance by rebelling. In 1921 Markno's detachments turned once and for all into gangs of looters and criminals. On August 1921, he fled into Romania. He crossed into Poland in 1922 and wound up in France in 1923 where he worked as a shoe mender and print worker. End quote. Contrary to the usual hotchpotch served up by modern Soviet historiography as we shall have occasion to appreciate, which consists of blending lie and truth, with the accent solidly on the former, this summary, aside from a few inexactitudes, which we shall set straight on, and the customary abuse, petit bourgeois, looters, criminals, appears essentially correct. In the same work, the entry under Maknovskina rounds off the official version. It is stated there that the movement's social base comprised of the well-to-do peasantry, or kulaks, that it was not merely a local movement, for it stretched from the Dnieper to the Don, that it was made up of volunteers that its armaments were exclusively seized from the enemy and finally that its ideology was encapsulated in the watchwords libertarian state, and free Soviets, which, according to the authors, boiled down to fighting against the proletarian state. It is very interesting to compare that evaluation dot with the one contained in the lengthy obituary notice carried in the columns of the, generally well-informed, newspaper Le Temps, the forerunner of Le Monde under the byline of its Moscow correspondent, Pierre Belland, quote, Le Temps has registered the premature death of the famed Markno, who died in Paris on July 27, 1934 of tuberculosis and was cremated at the Père Lachis Cemetery. Soviet newspapers have not found room the space for an obituary of the anarchist leader, nor as much as a single line at the foot of page 6 to record his demise this Nestor Markno was nonetheless a very curious figure and no conspiracy of silence will succeed in erasing the memory of the important role that the popular Bakko played during the Russian Revolution, 
particularly in the struggle against Denikin. Though his ephemeral Bolshevist allies, who wasted no time in getting rid of him once victory over the Whites had been secured, may not, historians of the future will reserve him the place that he deserves among the architects of the revolution. His political program. An anarchist, he sought to give land to the peasants, factories to the workers intact and advised them to organize themselves into federations of free communes. Which is to say that in the white generals who wanted a return of the Pomiaskis he saw enemies. On several occasions he allied himself with the Bolsheviks upon whom he looked at the time as the lesser of two evils. Acts of looting, terror or antisemitism were severely punished by Markno and his lieutenants. He managed to maintain his power in the southern Ukraine and attempted to make reality of some of his utopias, the elimination of prisons, the organization of communal life, free communes, workers' soviets from which no stratum of society was excluded. Under his short-lived government, there was complete press freedom, and he allowed publication of right social revolutionary and left social revolutionary newspapers, as well as Bolshevik organs, alongside anarchist news sheets. But it was during 1919 and Denikin's offensive, that the role of Markno and his bands of partisans proved crucial. Against Rangel, Markno dispatched several detachments of his partisans, and it was his cavalry that crossed the marshes and seized the Pecop Isthmus. There can be no question but that Denikin's defeat be accounted for by the peasant uprisings that hoisted Markno's black flag, rather than by the successes of Trotsky's regular army. The partisan bands of the Batko tip the scales in favor of the Reds, and if Moscow today prefers to forget that, impartial history will take it into the account, end quote. Berlin described the disagreement between Markno and the Bolsheviks to the latter's aversion to anarchist propaganda in favor of a regime without central authority, and in favor of a federation of free Soviets, in short, for everything at odds with the Marxist notion of the dictatorship of the proletariat, exercised in the name of the masses by the Communist Party. This latter appreciation acts as a counterbalance to the first and enables one to restore the true measure in the historical perspective of the actions of Markno and his people. Nevertheless, intervening between these two most believable official versions there is a teeming host of others which are mixed up and inaccurate, ranging from misapprehensions to blatant calumnies both petty and huge and all helping to cloud the issue seriously. That a lie piously repeated ran sometimes achieved the standing of a half-truth in some minds, we know, this is the case with several charges that are at once, crude and serious, the charges of antisemitism, banditry and military anarchism. Be that as it may the procedure is a familiar one, one besmirches the leader or leaders and thereby belittles the movement, and the advantage is that this offers justification for the most atrocious massacres and repressions, as witness the treatment doled out to the rebels of June 1848 and the communards of 1871. Be that as it may, we shall return at some length to all these charges and with the assistance of manifest, obstinate facts we shall establish the truth of the matter. However, we would do well to correct, straight away, several habitual errors including the one that automatically identifies the person of Markno with the movement to which he lent his name. Although, to be sure, the two are interconnected, they are not one and the same, and one cannot ascribe to Markno alone responsibility for certain vital or disastrous decisions, for instance, the decision to enter into alliance on two occasions with the Red Army and the Kremlin authorities. Those decisions were taken collectively on each occasion after long and bitter discussions concluding in a vote. On the contrary, certain decisions were made by Markno alone. Moreover, the movement's political complexion was not confined to the black of anarchy but also took in the whole spectrum of the far left of the day, left social revolutionaries, maximalists, Bolsheviks at odds with the party and even non-party, all united on a basis of free Soviets. Here let us stipulate further that the Maknavist movement was only the most important, by reason of its strength and duration, and the most remarkable, by virtue of its social achievements and internal structure of the dozens of partisan movements that burgeoned from Ukraine to central Russia and Siberia, most of them similarly attached to free Soviets and stamped out by the Leninist regime only with great difficulty over the years 1920-1924. Finally, if Markno was the symbol of his movement, the Gulyai Poly Libertarian Communist Group was its soul. 
It is within that overall framework that our study is situated, although Mark knows destiny and individual actions may serve as the guidelines of our work. In support of our narrative, we shall be making use of the writings of the chief protagonists, most of them in Russian and hitherto unpublished, to it we shall add certain characteristic documents by way of appendices. Regarding the latter part of Nestor Markno's life, his stay in Paris, we have collected several testimonies and interviews from individuals who knew or associated with him and to whom we owe thanks here. For a start, there is the 96-year-old doyen, Grisha Bartonovsky, deceased 1986, known as Barta, who first met Markno in 1907 in Ekaterinoslav when they worked together in a factory and frequented the same nocturnal haunts, before meeting up again in exile in Paris. Then let us mention the Bulgarian libertarians who were very close to Markno at that time, Kiro Radev, Irevan, Nikola Chorbadjif, Kosif Sintov, and Iosif Sintov. Ida Met, Markno's secretary from 1925 to 1927, enlightened us about certain of his character. Traits and his living conditions during those years. Let us also salute the Grande Dame of the French libertarian movement, May Picoret, who took Markno, his wife, and family in upon their arrival in Paris. Finally Nicolas Fauchier and René Boucher, militants very active at that time, have briefed us on his dealings with the French anarchists. To that gamut of sources, built up since 1964 let us add those from the family circle of the present writer, several members of my family having been variously mixed up in the events described a circumstance not unconnected with the reasons that have prompted me to pursue my laborious researches, but which involve not so much indulgence, apology, or, who knows, denigration, but maybe shall we say a greater readiness to show understanding of our subject. 2. In the land of the Zaporog Cossacks Before we proceed, it might be useful to provide some geographical, ethnographic and historical details of the territory that is to be the theatre of operations for Markno his movement, Ukraine and more especially its eastern portion, the left bank of the river Dnieper. Ukraine is the name of a land that extends from the foothills of the Urals and the Caucasus, to the foothills of the Carpathians, more precisely between the two great rivers, Dniester and Don, then between the river Pripyat and its tributaries the Bug and the Desna, to the Black Sea and the Sea of Azov. An area slightly larger than France, it is almost entirely covered by steppes that are the natural extensions of the Asiatic steppes, which explains how this territory was for centuries on the main access route for countless invasions of peoples who gradually occupied Europe and made cousins of most of the inhabitants of the old continent. The most recent of these invaders before and shortly after, the Christian era, the Scythians and Sarmatians Aryans lived there in their turn before the Khazars and Turkomans drove them out, only to be dislodged themselves by nomads, the Pechenegs and Polovtians. The Slavs appeared there around from the 5th century, later in the 9th century under the designation of Russians, they regrouped around Kiev, a flourishing city which, having become a rival of Byzantium, is described as the mother of Russian cities. Converted to Christianity in the 10th century, they represented Europe's bulwark against Asiatic invasions, until the countless hordes of Genghis Khan overwhelmed them and laid the whole land waste in the 13th century. It was at that point that the land of the northern Slavs, Muscovia, adopted the name, retained to this day, of Russia, while the former Russia was henceforth to be known as Ukraine, meaning border land and the outlying land of the civilized world. After the Tatar domination, a real calamity, that was to persist for two and a half centuries, the country came under the control of the Lithuanians, the Poles, and then, from 1654 on, of Moscow and, thereafter, its eastern part belonged to the empire of all the Russias, first under the name of New Russia and then as Little Russia. Nevertheless, the Ukrainians have always been distinct from the Russians, despite claims to the contrary from Muscovite patriots in physical, linguistic, political and social terms. They are much more homogeneously Slavs than the Russians who intermingled with the Finns from the northwest as well. This is evident in the physical makeup, the vast majority of Ukrainians are dark-eyed brunettes whereas among the Russians the blonde or brown-haired type with light-colored eyes predominates. Although both emerged from a common Slavic root, the two languages are as different as, say French and Italian. Customs and dress habits differ also. 
Ukrainian peasants wore an embroidered blouse tucked into thick aravery or baggy trousers, wore leather boots, and the paparka, a large fur hat, and the armiak, a homespun cloak. The Russian peasants or muzhiks, little men, wore their great blouse or kosovarotka outside their trousers, tucked into a broad belt and wore on the feet velinki, felt boots, or lapdis, braided booties, dressed in a kaftan or podiovka, a wraparound greatcoat, and on their heads wore a chapka, fur bonnet, and, once married, sported bushy beards whereas their Ukrainian counterparts let only flowing mustache sprout. The counterpart of the Russian izba, log cabin, was the Ukrainian kata, with its wooden or mortar walls, whitewashed and topped with a thatched roof and surrounded by a tiny garden. To conclude our rapid schedule of the differences between the two peoples, let us note that there has always been a certain animosity between them, as is often the case between northerners and southerners, and this has led them to give each other rather pejorative names like Katsapi, Russians, and sometimes Moskali, Muscovites, and Karkli, Ukrainians. The only common bonds between the two countries were originally dynastic alone, through the Scandinavian Rorik who established himself as Prince of Kiev in the 9th century. Whenever Ukraine placed itself under the protection of Moscow's Tsar in 1654 on account of their shared religion, Orthodox Christianity, it was, paradoxically, in order to safeguard its independence, recently regained following a long and exhausting national liberation struggle against Pole and Turk. Not that that prevented Moscow from turning her into a vassal and from gradually reducing her population of peasants and Cossacks, holding the land collectively on the basis of egalitarian democracy to the status of an enslaved mass dispossessed of its lands, this by means of direct colonization by the Tsars and their prebendaries, courtesans, and favorites of every hue. This factor, added to internal social differentiation, privileges for the Cossack hierarchy, led to the emergence of Ukrainian feudal potentates. Despite revolts and sullen resistance from the peasant mass, this process was enshrined by Catherine II, who formally introduced serfdom in 1781, which is to say, a century and a half after its introduction in Russia. The better to bring its new colony to heel, Moscow encouraged intensive settlements of foreign colonists. In Ekaterinoslav province in 1751-1755, lands were awarded to Orthodox Slavs who had escaped the Turks, Serbs, Vlachis, Moldavians, Bulgars and Montenegrins were settled in the Slaviano-Serbsk district. In 1779, Greeks, Georgians, Poles and Gypsies, as well as Turkish and Tatar captives were also planted in Ukraine. An enormous land distribution was made between 1775 and 1782. Five million hectares were awarded to seigneurs in good standing at the court of Catherine II, the enlightened despot so celebrated by French philosophers. Nor did she overlook her German compatriots whom she had poured in great numbers onto the richest lands, the famed black lands, Chernozyum, whose fertility derived from the rapid sprouting of grass upon the loose steppe soil and the decomposition of layer upon layer of vegetation. The proverbial excellence of the land had made the region, since time immemorial, the granary of Byzantium and Europe and, as such, it had always invited the covetousness of its more powerful neighbours. Catherine II's successors continued her pernicious policy. In 1803, some 1,000 hectares were assigned to every retired officer, and 500 to every non commissioned officer in the same circumstances. To work all this land, almost 100,000 peasants from Middle Russia, serfs of course, were imported. In 1846 1850, on an experimental basis, the state settled Jewish farming colonies in the Alexandrovsk and Marupol districts. Since before the Christian era, Jews had come along with the settlement of Greek traders around the shores of the Sea of Azov. This ancient presence had been given a massive boost under Polish rule, especially in the western Ukraine as the Polish lords found it to their benefit to use Poland's many Jews as commissariat and administrative agents. These Jews subsequently made up a significant national minority, especially in the great cities of that part of Ukraine. As a result of this plantation of foreigners, by 1917 the Ukrainians accounted for only two-thirds of their country's population. After them, in descending order, came the Russians, the Jews, the Germans, the Bulgars, the Tatars, the Greeks, and in insignificant numbers, 
the representatives of other nations Serbs, Armenians, Georgians, etc. Let us note, further, that in this land of settlers there were 100 men for every 93 women. Finally there were 4 million Ukrainians serving in the Tsarist Russian army in 1914. At the time of the general abolition of serfdom in the Russian Empire, most of the Ukrainian peasantry were awarded only quite tiny parcels of land 3 hectares on average and these they had in any case to buy back from their former seigneurs on many occasions. Just like their Russian brethren, among whom communal ownership of the land, Abskina, subsisted, they continued to govern themselves by means of the communal assembly, the Gromada, corresponding to the Russian Mir. In both cases, they were all denied the best lands which were set aside for the Tsar, crown lands, the Pomieskis, nobles, and the clergy, i.e., the famous trilogy of Holy Russia. Thus in 1891 to take the province of Ekaterinoslav, the figures being essentially valid for the whole of Ukraine, the nobles who accounted for 0.9% of the population held 31.06% of the arable lands, the Ukrainian peasants, 70% of the population, farmed only 37.55% of the land, the German planters, some 4% of the population, had 9.46% of the land, and generally the best land. As for the Greek 2% of the population, they had 6.62% of the cultivable land, usually not very good land at that. The Jewish farming colonies accounted for only an insignificant figure some 0.34% of the land. Agriculture was the main economic activity and occupied three quarters of the population. Agricultural production was made up of grains, beets, tobacco and sundry vegetables. Livestock were numerous, and there was on average one horse for every five inhabitants. Nearly 10% of people depended on the industry and mines of the Donets Coal Basin or the iron mines of Krivoy Rog. 5% of the population made a living out of trade while the remainder was made up of officials and public service employees. The Sea of Azov ports of Berdyansk, 47,000 inhabitants, and Marupol, 45,000, very active all year round, were linked by rail to Ekaterinoslav, 220,000 inhabitants in 1917, the capital of the southern Ukraine, itself connected via the important rail junction at Sinalnikovo with the Crimea, via Alexandrovsk, population 52,000, and Melitopol, population 18,000. Contrary to prejudices widespread in the West, the population did not wallow in crass ignorance, in 1923 for instance, out of those of school age in 1914. The numbers who could read and write in Ukraine stood at 90% in the towns and 73% in the countryside. For Russia, the figures were, respectively, 82% and 57%. Another feature of the province of Ekaterinoslav, two cradle of the Maknovskina, is that it had been the historical heartland of the Zaporog Cossacks, warrior communities of free men who over the centuries had fought ferociously to cling on to their independence. This is rather more than a coincidence and we might do well to dwell upon it a little. The origins of the Cossacks go back to the Middle Ages, in particular to the resistance against Tatar oppression, when a section of the Slav population opted to stand its ground and fight. The term, Cossack is itself of Tatar origin and means at once shepherd, horseman, free warrior, vagabond and, sometimes bandit. The people so-called began by establishing a sort of confraternity situated along a river. At the origin of all those that followed there were two, the Don and the Dnieper confraternities formed at around the same time in the 15th and 16th centuries. The first formation, the Don group, was made up of Russians drawn from the democratic towns of Novorod, Pskov and Ryazan, driven out by the awful persecutions visited upon them by Moscow's autocratic Tsars. Taking refuge in the eastern Ukraine and the northern Caucasus, they clung to their republican traditions, what was known as Cossack freedoms, namely, the practice of settling all their problems in general assembly, the Krug, equivalent to Novorod's democratic assembly, the Vechi, and of appointing their own ataman, an elected and revocable military leader. The second band established itself in Ukraine along the banks of the Dnieper and, to begin with, comprised exclusively of Ukrainians. Both bands maintained close ties of friendship and cooperation with each other. It was said that the two armies of the Don and the Dnieper are as brother and sister. 
It was only towards the end of the 16th century that, in the face of the Turkish threat, one of them threw in its lot with the Muscovite Tsar and the other with the Kingdom of Poland, all save the Cossacks from the Lower Dnieper, the Zaporov Cossacks, who remained independent. Given the crucial role played by the descendants of these two Cossacks bands in the Russian Civil War of 1917-1921 and thus in our narrative, we shall take a closer look at the main features of their evolution. From their earliest days the Don Cossacks swarmed over the adjoining regions, the Volga, the Urals, Astrakhan, etc., thus it was one of their people who had become a Volga Cossack, Ermak, who in the 1580s conquered virtually the whole of Siberia for the Tsar. They played a vital role for Moscow and indeed for the whole of Europe by repulsing and then subjugating all the nomadic peoples of Central Asia and of Siberia, who hitherto had been wont to invade and ravage northeastern Europe. The linking of the Don territory to Moscow in 1570 was merely federative, thus, when the Tsar openly trespassed against their rights, they first displayed some agitation and then exploded in open revolts, the best known of which were the revolts of Stenka Razin in 1670, of Bulevin in 1708 and of the Ural Cossack Pugashev in 1775. These uprisings were harshly put down, especially that of Bulevin, by Peter the Great who had a large number of Cossacks from every part executed. Those who survived these decimations were then scattered to the extremities of the empire. Turned into border guards, they formed regular troops called Voiskos, armies, after the rivers and regions to which they were assigned, in 1914 in order of importance these were as follows, the Don, Cuban, Turk, Ural, Orenburg, Astrakhan, Transbaikalia, Semirachinsk, Amor Anashuri. Meanwhile they lost their Russian ethnic homogeneity either by mixing with women carried off or by absorbing adjacent local peoples, Kalmuks, Beriots, Chechens, Cherkesses, or through the arrival of exiled Ukrainians and Zaporogs. The eleven Voiskos appointed after that formed staunch soldiers of the empire, coddled and privileged as such by those in power. They distinguished themselves in the campaigns and wars of Imperial Russia especially when they smashed Napoleon's hitherto undefeated cavalry in 1812-1814 and watered their mounts at the fountains of the champs Elysees in Paris. Having become pillars of the empire, the Cossacks were not content to wage war and carry Russia's borders on their saddles, they were also deployed for internal security. They were required to regularly dispatch Sotnir's 150-man squadrons, and regiments for service as police either garrisoning the leading towns and settlements in the country, or for use in the Tsar's personal guard. It was as the regime's Praetorian guards that they cruelly put down the 19th century Polish uprisings and the great revolutionary upheaval of 1905. Then Nagaika, Leather Whip, henceforth was of sinister reputation among the unbroken population. In peacetime the Cossacks could supply nearly 70,000 men and almost three times that number in times of war and when the 1914 war broke out they formed numerous units, 162 horse regiments, 171 independent cavalry sotniers, 24 battalions of infantry including the Plastoons shock commandos from the Cuban, as well as numerous artillery batteries, in all around 450,000 troops. Their order of battle was novel compared with the open file formations of the Russian regular cavalry, the forager's charge of French regulations and the single line of attack of the German cavalry. Among Cossacks the charge, the lava flow, consisted of fighting in a dispersed way such as to facilitate to the utmost the individual action of each fighting man and officers of every rank in taking whatever initiatives were best suited to the circumstances. The interval between the attackers made it possible for them to advance at speed across any terrain, and it made their actions particularly devastating. Their usual armaments comprised, of course, the sabre without which the Cossack is inconceivable, the lance, the rifle, the dagger and sometimes a handgun. Their pugnacious and daring made them formidable warriors. In 1917 the most numerous were the Don and Cuban Cossacks who alone accounted for nearly three-quarters of the Russian army's Cossack complement. Come the Civil War, they were to account for a similar fraction of General Denikin's anti-Bolshevik forces. In addition, tremendous social differentiation prevailed among the populace of the Cossack lands, there were many Russian immigrants, looked upon as non-Cossack intruders and who worked as sharecroppers on the lands of wealthy Cossacks. Among the Cossack masses, 
there were some indigents for, although each Cossack was automatically entitled to a parcel of land, the size of the holding varied according to rank. In the case, say, of the Cuban, in 1870 the hitherto collectively held lands were divided up as follows, a general got 1,500 hectares, a colonel 400 hectares, an assault, commander, 200, and a mere Cossack only 30 hectares. Moreover in the Cuban there was gulf between the literal Cossacks who were of Zaporog origin, and those of the interior who were of Russian extraction and clashes and rivalry between them were not unknown. These different characteristics explain why many poor or even medium Cossacks as well as some non-Cossack inhabitants of their lands were to opt during the civil war, in the beginning at any rate, for the Bolsheviks who seemed to them to offer assurances of greater social justice. The Dnieper Cossacks, Ukrainians, were, in spite of various adventures and revolt, brought into subjection to the power of the Polish lords, the pans, and were gradually absorbed into the general population under Polish control, those under Russian rule, who were also subjected to repression by Peter the Great, nonetheless supplied some regiments which, subsequently, in the wars of the empire also came to pitch their tents in Paris in 1814 and then melted into the population. In 1918 their descendants rallied in large numbers to the yellow and blue Ukrainian nationalist colors of Putlura's troops. Finally, and of greater interest to us here, there were the Zaporog Cossacks, whose name derives from the fact that the first of them sought refuge on islands amid the inaccessible rapids of the Lower Dnieper, their name means literally beyond the cataracts, from where they organized raids against the Tatars and Turks. They drew vittles from the wild fastness of what was termed Little Tartary, today's southern Ukraine, where a prodigal nature offered an abundance of game, fish, wild honey and natural shelter. The Zaporogs were free men or men whose ambition was to be such, and above all, men who aimed to remain such. As such, on condition that they were of the orthodox faith, they welcomed many outsiders to their ranks, Russians fleeing their despotic rulers or serfdom, retainers, peasants, townsfolk, vagabonds of various origins fleeing taxation, constraint and all manner of servitude and lord by the Zaporog's manner and free way of life, their Volnitsa, they could stay permanently or just sample Cossack life for a spell. In principle, every free Ukrainian was a Cossack, while retaining his land and could be mobilized at a moment's notice. The Zaporogs were a military and political force that played a crucial role in the 16th and 17th centuries in that part of the continent. They allied themselves with the Swedes and with Cromwell in their struggle against the Poles and Muscovites, sturdy sailors as well as valiant warriors, they could field an army of 40 men, a considerable figure for that time. Their forces, scattered right across Ukraine, were divided into pokes or regiments, and into sotnias or squadrons. As their military, administrative and religious capital they had the Sich, a wooden stockaded stronghold on an island in the Dnieper, first at Kortitsa and then on two other islands further downriver. Women and children were not admitted to the Sich, it was divided into 38 Kurans or working and living communities, each one bearing the name of the area of origin of its 150 men who garrisoned there, making in all nearly 6,000 Zaporogs permanently available. Organization was democratic and egalitarian, with the elective principle in operation at all echelons of command and of civilian office, they were all directly elected for a one-year term. They could be confirmed in or recalled from office at any time by a general assembly, the Kosh, and any mere Cossack could accede to any post. Elections normally were held in the month of October, they determined the Atamans of the Kurim, the Hetman or Ataman of all the Kurim as well as his staff, secretary, attendant, judge, etc. At the same time, all territories administered by the Sich were reassigned by means of the drawing of equal lots. Aside from filling those lots, the Zaporogs went in for hunting, fishing, they had a significant fleet and, naturally, given the historical circumstances of the day, for warfare. Following Pugashev's revolt, the Sich was destroyed in 1775 by order of Catherine II. Kortitsa became the site of a German settlement and the Zaporogs were either enslaved or forced into exile in the Cuban, the Crimea, Siberia, or even Turkey. Thus after many vicissitudes, the lands and liberties of the Zaporogs were whittled away and confiscated by local feudatories and agents of the Muscovite Tsars. However, 
The memory of that era of autonomy and freedom represented by the Volnitsa stayed lively among the region's population. The region was called Zaporozhye, and it is striking to note that the Maknavist movement merely and naturally adopted the Zaporog's traditions of an embryonic libertarian communism. Consequently, throughout the evolution of Tsarism we witness a double phenomenon. The Cossacks, libertarian-minded warrior peasants have been either courted, dragooned then domesticated or persecuted, decimated, and suppressed for that very reason. So it may be argued, paradoxically, that the true Cossacks have gone, while leaving their achievements alive, and that the people called by that name are no longer anything more than a warrior caste in the service of an autocratic authority that is the very antithesis of their initial ideal. In which case the 1917 revolution triggered a formidable reversion. 3. A Rebellious Youth Nesta Markno was born on October 27, 1888 in Guliaipoli, a sizable town crossed by the Gaishu River and belonging to the Alexandrovsk district of the Ekaterinoslav province. Guliaipoli means fair green, walking green and the name derives from the fact that, from time immemorial fairs frequent and of high repute in the region have been held there. Some Zaporog Cossacks had settled there over two centuries before which accounts for the towns being divided up along military lines into rotors or centuries. When Catherine II had ordered the destruction of the Sitch, many Zaporogs, rather than submit, had gone into exile, those who had not had the opportunity or time to do so had been enslaved. The ones from Guliaipoli had been awarded to one Shabelsky on the whim of some favorite of the Empress. At the beginning of the 20th century, Guliaipoli boasted nearly 10,000 inhabitants and by 1917 the figure was nearly 25,000, a cantonal capital and the residence of the cantonal police, superintendent, the communal magistrate and the rural agent, it possessed two orthodox churches, a synagogue, three schools, a rural first aid post and a posts and telegraph office. Two factories, Krieger and Kerner, churned out farm implements and employed cheap local labor. There were also two steam mills, several artisan workshops and some small undertakings. The bulk of the land belonged to the big landlords while the peasants owned only 45% of the arable land, the poorest of them, the Batrakis, worked for the big landlords who also hired seasonal workers who poured in from the provinces of Poltava and Chernigov at harvest times. Seven kilometers away lay the town's railway station, located on the sinelnikovo chaplino berdyansk railway connection. Heavy traffic passed along the road that linked Guliaipoli to the station where there were convoys delivering loads of wheat and flour, farm machinery and from where coke and ore for various local firms were brought back. Nesta was the fifth son of Ivan Markno and of Dokia Markno ne Perideri. His parents had been serfs of the Senior Shabelsky prior to their being given their freedom when Tsar Alexander II abolished serfdom in 1861. Their plot of land being insufficient to feed their family, the father went on working at his former master's place as a stable boy. When Nestor was born, his father was taken on as a coachman by a wealthy Jewish industrialist, Kerner, who owned a farm machinery plant, a steam-driven mill, a large store and 500 hectares of land leased out to some German settlers. A short time later, with Nestor scarcely 11 months old, his father died leaving his widow utterly unprovided for and with five young boys to care for. In these circumstances, Nesta's early childhood was marked by great poverty and by an absence of the games and gaiety that befit such tender years. His mother was reduced to entrusting him to a couple of well-to-do but childless peasants who intended to adopt him. She took him back after several weeks at the insistence of his older brothers because he was unhappy with the couple. At the age of eight, he entered the secular municipal school. To begin with he was a good pupil, then he began to play truant spending his days along with about a hundred urchins of his own age studying skating and all sorts of games. These parallel classes continued for weeks at a time until one fine day the ice gave way and Nesta was only just saved from drowning in the icy waters. This incident must have been at the root of the weakness in his lungs which subsequently proved fatal to him, for this soaking froze his clothing and he stayed like that for a time, before seeking the shelter of his uncle's home and getting help. His mother tended him by means of a memorable thrashing. He went back to school where he again became a good pupil until the summer arrived, 
Then he had himself taken on as the handler of a team of oxen on the land of a comfortably off peasant, Janssen, at the daily wage of 25 kopecks. His greatest delight was to race the seven kilometers to his maternal home to hand over his daily pay to his mother. It was only with that thought in mind that he was able to hold out all summer, despite two lashes from a whip doled out for some minor offense by the undermanager, a brute. In all this work brought the nine-year-old Nestor some twenty rubles, and these first earnings were handed over in their entirety to his mother to whom he was at all times to display the greatest attachment. His brothers also worked as farmhands, and they helped their mother who was in dire need. If one is to credit the memoirs of Anatol Gak, a Guliaipoli peasant who subsequently fled to Canada. Markno's house on the edge of the town's fairground was extremely poor, neither pig nor any of the usual amenities of a Ukrainian cattle were to be seen in their courtyard or farmyard, he stipulates. Nestor went back to school that autumn and was revealed as a good pupil in arithmetic and especially in reading, the first inkling of his future gifts as an orator. Unfortunately, that was the sum total of his studies for, at the end of the school year, his family's circumstance became so straitened that he had to carry on working throughout the year, although only ten years old. This sad circumstance aroused in him a sort of rage, resentment, even hatred for the wealthy property owner on whose holding he worked, and above all for his progeny, for these young idlers who often passed close by him, all fresh and neat, with full bellies and in cleanest clothes, reeking of perfume while he, filthy and in rags, barefooted and stinking of dung, scattered bedding for the calves. It was at this point that he began to awaken to social injustice although he still thought like a resigned slave, reckoning that that is how things are, the landlord and his were the masters, whereas he was paid for the unpleasantness of reeking of dung. The years passed, Nestor moved on from calves to horses, accepting his fate willy-nilly until one day he witnessed a scene that was to leave its indelible mark upon him. The landlord's sons, the manager and his undermanager were wont to give the stable lads a drubbing for the slightest peccadillo. The dark recesses of his mind made Nestor accept this craven spectacle and, like a real slave, he strove just like the others about him to avert his eyes and pretend he saw and heard not a thing. However, his mother had told him how, under serfdom, corporal punishment was quite commonplace and how she herself as a child had on two occasions been birched, merely because, quite within her rights she had refused to perform the corvée. She had had to present herself on the steps of the seigneur's big house to receive fifteen strokes of the birch in the presence of the master. His mother had also told him of the epic struggles of their Zaporul Cossack forebears against enemies on every side in order to safeguard their freedom. Thus, one summer's day in 1902 the young Nestor, thirteen years old, was present at a run-off mill scene, the landlord's sons, his manager and his assistant set about insulting then raining blows on the second stable boy in the presence of all the other stable hands. Half dead from fear at the wrath of their masters, Nestor could take no more and off he ran to alert the head stable boy, Bako Ivan, who was busy in a cowshed trimming the horse's tails. Learning of what was afoot, Bako Ivan, an elemental force, burst, like a man possessed, into the room where the chastisement was underway pitched into the young nobles and their acolytes and sent them rolling in the dirt with swathing punches and kicks. The attackers, attacked, fled in disarray, some through the window, some through the nearest doorway. This was the signal for revolt, all of the De La Boas and stable boys were outraged and went off in a body to demand an explanation. The old landlord took fright and in conciliatory tone besought them to forgive the idiocy of his young heirs, to remain in his service and even undertook to see that nothing of the sort would ever happen again. Bako Ivan related the episode to young Nestor, treating him to the first words of rebellion he had ever heard in his life. No one here should countenance the disgrace of being beaten, and as for you, little Nestor, if one of your masters should ever strike you, pick up the first pitchfork you lay hands on and let him have it. This advice, at once poetic and brutal, left a terrible mark upon Nestor's young soul and awakened him to his dignity. Henceforth he would keep a fork or some other tool within reach, meaning to put it to good use. One year later, Nestor quit his job as a stable boy and, at the prompting of his older brothers, had himself taken on at a local foundry as an apprentice. There he learned the art of casting harvester wheels. 
Meanwhile the family's situation had changed considerably. His three elder brothers, Carp, Sava and Emilian, after marrying set up homes of their own. That left only Nestor and his younger, brother Grigory in their mother's care. After a time, Nestor left the foundry and worked as a sales assistant for a wine merchant. Nauseated by his job, he gave it up after three months. Perhaps it was in the wake of this experience that he was to retain an aversion for wine and alcohol, that aversion was very real, despite all the fairy tales peddled latter about his alleged inebriate tendencies. Then he tended his mother's four hectares of land, which he worked with their lone horse. He worked by fits and starts, especially to lend a helping hand to his brothers, for instance, he signed on with a painting and decorating firm, for just long enough to pay for the cart needed to transport his brother's wheat. In 1904, one of them, Sava, was called up and set off for the Russo-Japanese front. Along came the 1905 revolution. He was enthused by events, and it induced him to read some clandestine political literature. At first he fell under the spell of the social democrats, won over by their socialist phraseology and their phony revolutionary order. He distributed their tracts in massive numbers. However, at the beginning of 1906, he made the acquaintance of anarchist peasants from Guliaipoli and soon became a sympathizer of their group. This group had been organized by Voldemar, Vladimir, Antony and Prokop Semenuta. Antony, the son of immigrant Czech workers and a lathe operator himself, exercised a decisive influence over Nestor by ridding his soul once and for all of the lingering remnants of the slightest spirit of servility and submission to any authority. Guliaipoli's peasant libertarian communist group operated in difficult circumstances for the Tsarist repression was at its height, a state of siege had been proclaimed nationwide, the court-martial was taking a heavy toll and military expeditions were gunning down alleged troublemakers. A detachment of Don Cossacks stationed in Guliaipoli to counter any eventuality set about gratuitous bullying of peaceable inhabitants. Anatol Gak describes one scene when he saw a teacher dragged along by two Don Cossacks with sabers at the ready, while a third beat him with rifle butt, shrieking with each blow. Take that, you wastrel, for your revolution. Despite this oppressive atmosphere, the town's anarchist group met regularly at least once each week and sometimes more often, with its 10 to 15 members. A melancholy Mark No recalled those meetings, for me such nights, we most often would gather to meet by night, were filled with light and joy. We peasants, with our meager learning, would assemble in winter at the home of one of us, in summer in the fields, near a pond, on the green grass, or, from time to time, in the broad daylight like young folks out for a stroll. We would meet to debate the issues that move us. From then on, Nestor threw himself wholeheartedly into the struggle for social revolution. 4. From militant to terrorist. Nestor first completed a six-month term in the anarchist study circle, and it was only once he had fully digested the ideals and goals of libertarian communism that he became a full-fledged member of the Guliaipoli group. At the time he was working as a foundry worker at the Kerner plant. With a degree of success, the group disseminated libertarian ideas among the nation's peasants, publishing and distributing tracts, but it also took care to reply with direct action to the governmental terror after the fashion of other anarchists from the Russian Empire who had decreed black terror against Tsarism. In order to equip itself with the wherewithal for its various operations, the group decided to carry out expropriations won against the local bourgeois and in the surrounding areas. The indictment drawn up by the prosecution of the Odessa Field Court Martial when the Guliaipoli Libertarian Communist Group appeared before it enumerates the following. On September 5, 1906 in Guliaipoli, an attack upon the home of the businessman. Pleskina by three individuals armed with revolvers and with faces blackened. On October 10, a fresh attack in Guliaipoli upon another businessman, Bruck, by four individuals, faces concealed by paper masks, who, brandishing revolvers and bombs, demanded 500 rubles for the starving. A little later, a third attack upon a wealthy local industrialist, Kerner, by four individuals, with three more acting as lookouts. In August 1907 in the nearby village of Gaishu, a fourth attack upon yet another businessman, Gyovich, by four individuals wearing sunglasses. 
On October 19, 1907, attack upon the mail coach, a gendarme and postman were killed. In 1908, three further attacks, again upon businessmen. The monies thus accumulated were used to develop propaganda and for the procurement, through Voldemar Antoni, of weapons and bombs in Vienna. The group also had contacts with the Ekaterinoslav group and certain others in Moscow. Another aspect of the Black Terror consisted of torching the properties and goods of the region's big landowners by way of replying to the so-called Stolopin reform designed to abolish the communal assembly, the Gromada, in order to foster the emergence of a new stratum of well-to-do peasants, the Kulaks, who, it was anticipated, would furnish fresh support for the regime. All of these actions lit a fire under the region's cops. The local Sherlock Holmes, Dixit Novopolin, police superintendent Karia Kentsev, tipped off by informers and acting on information gleaned from rough and ready questioning of suspects, managed to identify certain individuals as responsible for attacks, although for lack of evidence, he could not arrest them on the spot. In September 1907, Nestor was apprehended in very specific circumstances, a social revolutionary friend by the name of Makovsky borrowed his revolver, allegedly to take revenge on a gendarme officer who had recently put him through the mill. In fact, Makovsky used the gun to settle an affair of the heart with his fiancée. He fired two bullets into her and pumped the remainder into himself. Markno, who was on hand, did not have the time to prevent this unexpected turn of events and rushed to the aid of the wounded. That solicitude was his undoing for he was apprehended on the spot by the police. Some days later, Antoni, who was trying to communicate with him through an intermediary among the guard, was likewise arrested. In vain did they grill Markno and Antoni, nothing doing, they could not get the slightest admission out of them. Karia Kentsev told the local post commander on this score. Quote, I have never before seen men of this metal. I have plenty of evidence on which to state that they are dangerous anarchists but although I have put their flesh through a little suffering, I have extracted nothing from them. Markno seems like a peasant dolt when one looks at him, but I have very conclusive evidence for claiming that it was he who shot at the gendarmes on August 26, 1907. Well now, I have done all I was able to extract admissions but to no effect. On the contrary, he supplied me with facts, which I have checked out and which I have been forced to acknowledge as correct, demonstrating that he was not even in Guliapoli on that day. As for the other one, Antony, when I interrogated him, having him beaten at will, he dared declare to me. You, dead meat, you'll never get anything out of me. And yet I gave him a good taste of the swing. End quote. Despite the flimsiness of the charges against them, Antony was released only after a month and, Markno only after ten months, it was with that lengthy stay that Nestor, at the age of eighteen, began his lengthy acquaintance with prisons. Paradoxically it was a Guliapoli industrialist, one Vichlinsky, who secured his release by posting bail of two thousand rubles. All of the rest of the group's militants being outlawed, it was decided that Markno would adopt a line of behavior i.e., that he should remain within the law. He then found himself employment with a decorating firm but continued to be an activist by founding an anarchist study group made up of 25 young peasants from Bocchini, a village near Guliapoli. At its weekly get-together, he would peruse and discuss with them sundry basic texts of anarchist doctrine. The militant group uncovered two names who had infiltrated their ranks, Gora and Kushner, and promptly executed them, then decided to hold a general meeting to wind up the episode, for one. Of its members, Ivan Levadny, was suspected of being in touch with the police. The suspicions were confirmed when, as the meeting was breaking up, the house in which it was being held was cordoned off by a squadron of Don Cossacks and members of the local Okrana.3 Levadny suggested that they give themselves up, his treachery being so patent, but they all determined to tough it out and fight. In a daring sortie, abetted by the darkness, they managed to carve a path for themselves by firing their revolvers, cutting down Lepachenko, the second in command of the local police, some Cossacks, and detectives. In the course of the operation, Prokop Semenuta, who had founded the group along with Antony, was wounded in one leg, his brother, Alexander, carried him piggyback, but, seeing their pursuers gain on them, Prokop determined to stay behind to slow them up. 
Down to his last bullet, he blew his own brains out. To avenge his brother's death, Alexander Semenuta, accompanied by Markno and Philip. Onichenko, made up his mind to execute no lesser figure than the province's governor, who was due to pay a personal visit to Guliaipoli to look into the whole hullabaloo. This sensational scheme was aborted, for young people were banned from getting anywhere near the governor, the latter being desirous of addressing only heads of households and of sharing with them his outrage at the presence of terrorists in the town. Undeterred, Markno proposed to dynamite the local Okrana station, using two devices weighing 9 and 14 pounds respectively and originally meant for the governor. The conspirators were ready to give their own lives. An incident prevented them from carrying out their plan, they bumped into a patrol of Cossacks who made to search them. Again they managed to shoot their way out. However, Onachenko was arrested at his home, and Markno himself was picked up a little later. That arrest probably saved his life, for he had firmly intended to go back a few hours later to give the assassination plan a second try. It transpired that every last member of the group had been given away, first by the careless gossip of Nozozuachenko, a close friend of Nestor's, with a narc, one Shak Brin, jailed along with him in Ekaterinoslav and secondly by the statements of Levadny and Althorsen. Interrogated briskly by Karia Kentsev, Zuachenko corroborated his admissions with details galore and claimed that what he and the group had done had been prompted purely by political objectives set by the ideas of the people's freedom, for in all, 16 members of the group were rounded up. Only Antony and Alexander Semenuto escaped the dragnet and fled first to France and on to Belgium. According to Levadny, Markno was deemed one of the most dangerous terrorist members of the group, after the brothers Prokop and Alexander Semenuta. A start was made by accusing him of several expropriations and killings of gendarmes, however, for want of evidence and confessions, only some of these charges could be proceeded with. All of the accused were removed to a prison in Alexandrovsk. Preparation of the case lasted over a year. Meanwhile, Alexander Semenuta, who kept in touch with his people, sent a letter of personal greetings to Karia Kentsev, which reads as follows. To Guliaipoli, to Karia Kentsev, Poxy Devil, Mr. Superintendent, I have heard it said that you have been searching for me high and low and dearly wish to meet with me. If this be the case, I then beseech you to come to Belgium. Here, freedom of speech is unrestricted, and we will be able to chat at leisure. Signed, Alexander Semenuta, Guliaipoli Anarchist. In so doing, Semenuta was laying a false trail, for he returned to Ukraine intent upon arranging the escape of Markno and his comrades. Above all, he made up his mind to settle accounts with Karia Kentsev, the Sherlock Holmes who had been behind the rounding up of the whole group. The policeman was very fond of the theater, and, all unsuspecting in the belief that Semenuta was a thousand leagues away, he blithely went along to see a play very highly rated in Ukraine one autumn evening in 1909, along with his mistress. Semenuta watched for him, took a seat three rows behind him, his pockets heavy with two loaded revolvers, but he hesitated to fire, fearing that innocent spectators might be hit. He positioned himself then at the theatre exit, behind a tree, surprised Karia Kentsev and pumped three bullets into him. Alexander Semenuta had executed yet another gendarmerie officer, one who had especially distinguished himself in the repression. Then he turned his attention to planning Markno's escape. It was prepared for January 5, 1910 and the removal of the prisoners from Alexandrovsk to Ekaterinoslav. Along with anarchists from the region still at large, Semenuta positioned himself in Alexandrovsk railway station, disguised as a peasant, dressed in an enormous sheepskin cloak and, wearing a papaka, some comrades waited nearby and some sleighs were ready for the off. Everything seemed to be proceeding smoothly when it was learned that the train had been caught in a blizzard and was running late. Semenuta was thus obliged to step into the waiting room and there, in spite of his disguise, Althausen, the member of the group who had turned informer, recognized him and in the belief that he himself was the target, alerted the guards. This put paid to the planned escape but the intrepid Semenuta again managed to extricate himself at gunpoint. When the authorities learned of his return to Ukraine, they had no doubt but that he was behind several recent, sensational outrages, and they posted a substantial reward for his capture, dead or alive, 
as he had been decreed public enemy number one. Over several months, he thwarted all plans to search him out but nonetheless met a tragic end, one might say on account of nostalgia for the land of his birth. Indeed, in the company of a young libertarian by the name of Martha Pivel, he arrived back in. Gugliopoli for May 1, 1910. One of Markno's brothers offered to put him up while he himself went off to sleep at his mother's house. Semenuta's presence was immediately reported to the police, as was to come to light following the seizure of police archives in 1917 by one Piotr Shirovsky who was eager for the reward money. The police surrounded him, laid siege to the house and stormed it. They found Semenuta dead, he having kept his last bullet for himself, his female companion was gravely wounded. That such a daring militant so fanatically devoted to the cause of anarchy could have exercised such influence over the teenaged Markno, already quite resolute himself, who was to remember him with such emotion all his life, can readily be understood. The direct actions carried out by the Gugliopoli anarchist group were not at all out of the ordinary for the years 1906 to 1909, for the Tsarist repression was in full swing and the firing squads and hangmen were busy. The timid reforms granted at the start by Nicholas II, who was very conscious of his station, were quickly annulled and the mailed fist took over. Also, every revolutionary in the Russian Empire was resorting to the same sort of activities. At the time, a number of militants like Markno or Semenuta met their deaths either in combat or on the scaffold or were deported to Siberia or consigned to penal servitude. The few who survived this heroic struggle were not to forget the sacrifice of their comrades and were to pledge themselves to avenge them promptly in 1917 against the police and other goons of the autocracy. As a rule, the membership of the Gugliopoli Libertarian Communist Group was quite young, the older members being 25 years of age while Markno was the youngest. The indictment drawn up against the group charged the 16 proceeded against, first of all, with illegal subversive association and then with sundry criminal activities, expropriations and armed struggle against the authorities. Fourteen individuals were implicated, Nesta Markno, the brothers Anton and Igor Bondarenko, Klim Kurichenko, Philip Cherniavsky, the brothers Philip and Pyotr Onichenko, Ivan Shivchenko, tried and hanged before the main case was heard, Martinova and Zablodsky, Ukrainians, plus Efim Orlov, a Russian, all of them peasants, Norm Althausen, Labour Gorlick Qs, and Kosimir Lisovsky, a Pole, town dwellers. Let us note in passing the differing national origins of the group's membership, as noted for each person named, it represented rather well the diversity of the local population and even endowed the group's activities with a quite internationalist cachet. Obviously, the group's membership had been even larger, the others were either on the run or had not been charged in that there was no evidence against them. The accused whose names did not feature on the charge sheet were Levadny, Ukrainian, who officially died of typhus in the prison infirmary but who, according to Markno, was strangled for his treachery by an anarchist hospitalized with him there, and another militant of the group, who had been very close to Markno, one Kshiva, a Jew, who was accused of having murdered the agent provocateur. Kushner and was hanged on June 17, 1909. Nozol Zurichenko, Ukrainian, whose loose talk had led to the discovery of the group, contracted an acute form of typhus and could not stand trial alongside the others, this was undoubtedly a sort of ruse by the authorities who were unwilling to compromise their informant. Voldemar Antony, having fled to Belgium, emigrated shortly after that to South America where he spent many a long year working hard before turning into a Soviet patriot, returning with his family to the Soviet Union, to Kazakhstan, specifically, in the 1960s. In 1967 he even made a trip back to Gugliopoli for the 50th anniversary celebrations of October 1917, but his anarchist beliefs had been lost. The other members of the group who made good their escape continued to carry out propaganda and organizing activities in the Gugliopoli region thereby clinging to the progress made by the activities of their vanished or imprisoned comrades. These activities were thus not to be in vain and were to pave the way for the burgeoning of libertarianism come 1917. 5. Penal Servitude The trial of the Gugliopoli anarchist group took place in March 1910 in Ekaterinoslav. 
The court was ringed by a mass of gendarmes and troops, such was the fear, despite such prolific precautions, of an armed move by Alexander Semenyuta, then still alive, and his comrades, aimed at freeing Markno and his jailed confederates. The guards were under orders to kill the accused on the spot at the slightest sign of external attack. A local bigwig who arrived to visit the accused in prison had Markno presented to him, looked him over and then declared to the chief warder, to look at him, this Markno seems harmless enough yet they say he is very dangerous. After five days proceedings, the verdict was delivered on March 26, 1910, Martinova, Lisovsky and Zablodsky were sentenced to six years penal servitude, Kurachenko, Igor Bondarenko, Orlov, Althausen and Markno were first sentenced to 15 years hard labor for criminal association. And then to death by hanging for terrorist offenses and expropriations. Counsel suggested to the condemned that they seek leave to appeal, aside from Althausen, they scornfully refused. Markno announced to his defense lawyer, We have no intention of asking anything of this good-for-nothing Tsar. These rascals have sentenced us to death, so let them hang us. Nestor and his companions were locked up in a special condemned cell, the walls of which were covered by inscriptions from all who had preceded them into that antechamber of death. This dramatic circumstance drew a few pathetic lines from Markno in his memoirs, quote, Once inside these cells, one half feels that one has climbed down into the grave. One has the feeling that only one's straining fingertips are dinging to the surface of the earth. One then thinks of all who, being yet at large, cling to their belief and their hopes, intent upon doing something good and useful in the struggle for a better life. Having sacrificed oneself for this future, one feels flooded by a quite profound and very heartfelt love for one's comrades in the struggle. They seem so near, so dear, one wholeheartedly hopes that they may hold on to their faith and their hopes to the very end and take their love of the oppressed and their hatred of their oppressors further. The twelve condemned men in the cell had as their sole and exclusive preoccupation the obsessive thought of their imminent execution and tried to prepare for it with courage. Igor Bondarenko, one of his closest comrades, predicted a most active revolutionary future for Markno. Listen, Nesta. There's a chance that your sentence may be commuted to hard labor. Then the revolution will come along and set you free. It is my profound conviction that, once freed, you will hoist again the black flag of anarchy that our enemies have snatched from us. You will wrest it from them and raise it proudly on high. I have that premonition, for I have seen you in action, Nesta, and you do not tremble before torturers. Bondarenko wanted to get him to promise to shoulder that responsibility, but Nesta, supported by two other comrades, Orlov and Kruchenko, protested that he was too much of a weakling physically as well as having intellectual shortcomings. To which Bondarenko replied that to hold on to one's faith and inner strength, what was needed was not great physical might or exceptional intellectual gifts but evidence of great determination and profound commitment to the cause. One night they came to collect Kurachenko and Bondarenko for hanging, the former took his own life with strychnine while the second, before going to meet the hangman, and realizing that Markno would indeed escape the gallows, said these short farewells. Nesta, my brother, you are to live. I shall surely die I know that you will regain your freedom. They embraced one another as brothers and Igor Bondarenko strode firmly toward his executioners, as if there was any need of that, his pre-death prediction invested Markno even more with the will and determination he needed to keep his promise. After a 52-day numbing delay, Markno was indeed informed that his sentence and that of his comrade Orlov were to be commuted to hard labor for life, one in view of their youth at the time of the offenses in question and, in Markno's case, probably also on account of his steadfast behavior throughout the preliminary investigation, during which he had systematically denied all the accusations leveled against him. After this emotional strain, Markno greatly weakened physically, fell ill and contracted typhoid fever. He spent two months in the hospital, was several days in a coma, written off by the doctors and moved to a terminal ward. Even so he managed to come through this bad patch and summoned up enough strength to object to the treatment mitted out by the doctors. Let us make it clear that at this time inside prison and during penal servitude every convict deemed dangerous was shackled hand and foot and, in principle, around the clock, 
but certain inmates adept in the art of forcing locks abetted their fellow prisoners to get relief at times. He was to wear his chains right through his prison term, or for upwards of eight years, so that it was some time after his release before he was able to walk normally without losing his balance. He was then transferred to the prison in Lugansk where he was held for almost a year in extremely harsh conditions, some inmates could not bear them and took their own lives while others managed to keep going only on the hope of escape or of an imminent revolution that would set them free. He received visits from his mother and brother Grigory who bore news from home and briefed him on the death of Alexander Semenuta. After a further five and a half months stay in Ekaterinoslav prison, he was dispatched on August 2, 1911 to Moscow's central prison, the ill-famed Buterki. His dossier, which followed, drew a remark full of promise from the officer in charge of the convict section. Here your dreams of escape are, ended, a reference to all the escape bids he had planned with his fellow inmates in earlier prisons, only to see them all frustrated. To drive home this threat, they replaced his handcuffs with riveted irons then placed him in quarantine for eight days. Then he got to familiarize himself with his new abode. Most political prisoners, of any and every persuasion and assessed as being among the most dangerous or significant, were housed in this penitentiary, all in all, nearly 3,000 inmates were watched over by several hundred jailers or two-legged curs as Markno described them. On the other hand, and this was a real windfall for him, there was an exceptional collective library amassed by the convicts. Thanks to that, he was going to be able to round out his knowledge of history and literature, he devoured it all with gluttonous appetite, Klyachevsky's Russian history course, the works of Bulinsky, Lermontov, and even Leon Shestov. He also familiarized himself with the basic texts and programs of the various revolutionary groups, the social revolutionaries, social democrats, and their sundry tendencies, etc. He also read anarchist literature and was thunderstruck by Kropotkin's mutual aid which never left his side thereafter. His bridling at the provocations of the turnkeys earned him lengthy stays in the solitary confinement cell, and he fell seriously ill, laid low by a bad pneumonia. He was hospitalized, but, after three months, a tubercular lung was the diagnosis. He spent eight months in the hospital, and thanks to the well-organized assistance to political prisoners, he made a good recovery, however, during his detention, he was to spend two or three months a year thereafter in the hospital ward. It was there in Buterki that he came upon another famous anarchist activist, Pyotr Arshinov, Marin, with whom he was going to be bound with the ties of a solid friendship for nearly twenty years. Also he noticed the difference in treatment doled out by the administration in its dealings with intellectual and political bigwigs on the one hand and to mere workers and peasants on the other and likewise the attitude of the former lot of inmates towards the latter. Whereas the latter were frequently beaten, the intellectuals had no hesitation in shaking the hands of those responsible for such maltreatment, likewise, they had no problem in securing the privilege of not being obliged to carry their irons with them all the time. They worked in the workshops that were interesting and above all monitored the inmates' internal administration very closely, which meant that all help from the outside passed through their hands and that they shared out this booty as they saw fit. In this way Markno grasped once and for all that, such is the psychology of these intellectuals who seek from the socialist idea and from their militancy only the means of ensconcing themselves as masters and governors. These gentlemen wind up unable to understand in a more that the offering of handshakes and the making of gifts in kind or in cash to torturers who, pocketing these gifts, go off to beat up the co-religionists of the very people who have just greeted them so amicably is intolerable. So much so that from then on Markno lost all respect for eminent political figures of every persuasion and thereafter he called their role into question. The years passed, swallowed up by escape schemes that came to naught and by long, heated, political discussions and wide-ranging reading. Cut off from the world, Nestor was carried away with and devised fanciful schemes for combating the state, thus it was that he came to draft his first piece of writing in 1912, a violent, inflammatory revolutionary poem calling upon the exploited to revolt against their exploiters, against the authorities, against all oppressors. Summons. Let us rise in revolt, brethren, and with us the people beneath the black flag of anarchy will revolt. We will surge boldly forward, 
Under the fire of enemy bullets in the battle for faith in libertarian communism, our just regime. We shall cast down all thrones and bring low the power of capital. We will seize the gold and purple scepter and pay no more honor to anything. Through savage struggle we shall rid ourselves of the state and its laws. We have suffered long under the yoke of chains, prisons, and teeming gangs of executioners. The time has come to rise in rebellion and close ranks. Forward beneath the black flag of anarchy, onto the great struggle. Enough of serving tyrants as their tools, that is the source of all their might. Insurrection, brethren, laboring people. We will sweep away all carrion. That's the way we shall reply to the lies of tyrants, we free workers, armed with our determination. Long live our freedom, brethren. Long live the free commune. Death to all tyrants and their jailers. Let us rise, brethren, on the agreed signal, beneath the black flag of anarchy, against every one of them, the tyrants. Let us destroy all authorities and their cowardly restraints that push us into bloody battle. This vibrant summons to insurrection is a good expression of Markno's intractable character at the age of 23 years and which he was subsequently not to renege upon. Imprisonment, torture, penal servitude, nothing succeeded in breaking the young rebel's white-hot determination. He was bolstered in his beliefs by remembrance of the stories with which his mother had fed his childhood, tales of the life of free communities of Zaporov Cossacks in bygone times. He did not have any inkling that a day will come soon when he will feel himself their direct descendant and draw his inspiration from them in order to contribute to the free rebirth of his country. Although he remained hostile to any national separatism, he did take an interest in the ideas of his Ukrainian compatriots. The 1914 war split the inmates into two camps, patriots versus internationalists. Markno naturally gravitated to the latter despite Kropotkin's having come out in favor of the Untang Western powers. Increasingly he was alive to the noxiousness of every state system and the political and chauvinistic aberrations that this involved. The revolution of March 1917, so long awaited, erupted at last and opened the gates of the prisons, though not readily, for certain of the people newly in charge wanted to conduct a sort of triage and to make a specious distinction between common and political prisoners. Markno, delivered of his irons, after eight years of getting used to them, wobbled on his legs sometimes, having lost his sense of balance. He registered at Moscow City Hall then, equipped with identity papers in order, was put up in a former hospital. He was advised to take himself off to the Crimea to have his lungs, in a terrible state, looked after. However, he had a, quote, intuition that only the tempest will be enough to cure him, and his sole concern was to hurl himself wholly into the whirlwind of revolution. He linked up with the anarchist militants of Moscow and participated with them in the pan-Russian workers' demonstration. At first he planned to settle permanently in Moscow, and it was only on the prompting of his mother and comrades from the Gulyai libertarian communist group who bombarded him with telegrams that he decided to go home. His reluctance to return to the place of his birth, paradoxical though it may appear, can be explained by the fact that decisive events were expected in Moscow. Be that as it may, he took the train and, after two days' journey, was again in the bosom of his family. 6. Social Revolution in Gulyai After nine years' absence, Markno was understandably moved when he came to breathe again the air of home. Now aged 27 and a half years, the best years of his youth had been spent in the jails and dungeon recesses of a despised Tsarism. He had vengeance to take against life, but he was a militant of repute and only action could slake his thirst for social achievement. He went first to the home of his 70-year-old mother who struck him as greatly aged and stooped by the years. He saw again his older brothers Sava and Emilian, his other brothers who had set up homes of their own while he was away were still serving at the front. He came upon the surviving members of the Gulyai libertarian communist group, discovered what had become of this one and that, and made the acquaintances of the new young members of the group whose main activity consisted of surreptitiously distributing leaflets. Many peasants, male and female, showed up to greet this man back from the dead, as they called him, and this gave him a chance to gauge how receptive they were to libertarian ideas. 
This sampling of opinions set him at his ease, and he cobbled together a meeting with his comrades from the group. To them he spelled out his analysis of the situation, without waiting for the libertarian movement nationwide to recover its strength and start to organize itself, anarchists ought to be in the vanguard of mass revolutionary action. His activism clashed with the opposition from certain traditional anarchist militants who were calling for a propaganda drive to target the workers and designed solely to familiarize them with libertarian ideas. He and his friends found themselves outnumbered in the group. Not that that mattered for on no account could he make do with such a passive approach and the urge to act, suppressed over so many years, was seething inside him. From the moment he arrived back, he took the initiative by suggesting that local peasants appoint delegates and establish a Gugliopoli peasants' union. Some days later, on March 29, 1917, they did precisely that. The union represented most of the commune's peasants and in the ensuing days was to embrace the peasants from the district and then of the whole region. Hot on the heels of this, the metal workers and woodworkers organized committees of their own, a contingency fund was also set up. Infected by Markno's radical enthusiastic speechifying, they all elected him as their chairman, ignoring his wishes. Although this amounted to a relative infringement of the anarchist teaching that forbade acceptance of any formal authority, Markno accepted all the posts that they sought to confer upon him and was everywhere at once, in the committees and at the anarchist group. He also toured the surrounding militants, he even undertook to ransack the archives of the local police. Thus it was that he discovered that an erstwhile group member, Piotr Shirovsky, had denounced Alexander Semenuta for the 2,000 ruble reward posted for his capture, not that his greed had been hilly satisfied, for, according to the very same archives, only 500 rubles had been paid out to him. Nestor in this way came to realize just why this old friend had been nowhere to be found since his return. Whenever he was further elected as chairman of the communal committee, Markno refused the appointment, for, on the one hand, he still did not know how anarchists stood nationally with regard to such elections, and anyway, if he had accepted the chairmanships of other committees, it had only been in order to reduce the authority of those committees and forestall the election of party political representatives in his place. If the latter were to succeed in gaining the upper hand over the wishes of the workers, he reckoned that they, quote, would inevitably kill any creative initiative in the revolutionary movement. So if he did take up these various responsibilities, it was temporarily only, in order to be better informed about the actions of the formal authorities and to get the workers used to doing without tutors and to learn to shift for themselves. He was also dabbling here and there and indeed, once the operation of these committees had been well run in, he handed them over to a thoroughly reliable comrade, while keeping one eye on business. His tireless activity led to his being delegated to the Alexandrovsk Regional Peasant Congress. There he pushed through a vote to have the estates of the big landowners handed back to the peasant communes, without payment of compensation, to the great displeasure of the Social Democrats and cadets who advocated a buyback policy. His calls for collectivization of the land, factories, and workshops had a tremendous resonance throughout the region, and many a person travelled for a great distance to consult him and take a lead from him. So much so that even the anarchists from the big cities of Alexandrovsk and Ekaterinoslav, learning of his successes, called upon him to come and take up a place in their organization or lend them a hand in their undertakings. But Dulyaipoli was his priority, and there, constantly on call, he never shirked. We might cite the case of the strike by the commune's workers, of whom he had been elected trade union chairman. Begged by the workers to assume leadership of the strike, he agreed, for one thing because it was incumbent upon him by virtue of his office, and for another, because he hoped to win the most pugnacious of the workers over to the libertarian communist group. Before launching their strike, the workers, gathered together in a general assembly, called upon him to draft and present their demands to the bosses. After lengthy common discussion, he summoned the bosses and demanded of them an 80 to 100 percent wage increase under threat of an immediate and complete stoppage. The furious employers refused, he gave them one day to mull it over. The following day they showed up with proposals for a 35 to 40 percent raise. He deemed that offer an outright insult and urged them to take another day to think it over. Meanwhile, 
he arranged with the factory committees and workshop representatives to have the strike declared simultaneously throughout, should the bosses again refuse to meet their conditions. He even proposed to the workers that they proceed immediately with seizure of all capital assets whether on company premises or in the Gugliai Poly Bank, with an eye to utterly disarming the local bourgeoisie and to forestall possible steps by the authorities against strikers, pending their taking effective control of the firms upon themselves. The workers decided to leave this latter move until a later date, for they reckoned that they were ill prepared for it, and they preferred to have the expropriations of the firms contemporaneous with the wresting of the estates from the big landowners. The next day, the employers came back and, after two hours of quibbling, came up with an increased offer but one that was still less than had been asked for, hoping to hold out for a compromise. Whereupon Markno told them that the negotiations were over and that he was winding up the talks. At this point, Kerner, the richest of the businessmen and one-time employer of Nestor as well as of his father Ivan, an old fox sensing that things were taking a turn for the worse, hurriedly told him, Nestor Ivanovich, you were too hasty in winding up the meeting. I reckon that the workers' demands are justified. They are entitled to have us meet them, and I for my part am going to sign right away. Willanilly the other bosses followed the example of their most prominent colleague and the protocol of agreement was signed. Quote, Henceforth, the workers of Gugliai and surrounding area take all firms under their control, examine the economic and administrative implications of the affair and make ready to take over effective management. Incidentally, Markno and his comrades disarmed the local militia and rescinded their powers of arrest and search and reduced them to the role of town criers. Then they assembled the Pomieskis, confiscated title deeds and on that basis, conducted a precise inventory of all these land holdings. It was at this point that the region's peasants refused to pay the usual farm rents to these landlords, hoping to recover the land from them once the harvest was in, without quote, bandying words either with them or with the authorities which looked after them, and then to share the land out among all, peasant or worker, desirous of working it. In view of all these moves and of the positive results that flowed from them, Markno was startled by the smallness of the anarchist movement in Ukraine and in Russia, whose militants were quite numerous at several tens of thousands but ultimately rather passive compared with the left-wing political parties when not swept along in their wake. Indeed, the majority of anarchists were content to peddle libertarian ideas and notions among the working population and simultaneously to organize communities and clubs. Markno found all this very regrettable and he deplored their failure to organize themselves into a powerful all-Russian movement capable of espousing a shared tactic and strategy so as to play an active part in the movement of the revolutionary masses, thereby shaping events and linking up life and activity in towns with those in the countryside. Only thus, he reckoned, would it be possible to keep the social movement on course for libertarian communism. All his life, Markno was to regret the chronic disorganization of anarchists and its baneful impact, for all their numbers and good qualities, their inability to work to make hard and fast reality of their schemes of emancipation. He was even to attribute the failure of the Russian Revolution and of the libertarian movement to this grave shortcoming. For his part, Markno feared nothing in that year of 1917 and carried away by the sort of faith that moves mountains he contributed to the most radical, most daring ventures. On August 29, 1917, General Kornilov's thrust towards Petrograd, intent upon overthrowing the provisional government of the socialist Kerensky and establishing a strong authority, accelerated events. A committee for defense of the revolution was hastily set up in Guliaipoli, chairmanship of it was entrusted to Markno. As he was simultaneously chairman of the Peasants' Union which had now become a Soviet, he had to divide his time between the two tasks. To counter the attempted counter-revolution, he suggested, quote, disarming the entire local bourgeoisie and abolishing its rights over the people's assets, estates, factories, workshops, printing works, theatres, cinemas, and other public enterprises, which would henceforth be placed under the collective control of the workers. The Defense Committee accepted his proposal, however, as Kerensky had managed to ding to power, the balance of forces did not make it possible to implement every decision made. For the time being, the peasants made do with withholding rents from the landlords and with assuming control of the land, livestock and machinery. 
Only several huge estates were collectivized, some farming communes, made up of landless families and small like-minded groups settled on them. Each commune numbered about 200 individuals. There was a huge number of communes dotted around the whole region. Let us look more closely at the ones that Markno personally organized in the former German settlements of Niefeld and Klassen. These libertarian communes were founded upon the principle of equality and fellowship among all their members, male and female. Cooking and dining facilities were shared although any individual could see to his own meals provided proper notice was given. Everyone rose early and set to work right after breakfast. In the event of absenteeism, the commune member would let his neighbor know so that a replacement could be found. The work program was arranged by common consent at general assemblies. Farming was not the sole activity, there was also craft production and even a machine shop. As a member of one of these communes, Markno helped out with the work on two days a week. Come the planting in the spring, he helped with the harrowing and sowing, the rest of the time, he busied himself about the farm or even lent a helping hand to the mechanic at the electricity station. At this point he was living with a companion, Nastia. All of the participants looked upon this free communal lifestyle as the highest form of social justice. Certain landowners came around to that way of thinking and set about working the land for themselves. Indeed, it was left up to the former landowners to choose whether to take an equal share in the commune's lifestyle and work. From Victor Kravenko, the future sensational defector, we have a description of yet another libertarian commune set up in the same area, near Corbino on the Dnieper. Kravenko's father was one of the promoters of this commune which was named Nabat, the Toxin. It was comprised of about 100 worker families from Ekaterinoslav who had settled on the central portion of an old estate. Comprising 200 hectares of wheat land and some orchards, as well as the seigneurial home and its outbuildings. VCTR Kravenko's father had refused to join the Communist Party for he had no taste for dictatorship and terror, he bluntly confessed, even if these were wrapped in the folds of a red flag and so he wanted to remain free and to struggle on alone for a better world. The settlement proceeded with the agreement of the local peasants who had divided up the remainder of the estate, which reads as follows. The local Soviet, endorsing the initiative, had divided up the estates, it had also provided the provisions and livestock needed to complement what was left of the assets of the former owners. In the towns, industry had ground to a virtual standstill due to lack of raw materials and food rationing was so strict that people were all but dead of hunger. So the flight to the land, which held the promise of well-being for everybody, had been well received. The wish to appease certain intellectual urges had also prompted many to throw in their lot with us. Many men, in fact, burned with the desire to put into effect, within the narrow parameters of a cooperative farm, some of the theories that had been the stuff of their dreams over years of revolutionary fervor. The toxin, they told themselves, would ring out as a constant reminder of the ideal of brotherhood that seemed to have been forgotten. Completely in the tumult of the fratricidal war in which the communists, with their chica, were carrying out mass arrests and wrongly shooting folk on the most absurd pretexts. To the farm workers the urban workers brought the energy of despair. Of course, above all else, they wanted to be able to feed their loved ones, but they also sought to justify the sacrifices they had made in the past for their cause. The local peasants made fun of these city workers turned farmers, we shall see, they used to say with a wink of the eye, how these communists shall work our land. At bottom such teasing was without malice, it was, rather, symptomatic of friendly interest. Many peasants hastened to advise us and to help us every occasion that they had the chance. Far from resenting our experiment, they looked upon it like good neighbors, with sympathetic interest. More than once, when we were overloaded with work, they supplied us with precious assistance, and it was they who made a success of our first year. End quote. Later this commune was to fold. A victim of events, the idyllic dream of cooperative enterprise was to dissolve in discord and bitterness, or even in dismal despair, with commune workers quitting one after another. The work of the Gulyai Poly Soviet's procurement section was remarkable also, it established contacts with the textile factories in Moscow and elsewhere, with an eye to arranging direct barter with them. 
Despite hindrance from the quote new powers that be at the center, Bolsheviks and left SRs in coalition, diehard statists to a man who could not tolerate barter between the towns and the countryside unless channeled through state agencies, two trade-offs were arranged, several wagon loads of wheat and flour, against wagon loads of cloth ordered by the Soviet's procurement section. It was not a question of simple barter of goods of equivalent value, i.e., of circuitous commercial dealings, no. This was an exchange of goods in quantities that varied and determined only by the stated needs of both parties. It is also interesting to learn how dealings between the commune's different committees and the delegates whom they appointed were handled. These delegates, did they not become bureaucrats jealous of their prerogatives, uncontrollable and thus unaccountable, as has often been the case in history? The quote Leon Schneider case is a perfect illustration of the control that the committees sought to exercise over their elected or appointed officers. Schneider was a militant of a local anarchist group, delegated by the Metal Workers and Woodworkers Committee as their representative to the Ekaterinoslav Departmental Soviet of Peasants, Workers, and Soldier Deputies. His task was to oversee the supply of iron, cast iron, coal, and other vital raw materials to the factories and mills of Guliaipoli. Schneider, contaminated by the quote bureaucratic atmosphere, neglected his duties and when called to account over the tardiness or absence of supplies, his answer was that he had no time to bother with that anymore, that the departmental Soviet had assigned him another duty, and he invited the Guliaipoli committee to appoint someone else in his place. He then received a telegram hinting that he should return to Guliaipoli forthwith to render an account of his stewardship, otherwise, two comrades would be dispatched to bring him back. Suddenly more solicitous of his rank and file, he went back, delivered his report and was sent back to his workbench in the Kerner plant. Mortified he was to seize the earliest opportunity to avenge himself, as we shall see. As for Markno's role, at this time it is hard to get the precise measure of it, for all his offices and intense activities, he was regarded only as a sort of number one advisor, which is to say his advice and opinion were forever being sought but were not automatically adopted far from it, either in the anarchist group, where he was often challenged, especially by the younger members, or in the Soviet or indeed on the Committee for Defense of the Revolution. In short, his responsibilities were enormous but his power small. In that he was indeed the consistent libertarian militant. However, dark clouds were gathering in the blue skies of revolution, first of all, there was the Bolshevik coup d'etat in October, with which the left SRs threw in their lot the aim being to monopolize power, supposedly on the Soviet's behalf, then along came the anti-Bolshevik rebellion by Kaldin, the Ataman of the Don Cossacks, and that of the Ukrainian nationalists who aimed to drive out the Katsapi, Russians, and above all challenge all of the social changes made by the revolutionary peasants. Faced with this situation, the Guliaipoli Soviet decided to come to the aid of Alexandrovsk which was threatened by the troops of the Central Council, the government set up by the Ukrainian nationalists. That decision faced the local anarchists with a problem, for it had them support governmental forces here which, even if they were of the left, were nonetheless potential enemies of the masses' autonomy. Markno reckoned at the time that quote, as anarchists we must, paradox or no paradox, make up our minds to form a united front with the governmental forces. Keeping faith with anarchist principles, we will find a way to rise above all these contradictions and, once the dark forces of reaction have been smashed, we will broaden and deepen the course of the revolution for the greater good of an enslaved humanity. On January 4, 1918, a detachment of some 800 to 900 men was formed, some 300 of whom were members of the Guliaipoli anarchist group. Nestor's older brother, Sava Markno, assumed command, and off they went by train to Alexandrovsk to join up with Red Guards commanded by Bogdanov. Then Nestor was appointed a member of the city's revolutionary committee. He was placed in charge of the commission of inquiry into imprisoned officers accused of conspiring against the revolution. He was startled to discover among them the former prosecutor who had handled his case in 1909 and who had had him placed in the hole for complaining about his conditions of imprisonment. Markno in turn had him placed in the very cell that he had occupied in those days, prescribing identical conditions for this ex-prosecutor. The will had turned, 
an irony of history that should still give all who bear the responsibility for oppression good. Pause for thought. Nestor availed of his position to secure the release of workers and peasants still imprisoned under Kerensky and whom the Bolsheviks had refused to set free for fear that they might revolt against them too. It was at this point that Nestor underwent his baptism of fire by confronting several Cossack regiments from the Don who were returning from the front to link up with Kaledin. In view of the lively resistance that they encountered, they surrendered, their weapons were taken from them and then they were sent home. That operation over, the Guliai-Poly detachment made for home, though not without ferrying away some additional weaponry. Markno ran up against the thorny problem of finding funds for the activities of the Soviet and Commune. To be sure, he could have obtained any sum from the Alexandrovsk Revolutionary Committee, but in that case he would have acknowledged its authority and thus that of the Lenin. Government, Markno would have none of that at any price. So he suggested to the Soviet that it commandeer 250,000 rubles from the local bank. His suggestion was unanimously accepted. The money was seized from the bank in the name of the revolution to meet the needs of the Soviet, delivered within a few days, it was shared, at Markno's instigation, between a home for war orphans set up in the residence of the former superintendent of police, and the Soviet's procurement branch, the remainder was to meet the needs of the revolutionary committee. So it was that in the space of a year the Guliai-Poly Libertarian Communist Group, at the instigation of the compulsive Nestor with his multifaceted activities inside agencies representative of the working class, managed to contrive the winning of new social rights and, thanks to that, awaken a radical revolutionary consciousness in the region. 7. Ebb and Flow in the 1917 Revolution Thus far we have followed events as they occurred in the southern Ukraine, the better to understand the narrative which follows we would do well at this point to recapitulate in brief the general situation in the erstwhile Russian Empire. The days of rioting in February 1917, known under the name of the February Revolution, put paid to the Romanov dynasty which was incapable of resolving the problems posed the modernization of the country and dash its assumption of its place among the most advanced nations. The World War of 1914 cruelly exposed this impotence. Commanded by generals whose sole concern was for their own personal advancement, often proportionate with the number of their troops killed, poorly armed and haphazardly equipped, the Russian army had suffered colossal losses, with upwards of 9 million dead and wounded, including the Poles, and had no precise notion of why it was fighting. Officially the goals were the capture of Constantinople and the independence of a reunified Poland. In fact, the backstairs intrigues of French and British imperialism against the German could hardly but leave the Russian peasant masses cold as they profoundly yearned for peace. To that basic aspiration were added the claims of the empire's numerous nationalities and above all, the pressure for the agrarian reform urgently desired by the peasantry which accounted for almost 85% of the total population. The provisional revolutionary government that succeeded the Char felt itself obliged to honor the alliance agreement with the Western allies and continued the war, which was increasingly unpopular in the land. As for the urgent nationalist and land questions, it put these off until after the election of a constituent assembly, the old dream of Russian democracy, which, equipped with full powers, would resolve all these thorny issues for the best. This political foot-dragging and legislative formalism sparked off an initial left-wing revolt by the Kronstadt sailors, limply supported by the Bolsheviks in July 1917 and then there was an attempted military putsch from the right in August 1917, by General Kornilov, the army's supreme commander, seeking to restore discipline and prosecute the war to victory, both threats were contained without much problem and they merely bolstered the power of Kerensky and incorrigible chatterbox and cardboard Robespierre. Kerensky continued to play for time and lost all credibility to the advantage of Lenin whose influence was ceaselessly growing in that he was promising the masses so much and then some. Identical causes produce identical effects, and Kerensky's house of cards was collapsed in turn by an uprising of several thousand workers and Baltic sailors. Lenin capitalized upon this windfall, picked up the power lying in the street and cobbled together a new government, this time of people's commissars. The Bolshevik coup d'etat was generally well received by working people. Indeed, the watchwords on behalf of which it had been mounted, all power to the Soviets, land to the peasants, factory to the workers, 
immediate peace and national autonomy for the different peoples of the empire could not have been better attuned to the aspirations of the populace. However, the shrewd Lenin had merely played upon these aspirations for the sole purpose of ensconcing himself in power, once at the controls, he was to devote himself primarily to consolidation of his tenuous authority for it seemed the Soviets and other factory committees or soldiers' committees were there for appearances' sake only, all decisions being made without any consultation with them, through decrees handed down and railroaded through by the new worker and peasant government. A de facto armistice was arranged with the central empires, the soldiers' committees were overseen by Bolsheviks who wasted no time in getting rid of hostile officers and generals. However, Lenin and his cohorts did not dare prevent the elections for the Constituent Assembly scheduled for late November, or over a month after their coup d'état. The elections, the only free elections in Russia's entire history, provided the social revolutionaries with a very substantial majority, almost 60% of the votes, whereas the Bolsheviks, even by stuffing the ballot boxes in the big cities which they controlled, picked up only a quarter of the votes. This was a resounding repudiation. In principle, the new assembly, due to meet on January 5, 1918, was to assume the reins in the country and form a government representative of the generality of the citizenry. The Bolsheviks, though, continued to act, as if nothing had happened and indulged themselves with a temporary ban on hostile liberal newspapers, set up the Chica at the beginning of December 1917 and set about winning over the so-called left faction of the social revolutionaries by offering them some portfolios and junior positions in the government. They succeeded in this latter undertaking by adopting wholesale the agrarian program of their allies and immediately declaring the land socialized, without compensation or conditions, thereby usurping the General Assembly that was to have pronounced upon this. The measure was favorably received by the peasant masses for it often sanctioned a fate accompli. Hence the dissolution of the Constituent Assembly on the day following its opening session on January 6, 1918 triggered no great or immediate upset in the country. The social revolutionaries and their social democrat allies, the Mensheviks, the big losers in the episode, were convinced that in the end their legitimacy would win through, and they omitted to conduct a military operation for which they did not in any case have the wherewithal, against these usurpers, having no wish to see even, a single drop of Russian blood spilled, Chernov, the social revolutionary speaker of the Constituent Assembly, this sort of squeamishness was to lead to an unprecedented bloodbath, the blood being shed was not just Russian but all types. Confronted with this confused situation, several nations of the erstwhile empire realized their ambitions, Finland, Poland, Georgia, and Ukraine seceded and set themselves up as independent countries. The Don, Cuban and Turk Cossacks too wished to become autonomous and to set up a Cossack Federation. The Austro-German armies, hitherto observing a watching brief, capitalized upon the situation to unleash a mighty offensive in February 1918. They forged irresistibly ahead, for the Russian army had been demobilized and there were only Red Guards who more readily fired on unarmed civilians than tackled real soldier, to stop them. The Germans got to within 150 kilometers of Petrograd, passing through the Baltic lands, signed a separate peace treaty with the Central Roda, the government of independent Ukraine, and threatened the Bolshevik regime with complete collapse. Lenin insistently sued for negotiations, first of all without annexations or tribute, and then, with his back to the wall, agreed without further ado to all conditions imposed by the people who, in April 1917, had allowed him to return to Russia aboard the famed seal train. He had the treaty hastily ratified by his parties. Central Committee and the agreement was signed on March 3, 1918 at Brest-Litovsk. It provided for dismemberment of the former Russian Empire, i.e., formal recognition of the independence of Finland, Poland, the Baltic states and Ukraine, which is to say of territories covering an area of 780,000 square kilometers and a population of 56 million, all of them placed under the protection of the Austro-Germans. Paradoxically, this situation worked to Lenin's advantage, and the operation proved a boon to him, he had had his power recognized by the central empires, and he had no control over the ceded territories anyway. On the other hand, this capitulation afforded him some respite during which to better consolidate his shaky authority. 
For Ukrainian revolutionaries it was a real stab in the back. Their units had to let themselves be disarmed or evacuate the country and be disarmed anyway by Red Guards under Moscow's orders. The Austro-Germans swooped on Ukraine, guided by their local allies and bringing in their wake all the former great estate owners thrown out the year before by the revolutionary peasantry. Almost a million Austro-German troops occupied the territory ceded by Brest-Litovsk. The exactions and repression of the occupiers and of the Ukrainian oligarchy quickly triggered a popular resistance movement. Dozens of local insurgent detachments sprang up to harry enemy troops, engaging in a savage war of national liberation. This was the context in which Markno found himself. At first, he thought of resisting the invasion of the German and Austro-Hungarian troops, in all several hundred thousands of well-equipped and organized soldiers, Markno sets the figure for Ukraine at 600,000. To this end, he proposed in Guliaipoli the formation of several battalions and companies, totaling nearly 1,500 volunteers. With this detachment he meant to join up with Red Guards and partisan groups that looked likely to stand up to the invaders. He managed to secure arms from the Ukrainian Red Guard command and received several carriage loads, containing 3,000 rifles, some cartridges, and six cannon complete with shells. The city of Alexandrovsk asked the volunteers of Guliaipoli to come to its aid. A battalion of peasants plus the cavalry detachment made up of the members of Guliaipoli's libertarian communist group made for Alexandrovsk. As for Markno, he was drafted onto the staff of Yegorov, the commander of the front. While trying vainly to get there, the route having worsened, Markno found himself stuck in a railroad marshalling yard. It was there that he got the stunning news that Guliaipoli had been occupied by German troops. In fact, a handful of Ukrainian nationalists from the town, capitalizing upon Markno's absence and that of the region's most dependable units, had managed to bribe the company formed by the town's Jewish community and abetted by them had arrested the available members of the Soviet, the Revolutionary Committee and the Anarchist Group on April the 15th and 16th. Their treachery complete, these conspirators had then called in the Germans. Among these Ukrainian nationalists were some landowners keen to recover estates confiscated for the use of the farming communes, which is scarcely surprising, but there was also Vasily Shirovsky, the artillery chief, who had been led astray. The worst thing was the part which the town's armed Jewish company had played. Its leader, Taranovsky, who later on was also to be the last chief of staff of the Maknavist movement, had refused to get involved in the plot. His adjutant, Lymonsky, had jumped at the chance to replace him and with the backing of the company membership, shopkeepers afraid of libertarian collectivism, their children and other young folk misled by the demagogic speechifying of the Ukrainian nationalists, had carried out arrests of local revolutionaries, as well as tricking into disarming the anarchist detachment just back from the front. To make matters worse, Leon Schneider, the delegate called to order by those who had mandated him, had played an extremely active role sacking the premises of the libertarian communist group and going so far as to trample upon portraits of Bakunin, Kropotkin, and Alexander Semenyuta. Markno was flabbergasted by the news, he was devastated that such a tiny number of conspirators, a few dozen, should have been able to undo so rapidly the achievements built up at the cost of so much effort over a year. He was immediately worried about the dangers of antisemitism that might be evoked in the peasants by the conduct of the Jewish company under arms. He wanted to get home but was talked out of it, for the Austro-Germans were already in control of the commune, and he would have been shot out of hand. He then thought up a title for an appeal that he set about drafting, the traitor soil and tyrant's conscience are as black as a winter's night. Yet the enemy troops' advance was lightning fast, and, in order to avoid encirclement, the partisan groups to which he was attached fell back to Taganrog, a port and railroad junction on the Sea of Azov. Towards the end of April, a conference drew together all the anarchists from Guliaipoli and its environs who had managed to reach Taganrog. The situation was reviewed, and it was decided that some of them should make a tour of revolutionary Russia in order to gauge the difficulties that she faced. Others were to remain behind to work on clandestine organization of revolutionaries. A rendezvous was set for late June, early July, a time that it was reckoned would be favorable for a return to Guliaipoli 
and the initiation of a general uprising against the occupiers and their allies. 8. Wanderings Markno then embarked upon his tour from town to town, moving in a northerly direction, for he was due to visit Moscow and Petrograd. In Rostov-on-Don he was struck by the disarray of the revolutionaries, anarchists included. In Tsaritsyn he came upon his fellow communards from Gulyaipoli, who had had time to escape the vengeance of the estate owners. He saw again his companion, Nastia, pregnant and near to giving birth, but, with a heavy heart, he had to leave her to continue his travels. Along the route he witnessed disturbing scenes, revolutionary authorities arbitrarily and systematically disarming all autonomous partisan units on threat of shooting any who refused to abide by their ukases. In particular he was an eyewitness to a confrontation between the partisan groups of Petrenko, an active but non-aligned revolutionary, and Chika units. The latter had been routed and Petrenko could have taken control of the situation and cleaned house, but he magnanimously declined, whereupon the authorities sued for negotiations during which they treacherously had him arrested before disarming his unit. Petrenko was shot a short time later on some trumped-up charge. At this same time the attack upon anarchist associations all over Russia was mounted in a concerted way, their premises were wrecked their publications banned or tolerated only on specific draconian conditions, the recusant were either jailed or shot on a variety of pretexts. The Bolsheviks and their left SR allies rid themselves of their troublesome companions and indeed of all who might challenge their arrogation of power. Everywhere, Markno came to appreciate the revolutionary faith and commitment that motivated workers but also their lack of clear-sightedness regarding the ever-increasing prerogatives of revolutionary government. He saw at work certain so-called revolutionary elements made up of artisans, shopkeepers, and de class workers, many of them Jewish, and who, for all their belonging to revolutionary groups of every hue, anarchist ones included, were wheelers and dealers in the circles of power. They were going to wind up as a breeding ground ready to tackle all manner of dirty work assigned to them, as Czechists, members of requisition detachments dispatched against the peasants, bureaucrats of every kind, etc. These sad revelations led Markno to wonder if, quote, the revolution is not destined to perish by the very hand of revolutionaries, in the way of its development stands an executioner sprung from the revolutionaries' very own ranks, the government of two revolutionary parties which, for all their titanic endeavors, cannot confine the whole of the broad, deep life of the workers within the narrow compass of their teachers. He saw what these institutional revolutionaries were made of, who placed themselves athwart the road to liberation of the masses in revolution. Markno continued his journey aboard an armoured train, with a company of Red Guards in tow. He saved them from capture by the Don Cossacks. At a halt, the Cossacks surrounded the train and prepared to swoop gently upon the passengers. Nestor ingeniously advised the unit's commander to fake a sudden artillery exercise so as to hold back the crowd and seize the chance to extricate the train. His ingenuity was to extricate him thus many a time from worse jams. He stopped over in Saratov in the Volga estuary for a few days before moving on to Astrakhan, albeit not without some difficulty as his only travel pass was his credentials as delegate from the Gulyaipoli Revolutionary Committee. In the end, he completed the first stage of his trip by arriving in Moscow, which had been made the regime's new capital because Lenin thought that Petrograd was too exposed. All of the personalities of the new regime and the officially approved revolutionary groups were there. Markno, who strove right away to make contact with the anarchists, noted how the new regime had the libertarian movement under surveillance, and it was only with difficulty that he managed a meeting with its most active militants. Attending rallies, he listened to the Menshevik Martov, to Trotsky, the commissar for war, and to the anarchist Alexei Borovoy who fired him with enthusiasm. He met up again with his prison buddy Arshinov who, for want of something better to do, busied himself with the League for the Propagation of Libertarian Ideas, publishing the classical works of Bakunin and Kropotkin. Moscow struck him as the heartland of a paper revolution that attracted all socialists or anarchists who were infused by one and the same thing, lots of talk, writing, and from time to time a condescending offer of advice to the masses, but at a distance, from afar. He met Kropotkin, on the eve of his moving house to Dimitrovka on the outskirts of the capital. 
The apostle of anarchy made him affectionately welcome, answered his questions satisfactorily, and talked to him at length about the peasants of Ukraine, but whenever he sought his advice about what he intended to do upon his return home, Kropotkin categorically refused to offer the slightest advice. This matter is bound up with a very great risk to your life, comrade, and you alone can give it a proper answer. At their leave-taking, the old anarchist told him that, struggle is incompatible with sentimentality. Self-sacrifice, tough-mindedness and determination triumph over all on the road to the goal that you have set yourself. The theoretician of libertarian communism had assuredly discerned Nestor's strong personality and noted his tendency to get a little carried away, otherwise there is no accounting for the author of ethics having so bizarrely vetoed sentiment from the revolutionary struggle. It was probably a recommendation that Mark no not let himself be distracted from his goals. In any event, it made its mark upon the one-time terrorist and convict who was to bear it in mind at all times thereafter. A short time later, Kropotkin sent him a message urging him to, take good care of himself, for men like him are all too rare in Russia, which just goes to show the regard he had inspired in his venerable elder, as well as the perspicacity of the latter. 9. Interview with Lenin Markno went on frequenting Moscow's revolutionary haunts and paid a visit to the peasant branch of the Central Pan-Russian Executive Committee of Soviets. In short he briefed himself so well that he had no further need to continue his tour as far as Petrograd, and he decided to make back to Ukraine. However, he needed some phony identity papers if he was to cross the border established between Russia and the occupied Ukraine. He made up his mind to apply to the bureaucratic center, the Holy of Holies, in the Kremlin. Passed from bureaucrat to bureaucrat, he eventually wound up before Sverdlov, the chairman of the Central Executive Committee of Soviets, with whom he engaged in a discussion of the overall situation in the country and Ukraine. Sverdlov found his views of such interest that he suggested an interview with Lenin himself for the following day an appointment was made. By contrast, Sverdlov proved incapable of obtaining a room for Markno who was without lodgings, so, the boss of the blotting paper revolutionaries could arrange for him to meet the supreme guide but was utterly powerless in the matter of his lodgings. What a disparity of powers! Nestor was taken in by a friend he had met inside the Buterki, and back he came the next day, brandishing all his passes. Lenin welcomed him paternally, he took him by the arm, placing a hand on his shoulder and had him sit in a comfortable armchair. Then he set about questioning him minutely. From where did he come? How had the peasants of the region understood the slogan all powers to the local Soviets? How had they reacted to those who were against this watchword, especially the Ukrainian nationalists? Markno answered that the peasants had understood the watchword as the expression of the consciousness and will of the workers themselves, that the village, district or regional Soviets were merely the units of a revolutionary rallyment and of a self-managing economy serving the struggle against the bourgeoisie. Lenin came back to this matter three times, asking him if he regarded that interpretation as correct. When Nestor answered in the affirmative, Lenin then stated that the region had been contaminated by anarchism, and that that influence would not last. Sverdlov joined in the conversation and asked Markno if anarchism should be fermented among the peasantry. Whereupon Lenin pronounced that that would be to usher in counter-revolution and lead the proletariat to perdition. Markno then lost his call and protested that it would be nothing of the sort. Lenin set about rephrasing his comment. In his eyes, anarchists, having no large-scale organization of any substance, could not organize the proletariat and poor peasantry and thereby safeguard the revolution's gains. The conversation moved on to the activities of the Red Guards for whom Lenin had a high regard. Pulling no punches, Markno gave him an eye-opener by explaining that unlike the partisans who fought deep in the countryside, the Red Guards preferred to hold the railway lines, staying aboard their armored trains and raking their heels at the first sign of danger. That was why the populace, never having laid eyes on them, could not lend them their support. Lenin concluded from this, oddly enough, that the creation of a Red Army was the best solution and then he launched into a diatribe against the idealism of anarchists which would lead them to neglect the present for the sake of the future. The anarchists are always full of self-denial and ready for every sacrifice but as fanatics and long-sighted, they see only the distant future and ignore the present. 
Yet Lenin begged Markno not to think he was applying this thought to him, for he looked upon him as a, quote, man with a grasp of realities and the necessities of our age. If only Russia could boast of one third of anarchists of his ilk the communists would be ready, under certain conditions, to march alongside them and cooperate for the sake of free organization of producers. Soothed by these fine words, Markno felt welling up within him a feeling of profound regard for his interlocutor, of whose acrobatics, chicanery and opportunist U-turns he as yet knew nothing. As for anarchists' alleged concern with the future at the expense of the present, he raised the example of Ukraine correcting Lenin, who, like many Russians of every persuasion, had used the expression South of Russia or Southern Russia where most of the partisan groups that had fought against the reactionaries were led by anarchists. Moreover, nearly all the communes or associations had been set up at their instigation. In quoting these tangible examples, he showed that it was dear that anarchists stood foursquare in the present, where they looked to what might bring them closer to the future to which they gave, to be sure, every consideration. As he finished speaking, Markno looked Sverdlov directly in the eye, Sverdlov's face clouded, and he blushed slightly but went on smiling at him. As for Lenin, he opened his arms and declared, perhaps I am mistaken. Had he known at that precise moment that, a few years on, Markno would be giving him sleepless nights and that he would be making him the quarry for his pack of Czechists and special units of the Red Army, Lenin would have realized that he was indeed mistaken. And without any doubt at all he would promptly have repaired his error, for all his ingratiating manner and sweet words, by having his enemy to be cast into the dungeons of the Chica. The conversation limped along a little while longer, but, the essentials having been covered, Lenin, again in his fatherly mode, asked Markno's requirements in respect of identity papers and promised to do the needful for him. Some days later, towards the end of June, kitted out with these papers, essential if he was to get through the various checkpoints, Markno took the train bound for Oral. His month and a half long tour, which had taken him across the country, had enabled him to take the temperature of the revolution, gauge the weakness of the anarchist movement, a weakness both organizational and due to the depredations of the Bolshevik authorities, observe the leading echelons, meet with the most influential personages, in short, to formulate an exact idea of what had been done and of all that remained to be done in order to keep the revolution on the right course. 10. Back home again. Upon arriving in Oral, a border town, Markno was imprudent enough to climb down from the train and was unable to board again, for the carriages were camped by passengers. He managed to get across the border even so, disguised as a Ukrainian reserve officer. He came upon some Jewish friends from Guliaipoli who briefed him on developments locally, including among other things the death of his older brother Emilian, a war invalid, who had been mistaken for Nesta, and shot by the Germans. His other brother, Sava, had been arrested, his mother's house destroyed and his mother taken in by neighbors, finally, there were the shootings and torture directed against many anarchists and revolutionaries from Guliaipoli. Although devastated by these initial reports, Nesta steeled himself, he was among his own, the peasants of the Zaporozhye, loyal to their age-old yearnings for emancipation, far removed from the decrees and other pious pronouncements of Moscow, capital of paper revolution. Here he was now at, the heart of the real problem and only upon himself and those of his comrades from the Guliaipoli anarchist group who had got away could he rely for a resolution. The closer he drew to the land of his birth, the more people he met who knew him, he was obliged to trade his Ukrainian officer's uniform for civilian clothes. At one stop, he was warned by his friend Kogan from Guliaipoli that the German police had boarded the train to search for him. He hurriedly left his carriage and covered on foot the 27 kilometers to his destination, the village of Rozdevstvenskoy, some 21 kilometers from Guliaipoli. At the border, Markno had spotted some notices in German, Deutsches Vaterland, German territory, Ukraine had become an integral part of the German and the Austro-Hungarian Empire. More devastating still, since Brest-Litovsk, an expeditionary corps had been in occupation, enforcing German order. The Central Empires, delighted with the assistance rendered by Lenin and his government, hoped to draw from Ukraine's rich natural resources the wherewithal for a second wind in their war in the West against France, Britain and the United States. 
The Ukrainian National Assembly, the RODA, being regarded as insufficiently compliant, had been removed from power on March 29, 1918. The occupation had replaced it with the Hetman Pavlo Skoropadsky whose forefather had been the last Hetman of a free Ukraine prior to its annexation by Russia in the 18th century. A mere puppet on a string, the Hetman had formed a national guard, the Varta, an auxiliary for the Austro-German governors of the country. The Ukrainian bourgeoisie and feudalists had wasted no time in rallying around the new regime, for in that way they might use occupation forces to counter recalcitrant peasants before reclaiming the estates and assets of which the peasantry had collectively dispossessed them. The vengeance of these lords was savage, thousands of peasants were flogged, imprisoned, shot or hanged. The whole country was ransacked, all food, consumer goods and material were shipped off to Germany with the blessing of the hetman and the local squire Archie. Let us look at the testimony of one John Zydeus, a Russified Greek living in Odessa, a dyed-in-the-wool capitalist, and, liberal as he was, scarcely to be suspected of subversive views. Quote, German and Austrian troops having entered Ukraine, their command had to decide upon the attitude it would adopt regarding the revolutionary distraint upon the estates of the Pomieskis. As the main concern of the Central Powers was to siphon off Ukraine's reserves for their own benefit, whereas the establishment of an equitable social peace left them wholly indifferent, they opted to side with the bourgeoisie and above all the big estate owners. Not only did the German occupation authorities show themselves conciliatory and well-intentioned towards the Pomieskis, bringing none of the weight of their rule to bear upon them, but they even went out of their way to do anything in their power to be agreeable to them. Above all else, the estate owners were to be restored in the property rights which revolution had stripped from them. This was one of the most shameful episodes in the entire history of the Civil War. Let it be stated frankly, their conduct towards the peasants ensured that the infiltration of revolution, which had been interrupted for a time, came back with a vengeance once German troops evacuated Russian soil. Many landlords did not bother to reinstall themselves on their former estates but, abetted by German and Austrian troops, set about divesting the peasants of their lands and their assets. In cruelty and cynicism, their reprisal raids outdid the famous expeditions of Tsarist times, especially as the Austrian and German officers who commanded these detachments claimed a percentage of the booty. Thus a detachment would arrive in a village, on the instructions of the Pomeshik, a collective note was presented to the peasants, demanding the return of given quantities of livestock, tools, chattels, etc., the raid complete, the German or Austrian officer would pocket 10% to 20% of the value of the restored assets. It goes without saying that the German military, educated to the most profound contempt for the Russian people, were very appreciative of these sources of income and shrank from no measure, no matter how brutal, likely to generate them. The reprisal expeditions were marked by hangings and shootings. Executions dispensed with any sort of proceedings, the venom of the landlords cared not a jot for it, and the German officers gladly washed their hands of any show of a trial. They shot and hanged without any pretense of trial, often not even bothering to check the identity of the defendant. The landowner or his agent had merely to declare that such and such a peasant had been involved in confiscation of his estates for the culprit to be summarily executed. One can readily appreciate the rancor that built up in the souls of Ukrainian peasants, and what hatred and revenge such barbarous executions engendered against landowners. Powerless against the armed might at the disposal of their oppressors, the peasants knuckled under and suffered, as they awaited their revenge. End quote. As an active revolutionary center, Gulyai Poly merited special treatment, the members of the Soviet, Revolutionary Committee and Libertarian Communist Group were denounced by Ukrainian nationalists and the local bourgeois. Once arrested, they were tortured and shot, excepting those who had successfully gone to ground and who were living a clandestine existence. Among the anarchists to fall victim to this white terror was the group's first secretary, Moshe Kalinichenko, shot but still alive after the opening salvo, he continued to berate his executioners before being finished off. Leo Bogolik, a very active libertarian from the town's Jewish community, was beaten to death, Stefan Shepel and Korostelev, known as Kudai, courageous militants, also perished. Nestor's older brother, Emilian, 
almost blind following a wound sustained during the Russo-Japanese War in 1904, was shot in front of his wife and their five young children. Others were jailed in Alexandrovsk to await the same fate, Alexander Kalashnikov and Nestor's other brother, Sava. Such was the picture of devastation uncovered by Markno upon arrival here where, for nearly a year, he had made an intense contribution to the founding of a free community based on social justice. He re-established contact with those close to him, his relatives and several members of the anarchist group, returned, like him, from Russia, as agreed at the Taganrog conference. Every one of them advised against showing his face again in Guliaipoli, for he would be instantly denounced by some narc in the pay of the occupation, arrested and speedily executed. For some weeks, he hid in a neighboring village, then, unable to stand it any longer, he returned to his native town one night to seek out some reliable peasants there. With them he evaluated the situation and briefed them on his travel experiences. The letters that he had written them had been reproduced for circulation in the area. In them he had advocated autonomous and organized action by the peasants and counseled against terrorist acts that would draw down foreseeable repression and hamper the overall organization of the insurrection. Above all, he was against acts of vengeance against members of the Jewish company who, intimidated or bamboozled by the Ukrainian nationalists' threats or promises, had assisted the arrest of Guliaipoli's revolutionaries. Such acts might be misinterpreted and give rise to a display of antisemitism, thereby compromising the region's revolutionary reputation. However, he was unable to prevent sentence being passed on Leon Schneider, the group's renegade, although Schneider had completely vanished. He also managed to set aside the cases of Vasily Shirovsky and Taranovsky who, caught up in the conspiracy in spite of themselves, had promptly dissociated themselves from it and had since bitterly regretted their passivity in not opposing it. Markno reckoned that the political preparation of mines was the priority, he zealously peddled the idea of a general uprising against foreign and native-born oppressors. He did not rest from holding get-togethers and small meetings at which he advocated, in the light of this idea, mobilization of local detachments of insurgents. His presence was reported to the authorities, and he was obliged to quit Guliaipoli. However, now that it was known that he was around and trying to organize armed bands, they did not dare execute the anarchists jailed in Alexandrovsk for fear of reprisals. A substantial price was placed on his head. The dragnets and searches were stepped up, he narrowly escaped one enemy patrol simply because, caught in the act of explaining the operation of some Colt and Mauser revolvers to some peasant friends, he was able to offer an immediate practical demonstration and thus extricate himself. The first detachment calling itself Maknavist was formed in a village near Guliaipoli, Voskresenska, and it mounted raids against the squires and the enemy's detachments. Markno also began to lead the same sort of attacks along with peasants from Ternovka village. But he nonetheless felt that the lead should come from Guliaipoli which enjoyed huge popularity throughout that part of Ukraine. So he went back there and, with the agreement of his comrades, decided to blow up the Austro-German district command center in the township. Dressed as a woman, a comrade from the group, Isidore Lyuti, alias Petia, who was never far from Markno's side and served as his bodyguard, went off to reconnoiter. As for Nestor, he dressed up as a young woman, making up his face and equipped with some powerful bombs, set off with Petia to carry out their mission. Only the presence of some women and children in the room where the targeted officers were altered their plans, but Nestor had trouble getting Petia to accept this. Indeed, it was at all times as a conscientious militant that he evaluated their operations and their consequences, and he was very well aware that this instance, which would inevitably have cost the lives of innocents, would have been very badly received by the population. 11. The Beginnings of Partisan Warfare Having peddled the idea of a general insurrection throughout the district, Markno and his companions resolved to strike and to make the first move by occupying Guliaipoli which they had designated as the insurgent center. On September 22, 1918, Nestor and his fellow members of the Guliaipoli anarchist group Alexei Mochenko, Semyon Koretnik, Petya Lyuti, Andrei Semenyuta, the last brother of Prokop and Alexander, the founders of the group, and one Fomo Ryabko 
from elsewhere, began their odyssey along with seven peasants from the villages of Ternovka and Vasilevka. The group was some 90 kilometers from Guliaipoli and reckoned to cover that distance in nine hours. Nestor, disguised as a captain of the Varta, stood on a tachanka, atop which a Maxim gun had been mounted, his companions followed on horseback, armed with rifles. They quickly encountered a genuine Varta unit. Taken in by his splendid uniform, the Hetman's guards let them get within 30 meters, whereupon Markno stood up on the Tachanka and called upon them to drop their weapons. They made as if to rally but a burst of fire from the Maxim gun, aimed above their heads, forced them to reconsider. Nestor proceeded to question them, passing himself off as a captain specially dispatched by the Hetman to track down revolutionaries in the district. Reassured, the commander of the Varta detachment supplied him with full intelligence concerning Austro-German forces in the area, their quarters, and their strength. Moreover, he boasted of his own exploits in the repression against the recalcitrant peasants of the region. Dropping the pretense, Markno then disclosed his true identity, to the amazement of the Hetman soldiery. They fell on their knees before him to beg his mercy and tried to bribe him with promises of hefty sums of money. Having no proof of their misdeeds, Markno decided merely to tie them up and to dump them out of sight like that off the road, until they might be freed by shepherds or might free themselves, this lest they give away his presence too soon. In so doing he revealed one of the characteristic features of his personality, outside of combat, he was always to abhor bloodshed and was to resort to it only when pushed to the limits by the atrocities of the enemy. But the Varta guards, panicking, took to their heels. Whereupon the Maknavists were obliged to cut them down. Not far from there they came upon a local police chief who called them to explain the meaning of the shots he had heard, in view of his insistence in citing the authority of the hetman, Markno had him hanged from the highest cross in the nearby cemetery, displaying a placard bearing the inscription, one should fight for the emancipation of the workers and not for executioners and oppressors. This episode can serve as an archetype of all that were to ensue. Markno and his companions were often to show up disguised as regular soldiers and, capitalizing upon the element of surprise in the stratagem, disarm and punish their enemies. The next night, pressing on with its ride, Markno's detachment passed without mishap through villages lying on the route to Guliaipoli, thanks to the uniforms they were wearing. They arrived in Guliaipoli in the early morning and at the last minute just avoided running smack into numerous German troops, having just enough time to scurry away and hold up in a nearby forest. There they came upon some shepherds who informed them that the German authorities and their native-born allies were everywhere spreading a rumor that Markno had retreated to Moscow, after having robbed the peasants of Guliaipoli. He had supposedly bought himself a luxury home and was living high there. He was even shown a leaflet written in Russian and Ukrainian with words to that effect. The bigger the lie the better it works, professional liars sometimes tell themselves, this was the source of the Markno rumor that was to spread just as the Maknavist struggle assumed larger dimensions. A little later, when they were in Marfapol, a village adjacent to Guliaipoli, Markno and his band encountered an Austria detachment accompanied by a squadron of the Hetman's police. Markno threw them off the scent by starting to flee from the village, he did so the better to expose his pursuers, then cut them down with the machine gun. Among the survivors from the enemy band, the Guliaipoli police chief who had distinguished himself in the repression against the peasants was instantly executed. Among the other prisoners were two Ukrainians conscripted against their will into the Austrian army. Markno dictated a letter to them for translation into German for distribution among the troops. He urged them to disobey their officers and cease all participation in the repression of the Ukrainian working people and to go home and carry out their own revolution. If they persisted in following their officers, they would then have to face the vengeance of insurgents who would make no distinction between them and the butchers of peasants. He released these soldiers with that message then, there being limits to his trust, he made off with his group first in one direction, and then, once out of sight, swung around and stopped in a nearby village, Shanshorovka, some 17 kilometers from Guliaipoli. The next day, the Austro-Germans took severe reprisals against the Marfapol peasants. The day after that, seizing upon the absence of the bulk of the enemy forces, Markno entered Guliaipoli, scattered nearly all his men through the district, 
charging them to raise the peasants and stayed behind in the town with just seven men. A local assembly was held the following night with 400 inhabitants attending. Discussion centered on the best way of launching the insurrection, where and how to direct it, how to seize hold of the bulk of the enemy troops and disarm all occupiers. The whole program was worked out for the next night. Meanwhile, Markno wrote two proclamations for distribution just as soon as Guliapoli would be under the complete control of the insurgents. As scheduled, the following night the insurgents seized control of the area with great ease and no casualties on their side. They were in control of the post office, telephone exchange, railway station, and the access routes to the town. Mark knows two appeals were printed, 7,000 and 20,000 copies respectively, and quickly distributed and followed up by insurrectionary acts throughout the whole region. A revolutionary committee was appointed forthwith and a telegram written by Mark Noe was dispatched all over Ukraine. To everyone, everyone, everyone. The Guliaipoli District Revolutionary Committee announces the seizure of Guliaipoli by the insurgents, there the power of the Soviets has been re-established, we declare a general insurrection of the workers and peasants against the butchers and stranglers of the Ukrainian Revolution, the Austro-Germans, and the Hetman's Guards. The Austro-Germans recovered a few days later and marshaled significant forces around Guliaipoli. Markno and his companions decided against digging in there and resolved to evacuate the town, letting it be believed that the populace had complied without actually supporting them, this in order to forestall reprisals such as had occurred at Marfapol. It was for this reason that the local assembly had been held at night and had attracted only the most dependable inhabitants, so as to avoid possible denunciations should the insurrection fail. Markno handled things intelligently and with prudence, but not without mishap for his suggestions were one by one challenged by other members of the group who formed, as it were, the general staff of the movement. The facts, though, proved Markno correct on several occasions and so his companions abided more and more scrupulously by his directives. He displayed remarkable gifts as a leader of men, gifts that never failed him thereafter. On September 29th, enemy troops attacked from all sides, the insurgents repulsed them and then, Towards evening, when they saw the threat of encirclement looming, they peeled off in the direction of Marupol, a port on the Sea of Azov. En route, capitalizing upon the darkness and the suddenness of their appearance, they disarmed some squires and their guards, changed horses, and recovered a machine gun. Just as they had done before, they followed a false trail in order to shake off possible pursuers, and stopped over in the town of Bolshmikhailovka, or Dubrivka, on the edge of the Dubrivka forest some 36 kilometers from Guliaipoli. The next day, they met up with the 60-strong detachment of Fedor Shus, an anarchist sailor who had taken part in the Taganrog conference and since waged a bitter struggle against the occupation. Shus was content to harry, successfully it should be said, the occupation, troops and the punitive expeditions of the squires and the Varta. Markno suggested to him that they should join forces in order to conduct open, rather than guerrilla warfare. The amalgamation went ahead and a joint meeting was held in the town, at it Markno delivered a long address that scared his friends, for he issued a summons to the struggle against all enemies, present and future, in the shape of the Russian white guards who were beginning to invade the region. The populace rallied to his proposals arid within two days there were nearly 1,500 volunteers, only one in four of them armed. On the strength of mistaken intelligence, the insurgents took inadequate precautions in the belief that the enemy was not in the vicinity. Thus, one night they were taken by surprise and, knowing nothing of the exact strength of their assailants, Markno ordered a withdrawal. Many insurgents had not had time to join him and were penned in Dubrivka while an ambush cut off the retreat of a small group of fugitives in the direction of the forest. It was at this point that Markno revealed an extraordinary military talent. He, who had never done any soldiering, had his men move forward at right angles, skirting the enemy position and ensuring access to the forest. Schuss intended to retreat into the impregnable blockhouse that he had built himself inside the forest and there await the enemy's evacuation of the region, so as to be able to tend his wounded and avert reprisals against the town. Markno's priority was to establish the numbers of enemy troops, they proved to be far superior numerically and in terms of armaments. 
Even so, Markno proposed to attack. Shus resisted this for a long time on the grounds that it was madness to attack such superior forces. Whereupon Markno gave a speech that enthused all present, and this was the occasion on which the Dubrivka peasants awarded him the title of Batko. Henceforth, you are our Ukrainian Batko, and we shall perish together with you if need be. Lead us into town against the enemy. In his memoirs, Markno remarks that he really must have been an anarchist revolutionary not to succumb to this honor awarded in all Navit by the mass of peasant toilers who had faith in him. He justifies this confidence by commenting, it would appear that I was that revolutionary for all my subsequent actions have confirmed it. That night, September 30, 1918, saw the first great feat by arms of the insurgents. Indeed, Schuss, Markno, Semyon Kermik and Mochenko, Lyuti and Petrenko, the latter a local insurgent of great promise, selected the most daring and determined of the partisans, split into two groups, one with Schuss's men armed with a Maxim and the other under Nesta's personal command, equipped with a Lewis submachine gun, in all about 30 men, attacking a battalion of the Austrian regular army almost 500 soldiers about 100 well-armed squires and 80 Varta guards, which is to say, odds of 25 to 1. The enemy was bivouacked on the square in front of the town's church, awaiting reinforcements before moving out at dawn to pursue the insurgents into the forest. Well briefed on the disposition of the enemy, Markno and his companions skipped into the town and proceeded through the streets and the courtyards of the Katas. Before attacking and while waiting for Schuss to get in position, Nesta spoke these last fiery words, This is it, we are in the arms of death. So, friends, let us be dauntless to the point of madness, as our cause demands. One final incident almost betrayed their presence, the local mistress of the commander of the Varta guards had made up her mind at all costs to warn her loved ones of any insurgent attack and it was only on a tip-off from a peasant woman of the town that the insurgents managed to intercept the traitor at the last moment. At a signal arranged with Schuss, Markno directed heavy and accurate gunfire at the enemy, sowing panic among the troops who had been calmly bivouacked with weapons stacked, a surprise attack was the furthest thing from their minds. To hasten the enemy's rout, Markno hurled himself into the attack. The soldiers and enemy guards fled for all they were worth their officers setting the example while the Dubrivka peasants, brandishing pitchforks, clubs, and axes, pursued them, adding to their panic. Markno had great difficulty in extricating 25 Austrian soldiers from the hands of peasants eager to lynch them. The trophies of battle were great, for machine guns, two munitions trucks and 80 prisoners, mostly, ordinary soldiers and Varta guards, the officer having scarpered or perished in the fighting. The Varta members and members of the band of landowners were shot out of hand for, despite warnings, they had persisted in their oppressive activities. As for the Austrian soldiers, they were fed then released on promising to fight no more against the revolutionary peasants, they were issued with provisions and a bottle of vodka but stripped of their kepis, this symbolic act indicated their demilitarization. From that day on, all his companions displayed great affection towards and every confidence in Nesta, his tactics, and operational strategies. His renown, boosted by tales of his military prowess, grew without cease, he became Bacco Markno, the people's avenger, reluctantly to begin with, then with his agreement once he realized that he was a rallying point. He had occasion to wreak people's vengeance a short time later during an incident that was to remain the most famous of all. A band of insurgents had been smashed and several dozen prisoners treated cruelly and hanged near a village by the name of Mikhailovo Lukashevo. A Varta captain by the name of Mazukin had especially distinguished himself in this repression. One evening, after having laid waste to an enemy German settlement, Markno and his detachment ran across this same Mazukin, along with a small escort. As ever, Markno seized the initiative by calling out imperiously, Halt! Who are you? Where are you coming from? He heard, by way of an answer, who commands your detachment? I am Staff Captain Mazukin, Varta commander for the Alexandrovsk district. At this point the insurgents surrounded him and took him prisoner. This savage pacifier then begged them in vain to spare his life. From a letter found on him, it was discovered that he had been en route to a soiree organized by a local squire called Mergorodsky. 
Mark No and Schuss donned the clothing of Mazukin and his adjutant before showing up in their place at Mergorodsky's fortified farm. They announced themselves as Mazukin's aides and outriders, they were made welcome to cries of hurrah for the Russian officers. The company there was select, a retired general, a colonel, three Austrian officers and two local squires, as well as their womenfolk. The assembly toasted their host, the renaissance of Russia, the landlords, and the salvation of the Russian church from anarchists. When a fresh toast was offered to the success of the hunt for Markno, Markno drew a bomb from his pocket and hurled it towards his fellow guests, disclosing his true identity, before dashing outside with Schuss. Frozen in their tracks with fright, the revelers did not have time to escape and perished in the explosion. It ought to be said that there was no quarter given on either side, during the entire period of the Austro-German occupation of Ukraine almost 80,000 peasants paid with their lives for their resistance to oppression. In this climate, a dramatic incident played a capital role in the movement's birth, this was the matter of reprisals taken by the Austro-Germans and the local squires, especially German settlers, against the township of Dubrivka. They put 608 catters to the torch and beat, tortured and murdered the peasants, raping the women. All these actions left the peasants of the region thoroughly outraged. Markno and his detachment acted as the executive arm of this thirst for vengeance, and they showed no pity this time in laying waste the homes of the squires. But here again, it fell to Markno to display his tactical intelligence, he opposed systematic massacre of all the squires and bourgeois in the region and did not want some blind jackery but rather a social war waged with discrimination. He preferred to hurt the privileged in their pockets, at least provided they had no criminal acts to answer for, and he exacted from them substantial fines in money, arms, and material. He also sought to stoke up the social inferno in the whole region to a maximum. The slow patient preparation over weeks paid dividends, bands of insurgents were organized throughout the region, and they harried the occupiers and their allies. This vast game of cat and mouse was to drag on for several weeks with the insurgents and their enemies taking the roles in turns, while the latter gave chase, the former would show up in their rear and smash their isolated units. Let us note that Nestor Markno had learnt well from Alexander Semenuta when he used to carry out his daring acts of terrorism, but in addition, he displayed great organizational and military talents. He was methodical to the point of mania, a thoroughness without which he obviously could not have survived hundreds of battles and preserved the essential core of the movement. Whenever he occupied an area, he immediately set up outposts on every side, day and night, and this ensured that he would not be surprised and be in a position to react as he chose, according to enemy numbers and to stand and fight or slip away. Then he would lay false trails as to which direction he was taking, by frequently changing his course, he moved, preferably under the cover of night, into areas where no detail of the topography was unknown to him and while keeping himself permanently informed as to enemy movements. Finally, he missed no opportunity to address the peasants, whipping them up with his fiery, spirited diatribes against the oppressors, so much so that they soon came to consider him their natural defender. It was for this reason that they all loved to call him Bacco and avidly told of his exploits. To these gifts, Markno added the qualities of rare Samfroid and presence of mind, he scarcely ever was ruffled, would sum up the situation in AF Ash and devise the best possible solution, which would allow him to extricate himself yet again from the hornet's nest. Yet at the beginning, this self-mastery was not always apparent, on one occasion, his negligence even had disastrous consequences for his detachment. Billeted in the village of Temirovka on November 15, 1918, some insurgents picked up a suspect, a local kulak by the name of Tsapko. Tsapko, although quite well known as an informer for the occupiers, claimed to have come to seek permission for a relative's bridal procession to pass through the village at dawn. Against the advice of his comrades, Markno set Tsapko free, refused to vacate the area and took no special precautionary measures. A half hour later, the camp was violently attacked by a Hungarian detachment well briefed, thanks to Tsapko, regarding the disposition of the insurgents. A shambles ensued, Markno quickly reacted, placing a Lewis automatic rifle on Petia Lyuti's shoulder and sweeping the attackers with gunfire, bringing their advance to a stop. 
Mochenko attempted a counterattack with a group of horsemen but to no avail and sustained heavy losses. The insurgents fell back and found themselves in the open, the Hungarian snipers seized the chance to pick them off one by one with accurate fire. Schuss was hit by a bullet that pierced both his legs. Pinned down by Hungarian fire, the insurgents were decimated. At one point, Podgorny, an insurgent, attempted to salvage the situation by taking the assailants from the rear with a machine gun and about 15 partisans. The Hungarians received reinforcements, and the situation became hopeless for Markno and his companions, who were in any case hampered by their wounded whom they doggedly refused to abandon. Semyon Koretnik was hit also. Out of ten men around Markno, soon only two were left and one of these, losing control of his nerves, took his own life with a bullet to the head. The unarmed Markno dashed forward to retrieve the revolver from the suicide and found himself suddenly hemmed in by silhouettes whom he thought enemies, rather than let himself be captured, he too prepared to blow his own brains out when he realized that in fact these were companions coming to his aid, Lyuti, Mochenko and Piotr Petrenko. They saved him by carrying him off at a gallop while he squatted on two rifles, crossed one over the other. Once safe, Markno realized that he had been wounded in one hand and that the tops of his overcoat and of his papaka had been shot through in several places. The detachment managed to slip away, but its losses were dramatic, nearly half of its 350 fighters, although the Hungarians too had taken considerable casualties. The lesson was a severe one, henceforth nothing would ever be left to chance, and they would be wary of the suspect. Despite this serious reverse, the insurgents went on ravaging the fortified farms of the German colonists and the squires of the region, not without difficulty, for they were quite numerous in the Chernozyum country and quite well armed. Be that as it may, the insurgents were now chastened and highly motivated, in the space of a few weeks, the whole area surrounding Guliaipoli had been cleared of nests, units and punitive detachments of Germans, Austro-Hungarians, German colonists and the Varta. The whole left bank of the Dnieper was aflame, as the general uprising spread like a trail of gunpowder. Towards the close of 1918, this initial front had been solidly established in the Alexandrovsk region and at its heart was Guliaipoli. Markno then dispatched a menacing telegram to the German high command in Alexandrovsk, in it he insisted upon release of imprisoned members of the Guliaipoli anarchist group and held the German authorities answerable for their safety. This threat gave pause for thought, the reply from the German commander in Alexandrovsk to the insurgent high command was conciliatory and guaranteed the lives of the prisoners. The insurgent movement had become a viable and intimidating interlocutor. An extraordinary conference drew all the delegates from all of the region's insurgent groups. At it Markno blithely proposed opening up for France, against the Hetman, the Germans, and Austro-Hungarians, against the Don Cossacks of the Ataman Krasnov, against the White Guard detachments of Colonel Drozdov which crisscrossed the Berdyansk district and against the White General Tillo and the detachments of Germans moving up from the Crimea to pacify the region. His comrades thought he had taken leave of his senses, for they reckoned they did not have sufficient forces to hold such an extensive broad front. He countered by arguing that henceforth they had to move into a higher phase of the struggle and, to that end, had to turn their detachments into mixed battalions of cavalry infantry mounted on machine gun carrying tachankers, plus an artillery section. Moreover, he wanted to capitalize on the fear that insurgents had struck into their enemies and give an added boost to the resolution of the peasants of the region. He ended up securing the backing of those present, who then proceeded to elect people to take charge of the fronts, Piotr Petrenko got the one stretching from Chaplino to Grishino, Tychenko the younger and, the sailor Kroskovsky got the one between Pologui and Ser Konstantinovka. A third front around Orokovo would be formed under the supervision of Batko Pravda, a highly pugnacious legless cripple and anarchist. From the assembly, these overseers received the following instruction. Every discretion is given them in order to introduce the revolution any discipline that might abet the organization of the combat sector and the fielding of a single contingent of fighters, with the consent of the masses of the insurgents concerned, obviously. In operational terms, they are completely subordinate to the main high command of the insurgent units bearing the name of Batko Markno and directly answerable to the Batko himself. 
This federative organization rendered possible a unity of action that was essential for operations on a large scale. Markno, then, amassed the functions of General Commander-in-Chief and Chief of the Central Command which included his two aides Schuss and Petia Lyuti, as well as Semyon Koretnik and Alexei Marchenko. Furthermore, an intelligence source was established, made up essentially of peasant women volunteers whose task it was to keep the command AU fate with all of the enemy's movements and dispositions. Yet there was still a huge gulf between intentions and realities and the insurgents had to go through many engagements, with varying fortunes, against all their enemies. Markno, the movement's command staff and his escort came within an ace of annihilation in an engagement near Sinalnikovo. They were encircled by German and Austrian troops, sustained heavy losses and were only rescued in extremists by the providential arrival of several detachments of partisans summoned to the rescue by the local population. Among the reinforcements, the detachment from Yulianovsk, made up exclusively of 250 peasant ex-soldiers, distinguished itself by successfully, and despite a hail of gunfire, putting the enemy to flight and pursuing him over a distance of more than 10 kilometers. Little by little, Markno and his main detachment managed to structure all of the local groups to the extent where accesses to and exits from the region were locked up tight and all passage denied to German trains. On November 20, 1918, during a routine check on a train, Markno and the younger of the Koretnik brothers, Pantelei, were gravely negligent, they departed from the usual practice of stationing dynamiters in front of the train and of positioning barricades in front of and behind the checkpoint. Now this was an armored train in the hands of white guards, these white guards let fly with murderous gunfire at Markno and his companions before making good their escape. Several elite outriders from Markno's detachment, experienced former border guards, were killed. Seeing the grief of the insurgents, the white guards reckoned they must have killed Markno. The report of his death immediately swept the country to the great rejoicing of the Austro-Germans and the landowners. The white officers in charge of the raid were even decorated in Alexandrovsk and fate as heroes in the local press. Rumor had it that the Maknavists were on the run everywhere, the squires and their guards who had sought refuge in the town began to drift back to their estates. Now, Markno stepped up his raids and took it upon himself to give the lie to the rumors of his death. If they showed any resistance, the squires were wiped out, otherwise, the insurgents made do with seizing all their weapons, horses, and any equipment that might prove useful. Meanwhile in Kiev, a coup d'état ousted Hetman Skoropadsky and a new Ukrainian nationalist government seized power under the name of the Directory, the strong man in it was Simon Petlyura, whence the name Petlyurists given to its supporters. This new government sought to be independent of the Germans and Austrians who, in any event, no longer had any reason for fighting since the November 11, 1918 armistice concluded with the Western Allies. The new authorities freed all political detainees, thus did the anarchists from Gulyaipoli return home. Among them were Savamarkno, Alexander Kalashnikov and Philip Kratt. A period of wait and see ensued, for several weeks a truce with the Directory held. The Directory had an interest in courting the insurgents, for it hoped to be able to deploy them in its nationalist cause while at the same time it was on the best of terms with the Russian White Guards and encouraged the formation of regiments destined to join up with the White General Denikin. In a little over two and a half months, Markno and his anarchist comrades had succeeded in the gamble of liberating the greater part of the eastern Ukraine from the grip of the German and Austro-Hungarian armies of occupation and of their local allies. The tiny detachment of a dozen men which had set out from Ternovka for Gulyaipoli on September 22, 1918, had turned into an insurgent army manning several fronts connected by a central command. Henceforth, Markno and his companions were battle-hardened, at the cost of heavy losses, it is true. They had become conversant with the strategy and tactics of partisan warfare, knew how to avoid the pitfalls of classic positional warfare, chose the time and place for their engagements and always popped up where least expected. They knew how to dynamite and take over an armored train or a fortified farm. They knew too that above all they had to rely on their own devices in the defense of their interests and their freedom. Their enemies had changed too, no longer were they occupation troops, 
demoralized by their defeat in the West and who thought of nothing else but getting home as peaceably as possible. A much more dangerous enemy loomed on the horizon, regiments of Cossack officers and troops, commanded by General Denikin. 12. The Civil War in Russia Towards the close of 1918 the Civil War in Russia crystallized on several fronts. For a start, in the south, in the Cossack territories of the Don, the Cuban and the Turk, several armies were making headway under the unified command of General Denikin. Let us briefly review the origins of this movement. Nationalistic officers could not have remained indifferent in the face of the evolution of the country which they found catastrophic. Already under Kerensky, General Kornilov, appointed Generalissimo, commander of the entire Russian army, had rebelled against the authorities, citing the absence of the necessary order and discipline required in his view to bring the war to a victorious conclusion. Contrary to what has often been claimed, Kornilov was a patriotic officer who had risen through the ranks, the son of a mere Cossack, with a Sart, Mongolian, for a mother, and while no inflammatory revolutionary, it had nonetheless been he who had ordered the arrest of the Tsar and his family, so he was no reactionary but was solidly anti-monarchy and wont to say to any who would listen that he would emigrate to the United States should the monarchy be restored in Russia. After the failure of his coup de force, he was placed under arrest under the supervision of his friend and successor, the Generalissimo Alexiv and of the latter's chief of staff, General Denikin. Following the Bolshevik coup d'état of October 1917, Kornilov and Alexiv hurriedly decamped for the Don, which area they had assessed as suited to their patriotic activity. Word circulated among nationalistic officers and a tiny contingent of volunteers was formed in Novokokarsk, the capital of the Don Cossacks. The volunteer army came formally into existence on December 25, 1917, under the military command of Kornilov and the administrative command of Alexiv. Its objective was to raise an armed force capable resisting the growing anarchy and the occupation, whether Bolshevik or German. An armed force whose duty it will be to afford Russian citizens a free choice of the government of their homeland through the summoning of the Constituent Assembly. This last item was further confirmed by the dissolution of the said assembly by Lenin some days later. A small front was established on the basis of the three main Don cities, Taganrog, Novokokarsk and Rostov. The volunteers wore a small white ribbon to distinguish themselves from their enemies, their uniforms being for the most part similar and it was this that ensured that they were henceforth known as the Whites. Routed by the Red Guards, they were obliged to fall back in the direction of Ekaterinoda, capital of the Cuban. The Don Cossacks Ataman, Kaledin, strove in vain to raise his Cossacks against the Bolsheviks in the name of the territory's autonomy, but he went unheeded and committed suicide out of despair on January 29, 1918. The contingent of 4,000 whites began its march on February 9, in the depths of winter, for which reason this march is known as the Ice Campaign and battled its way across 400 kilometers before collapsing outside Ekaterinoda at the beginning of April 1918. Kornilov, killed by a stray shell on March 31, which suited the reactionaries in his camp just fine, was replaced by Denikin who was also of very modest origins, a father who had been born a serf before rising through the ranks as an officer, and whose mother and wife were Poles. This Denikin was a fanatical advocate of a Russia one and indivisible. Despite early reverses, the band of whites grew, boosted first of all by some officers who had managed to join up with it and then by the Cossacks of the Don and the Cuban. At first neutral, the latter had quickly been persuaded by events of the danger inherent in the Bolsheviks who abruptly abolished their traditional rights and, moreover, brutally commandeered their foodstuffs and belongings. Three white armies were formed, the Army of the Volunteers, the Army of the Don Cossacks commanded by the Ataman Krasnov, and the army of the Cuban commanded by Colonel Pokrovsky who was subsequently promoted general by the government of the Cuban. It was only several months on that they were to be brought under Denikin's overall command and not without friction. These three armies had their work cut out with a red army of some 100,000 Cossacks and troops. In the end they occupied Ekaterinoda in August 1918 and then the northern Caucasus, barring the road from Moscow to their adversaries, then they cleansed the whole of the Caucasus of enemy units, finally, 
they occupied the Don territory and set themselves the goal of seizing the rich mining basin of the Donets and the southern Ukraine to the southwest and Tsaritsyn to the north, thereby carving a path towards Moscow. Conscious of the fact that their power was going to remain fragile unless they had solid armed backing to call upon, Lenin and Trotsky founded a new army, dubbed the Red Army of Workers and Peasants and this replaced the Red Guards and the partisan detachments which were deemed too independent. It was more than just a change of name, a complete change of outlook was involved here. This was no longer workers under arms, but a compliant armed force in the service, the exclusive service of the authorities. However, this army was not created out of whole cloth, the former Red Guards and soldiers from the erstwhile Russian army were paid a wage and were led by former Tsarist officers in the guise of military experts and the latter were themselves shadowed by political commissars, Bolshevik militants charged with monitoring their loyalty to the new regime. Entire regiments of Latvians from the old Russian army, with officers at their head, were absorbed whole into the Red Army. Internationalist regiments and battalions were made up by Poles, Chinese and Hungarian XPOWS and their Serbian and German counterparts, while awaiting hypothetical repatriation, the latter became fighting hostages. All of these mercenaries did not waste much time in proving themselves. As for the Russian soldiery, they either signed on or were forcibly enlisted and, in the event of insubordination, or desertion, they were liable to the death penalty. Trotsky, a lover of fine phrases, spelled out their alternative thus, probable death while advancing, certain death in retreat. In this way the strength of the Red Army reached 600,000 men by November 1918, rising to a million by February 1919. On March 12, 1918, Trotsky was appointed People's Commissar and President of the Military Council, which had been set up at his suggestion. The most startling thing was the recruitment en mass of ex tsarist officers, hitherto so much denounced. Most of them joined in all good faith, in the belief that they were placing themselves at the disposal of a Russian government intent upon the welfare of the people. The most ambitious of them spotted the chance of rapid advancement in a new army, others were forced into it, with their families held hostage against desertion on their part. These recruits included such bigwigs as Brusilov, Astwal commander of the front, plus instructors from the military academy, well-known ex-generals like Bonch Bruvich and Sitting, a one-time minister of war like Paul Ivanov and tens of thousands of officers and NCOs like Tukhachevsky, Shaposhnikov, Zakov, Blucher, Sergei Kamenev, etc. This being so, the Bolsheviks were to be ill-placed to take their white adversaries to task for being Tsarist ex-officers for they themselves had as many of those in their ranks as their adversaries did, some 30,000 in 1918 and more later. Of course, this whole new army and its composition represented grave injury to Lenin's the rising as spelled out in the state and revolution, but as in religion, accommodations sit easy with doctrine, provided they be made in the name of the sacrosanct cause. The presence of numerous foreigners in the contending military units, there were some 250,000 foreign combatants in the Russian Civil War, and it may be said that the part they played was crucial to the course it took, was at its most spectacular in the case of the Czech Legion. Under compulsion and constraint, the Czechs had served with the Austrian troops against their fellow Slavs. At the first opportunity they had surrendered en masse to the Russian army. Having agreed, at the request of the Allies, to take up arms again against their former masters, they had been organized into an autonomous army corps some three divisions strong, led by Russian officers a force of about 45,000 men. They had distinguished themselves in the offensive ordered by Kerensky in June 1917 and which had come to an abrupt end. In light of the turn taken by developments in Russia, it had been decided that they would be evacuated to Siberia for redeployment on the Western Front alongside the Allies. They had taken the train for Vladivostok, when, en route, in Chelyabinsk, certain incidents brought them into conflict with local Bolsheviks. Trotsky attempted to ride roughshod over them by issuing an order for them to be disarmed and that they be incorporated into the Red Army, with any who refused dispatched to concentration camps. The upshot of this mishandling of the situation was not long in coming. The Czechs went on the offensive and at the end of May 1918 they seized the main stations on the Trans-Siberian Railroad, coming formally into conflict with the Bolshevik authorities. In the whole of Siberia, 
This important armed force, well equipped and officered, was to play the role of arbiter for upwards of two years. The members of the Constituent Assembly dissolved by Lenin had not given up. They rose in revolt, and abetted by the Czechs, they seized Samra on the Volga and in June 1918 they formed a committee for the Constituent Assembly, the Komak, and then a provisional government initially made up exclusively, of so-called center or right social revolutionaries. This government immediately promulgated several democratic decrees, some local organs of self-management, the peasant and urban committees, had their functions restored, the death penalty was abolished, even for Bolsheviks, restrictions on revictualing were rescinded, the eight-hour working day was introduced, the ban on strikes lifted, a ban placed on the lockout, and fresh elections were to be held to the Soviets, etc. The Mensheviks then joined this government which controlled a sizable part of central Russia and a population of some 12 million. At first it appealed to the inhabitants to enlist voluntarily in a Russian democratic army, but when the 10,000 volunteers proved inadequate, it ordered conscription of younger ones, which, to be sure, resulted in an army some 40,000 strong, but one badly led by officers of reactionary persuasions. The Committee for the Constituent Assembly enjoyed the support of the Czechs, all of them of democratic persuasions, who handed over to it the huge gold reserves captured from the Bolsheviks in Kazan. However, some ill-advised bourgeois measures were to alienate the bulk of the population from the committee, the banks and industry were denationalized and compensation had to be paid to landlords for properties seized from them by the peasants. Also, it was to meet with increasingly open hostility from the Omsk bloc, the Siberian government set up with the support of the bourgeoisie and all the monarchist reactionaries who had fled there many of them officers disinclined to forget the treatment that the social revolutionaries had mitted out to them at the front in 1917. The latter schemed every bit as much and more in order to secure the exclusive backing of the Czechs and the Allies, and they also intended very obviously to seize the gold reserves, a substantial consideration in any diplomatic maneuvering. The Committee for the Constituent Assembly found itself bolstered by the worker uprising in Azevsk and Voltkinsk. Nearly 35,000 workers from the arms factories situated there rebelled against the Bolsheviks, drove them out and formed regular regiments which threw in their lot with the Russian Democratic Army. Samara's social revolutionaries found themselves between the Devil and the Deep Blue Sea, the Bolsheviks and Omsk's reactionaries. Under pressure from the Allies, a gathering of 23 different Siberian governments and groupings, cooperative associations, political organizations, etc., was held in Ufa in September 1918, and its protracted negotiations ended with the establishment of a common directory made up of five members, including Admiral Kolchak, backed by the British, as Minister of War. The seat of the new government was switched to Omsk, and the gold ship there also, Samra being, it was reckoned, too, close to the front. In principle, the Constituent Assembly remained sovereign, but a new National Assembly was due to be elected on February 1, 1919. In spite of everything, and because of the Social Revolutionaries' presence, the Directory enjoyed the backing of the populace and the mobilization that it decreed is telling on this point, some 200,000 conscripts reported for induction. The big bourgeoisie and the toppled aristocrats could not bear, however, to be elbowed out of the direction of operations, so, with the support of the soldiery, they mounted a coup d'etat on November 18, 1918 with the blessing of the British and hoisted Admiral Kolchak into power. Eliminated, the Democrats found themselves hunted down, shot out of hand or treated as enemies, at first this drew from them resistance and protests, but those were followed by direct uprisings against those who had usurped popular legitimacy. Urged on by the Allies, Denikin acknowledged Kolchak's suzerainty and both were openly abetted by the Anglo-French in terms of arms, munitions, and equipment. These Allies placed formal conditions upon their support, Kolchak and Denikin had to acknowledge the authority of a future Russian government formed following the summoning of a freely elected constituent assembly, as well. As the regulation of conflict caused by the prescription of the country's borders through the League of Nations to which the new Russia would be obliged to affiliate, the whole business was complicated further by the direct intervention of the Allies. Up until the Brest-Litovsk Treaty, they had been lost in speculation about the intentions of Lenin's government. 
but confronted with a fate accompli and discovering its perilous consequences in the shape of German offensives on the French front, Paris, London and Washington were forced to make a stand. However, they had not given up hope of turning the Russian situation around, for they knew that many leaders, including the Bolsheviks allies the left SRs hoped for a resumption of hostilities against the central empires. The assassination of Count Mirbach, Germany's ambassador in Moscow, and the ensuing uprising of the left SRs which met with some initial success before meeting defeat in the hands of the Letts and Hungarians in Lenin's service, dispelled their lingering hopes and then induced them to side openly with enemies of the Bolsheviks. The principle of a barbed wire curtain, subsequently referred to as a cordon sanitaire was espoused with an eye to isolating Red Russia as an objective confederate of Germany. Henceforth, all anti-Bolshevik forces were given help in the shape of arms and munitions, the Czechs were encouraged to keep control of the 7,000-kilometer-long Trans-Siberian Railroad, and French, British, American, Italian and Japanese troops landed in Vladivostok in August 1918. The entry into the War of the U.S., with its vast potential, alongside the Anglo-French, tipped the scales once and for all in the latter's favor. Moreover, disorders broke out in the German army, exhausted by upwards of four years of stressful combat. Confronted with this threat of disintegration at home, the Central Empire's general staff concluded an armistice with the Allies. The implications for this situation inside Russia were enormous. First of all, the Bolshevik leaders ipso facto tore up the humiliating Treaty of Brest-Litovsk and gained some elbow room in areas hitherto occupied by the Austro-Germans. Moreover, the Allies were no longer bothered about intervening and directly abetting the anti-Bolshevik movements. The most serious impact was felt by the 600,000 Austro-Germans tied down in Ukraine and now caught, in a trap. Those of them who found themselves furthest to the west still managed to quit Ukraine without too much difficulty and to return home. The rest found themselves continually harassed by partisan detachments keen to avenge 80,000 peasant fatalities caused by the occupation. Frequently Austro-German evacuation convoys had to do battle in order to force a passage for themselves, and they did not always come off best, in which case their officers paid with their lives for their collective crimes and the ordinary soldiers were freed without further harm. Obviously, the loot and arms of intercepted units were confiscated and used to equip local insurgents. Another repercussion was that Poland and the Baltic countries, Latvia, Estonia and Lithuania regained their independence completely. The withdrawal of Austro-German troops left the arena open for all movements possessed of enough men and weapons to assert themselves. In the east, in Siberia, Admiral Kolchak's 130-000 strong army began to push towards Moscow from January 1919 on. One by one it seized the stations on the Trans-Siberian route and established itself on four fronts. The most important front was the Central Front, called the Western Front, established in the Kazan area. The Kolchakists were commanded by two Czech generals, Jan Sirovi and Gaida. There were 42,000 Russians and 20,000 Czechs there, well armed and with 182 cannon at their disposal. The southwestern front stretched from Samra to Orenburg, essentially it was manned by Cossacks from the Orenburg, commanded by the Ataman Dutov, about 28,000 men and 54 cannon. The Ural Front, further to the south, was held by the Ural Cossacks led by General Akutin, about 5,500 averagely armed men, and, the Northwestern Front, which was to cover the vast regions lying to the north of the central deployment, was commanded by General Ivanov Rinov who could call upon 36,000 poorly equipped men. Against these fronts, the Red Army, divided up into six armies commanded by Tsarist ex-generals, also numbered 130,000 men able to call upon 300 cannon. Conscripts under force have little stomach for fighting, so they were stiffened by the more readily manageable Hungarian, Latvian and Chinese units. To these fronts let us at the front of the Ataman Semyonov in central Siberia, backed by the Japanese, he had at his disposal several thousand Beriots, Mongols and Ashuri Cossacks. In the far north in Archangelsk an expeditionary corps of 15,000 British had been landed, a supreme government was founded up there under the leadership of the old populist socialist Thakokovsky. A little later, in January 1918, 
The Russian general Miller was appointed governor of the province and had at his disposal an army of 7,000, against some 20,000 Red soldiers. In the southwest, in December 1918, the French fleet anchored off Odessa. The troops of General Franchet d'Espery, who subsequently became Marshal of France, were due to be deployed in a possible operation in Ukraine to back up the oversight of Central Europe. The French were joined by a contingent of Greeks and an entire Allied expeditionary force 50,000 strong and commanded by General Anselm was deployed between Odessa and its region, from Tiraspol to Kherson and Nikolaev, as well as in the Crimea where the French occupied Sebastopol and Simferopol. Their arrival encouraged the growth of groups of white officers answering to General Denikin. Further west, the Poles benefited from French military assistance and were active on the borders of their huge northern neighbor. The Ukrainian nationalists at last held much of Ukraine, but they were poorly equipped and had to make a stand on every front for they were recognized by no one, the Allies looked upon them as in cahoots with the Germans, the Poles disputed with them for Galicia, Denikin denied their right of secession. Moscow simply ignored them and only with Markno, and then only initially, was a de facto neutrality feasible. Thus towards the beginning of 1919 Lenin's Russia was encircled by several important fronts. It did, however, have at its disposal the vastness of the interior of the country, all these fronts being on the periphery where the arms factories and the bulk of the population were located. In addition, it was able to deploy the huge arms reserves of Tsarist Russia. All of these trump cards were far from insignificant, however, Lenin lacked the chief asset, popular support, for his regime was ill-served by its agrarian, and indeed its labor policy. On some it imposed massive requisition of foodstuffs and goods, in its dealings with the others it divested of all power the factory and workshop committees that they had elected. Not that this occurred without popular resistance and popular revolts, according to the very statistics of the Bolsheviks People's Commissariat for Internal Affairs, between July and the end of 1918, 129 anti-Bolshevik revolts erupted in just the 16 provinces of European Russia, in particular, 27 armed uprisings occurred in just the two provinces of Tambov and Voronezh over the same period. According to the same source, the chief cause of uprisings was the requisitioning of wheat and forcible recruitment of conscripts. Most were the handiwork of social revolutionaries, but often they were spontaneous. These dashes were bloody if one is to judge by the fact that in the months of July, August, and September 1918 some 15,000 Bolsheviks and the like perished in some 22 provinces of European Russia. It is true that the backlash from the Leninist authorities must have been even more terrible. It may readily be appreciated that peasants and workers mobilized under coercion had no stomach for the fight and had a tendency to surrender quickly when confronted by a determined enemy, even if it meant swelling his ranks instead. 13. The Birth of the Makhnovist Insurgent Army From November 1918, Makhnovist partisans were manning a front on the edge of the Don territory and the Donets Basin. They confined to that area the movements of the Don Cossack Army of the Ataman Krasnov and the detachments of General Mimayevsky's volunteer army. Given the length of the front, it looked as if it would be hard for them to establish another one to the west, or their rear, against the Petliurists. When the Petliurists allowed the formation of White Guard detachments on their territory, relations became strained, they became openly hostile when the Directory came out in favor of the petite and medium bourgeoisie and they were virtually at war once it announced a general mobilization throughout the length and breadth of Ukraine, including territory controlled by Markno. Markno did his best to obstruct it by every means, however, at a meeting in Ekaterinoslav between Korobets, the Petlierist commander in the town, and the insurgents command led by Alexei Chubenko, a compromise was hammered out and there were even plans for a joint campaign against Denikin. Furthermore, the nationalists supplied the Makhnovists with weapons and munitions. However, the natures of the two movements were too much at odds for any entente to last. Paradoxically, it was an incident involving a third party that brought about the split. The Petliurists broke up the workers' Soviet of Ekaterinoslav, arrested six Bolsheviks and shot two left SRs. The members of the broken Soviet and the Bolsheviks appealed to Markno. Out of solidarity, he agreed to intervene, 
also because he wanted to get his hands on the enormous arsenal stored in that city. That was the first mistake, he flew to the aid of political adversaries whom he had bitterly criticized a short time before. His second mistake was of a military nature. He overestimated the assistance promised by the Bolsheviks and left SRs a thousand workers and militants, when there was to be only half that number, and underestimated enemy strength, nearly four thousand men, not counting the endlessly awaited reinforcements. It would appear that Markno had been dragged along against his better judgment, at the insistence of his friend Alexei Mochenko. At the head of 600 partisans, Markno determined upon an attack on December 27, 1918, against the garrison of the regional capital. Everything started well enough, thanks to an ingenious and daring stratagem, one band of partisans, led by Kalashnikov, shipped aboard a morning train normally crammed with workers, seized the railroad station without firing a shot while the remainder of the Maknavists neutralized guard posts on the approaches. The booty was not to be dismissed, twenty machine guns, for cannon and ammunition. But the Petliurists dug in in the city where the street fighting, to which the partisans were hardly used, was to drag on for several days. During the battle, the Bolsheviks played politics and passed to Markno a dispatch from Lenin reminding him of their interview and confirming him as commander-in-chief of the Soviet forces in Ekaterinoslav province. To which Markno replied that there were no Soviet forces, only the Maknavist insurgent army. Undaunted, the Bolsheviks persisted with their rigmarole and appointed themselves to take charge of the town, as commanders of the town and the militia, as post office commissars and communications chiefs, as well as other bureaucratic officers. All this while Markno was fighting day and night in the front lines and without rest. When the fighting was over, all of the self-appointed bureaucrats showed up at Markno's headquarters on the second floor of the railway station in order to take delivery of power. As soon as he realized what was afoot, Markno put them to flight with kicks and slaps about the back of the head, not merely from that story but also from the station. Driven out by the door, the Bolsheviks returned via the windows, again approaching him to get him to back their candidacy in the towns. Revolutionary Committee, for the Maknavist partisans, anarchists, and left SRs had a majority on it, and were unwilling to kowtow to them. Markno paid a visit to see the location of this politicking and refused to have any truck with such connivance. Realizing that the situation was now beyond their control, the Bolsheviks began to shun the Maknavists and, much more, ceased to perform the military guard duties allotted to their militants. So much so that a robust counterattack by the Petliurists, bolstered by Colonel Samokish's riflemen, completely surprised the partisans who, to avoid being pinned down in the station and wiped out, were forced to cross the bridge over the Dnieper connecting the station with the rest of the city. The bridge was utterly unprotected, for the Bolshevik unit charged with guarding access to it had split in two, one section, panicking, had taken to its heels without waiting to be relieved, while the other turned renegade and opened fire on the Maknavists. Their retreat thus cut off, the Maknavists then had to scurry across the ice of the frozen river, many of them were either mown down by enemy fire or drowned in the Dnieper. The failure of the expedition was all but complete as the insurgents had been able to evacuate. Only part of their armaments since some Petliarist railroad workers had diverted several carriages. Once back in Guliaipoli, Markno put his head together with his comrades, it was decided to convene a congress for reorganization of the front, a task entrusted to Victor Belash, an anarchist worker, and then a general congress of the region's peasants, workers, and fighters, the convening of this latter congress was entrusted to Golovko, a peasant from Mikhailovka township. Belash hastily toured the front to spread the word that the congress had been scheduled for January 3rd. The decision, reached one month previously, to redeploy all detachments of partisans as regiments had not as yet been put fully into effect. Each band of partisans was always raised locally, adopting the name of the nearest town, appointing a Batko and liaising informally with Batko Markno. The supply of weapons was very inadequate, barely half of the partisans had rifles and a few cartridges, and these were mostly sawn off hunting rifles and shark guns. The rest were armed with pikes, pitchforks and cudgels. Their best weapon was still their fierce determination to liberate or defend their villages from enemies of every hue who threatened them. 
The Congress of the Front would held on January 3 and 4, 1919 in the railway station at Polagui, a rail depot halfway between Guliaipoli and Marupol. Some 40 delegates were present on the basis of one delegate per detachment. Markno, busy at the front, was not present. The opening, speeches disclosed the dire need for arms and unity of command. Belash suggested that all the detachments, big and small alike, should amalgamate into regiments to which a medical unit and supply section would be assigned. A resolution on radical reorganization of the front was passed unanimously, an operational command was set up to complement Markno's main staff. This operational staff was to enjoy discretionary authority over the front and its rearguard, the work of amalgamating the detachments into regiments, or allocating equipment, setting up new detachments and the various staff of the front would fall to it, as would direction of military operations. All detachments refusing to acknowledge its authority were to be disarmed and their commanders brought before a general tribunal of the insurgents. As the Congress broke up, a six-man operational command was elected, Belash was to head this. He was given wide powers to co-opt further members. He drew up an order reorganizing the front, and, this was promptly circulated among all the detachments. Along the first front, some 160 plus kilometers in length, five regiments were formed, a total of 6,200 fighters, only half of them armed. Each regiment comprised three battalions, each battalion three companies and each company three platoons. Each battalion, company and platoon commander was to be elected, and each regiment would appoint its own staff. The insurgents faced enemies who were many and well armed, to the northwest, towards the city of Alexandrovsk, there were 2,000 Petlyurists, to the west, the Eger Brigade and detachments of German settlers, about 5,000 men, to the south, a detachment of four, 500 Ukrainian white volunteers and other units under the command of General Mimayevsky. Included among all these troops were local peasants who had been pressed into service, and it was taken for granted that they would seize the opportunity of the first engagements to come over with weapons and baggage to the Maknavist insurgents. That was the reason why the latter went on to the offensive on January 8, in spite of their being outnumbered and of the inadequacy of their weaponry. Desertions gave a spectacular boost to insurgent numbers, by January 20, their southern front boasted 15,000 rifles, 1,000 horsemen, 40 machine guns and stretched over a distance of 250 kilometers. To the west, a 2,000-strong Maknavist detachment led by Chali tackled the Petlyurists. To the north, the detachment commanded by Petrenko, assisted by anarchist, left SR and Bolshevik partisans, numbered nearly 10,000 men. Many local partisan groups were as yet operating independently of the front, in Guliaipoli and Polagui there were 5,000 men in reserve. So, not counting the autonomous local partisan bands, the insurgent Maknavist army numbered, by January 19, 1919, nearly 29,000 frontline fighters and 20,000 men held in reserve for want of weapons. It manned a front line totaling more than 550 kilometers in length, against the Ukrainian nationalists and the whites. The insurgent movement's strength grew on a daily basis, although the enemy offensives escalated. On January 20, at Henichesk, one of the two Crimean isthmuses, an expeditionary corps landed which had come from the Caucasus to beef up the Eger Brigade and the straightened German settlers. It was made up of 2,000 infantry and 300 cavalry. On the same day, further landing of 10,000 white infantry was made at Berdyansk. A third white contingent of 2,000 infantry and 800 cavalry, again from the Caucasus, marched on Guliaipoli. These were all elite troops, Don Cossacks and Chechens, placed under the command of General Mimayevsky whose intent was to mop up the region before pressing on to Moscow. Savage fighting ensued, the populace fled into the fields and forests, when they could, especially the menfolk, so as to avoid being shot or forcibly enlisted, for the most part they tried to make it to Guliaipoli, the heart of the resistance. Their womenfolk, obliged to stay behind to look after the children, were often raped by the soldiery. Irresistibly, the whites pressed forward and captured the approaches to Guliaipoli. At this point, on January 23, the first regional congress of peasants, 
workers, and fighters opened, in Bolshevik Hylovka. 100 delegates represented the rural districts and partisan units. In view of the critical situation, their agenda concerned itself solely with the strengthening of the front and the overtures to be made to the Petlerist directory to secure the return of conscripted peasants. Markno was not present, being in action on the front. Contrary to the preceding Congress, where nearly all participants had been anarchists, this one comprised, as far as the postholders, aside from Congress Chairman Golovko, were concerned solely of left SRs and maximalists. The Congress members decided upon mobilization of those who had served during the 1914-1917 war and who were thus conversant with weapons handling. This call-up was not obligatory, but it was morally imperative for the revolution's defense. In addition to promising to shrink from nothing to support the Maknavist movement, Congress assigned itself the task of claiming back all those forcibly inducted into the Petlerist and White Armies. To this end, a special delegation was appointed and accredited. And this propaganda was not without impact, peasants deserted en masse from the Petlerist army once they grasped its chauvinistic, bourgeois character. So that the partisans liberated, almost without a shot's being fired, many of the places held by the Ukrainian nationalists. It was at this point that the first Red Army units arrived on the scene from Russia and ensconced themselves in the liberated or open villages. In Kharkov, which had been liberated by the detachment of the anarchist Cherednyak, a Ukrainian Soviet government headed by the Bolshevik Christian Rakovsky was proclaimed in January 1919. Thus did Lenin secretly nullify the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk. On January 26, Ekaterinoslav, which the Petlyurists had abandoned, was occupied by the Bolshevik Kronstadt sailor Pavel Dibenko at the head of a dozen armored trains and a detachment of infantry. The Red Army's capture of Lugansk, a key port on the Black Sea, cut white expeditionary forces off from their base and forced them into withdrawing from air positions. On January 26, a joint assembly of Belch's operational staff and Markno's main staff determined to dispatch Chubenko to meet with Dibenko and request arms and munitions. If need be, Alexei Chubenko was empowered to enter into a military agreement. Time was of the essence, for the Whites were regrouping their forces preparatory to a general onslaught. Chubenko did meet Dibenko and reached an agreement with him that he passed on by telephone to his comrades for their approval. This purely military accord turned the insurgent army into No. 3 Dnieper Brigade bearing the name of Bako Markno, making it an integral part of the Red Army. In return, the Red Army undertook to issue it with the requisite weaponry, supplies, and finding. The Maknavists retained their internal structure based on the principles of volunteer service, self-discipline, and election of all commanders. Dibenko promised to send 10,000 rifles, 20 machine guns, cartridges, an artillery battery, some money and so on, within two days. The insurgents were itching to get their hands on all this so that they might mount an offensive and liberate their districts, they decided to send a further delegation to Kharkov to sign another agreement with Rakovsky's government and to also secure arms as speedily as possible from that source. While this was afoot, the enemy launched his offensive, the insurgents repulsed the attackers at Bayonet Point and forced them to stand off. The Maknavist counterattack was a success beyond all expectations. The environs of Guliaipoli were freed once again from the Chechens. Attacks followed counterattacks, all at bayonet point. The insurgents, galvanized by the liberation of their loved ones, managed to force the enemy right back to his former positions. In Kharkov, the Maknavist delegation led by Belash was received by the staff of Antonofovsinko, the commander of the Ukrainian front who reassured it concerning the agreement, reached with Dubenko, whom he depicted as a formal representative of the Red Army and of the Ukrainian Soviet government. It was desirable that the region should be liberated as early as possible so that it might be possible to organize the economy and a communist society. Berlash called at the headquarters of the Anarchist Confederation of Ukraine, the Nabat, Toxin, spelled out to those present just what the Maknovskina was and asked their assistance in the form of anarchist literature and anarchist propaganda. A first team of anarchists left immediately for Gulyai Poly carrying in four wagons the presses of the Confederation's newspaper and some anarchist literature. 
A second group made ready to join them along with some other comrades from Moscow, who included Arshinov, who served time in prison with Markno. 14. Soviet Power and the Power of the Soviets Capitalizing upon the confusion that followed withdrawal of the Austro-German troops from Ukraine, the Bolsheviks wasted no time in occupying the cities of Kharkov and Kiev. There they set up a Ukrainian-Soviet government under Christian Rakovsky, whereupon the Red Army attempted at Bayonet Point to push southwards. The aid requested by the Maknavist insurgents was grist to their mill, from now on they could purport to be acting on behalf of the local masses. As yet the latter had no knowledge of the reality lurking behind the whole alluring phraseology and official slogans of the Leninists, likewise, they knew nothing of the situation in Russia and particularly of Moscow's policy as applied to the problems of the peasantry there. Anyway what did that consist of exactly? In keeping with their old catechism, the Bolsheviks regarded as proletarians only industrial workers, the only ones truly serviceable for a social revolution, peasants were essentially conservatives. Their only ambition being to become smallholders and to work their plots of land themselves and that, argued Lenin and his fellows, was the open door to petit bourgeois capitalist production. The peasants were going to be genuinely revolutionaries only if they had no land and worked as wage earners in large-scale production, be it capitalist or state-owned. Moreover, the difficulties in keeping the cities supplied had induced nearly 8 million individuals to quit the city for the countryside where they became a malleable and disposable mass due to the very fact that they had no land. It was to these rootless persons that the Bolsheviks were going to award the great landed estates that had been confiscated, and this to the detriment of the local peasantry, keen to share out those estates so as to boost their meager holdings. The townies, landless peasants, were to be dubbed as poor peasants and organized into committees, the combed, thereby representing the new power base. In the countryside, they were to be encouraged to seize the holdings and produce of Kulak peasantry, actually, of the great bulk of the peasantry since the real Kulaks had either been eliminated as early as 1917 to 1918 or reduced to more modest circumstances. In addition, in order to ease food shortages in the towns, the authorities set up mobile requisition squads which were dispatched straight out into the countryside to issue paper, currency or receipts against the produce seized, some blatantly pillaged the populace, if need be shooting resistors and torching their homes. As we have just seen was the case in Russia, such methods sparked off numerous peasant revolts and uprisings, drowned in blood by the regime's janissaries. Indeed, the Leninist regime's sledgehammer. Argument was the argument of deliberate terror, the Chika followed the Red Army everywhere and promptly indulged in a preventive purge which is to say that it shot individuals regarded as potential enemies of the authorities and did so on a grand scale. The chairman of the Kiev Chika, Latsis, announced to his subordinates on this point. Do not try to speculate whether the accused have or have not conspired against the Soviet authorities, in arms or verbally. You ought to ask them first of all to what class they belong, of what social origin they are, to what degree have they been educated, and what is their profession. These questions should decide the fate of the suspects. That is the meaning and nature of Red Terror. In Ukraine too, these methods were employed as we shall have occasion to note in the case of Ekaterinoslav which was captured for a few days by the Maknavists, recaptured by the Ukrainian nationalists and then occupied at some length by the Red Army. One inhabitant of the city, G. Vigrenyev, testifies, to begin with the Red troops made a good impression, there were no excesses, attempts at looting by some Chinese soldiers were nipped in the bud, and some of them were even shot. Then things changed. Quote, all in all, the initial days were so calm that the population was beginning to bless the Soviet regime that was bringing a troubled time to an end. Soon, however, they were to get acquainted with the other side of the coin. On the fifth day, the Chika arrived from Kharkov and set zealously to work. Endless arrests and firing squads without benefit of trial began to become routine. All who had been one-time supporters of the Hetman, or even of Putlura, were arrested. Many were shot out of hand the moment questioning began and very often mistakenly. Soon there was not a family left from the city's intelligentsia which had not had one of its members placed under arrest. No information was released to those anxious for their nearest and dearest, 
the Chica was guarded by a double cordon of troops who would let no one through. Chica activity so dominated local life that it ensured that the hastily organized authority of the Presidium of the Soviet of the city's workers went quite unnoticed. Now, the inhabitants soon felt the impact of that authority also, especially where food supply was concerned. After the setting up in Ekaterinoslav of a supply commissariat, stocks began to melt away discernibly. The market which hitherto had always been plentifully stocked, even right after fighting, rapidly became deserted. Day by day prices escalated at a crazy rate. With the space of three weeks they doubled and after that the progression was geometrical. The roots of this phenomenon were as straightforward as could be. The supply commissariat had vigorously campaigned against freedom of trade, after having issued the population with ration cards which, however, could not be traded for any product. Ekaterinoslav was ringed by audit detachments which ruthlessly confiscated all produce from peasants attempting to bring their produce into the city. Meanwhile, the city's huge stocks of foodstuffs were quickly bought up or purloined by all sorts of requisition detachments flooding in from cities to the north, i.e., from Russia. Assisted by such an arrangement, the city, hitherto so rich in food supplies thanks to the fertility of its region, was quickly turned into a starving wasteland. Given that the city had no cooperative organization of any sort, the situation became worse than it was in the north. End quote. The new authorities introduced many other reforms, not the least original was the reform of educational provision. The eighth and final year of secondary schooling was simply dropped, teachers had to seek election and, in order to do so, to spell out their educational and political credo all under the higher authority of a young student promoted to Commissar for Education. Communist cells were established in every educational site, their main object being to denounce heretical teachers. Thus, this Soviet authority imported from Moscow fell a long way short of meeting the needs and aspirations of the populace, its bureaucratic methods soon created a situation of food shortages and complete arbitrariness in the life of society. The regime imposed its views and the Soviets worked in one direction only, as a transmission belt, from the top towards the bottom. Everything was dictated by a handful of members, higher-ups from the party's central committee. As far as the Maknavists were concerned, the power of the Soviets was rather more than just another piece of Kant, they saw them as free agencies emanating directly from the workers and expressing their wishes and aspirations without recourse to intermediaries of any sort. The two social and political approaches were radically opposed to each other, communism built from above or from below, which is to say authoritarians versus libertarians. On this point, let us quote Pyotr Arshinov, the chronicler of the Maknavist movement. The statists fear the free people. They assert that without authority, the latter will lose the anchor of sociability, will split asunder and turn wild. Naturally these are absurd arguments supported by idlers, who love power and the prospect of work for others, or by the blinkered thinkers of bourgeois society. The emancipation of the people does indeed spell degeneracy and a savage life, not for the people, though, but for those who live off power and privilege, from the toil of the workers and from their heart's blood. End quote. The peasants of the Guliaipoli region took it upon themselves to demonstrate the accuracy of this view. For upwards of six months between November 1918 and June 1919 and despite the state of war they lived without any political authorities and organized free Soviets and libertarian communes for their work and their everyday affairs. According to one of the resolutions of a district peasant congress, it was affirmed that, land belongs to no one, and only those who work it may use it, this blunt rejection of the state aroused regret in the Soviet historian, Kubanin. The largest of these communes, named after Rosa Luxemburg as a tribute to that late revolutionary, tribute to her, not to her ideas, housed 40 families as of May 1919. By May 1st it was to boast a population of 285 adults and children, and would have 125 hectares under crops. Several dozens of anarchists showed up from the cities, as requested by Markno. They included Arshinov and a baron who were to help get out the insurgent movement's mouthpieces The Road to Freedom and later the Maknavist Voice. The Ukrainian Anarchist Confederation, the Nabat, set up shop in Guliaipoli. 
In his memoirs, Victor Belash describes Gugliopoli as it was then. The building housing the insurgent army's headquarters was topped by huge black banners bearing the slogans War on the Palaces, Peace to the Cottages, On the Side of Oppressed Against Oppressors, Always, and The Emancipation of the Workers is the Affair of the Workers Themselves. In the adjoining building, the premises of the District Soviet of Peasant Deputies, Worker Deputies, and Soldier Deputies, two flags few bearing the inscriptions, Power Generates Parasites, Long Live Anarchy, and All Power to the Soviets Right Now. As scheduled, the Second Regional Congress of Peasants, Workers, and Fighters proceeded on February 12, 1919 in Gugliopoli. It drew 245 delegates representing 350 rural districts. On this occasion, Mark No was in attendance. He turned down a proposal to nominate him as chairman of the Congress, as the tense situation on the front might call him away at any moment. All the same, he was elected honorary chairman. The delegation that had been dispatched to Kharkov reported on its negotiations with the Secretary of the Government, as it had not secured an interview with the People's Commissar's ministers. That official had stated that the government had no intention of opening hostilities against the Maknavist movement, that their agreement had been as yet unconfirmed but that it probably would be. A lively debate then took place in Congress on the idea of free Soviets and their incompatibility with any party political authority. The Ukrainian provisional government stood by, first in Moscow and then in Kursk, until the workers and peasants of Ukraine had liberated the territory of enemies. Now that the enemy is beaten, some government appears in our midst describing itself as Bolshevik and aiming to impose its party dictatorship upon us. Is that to be countenanced? We are non-party insurgents, and we have revolted against all our oppressors, we will not countenance a new enslavement, no matter the quarter whence it may come. Speech of Chernonizny, delegate of the Novopavlovsk district, and the anarchist insurgent Boino declared, quote, whatever the cost, we must set up Soviets which are beyond pressure from any and every party. Only non-party Soviets of workers, freely elected are capable of affording us new liberties and rescuing the laboring people from enslavement and oppression. Long life to the freely elected, anti-authoritarian Soviets. Markno made a contribution, to the same effect. The resolution passed by the Congress is thus a fine expression of the participants' defiance of the political authorities installed by the Bolsheviks. The Congress finally elected a regional military revolutionary Soviet which became its executive organ in the interval between its sittings. Even so, this was liable to disbandment at any time by an extraordinary Congress. Its powers were all-embracing, covering the military, social, economic and political aspects of the region's insurgent movement. A central supply section was established in Gugliopoli, it marshaled supplies and forage for subsequent distribution throughout the front, finally, voluntary and egalitarian mobilization was confirmed, appeal being made to the conscience and goodwill of every individual, this mobilization was meant to have a measured impact upon the villages, townships and districts, so that essential agricultural tasks could continue to be assured. Despite the influx of volunteers, many had to be sent home temporarily due to the dearth of weapons. Already what weapons were available were not being deployed along the traditional lines. Kubanin deplores this departure from tradition also, infantry mounted on Tachankis and thus highly mobile could cover 60 to 100 kilometers per day, and these Tachankis were fitted with machine guns when available, rifles had their barrels sawed down rendering them more readily manageable in close quarters or hand-to-hand -hand fighting. Moreover, the latter form of combat was the insurgents' preferred form, as often as they were able, they would pop up unexpectedly in the rear or on the flanks of the enemy and mount an all-out onslaught, first with rifle and machine gun, and then with sabers, in the use of which they excelled. Nor was artillery missed out, this was commanded by Vasily Shirovsky, gunnery expert. According to Mark no, by February-April 1919, the insurgent movement numbered almost 30,000 fighters and 70,000 men in reserve, always for want of weapons but ever ready to move to the front if the need arose. Let it be noted that the insurgents identified with the workers in the large cities. The peasants of Gugliopoli devised the watchword, Worker, join hands with us, and acted upon this by making contact directly. 
The most telling instance was the case of the 100 wagon loads of wheat seized from the Whites in February 1919 and which a delegation shipped to Moscow. However, this independent-minded move and such spontaneous acts were deeply frowned upon by the Bolshevik potentates in Moscow, and their hostility was growing without restraint. 15. Alliance with the Red Army Markno and the staff of the insurgents allied themselves with the Red Army, for one thing, because they placed the revolution's interests above ideological differences, and, for another, because they were beset by a terrible shortage of arms and munitions, trophies taken from the enemy being insufficient to make up for the daily consumption of cartridges and insufficient to arm the many volunteers who showed up to fight in their ranks. As far as the Maknavists were concerned, this was only a military and by no stretch of the imagination a political compact, for in political terms Bolsheviks were still, in their eyes, adversaries, as the Second Regional Congress had confirmed. Moscow took a different view. From the moment that a military alliance exists, there is automatically political dependency, i.e., formal recognition of the authority of the Ukrainian Soviet government. These two very divergent outlooks were to lie at the root of a latent conflict. For the time being, the Bolsheviks had scarcely any option, they had scarcely any troops in Ukraine and the danger of white offensives was looming. Indeed, at the beginning of 1919 the Red Army in Ukraine was made up almost exclusively of detachments of local partisans which had subordinated themselves for the very same reason as the Maknavists. Such composition was not at all to the taste of the Red leadership who were preoccupied with hierarchical order and discipline. To begin with, their efforts were going to be devoted to overhauling the structure of the partisan groups and turning these into regiments, brigades, and divisions. This is how Vitaly Primakov, one of the chief Bolshevik military officials of the Times described this phase, towards the end of January 1919, substantial reforms were introduced in the, Red, insurgent army. Divisions were organized on the Russian model, the quality of headquarters staff was noticeably improved. Certain regimental commanders were stood down for acts of banditry. The regiments were, overseen by political commissars, Political sections were introduced in the divisions. Some independent regimental commanders were removed or shot. The tide of regimental ataman was abolished and that of commander replaced it. The finest regiments were turned into brigades. Some artillery divisions were set up. Based on the Dnieper, the army proceeded all that February with this reshuffle. Then it entered into contact with the atamans Grigoriev, Markno and others. The government was now confronted with the task of preserving its army from contagion by the Maknovskina and the Grigorievskina. This burden fell entirely upon the army's youthful political cadres, which simultaneously conducted a political agitation campaign and chica, work, not only educating the troops but also shooting the most inflexible atamans. This tiresome duty was performed with honor by the young political cadres. Thus the Bolsheviks' primary concern was to conduct a squalid police operation designed to turn free insurgents, revolutionary insurgents, into a slavish, obedient mass and to shoot honest revolutionaries if need be, whose only failing was their refusal to kowtow to the evangel of the Leninist state. What Primakov, who apparently played a leading part in this whole process, leaves unsaid is that during all this time the Atamans, from whom he feared contagion, held the front heroically against the White Guards. According to the military agreement concluded, Bolshevik political commissars were to operate within the Maknavist insurgent army ranks, this army was pompously rechristened brigade. Also the Chika wanted to screen its members over. Both the commissars and the Chika were chased out by the peasants or treated with contempt by the insurgents who were fighting for their land, their families and their freedom and who were well aware that these would be best guaranteed only through the success of the social revolution and who had no political lessons to learn from missionaries of the self-styled scientific socialist faith. Markno himself obliged to put up with them, treated them with sarcasm, Bolshevik missionaries complained. Moreover, the military compact was none too scrupulously observed by the Bolsheviks, aside from an initial delivery of 100,000 cartridges and 3,000 Italian special caliber rifles, each one accompanied by only a dozen shells, that was all the Maknavists were to get, and none of the promised cannon or machine guns. 
Anyway, in some instances the cartridges were faulty, having been sabotaged by Denikin supporters who had infiltrated the ranks of the Red Army, some of them were later to be discovered and shot, this piecemeal delivery was deliberate, for the reasons set out by Primakov earlier and for some bizarre reason applied also to deliveries to Dibenko who, although had died in the war Bolshevik, was nonetheless suspected of playing along with the Atamans, in his forces, every two fighters were entitled to a rifle between them, whereas among Grigorev, the ratio was one between three with the worst ratio the one among for that prevailed among the Maknovists. The Bolsheviks also bemoaned the growing influence of anarchists over the insurgent movement and more so, the presence of a rather sizable group of left SRs, who had been accepted by the insurgents only on the basis of the fight against the whites and for the power of the free Soviets. Especially since these left SRs included Viktor Popov, a black sea sailor who had led the left SR rising against Lenin in July 1918 and had come within an ace of success, he was subsequently to play a very active role in the Maknavist movement, taking charge among other things of its intelligence branch. Markno was not content to quarantine the political commissars, he also arrested a detachment of Czechists who were beginning operations in Berdyansk and had them manhandled into the front lines. It was hardly surprising in these circumstances that relations became strained and that the Red authorities were forever on the lookout for quibbles, inventing tales of uprisings where all that was going on was simple troop movements and units relieving one another. Joseph Dybet's evidence is very revealing of these frictions and of the Bolsheviks' bad faith. To make matters worse, Dybet's was a former anarcho-syndicalist of some note, having been one of the founders of Golos Truda, the voice of labor, the great Russian anarcho-syndicalist organ published in the US, where he had spent ten years an immigrant. According to Dybets, the fog shrouding his thinking had lifted after he read Lenin's The State and Revolution, whereupon he had ardently embraced this new pope's religion of realism and efficiency. In February 1919, he was in Berdyansk. The Maknavists occupied the port and Dybets met Markno, which gave rise to the following laconic exchange. Good day, Dybets. So, it seems you're a renegade now? Good day. It would appear that I am a renegade. Which means you are completely Bolshevik. Yes, completely. Yes, it's true that many have sold out to the Bolsheviks. Nothing to be done about it. That's right, they do sell out. I too have sold out. Take care, lest you regret it. I will take care. Dybet's wife, Rosa, had remained an anarchist and, what is more, had been an inmate in the same prison in Ekaterinoslav as Markno ten years before. This was a significant point in Dybet's favor and afforded him a certain license in the tone of his conversation with Markno. This is how their exchange went, as Dybet's tells it at any rate. Dybet's to Markno, what is your program? To eliminate the whites first and then the Bolsheviks. Well, what do you intend to do after that? Afterwards, the people will govern themselves. And how will they be able to govern themselves? Let me have your views on that. Markno, spelled out, in vague fashion, the anarchist thinking about the absence of constraints upon peasant communes which would not be subordinated to the state, nor to any organizational center. Our activists, he said, are confined solely to agitation and propaganda. The people themselves do everything. That is what we are doing also at the moment in military affairs. The army runs itself. That's absurd, utterly absurd. But Markno was not to be put off. You will see. First we are going to rid ourselves of the whites and then of the Bolsheviks. Dybets tackled Markno yet again, asking him what he intended to establish as a regime. The Ukrainian libertarian's answer was, the People's Commune. The Anarchist Republic, which was hardly surprising. Dybets reckoned that he had found a crushing argument, when he countered that Markno couldn't even run a factory and was surrounded only by bandits and anarchists on the run from the bullets of the Chica. A contemptuous Markno brought the exchange to a dose by dismissing him several times as a renegade. Belated and sudden though his conversion may have been, Dybets played a significant role among local Bolsheviks, 
He headed a revolutionary committee in Berdyansk, a committee representing nobody but the Bolsheviks but which nonetheless arrogated certain rights to itself. Dybets thus crowed about having put one over on the Makhnovists. At a time when, according to the testimony of Antonov, Ovsinko, half of the Makhnovists were virtually barefoot and when the Gulyai military, revolutionary Soviet urgently requested a shipment of 12 wagon loads of leather, produced by the tanneries of Berdyansk, Dybets arranged to have the shipment rerouted to Moscow, then indignantly accused the Makhnovists of having been behind its disappearance. He smugly recalled that in so doing he had furnished himself with a decisive comment for his discussions with the Makhnovists, at the first sign of a problem, he used to say to them, and the leather, what have you done with it? Markno authorized the display of Bolshevik newspapers in Gulyaipoli, Berdyansk and Marupol. A certain Urolov, a Leninist militant, tells this tale, bearing a safe conduct pass from Markno, he set out for Berdyansk, there to see to publication of a newspaper for his party. Right from the very first two issues, he railed violently against the Makhnovist insurgents while they at the time were busy containing a push by the enemy. Protests having had no effect, some insurgents turned up to smash the plates of the third issue of Urolov's provocative publication. For their part, the insurgents kept up their side of the bargain, they sent two of their tried and tested regiments to help Dibenko combat the White Guard and German settler detachments in the Crimea. For their own part, they went on the offensive in April and got within a few kilometers of Taganrog, the headquarters of Denikin's front. For want of arms and ammunition, they were unable to capitalize upon this success. Chance brought them into Marupol with some Frenchmen who were unloading materials and arms for the Denikinists. The Frenchmen suggested to the insurgents that they swap the weapons for some coal stacked on the dockside and which they needed urgently, but the Frenchmen met with a categorical refusal and the whole episode ended with some artillery exchanges. The Kremlin's official mouthpiece, Pravda, acknowledged the merits of Markno and wrote of him on April 3, 1919. The Ukrainians say of Markno, our Bakko fears neither God nor devil, yet he is a simple man like us. There followed a biographical sketch of Nestor. The peasants, despite the threat of their being shot for having protected Markno help him in all things. He has set up a detachment and turned down a proposal of union with the directory, declaring to a villagers' congress in Alexandrovsk that, the Petlierist movement is only an adventure distracting the masses from the revolution. With 600 men, he took Ekaterinoslav, investing the city via the railway station but was forced to pull back to the Dnieper, being under Dibenko's command, he has been incorporated into the Red Army of which he forms a brigade. He has been assigned the task of fighting the white volunteers and of keeping the railroad clear up as far as Berdyansk, in which he has acquitted himself brilliantly. The white's finest regiments have been smashed. Things livened up, nonetheless, when the military revolutionary Soviet appointed by the Second Congress of Peasants and Insurgents summoned the Third Regional Congress for April 10 in Gulyaipoli. Delegates from 72 districts, representing upwards of 2 million inhabitants, took part. All civil and military issues were dealt with great gusto. Towards the end of the proceedings, the Congress received a telegram from Dibenko in which the latter pronounced the Congress counter-revolutionary and outlawed its organizers whom he threatened with the most rigorous repressive measures. Addressing himself to Markno, Dibenko ordered him to ensure that there was no repetition of the episode, a copy of the telegram was forwarded to the Gulyaipoli Soviet. The military revolutionary Soviet was superciliously ignored. In its reply, which has become famous, the latter made it its business to enlighten Dibenko as to the situation. Quote, before pronouncing the Congress counter-revolutionary, Comrade Dibenko did not take the trouble to establish in whose name and for what purpose it had been summoned, right? So allow us, Your Excellency, to inform you by whom and for what this, according to you, patently counter-revolutionary, Congress has been summoned and then, maybe, it will not strike you as quite so frightening as you describe it. The Congress, as stated above, was summoned by the Executive Committee of the Military Revolutionary Soviet of the Gulyaipoli, that being the central township. It has described itself as the Third Regional Congress. It was convened in order to lay down the future policy line for activities of the Military Revolutionary Soviet, you see, Comrade Dibenko, 
There had already been two previous counter-revolutionary congresses of this sort. Now to the question that you might pose yourself, whence comes the military revolutionary Soviet and to what end was it established? If you are not a you fate, comrade Dibenko, then allow us to bring you up to date. This Soviet was established in accordance with the resolution of the Second Congress, which took place on February 12th in Guliaipoli, you see how long ago that was, for you were not even around then, in order to organize the front and proceed to a volunteer mobilization, given that we were ringed by whites and that the first detachments of insurgent volunteers were insufficient to hold such an extensive front. So there were no Soviet troops in our region and anyway the populace did not expect much assistance, being of the mind that it was their duty to look to their own defense. End quote. The authors of this reply then set out how and why the military revolutionary Soviet with its 32 members, one delegate from each district of the provinces of Ekaterinoslav and Tavrida, had come into being. Then they harked back to the origins of the convening of the Second Congress which had been summoned by a five-member commission appointed by the First Congress on January 23rd and who had not been outlawed in that the sort of hero who would venture to trespass against the people's rights won in open battle at the cost of their own blood, still was not around at that time. Then they went on to explain to Dibenko, whom they held was ignorant of all this, the basic reasons behind the insurgent movement and the progress of its fight against its enemies first of all, only to return to the appointment of the impugned Soviet which had only executive powers, and to the sovereign role of the Third Congress apropos evaluation of and formulation of policy on the events in progress. In conclusion, Comrade Dibenko was taken seriously to task. Quote, there now, Comrade Dibenko, you have before you a picture that should be an eye-opener for you. Collect your wits. Reconsider. Have you the right, you alone, to label as counter-revolutionaries upwards of one million workers who have, with their horny hands, cast off the shackles of slavery and henceforth look to themselves for the reshaping of their lives as they see fit? No. If you be a genuine revolutionary, you must help them in their struggle against the oppressors and in the building of a new and free life. Can it be that laws laid down by a handful of individuals, describing themselves as revolutionaries, can afford them the right to declare outside of the law an entire people more revolutionary than themselves. The Soviet's executive committee embodies the whole mass of the people. Is it tolerable or reasonable that laws of violence be thrust upon the lives of a people which has just rid itself of all lawmakers and all laws? Is there some law, according to which a revolutionary is alleged to have the right to enforce the harshest punishment? against the revolutionary mass on whose behalf he fights, and this because that same mass has secured for itself the benefits that the revolutionary promised them, freedom and equality. Can that mass remain silent when the revolutionary strips it of the freedom which it has just won? Does the law of revolution require the shooting of a delegate on the grounds that he is striving to achieve in life the task entrusted to him by the revolution mass which appointed him? What interests should the revolutionary defend? Those of the party? Or those of the people at the cost of whose blood the revolution has been set in motion? End quote. This mini anthology on the revolutionary autonomy of the workers closed with an invitation should Dibenko and those like him persist in their dirty businesses to declare counter revolutionary and outlaws all who had participated in the foregoing congresses and the combatants who had fought and were fighting still for the people's emancipation without seeking anybody's leave to do so. The signatories to the document, members of the Soviet, finally stated that they would carry on with their tasks and had neither the right nor the duty to default upon the responsibility which the people had delegated onto their shoulders. This text was countersigned by the chairman of the military revolutionary Soviet, Chernyznik, by the vice chairman, Leonid Kogan, by the secretary, Karbit, and by the members Koval, Petrenko, Dotsenko, and others. Markno was not among them not having even attended this congress, having been caught up in fighting, and in any case, he had nothing to do with the supreme organ of the movement. Thus Dibenko discovered with whom he had to deal, the mass of the people. He himself came from the mass of the people and had quite good revolutionary credentials, all he needed was the requisite finesse to distinguish between the language of revolution and that of a party which had proclaimed itself repository of the revolutionary masses' historical and political interests. 
In fact, he was a bumpkin who did not shrink from the most brutal and disgusting measures if they enforced respect. Dibetz describes how he slew the commander of a Red Army Cavalry Regiment where he stood, without a word spoken, just to ensure readier obedience from the combatants. Although these were commonplace measures albeit generally used with greater discretion in that army, Dibenko displayed great enthusiasm for them. With Antonov of Sinko we have a completely different kettle of fish. He was an old Bolshevik militant, one of those professional revolutionaries who had kept the party afloat for years. In October 1917, he had led the Petrograd Military Soviet which organized the storming of the Winter Palace. At this time he was in command of the Ukrainian Front. He was very well aware that the Maknavist insurgents were, supporters of local Soviets, regarded as free Soviets answerable to no central authority. He had wanted to get a more exact notion of the whole commotion denounced by his party colleagues, and so he paid a visit to Gulyaipoli on April 28 and has left us with a superb, objective account of the situation. For a start, he addressed a message to Markno announcing that he would be passing through the region. By return he received a telegram from Markno, I know you to be an upright and independent revolutionary. On behalf of the revolutionary, insurgent units of the 3rd Dnieper Brigade and all of the revolutionary organizations of the Gulyai, Poly region which proudly bear the banner of the insurrection, I am charged to invite you to call upon us to visit our own little Petrograd free, revolutionary Gulyai Poly. En route, Antonov of Sinko reviewed all recent developments on the front, the fine conduct of the Maknavists and the advice of one Bolshevik leader, Sokolov, and of Hittes, commander of the Southern Front, to the effect that Markno be removed from command of his brigade, which struck him as uncalled for since, as the saying goes, one does not change horses in midstream. From the railway station, a troika brought him briskly to Gulyaipoli. He was welcomed to the strains of the International, played by an orchestra. So let us now turn to his account, quote. A group of bronzed partisans stepped forward to greet the front commander, one man broke ranks, a man of small stature and quite youthful, with sombre eyes and a hyperparka perched on his head. He stopped two paces away and saluted, Brigade Commander Bako Markno. We are successful in holding the front. At present we are waging the battle for Marupol. On behalf of the revolutionary insurgents of the Ekaterinoslav province, I salute the leader of Ukraine's Soviet troops. Handshake. Markno introduces the members of the Gulyaipoli Soviet's executive committee and of his staff. Also there is the political commissar of the bridge, my old acquaintance, Marasia Nikiforova. We review the troops. The brigade's main units are on the front. Here there are only a reserve regiment undergoing training and two cavalry platoons. Dressed in a motley assortment of uniforms and clothing and brandishing all sorts of arms, the impression they give is nonetheless one full of verve and pugnacious. They devour me with their eyes. In silence they all listen to the front commander's speech about the import of our struggle, on the position on the different fronts, on the heavy responsibility entrusted to the Markno Brigade, on the necessity for iron discipline, and they greeted his concluded words with hurrahs. Markno replied to the front commander by wishing him welcome, alluded somewhat touchily to the unfair charges laid against the insurgents, mentioned their successes and promised further successes, if support in arms and equipment is forthcoming. His voice is not very loud, there is a slight hiss to it, and his pronunciation is soft, all in all, he does not give the impression of being a great orator, but how attentively they all hear him out. We step into the building housing the brigade staff and quickly inspect its branches, the inspection is gratifying. One can discern the hand of a specialist, Staff Commander Ozerov, at work. End quote. An exchange upon the situation of the front ensued. The deployment of the brigade's units was reviewed, the results of the April 23rd offensive examined, while the conversation was in progress news arrived of the capture of Marupol and of the capture of every last man of the enemy's first mixed regiment of infantry and cavalry. Markno, though, stated that he did not have the wherewithal to follow up the offensive and that it would be feasible to form two whole divisions, but the arms and equipment just were not available. He added that the Red Army's 9th Reserve Division, deployed to the north of his brigade, 
was prone to panic and that its command sympathies lay with the whites. He cited the instance of the offensive against Taganrog when this 9th Division fell back abruptly, leading to the encirclement and extermination of a Macnavist regiment which fought to the bitter end, without surrendering. Then he bemoaned the shortage of armaments. In his report, Antonov of Sinko comments, his complaint is well founded, there was neither money nor weapons nor munitions nor equipment. Some time back Debenko did supply 3,000 Italian rifles with a few cartridges each and now that the ammunition has run out, these rifles are useless. The remainder of the arms and equipment was booty taken from the enemy. Half of the partisans went barefoot. And what of the charges of banditry? Why here comes the big bandit, Batko Pravda, the legless cripple commander of a detachment shows up and salutes Antonov of Sinko. He is a dyed-in-the-wool libertarian communist and a first-rate fighting man, in spite of this, all sorts of rumors are peddled about him, allegedly he cuts Bolshevik throats and fights against Soviet power. He has personally slain bandits. Persecution of political commissars. Not a bit of it. But we have need of fighters, not gossips. Nobody drove them out. They buggered off themselves. Of course we do have. Lots who are opposed to your way of thinking and, if you wish, we can discuss. Everything that, Markno says is confirmed by the brigade's Bolshevik political commissar. As their conversations proceed, the insurgents and their guests share a meal washed down by some reddish liqueur. Markno tells Antonov of Sinko that he is not a drinker and faith has banned alcohol. The members of the Gulyaipoli Soviet congratulate themselves on their work. The town boasts three magnificently appointed secondary schools and some children's communes. Ten military hospitals house a thousand wounded but unfortunately there is no experienced doctor. Antonov of Sinko pays a visit to some of them, finding them to be very clean and spacious, having been set up in seigneurial homes. There is also a repair shop for artillery pieces. Antonov of Sinko has a tete tete discussion with Markno about what helped to afford to Soviet Hungary, about the breakthrough in Europe, the danger of an offensive by Denikin, and the need to erect a united, steely front of social revolution against that. In the end, the pair shake hands firmly, looking each other in the eye. Markno declares that as long as he leads the insurgents, there will be no anti Soviet acts and that battle without quarter will be waged against the bourgeois generals. Without demur, he agrees to the conversion of his sector of the front into a division, under the command of one Chikvanaya, with Markno remaining brigade commander. A great get-together brings the day to a close, everyone rallies around the watchword of, all out against the common foe, the bourgeois generals. In 1927, in an appendix to this account, quite startling for a Bolshevik at that time, Antonov of Sinko noted that, in the light of subsequent developments, his testimony might appear to unduly idealize the insurgents, but, he added he had striven only to be objective. Summarizing his impressions, Antonov of Sinko telegraphed the following message to Rakovsky on April 29. I spent the entire day with Markno. He, his brigade and the whole region represent a great fighting force. There is no conspiracy. Markno himself would not allow it. It is possible to organize the region well, there is excellent material there, and we must keep it on our side and not create yet another new front to fight on. If consistent work is followed through, this region will become an impregnable stronghold. The punitive measures contemplated are senseless. There must be an immediate end of the attacks against the Maknavists that are beginning to appear in our newspapers. Without waiting for any reply, he also telegraphed to Bubnov and to the editions of the Kharkov Izvestia, the official mouthpiece of the Ukrainian Soviet government. In your edition of April 5, you carried an article entitled Down with the Maknovskina. That article is awash with mistruths and is blatantly provocative in tone. Such attacks damage our struggle against the counter-revolution. In that struggle, Markno and his brigade have demonstrated and do demonstrate an extraordinary revolutionary valor, and are deserving, not of abuse from officials, but rather of the fraternal gratitude of all worker and peasant revolutionaries. On May 2, he confirmed his impressions in a more considered report to Lev Kamenev. 
At the same time, he ordered Skatchko, the commander of the Second Army, to waste no time in supplying artillery, for million rubles, equipment, filled kitchens, a portable telephone, cartridges for those 3,000 Italian rifles, two surgeons, two physicians, medical supplies, pharmaceutical equipment, and an armored train. All as a matter of urgency. The new front line, fixed by Trotsky along the Donets Basin and under the care of the Russian command which thus stripped Markno of the supervision of the front which was held by him, Antonov Ovsinko also objected to. Trotsky's reply was typical of him. Your comments, according to which the Ukrainian troops are capable of fighting only under a Ukrainian command, derive from a refusal to look truth in the face. The Maknavists fall back from the Marupol front, not because they are under the authority of Hittes and not yours, but because they faced an enemy more daunting than the Patliurists. The main enemy is on the Donets Basin and it is to there that we must switch our main forces. Any delay in this operation would be the most awful crime against the Republic. Antonov Ovsinko reacted with indignation and anger to this chastisement. It would not be hard to discover that, one, I had undertaken, and continue to do so, every step to convert the insurgent units into regular army, two, neither Moscow nor the Commissar for War in Ukraine was of the slightest assistance to me in this organizational endeavor, three, nonetheless, some excellent cadres have been formed in Ukraine for the army of the future. The allegation regarding easy victories obtained here is a fantastic concoction by people far removed from the military work in Ukraine. Without bothering to examine all of these arguments properly, you have condemned my whole work in extreme terms. My outrage is great. Obviously, the Carnot of the Russian Revolution, at least as he imagined himself to be, could not countenance anyone's contradicting him in his strategic evaluations, he banked on a push by Denikin in a northerly direction, the target of which would be the Donets Basin and a link-up with Kolchak. What followed was to expose the idiocy of Trotsky's calculations. As for Antonov Ovsinko's lobbying, that had scarcely any success, Markno was outfitted with neither weapons nor equipment and the hostile press campaign against him carried on in the Bolshevik newspapers. In the wake of his lively retort to Trotsky's sermonizing, Antonov Ovsinko's star seriously declined and on June 15 he was replaced by Vatsitis, a let and Tsarist ex-colonel, as commander of the Ukrainian front. Intrigued by his impressions, several Soviet bigwigs paid a visit to Gulyaipoli a week later. Lev Kaminv, a.k.a. Rosenfeld, Zinoviev's brother-in-law, Voroshilov, Meslauk, the commissar for war in the Ukrainian Soviet government, Muranov, Zorin, Sidersky, and others. Their armored train pulled into Gulyai Police Station on May 7, 1919, in the morning. They were greeted by Merosia Nikiforova, Mikhailov Pavlenko, and Boris Veritelnikov, who proposed to escort them into town. Half reassured, Kamin happened to issue instructions to the commander of the train to dispatch a patrol to fetch them, should they fail to return by 6 p.m. Meanwhile, Markno showed up and was introduced to the new arrivals, he escorted them and along the way pointed out a tree from which he personally had hanged a white colonel. They were welcome to the town to the sounds of the international and visited the movement's social achievements. They took refreshments and were introduced to a pretty young Ukrainian, Galina Kuzmenko, Nesta Markno's partner and secretary. Everything went swimmingly, except during an interview with Markno and his staff, when Kaminv demanded abolition of the military revolutionary Soviet, a creation of the regional congress. The discussions founded, for the insurgents explained to him that the aforesaid body had been created by the masses and on no account could it be disbanded by any authority at all. The reply displeased the red officials, even so, they bade the Maknavists fond farewells, Kaminv even embraced Markno and assured him that the Bolsheviks will always find a common language with authentic revolutionaries like the Maknavists and that they could and always should work hand in glove. Upon arrival in Ekaterinoslav, Kaminv telegraphed Moscow to have reduced from one year to six months a conviction against Merosia Nikiforova which banned him from holding office. He also published an open letter to Comrade Markno, commander of the 3rd Brigade, wherein he stated that the rumors about separatist or anti-Soviet schemes on the part of the Maknavist insurgents were utterly without foundation. Markno he described as an 
upright and dauntless fighter who fought with courage against the whites and foreign invaders. However, he recalled that the front manned by the insurgents was only a one-thousandth part of the overall front, and alluded to differences of opinion, which would be smoothed over, if they deliver coal and wheat from the region, the central authorities will then send them the armaments and everything they need. Pyotr Arshinov, who was present at this encounter later wondered if Kamin's and even Antonofovsinko's attitude had been sincere, or whether they had merely provided cover for a reconnaissance operation in advance of a general Bolshevik offensive against the Maknavists, an offensive that had been long in the preparation. He based this hypothesis on the conspiracy devised a little later by one Padalka, commander of a regiment of insurgents. Bribed by the Bolsheviks, Padalka was to have seized Markno and his staff. This scheme was only foiled at the very last minute, thanks to Markno's unexpected return to Guliaipoli from Berdyansk by airplane. This was not impossible but it strikes us more likely that the initiative had been taken here by some Czechists rather than by political leaders, and the evidence for this is supplied by the telegram that was sent to Kamenev by Lenin on May 7. In that Rostov has not been taken, we need to be temporarily diplomatic with Markno's army, dispatching Antonov, and holding him personally accountable for Markno's troops. So a double cross was intended, but postponed to a more opportune time. Also, Markno was warned by revolutionaries working inside Soviet institutions never to go if summoned either to Ekaterinoslav or to Kharkov, for any official summons would be cover for a trap leading to his death. All of which meant that the Leninists would not on any account tolerate the autonomous activity of the region's insurgent masses and would ultimately use force to curtail it. Some days later, a grave problem confronted the Bolsheviks, their ally, Grigoriev, refused to go fight the Romanians by way of assisting Soviet Hungary and turned against them. This Grigoriev had significant muscle at his disposal, 30,000 rifles, 10 armored trains, 700 machine guns, 50 cannon, tanks and trucks. He quickly seized a considerable portion of the western Ukraine. Fearing the worst, i.e., a revolt by the Maknavists and their throwing in their lot with Grigoriev, which would oblige the Bolsheviks to evacuate Ukraine, left Kamin dispatched a telegram to Markno on May 12, urging him to condemn Grigoriev's venture. The traitor Grigoriev has delivered the front to the enemy. Refusing to carry out the order to fight, he has turned his guns against us. The moment of decision has come, either you will go with the workers and peasants of the whole of Russia, or you will ipso facto open the front to the enemy. There is no margin for hesitation. Report to me immediately the disposition of your troops and issue a proclamation against Grigoriev, sending a copy to me in Kharkov. A failure to reply on your part will be deemed a declaration of war. I believe in the honor of revolutionaries, yours, and that of Arshinov, Veritelnikov, and others. Grigoriev was a one-time captain of the Tsarist army who had been promiscuous in his allegiances, starting with Kerensky, he moved on to the Ukrainian Roda, the Hetman Skoropadsky, Putlura, and the Directory and latterly to the Bolsheviks. Each time he had turned savagely against his erstwhile allies and masters, making a decisive contribution to their defeat. On the Bolsheviks' behalf he had fought the French and the Greeks in Odessa. He had captured that great city by routing the Allied troops and giving the French command, which was in the future to fight shy of sending infantry units onto Ukrainian soil and was henceforth to make do, with occasionally shelling the revolutionaries from its ships, something to think about. Grigoriev was a redoubtable war chief, competent and courageous and always in the thick of the action, which galvanized his men. What is more, he was a sharpshooter, once he had brought down a marauder with a revolver shot in the head at fifty paces. He was very popular among the poor peasants, who accounted for the bulk of his troops, for he readily issued free the foodstuffs and goods seized from the bourgeoisie. To the great relish of his men, he had a weakness for semi-poetic, semi ubu esque proclamations. In November 1918, he issued a threat to the German generals to the effect that he would swat them like flies, with a flick of his hand, unless they quit Ukraine within four days, taking their personal effects with them, otherwise he would send them home in their shirt tails. He had also threatened to blow out his own brains at the time of the fighting against the Greeks, 
if his cavalry, surrounded by Greek cavalry mounted on mules and donkeys, and outnumbering him three to one, managed to beat his men. Happily for him, his horse-riding cavalry had successfully overwhelmed their opponents. Following his entry into Odessa, he had issued order number one in which he declared that he had trounced the French, the Greeks, the Romanians, and the white volunteers and thanks to one of his shells might even have toppled Clemenceau from the presidency that he so coveted. A claim that may not be completely devoid of substance. When he turned against the Bolsheviks, he called upon the peasants to fight with whatever they could lay their hands on, if you have no weapons, take up your pitchforks, axes, and stakes and get stuck in. He tried several times to link up with Markno, but only one of his messages got through to the libertarian. Bako. Why bother with the communists? Knock them on the head. Ataman Grigorev. His strategy was that of most of the partisan groups, he stuck doggedly to his native soil and refused to go off and fight as a mercenary in Hungary. It was enough for him to hold the Bessarabian front. Let us note at this point that the Bolsheviks had a sizable Hungarian detachment, ex-prisoners from the Austrian army who had not gone home but had been organized as a Red Army unit. They too declined to be assigned to the southern Ukrainian front and wanted to go home and fight. In this regard, the Bolshevik tactic was systematic, and persists to this day. They always used troops who had no links with the region or country in question. Thus into Ukraine they were to dispatch Chinese, Lets and Germans. The Maknavists did not know why Grigorov had become a renegade, so their primary concern was to circulate a general communique to affirm their own loyalty to the revolution. Quote. Marupol campaign headquarters of the Maknavist army. Copies to all combat sector commanders, all regimental, battalion, company and platoon commanders. Order to be read out to all Bakko Markno troop units, so-called. Copy to command the extraordinary plenipotentiary of the Defense Soviet. Take most vigorous steps to sustain the front. On no grounds tolerate weakening of the revolution's external front. Revolutionary honor and dignity oblige us to keep faith with the revolution and the people. Grigorov's squabbles with the Bolsheviks over power cannot induce us to undermine the front which the White Guards mean to smash in order to enslave the people. Until such time as we have vanquished our common enemy in the shape of the Whites from the Don, we will not firmly and fully appreciate the freedom won by our hands and our rifles, and we shall remain on the front, fighting for the people's freedom and not in any circumstances for power, nor for the intrigues of political charlatans. Brigade Commander Bakko Markno, members of the staff, signatures added. This initial reaction meant that the insurgents were keeping clear of all intrigues and sticking to their battle against the whites on the front. That one was destined for their fighters, Markno and his staff at the same time sent this even more explicit reply to Kameenf himself. As soon as your telegram was received, I immediately gave the order to hold the front with undiminished firmness, yielding not one inch of our positions to Denikin or to any other counter-revolutionary pack, thereby performing our revolutionary duty towards the workers and peasants of Russia and of the whole world. For your benefit, let me declare that the entire front and I will remain unshakably loyal to the worker and peasant revolution, but not to the institutions of violence in the persons of your commissars and Czechists who act arbitrarily against the laboring population. I do not know what he is doing nor what aims he pursues, for that very reason I am going to refrain from publication of a proclamation against him, until such time as I am in receipt of fuller details. As an anarchist revolutionary, let me declare that I cannot by any means support seizure of power by Grigorov or by anyone, as hitherto, I am going to drive out, with my insurgent comrades, the bands of Denikin, while striving at the same time to let the liberated regions be networked by free unions of peasants and workers who would thus enjoy full powers in their areas. In this respect, agencies of constraint and violence such as chakers and commissariats, instituting a party dictatorship and exercising their violence even against the anarchist unions and their press, will find us determined adversaries. Brigade Commander, Bakko Markno, members of the staff, signatures appended, Chairman of the Cultural Section, Arshinov. That answer, made in all objectivity and independence of outlook, is dear and unmistakable. The insurgents reaffirmed their loyalty to the revolutionary cause but had no wish to be the deaf, 
blind puppets of any party, no matter how revolutionary it professed to be. A passing swipe had been made at the Bolsheviks' repressive organs, a word to the wise is enough. Perhaps it was their excesses that had prompted Grigorov's revolt. In order to shed some light on the matter, a panel of insurgents was set up to go and make an on-site investigation. Meanwhile, the telegram from Grigorov, mentioned earlier, arrived. The recommendation to knock the Bolsheviks on the head was a touch vague, and the message went unanswered by the insurgents. Their commission of inquiry made its report, it transpired that Grigorov was nothing more than a warlord but one who trailed many poor peasants in his wake. This discovery led the staff and the insurgents' military revolutionary Soviet to draw up a long proclamation headed Who is Grigorov, exposing the adventurer, his anti-Semitic tendencies when he vented his spleen on those who crucified Christ and even his anti-Russian mentality when he talked about those who came from the dregs of Moscow. Didn't Grigorov gladly crow that whenever he had captured Odessa, with its 630,000 inhabitants, 400,000 of them Jews, a revolutionary committee had immediately been formed, made up of 99 members, 97 Jews, and two Russian imbeciles. The Maknavists also denounced these contradictions when he claimed to be championing the real power of the Soviets yet simultaneously ordered everybody to elect their commissars and then to mobilize carrying out his order while he would look after the rest. Yet the Maknavist proclamation made a distinction between the peasant mass that followed the Ataman, a mass to be regarded not so much as counter-revolutionary as the victim of deception, and it was to be hoped that the healthy revolutionary intuition of the peasants would open their eyes and that they will leave Grigorov and rally again to the banner of revolution. However, the causes behind his revolt also had to be sought in the Bolsheviks coming to Ukraine and the installation of their party dictatorship, accompanied by its sinister shakers, quote, of which Grigorov has made use in his adventure. He is a traitor to the revolution and an enemy of the people, but the party of the Bolshevik communists is every bit as much the workers' enemy. Through its unaccountable dictatorship, it has created among the masses a hatred that currently benefits Grigorov and tomorrow may benefit some other adventurer. Let us again remind the laboring people that its deliverance from oppression, poverty and violence will be secured only by its own efforts. No change of authority will be able to help in that. It is only through their own free organizations of peasants and workers that toilers will arrive at the threshold of social revolution, complete freedom and authentic equality. End quote. As may be seen, the Bolsheviks too were not spared Arid had no special grounds for congratulations on this score. The essential point, though, in their eyes was still that Markno was not turning against them for the moment. A huge number of copies of this proclamation was run off and these were distributed among the peasants and fighters. It was also included in the Maknavist movement's organ, the Road to Freedom, and in the mouthpiece of the Ukrainian anarchist confederation, Nabat, Toxin. Grigorov became the beat noir of Moscow who dispatched against him all of the reinforcements meant for the Southern Front. Worse still, the 1st Red Cossack Regiment, 1,200 horsemen and 8 cannon, and the assault regiment from the Crimea were pulled out of the front lines for use against him. Not everyone accepted the assignment, the Kiev-based 9th Ukrainian regiment refused at the beginning of May to march against him and was duly disarmed and then reformed. Certain units fraternized with the Ataman and defected to his side. He managed to capture Ekaterinoslav but was unable to hold onto it for more than two days. On May 20, by which time Grigorov's failure was apparent, Antonov Ovsinko asked Dubenko to transfer his divisions forthwith to the southern front. He met with a refusal, Dubenko claiming that the Ataman's revolt was still virulent and that the Red Troops had taken heavy losses. This refusal frustrated Antonov Ovsinko who was keen to marshal Dubenko's divisions plus Pokus's detachment as urgently as possible on the southern front, in order to amalgamate them with Markno's. Brigade before entrusting command of the division thus formed to Chikvanaya who was under orders from the party hierarchy. In this way the Batko would have been hemmed in by dependable Bolsheviks and there would have been no further fear of a revolt from that quarter. The politico-strategic consideration of the Red Army's high command were about to confuse the situation to a singular extent and to poison relations with the Maknavists. 16. The Breakdown of the Alliance and the Collapse of the Front 
The whole burden of the Southern Front fell upon the Machnavists who were inadequately equipped with arms and ammunition by the Red Army in spite of the clauses of the Alliance Agreement. Facing them, the Whites had laid the groundwork for a big push in order to shake themselves loose of this front which threatened the left flank of their northbound offensive. At the head of two Cossack divisions from the Cuban and the Tarek, well-armed and well-appointed by the Anglo-French, General Shkuro was in charge of operations. The breach of the front came about almost fortuitously due to a gross error by the command of a Red Division. In his memoirs, Shkuro tells the story thus. Returning to Ilovaisk, I received a report on operations of the 1st Cavalry Division. It transpired that the 1st Regiment of White Partisans had, while advancing, dashed with a substantial force of Reds dug in on the banks of a river fordable only with difficulty. Sustaining heavy losses, the White Partisans had begun to fall back. The Reds decided to give chase and cross the river. At this point, Esaul Solomakin, Commander of the 2nd Regiment of the White Partisans, using his initiative, fell upon the flanks of the Bolsheviks and drove them towards the river. Many Bolsheviks drowned there or were cut down by sabers. We took nearly 1,500 prisoners, several cannon and a quantity of machine guns and munitions. The Reds' front had been pierced. I held my two divisions into the breach, giving them as their objective Yuzovka, which the Caucasus Division was to attack from, the South and the Turk Division from the North. On May 18th a division of tanks, a weapon hitherto not, seen there arrived with General Mimayevsky, Shkuro's superior. I entrusted custody of them to my squadron of wolves. The next day, the Kornilovites, an elite division called after General Kornilov, went on the attack with these tanks and captured Yasinovata. That same day, my division took Yuzovka, taking numerous prisoners, Reds, and Machnavists alike. After having all the communists hanged, I sent all the rest home. Wasting no more time there, we took the railway stations at Chaplino and Volnovaka without great losses. This crucial engagement had not been taken seriously by the Red Army Command and, rather than admit to incompetence, it chose instead to place the blame on Machnavists. But for the time being, Shkuro failed to capitalize upon this breakthrough and the axis of the offensive remained fixed to the north, via Kursk and the road to Moscow. Thus it was not too late to save the southern front which played a vital role in pinning down numerous heavily armed enemy forces over a distance of more than 150 kilometers, forces that were using, for the first time in the civil war, numerous tanks and armored cars, giving them a technical superiority which accounts for Marknos being forced back from the front. What was afoot in the Bolshevik upper echelons at the time? The breakthrough by Shkuro was underestimated and minds were focused instead on the best way of eliminating Markno. There was a breakdown in coordination, Skatchko, commander of the Second Army and Markno's direct superior, took the decision to deploy the Maknovist Brigade as a division. When Antonov Ovsinko vigorously objected, he gave him this account of his rationale, quote, the military revolutionary Soviet of the Second Army is very well aware that Markno's brigade represents a peasant mass awash with petty bourgeois anarchist and left s tendencies, utterly opposed to state communism. Conflict between the Maknovskina and communism is inevitable, sooner or later. Even at the time of the formation of Markno's brigade, the commander of the Second Army issued him with Italian rifles on the reckoning that if need be it would be possible to withhold cartridges from them. But the Second Army's military revolutionary Soviet is persuaded that, until such time as the common enemy of communism and of the revolutionary, albeit petit bourgeois, peasantry, to wit, the reactionary monarchy, will be definitively beaten and until such time as the white volunteer troops will be pushed back towards the Cuban, the Maknovskina's leaders will not march under arms and will not have that opportunity against Soviet power. It is for that reason that we have thus far been able to use Markno's troops in the struggle against the Whites, while converting them internally and gradually into more regular troops better nourished with the spirit of communism. The deployment of Markno's brigade as a division may be tremendously helpful to work within its ranks, for it affords us a pretext for dispatching a large number of our political militants and officers to it. The whole of Gugliai followed Markno. That population supplies him with 20,000 armed partisans who make up his brigade and are now to form a division. 
Trotsky has interpreted the brigade's conversion into a division as an authentic deployment, but that is a mistake. It is only an organizational reshuffle that paves the way for our political militants and military specialists to penetrate the mass of Marknos troops an abrupt change in our policy through cancellation of this. Conversion into a division, endorsed by War Commissar Meslauk for all that, will put Markno on his guard and may well induce him to cease his activities on the front against the whites. Obviously, such a cessation will entail an increase of white pressures upon other parts of the Southern Front and there will be a worsening of the situation overall. Our command will insist upon more strenuous activities from Markno. The latter will begin to allow combat orders to go unheeded and an open breach between him and us will be opened in short order. That would be negative, for the whole second Ukrainian army at present comprises solely of Markno's brigade. Ukrainian units from other armies, all of them drawn from insurgent detachments, will not fight Markno. So, if he is to be liquidated, it would be essential that we are able to call upon at least two complete and well-armed divisions. End quote. The shameful secret stands exposed, the underarming of the Maknavists had been premeditated and had had no purpose other than to bring them to heel. Moreover, all of this whole squabble about deployment or conversion of the Maknavist brigade into a division, which would be laughable were it not for the dramatic civil war setting, had as its common denominator the aim of reducing Markno's influence and then of divesting him utterly of his responsibilities. A prize example of the mentality incipient at this time in these tinpot Bolshevik Machiavellians. Ultimately Antonov Ovsinko carried the day and the redeployment of Markno's brigade as a division was revoked. The Maknavists, who were fighting desperately to contain the push by the Whites and who were in receipt of no assistance from the Reds, grew weary of all this scheming and decided to recover their autonomy and then to set themselves up as an independent insurgent army headed by Markno, retaining only operational ties with the Red Army. This they communicated to the paper Generalissimos, quote, to the commander of the Southern Front, to Front Commander Antonov Ovsinko, to the chairman of the Soviet of People's Commissars Rakovsky, to Commissar for War Meslauk, to Lenin, to the Kremlin in Moscow, to Kamin chairman of the Defense Soviet in Kharkov, the staff of the 1st Insurgent Division, having examined the communique from the Southern Front ordering the 1st Ukrainian Insurgent Division to revert to the status of 3 Road Brigade, expresses its categorical disagreement on this point. It takes profound exception to the unfair treatment mitted out to the insurgent's leader, Comrade Markno, and, furthermore, anticipates that this order will have harmful consequences, perhaps involving countless catastrophes for the revolution at the front and in the rear alike. It is persuaded that it is entitled to spell out the following facts to the Southern Front Command, and to the central authorities of Ukraine and Russia. The insurgent movement in Ukraine began with the desperate engagements of the peasants against exploiters of all sorts, beginning with the hetman and ending with Putlura. With time, it formed regular regiments and manned a broad front against Denikin's counter-revolution. From the earliest days of its existence, Comrade Nestor Markno has been the sole and the indefatigable moving force behind this insurgent movement. He has shown himself to be the natural commander of the brigade, and later of the division raised to that office by the General Commander Congress of Insurgents. All of the eleven insurgent regiments making up the 1st Division of Ukraine regard Comrade Markno as their closest and most natural guide, elevated to that position by all the difficulties on the long road of the revolution. It is absolutely certain that with Markno eliminated from that position, entire brigades will not accept anyone else in his place. There can be no doubt but that. That will also have a fatal impact upon the front and upon the rear guard. This is why the staff of the IST, Ukrainian insurgent division of the so-called Bakho Markno units has determined, to propose to and require of Comrade Markno that he remain in his position of responsibility, despite his attempting to quit it in the light of the situation created. Two, that all eleven infantry regiments, the two cavalry regiments, the two assault groups, the artillery brigade and the other technical units become one independent insurgent army, command thereof being entrusted to Comrade Markno. In operational matters this army will be subject to the command of the Southern Front, to the extent that the latter's operational orders correspond to real requirements of the Revolutionary Front. All operational decisions of the insurgent army are to be communicated directly to the Red Army Command. 
Furthermore, the attention of all central authorities of the Soviet republics of Ukraine and Russia is drawn to the following declaration, Comrade Markno and we all are authentic revolutionaries, fighting for the ideals of social revolution. That is why we regard as offensive to us and intolerable on the part of a revolutionary, Debenko's reservation fraught words regarding Comrade Markno, as uttered in the presence of our delegation, I've given one bandit a thrashing, one more won't be any problem, when the Grigoriev episode found in Comrade Markno a vigorous and inflexible enemy. Three issues of the road to freedom and the special proclamation circulated throughout Ukraine testify to that. Believing in the triumph of the social revolution, in absolute commitment to that from both the officers of the Soviet republics in the persons of Lenin, Lunakarsky and Kaminev, as well as from Comrade Markno and his men, sons of the revolution, the command of the 1st Ukrainian Insurgent Division issues a categorical assurance that all potential misunderstandings regularly generated by false information, from agents of the authorities, can and must be thoroughly dispelled by fraternal means. The staff of the 1st Ukrainian Insurgent Division of the troops known as Bakko Markno's troops. May 29, 1919 in Gulyipoli. End quote. This was a dear and unambiguous stand on all the maneuvers designed to oust Markno from his post. Apparently Markno had wanted to step down lest the situation of the front be compromised, but the insurgents had talked him out of it. The tone of this address was still fraternal and it leaves the door open for any amicable negotiation or accommodation. Thus far the insurgents had scrupulously adhered to the military compact entered into. Their view was that, even if the Bolsheviks were against their operating autonomously, this could only be at the level of ideas and that they would discover some common language, as Lev Kamin had it, and that class solidarity would come into play in the contest against the whites, the loftier interests of the social revolution being placed above the discrepancies of opinion. They were mistaken and the officers of the Soviet republics were about to take it upon themselves to demonstrate so. Seeing their plans frustrated, the leaders, political and military, of the Southern Front were first of all to threaten Markno, quote. The Military Revolutionary Council of the Southern Front signals that Markno's activities and pronouncements are deemed criminal. Bearing responsibility for a given sector of the Second Army's Southern Front, Markno has, by his pronouncements, introduced wholesale disorganization into the administration and the command and then by allowing units to act according to their lights, he betrays the front. Markno must be arrested and brought before the Revolutionary Tribunal. On these grounds the Military Revolutionary Council of the Second Army hereby takes the requisite steps to forestall any possibility of Markno avoiding the merited sanction v. Hittes. A. Kolgayev end quote. On May 31, the Military Revolutionary Soviet of the Gulyipoli region, given the seriousness of the situation, resolved to convene a fourth regional congress of peasants, workers, and fighters from the entire territory under Makhnovist control, 90 districts from the provinces of Ekaterinoslav, the Tavrida, Kherson, Kharkov, and the Donets Basin. The summons stipulated that, only the toiling masses will be able to devise a way out of the situation created and not parties or individuals. The Congress was scheduled for June 15 in Gulyipoli. The conventional representation was one delegate per 3,000 workers or peasants, one representative per insurgent unit or Red Army unit, regiment, division, etc., two delegates for the central staff of the Bakko Markno division and one per brigade staff. The district executive committees were to send along one delegate per faction organizations or parties accepting the basis of the Soviet regime were entitled to one delegate per district branch. Elections would take place at general assemblies. The agenda centered on the following items. A. Reports from the Executive Committee of the Military Revolutionary Soviet and from delegates from the district executive committees. B. Business in hand. C. Purpose, meaning and tasks of the Gulyipoli Regional Soviet. D. Reorganization of the Regional Military Revolutionary Soviet, E. Organization of military tasks in the region, F. The question of provisions, G. The agrarian issue, H. The financial question, I. The unions of peasant laborious and workers, J. Public safety, K. The exercise of justice in the region, L. Other business. 
In this way the Gulyaypoli region's military revolutionary Soviet recalled that it was only the executive arm of the supreme authority of the region, namely the General Congress. As was only normal for revolutionaries who believed that everything had to emanate from below, that the workers and fighters had to handle and regulate their affairs for themselves. That was not the view of Trotsky who had recently arrived in the area which he knew only through the tittle-tattle in party offices. He had already crossed swords with Antonofovsinko over Markno. He found the libertarian effervescence that prevailed in the region and the methods of direct democracy used by the insurgents deeply repugnant, he being so thoroughly imbued with omnipotence of the new state as well as being so full of himself of course. On June 2nd he published this bilious diatribe against Markno. There is Soviet Russia and there is Soviet Ukraine. And alongside, there is still a known state, Gulyaypoli. There the staff of a certain Markno reigns. First of all he commanded a detachment of irregulars and then a brigade and then, it would seem, a division. Finally, today, everything is decked out in the colors of a special rebel white army. Against whom have Markno's rioters risen? That is a question to which a clear and precise answer must be given, an answer in words and an answer in deeds. Markno and his closest confederates consider themselves anarchists and on that basis repudiate all governmental power. Are they in consequence enemies of Soviet power? Apparently so, since Soviet power is the governmental power of the toiling workers and peasants. However, Markno's acolytes have decided not to declare openly that they are against Soviet power. They play it shrewd and avoid the issue, they claim to acknowledge local Soviet authority and, repudiate only the central authorities. Markno's acolytes chant, down with the party, down with, the communists, long live the non-party Soviets. And yet this is only a pitiable lie. Markno and his henchmen are absolutely not non-partisan. They all belong to the anarchist school and issue circulars or letters to all their co-religionists, inviting them to Gulyaypoli, there to organize power of their own. Markno's army is the ugliest face of guerrilla warfare, although it does include a number of good soldiers. It is impossible to discover the merest hint of discipline or order in this army. In this army, commanders are elected. Markno's acolytes chant, down with appointed commanders. Thus, they mistakenly mislead only the most obtuse of their own troops. Only under the bourgeois regime when Tsarist functionaries or bourgeois ministers appointed as they deemed fit commanders who kept the bulk of troops in a state of subjection to the bourgeois classes. Could one speak of appointed commanders? Today we have no power other than that which is elected, by the whole of the working class and toiling peasantry. As a result, commanders appointed by the central Soviet authorities are installed by the will of millions of workers, whereas the commanders of Markno's bands reflect the interests of a tiny anarchist clique dependent on kulaks and obscurantism. The radical change of tone, compared with that of Antonofovsinko is all too obvious, yet it was Antonofovsinko who was the Bolshevik militant of long standing whereas Trotsky was but a recent convert, in 1917, after the return of Lenin in whose nostrils he had not always had the odor of sainthood, Haddon Lenin called him a little Judas, his forehead branded with the crimson of shame. Thus he felt himself compelled systematically to outzell at the most zealous of his new party colleagues, he talked about order and discipline, and railed against election of commanders by the ranks. But who was he trying to fool when he talked of Bolshevik power having been elected by the whole of the working class and toiling peasantry? Did he think he could erase the memory that, in the Constituent Assembly elections of November 1917, his party had taken barely a quarter of the votes. As for the interests of a tiny clique, they were the interests of his party's central committee, a party, which he defended by recourse to calumny. Even Kubinin, the official Soviet historian of the Makhnovskina and not inclined to be considerate of its sensibilities, describes as a typically prickly and venomous phrase, this passage from the firebrand Trotsky scratch the surface a little and one finds Grigoriev. And quite often there is no need to scratch, the rampant kulak bane for the blood of communists, or the small speculator were not long in showing their true colors. The amalgamation with Grigoriev just goes to demonstrate Trotsky's utter ignorance of the situation locally but on the other hand the epithet kulak, 
A fight of fancy here used for the first time against Markno was to enjoy a brilliant future in Bolshevik ideology. This was an original contribution by Trotsky to contemporary socio-political vocabulary. He concluded this his first formal statement of position by stigmatizing the Atamans and straw commanders with this menace. It is high time to have an end of them once and for all so that none may be tempted to start up again, and he promised a response in, word and in deed. Two days later, on June 4, he was at it again in an interview with representatives of the press in Kharkov, he announced to them that a regeneration was crucial and that this would consist mainly of abolishing the independent anarchist Republic of Guliaipoli, for on the Donets front rampages the brigade or army division I do not know how one would describe it of a certain Markno. This fighting unit currently attracts to itself all of the elements of decomposition, decadence, revolt and putrefaction. Markno's bands are even now trying to convene a military Soviet congress of five provinces. It goes without saying that the command will neither accept nor authorize anything of the sort. Meanwhile he discovered that the Fourth Regional Congress had been summoned and he prepared his reply. Asked by a journalist if Kharkov was not under threat from the White Offensive, Trotsky expressed amazement at the posing of such a question, for he reckoned that Kharkov was no more under threat than Moscow, Tver or any other city of the Soviet Republic. He was utterly oblivious of the danger represented by Denikin and was concerned only with neutralizing Markno. That same day he issued his reply to the convening of the Guliaipoli Congress, his celebrated Order No. 1824, wherein he declared that this Congress is wholly directed against Soviet power in Ukraine and against the organization of the Southern Front of which the Markno Brigade is a part. Its outcome could not but be the delivery of the, quote, front to the whites, in the face of whom Markno's brigade does nothing but retreat due to his incompetence and the criminally treacherous tendencies of his commanders. 1. The aforementioned Congress is hereby prohibited and cannot in any event be countenanced. 2. The entire peasant and worker population should be cautioned orally and in writing that participation in this Congress will be deemed high treason against the Soviet Republic and the Soviet Front. 3. All delegates to the above-mentioned Congress should immediately be placed under arrest and hauled before the Revolutionary Court Martial of 14th, formerly 2ND, Army of Ukraine. 4. All who circulate the appeals of Markno and the Guliaipoli Executive Committee should be arrested. End quote. Trotsky signed this as President of the Republic's Military Revolutionary Soviet, which gave him full powers in Ukraine. He had recalled Antonovsinko and it was his replacement, Vatsitis, a Latvian Tsarist ex-colonel who countersigned this order as front commander. This document, which Arshinov regards as a classic, recommending that it be memoized by heart, was followed up on June 6 by order of the day number 107, which confirmed the foregoing order and specifically stipulated the punishment due. Firing squad. It is worth reprinting in its entirety. Gathered around the irregular Markno, a band of individuals has set out on the same road as the traitor Grigoriev and has hatched a plot against Soviet power. This gang from Guliaipoli has dared schedule for June 15 a Congress of Anarchist and Kulak delegates in order to struggle against the Red Army and Soviet authorities. That Congress is banned. Let me announce that any possible participant in this Congress will be deemed a traitor, guilty of conspiring in the immediate rear of our troops and of opening the gates to the enemy. Markno invites runaways from other armies and units to join him. I hereby order, all military authorities and blockade detachment deployed in accordance with my instructions to seize all such traitors who voluntarily quit their units to join Markno and to produce them before the Revolutionary Tribunal as deserters so that they may stand trial in accordance with the laws in force in time of war. Their punishment can only be the firing squad. The Pan-Russian Central Executive Committee of Russia and Ukraine has charged me to restore order on the front in the Donetsk Basin and in its immediate rear. I hereby proclaim that order will be restored with a mailed fist. Enemies of the workers and peasants Red Army, profiteers, kulaks, rioters, henchmen of Markno or of Grigoriev are to be eliminated without quarter by staunch reliable regular units. Long live the revolutionary order discipline and struggle against the enemies of the people. Long live the Soviet Union and Soviet Russia. 
Here Trotsky is using the language beloved of all fans of the strong arm, of defenders of the established order, plot, gangs, punishment, firing squad, and mailed fist. There is, however, one novelty, this time the established order professes to be revolutionary and proletarian and addresses itself to the very people it professes to represent, the peasants and workers. In short, it seeks to forbid them from taking their affairs into their own hands, banning revolutionaries from making revolution. An unappetizing mentality this, which unfortunately holds out the promise of an exemplary future. Here Trotsky was applying new psychological warfare methods in a revolutionary setting, deliberate lying, misrepresentation, ideological dismissal, guilt by association, all these ingredients were henceforth to add spice to the cuisine of hegemonic power. However, if Trotsky indulged himself in this sort of behavior and bade at anyone daring to question his decisions, it was because he knew he had the support of Lenin who certainly had no desire to allow this region to organize itself autonomously and escape from his direct control, militarily as well as politically speaking. Otherwise, that example might prove unduly contagious. The answer in words now completed, that only left the answer in deeds, and this was not long in coming. Three peasants, Kostin, Polyan, and Dobrolubov, taken in the very act of discussing the convening of the Gulyai Regional Congress, were hauled before the tribunal of the 14th Army and shot on the spot for just that. And to cap it all, these famous orders were not even conveyed directly to the Maknavist insurgents who in any case had their work cut out with the Whites. Following the breakthrough achieved on May 17, Shkuro returned to Debortsevo where he had to assist the Don Cossack general, Kalinin, who had also broken through the Red Front and seized Lugansk. As a result, the front facing Markno remained stationary. According to Antonov Ovsinko, it was because he had received neither the military supplies nor reinforcements, which had been dispatched against Grigoriv, that Markno was unable to withstand the attack by Shkuro's cavalry at Yuzovka. Even Skachko, the Second Army's commander, realized on May 21 that an infantry brigade was urgently needed to repair the breach, as well as artillery and cavalry. Markno's division was in dire need of cartridges and artillery shells. It was obvious that under the new politico-military approach introduced by Trotsky, resupplying of the insurgents was no longer on, indeed, quite the opposite. So, what was happening with the Maknavists? Was it perhaps in order to demonstrate their revolutionary bona fides yet again, or maybe because they underestimated their adversaries? Whatever the case may have been, they mounted a counter-attack against Yuzovka and drove out General Mimayevsky's troops, the general called in Shkuro, this time assigning him the task of mopping up the Maknavist front. Quote, At this point, probably the beginning of June, Markno again went on the offensive against Mimayevsky's corps and forced it to quit Yuzovka. I was assigned the task of attacking the Maknavists. Doubling back I rested Yuzovka before marching on Marupol which I attacked and captured along with General Vinogradov's mixed volunteer army detachment. Leaving the 1st Tarek Division to support the volunteer army corps entrusted by Mimayevsky to General Kutyepov who had already captured Bakhmut and was closing on Kharkov, I along with the 1st Caucasus Division undertook an attack upon the Maknavists' capital and repository for their booty the township of Guliaipoli. This I took after bitter fighting and the remainder of the Maknavists were wiped out or scattered, whereupon, I put the important railway junction of Sinelnikovo to the torch. End quote. According to Arshinov, prior to Shkuro's attack, the Bolsheviks had left the stretch of the front which they were holding at Grishino, north of Markno's front, unmanned, and it was precisely through there that Shkuro had poured in to take the whole Maknavist division from the rear. However, several days previously the insurgents had warned the Red Army's headquarters of this weak point, also, whether due to incompetence or deliberately the Bolshevik command had failed to make good the deficiency, leading to the front's collapse. Again, according to Arshinov, Trotsky allegedly had declared that it was better that the whole Ukraine be surrendered to Denikin than that the Maknovskina be allowed to develop further. Denikin's movement, being openly counter-revolutionary, will still be susceptible to decomposition from within by means of class agitation, whereas the Maknovskina is spreading into the depths of the masses and in turn raises the masses against us. Such reasoning was not at all surprising, 
It was a pompous variation upon Lenin's line about whoever is not with us is against us. The military alliance had lasted four full months and had been used only in a one-sided way by Moscow. Now that the Maknavist front had buckled, it could be abjured at the earliest opportunity, in the most profitable manner available. Shkuro's offensive caught the insurgents by surprise and forced them to fall back 100 kilometers in a single day, abandoning Marupol. Despite a desperate defense, Markno even had to give up Guliaipoli, overwhelmed by the Cossack flood. It was at this juncture that he learned of Trotsky's orders of some days before an outright declaration of war. He put his head together with his staff and decided to focus on the most pressing task, i.e., containing the white onslaught as best he could. Seeing that he personally was the bugbear of the Bolshevik high command, he decided to resign his posts inside his division for the sake of the overriding interests of the revolution. He reckoned that this was the only way to avert the opening of a second front and being caught in a pincer movement that the insurgents had no way of withstanding. He dispatched a telegram to Trotsky to inform him of his decision. Trotsky's reply was prompt, in the shape of an order of the day on June 8. Have done with Markno. Who bears the responsibility for our latest reverses on the southern front, notably in the Donets Basin? Markno and his gangs. In words, this clique fights the whole world and annihilates all enemies, however, when it comes to the real fight, the commanders of these troops shamelessly abandon positions entrusted to them and quite simply fall back over several dozen versts. Markno's brigade contained a number of good and faithful fighters. Even with regular organization of supplies and leadership, and above all in the absence of internal discipline or sensible command, Markno's units have shown themselves incapable of weathering the slightest combat, the white cavalry drove them before it like a flock of sheep. The bigwigs of Guliaipoli went even further. For June 15 they scheduled a congress of the military and peasant units of five regions so as to give battle openly against Soviet power and the established order in the Red Army. We can no longer tolerate our continued humiliation at the hands of this gang which has lost all following. If we leave Markno to pursue his plans, we will be faced with a fresh rebellion along the lines of Grigorov's, which would spring from its nest in Guliaipoli. This is why the central military authorities have categorically banned the Congress and dispatched trustworthy and loyal units to restore order in the region where Markno is rampant. Today that criminal outbreak is ended. Markno and his adjutants have been ousted. Markno's rebellion is in the process of liquidation. It is true that many profiteers and bandits professing loyalty to Markno still remain in different units, and are trying to reach to Guliaipoli, there is no discipline there and no obligation to fight honestly, against enemies of the toiling people and thus a paradise on earth for cowards and good-for-nothings. The balance of power being at this point tilted in his favor, Trotsky made maximum use of it, he accused Markno and his companions of every sort of evil doing, taking care to accept a number of good fighters, for there was always a use for cannon fodder. After having contrived to minimize and sabotage provisions and munitions to the insurgents, he laid the blame for shortages on the absence of regular organization of supplies and leadership, and above all of internal discipline and sensible command, by which is meant the absence of Czechist methods and Tsarist ex-officer military experts taken on in massive numbers by Moscow. The resignation of Markno and his staff was willfully misconstrued, they have been ousted. This was the apogee of Trotsky's whole campaign against Markno and the Guliaipoli region. Had these been only the bombast of the Salon or of some party meeting, no great harm would have been done, but in reality the fact was that his answer in deeds turned out to be the ransacking of the Rosa Luxemburg Libertarian Commune, the arrest and execution of several dozen insurgents, sordid police operations carried out by, according to Trotsky, trustworthy and loyal units, which is to say Czechists pressing on with the liquidation of rebellion, and all this behind Maknavists who were standing up to the Cossack flood of Shkuro. The most cynical and ignominious part of this declaration related to Guliaipoli which it dubbed paradise on earth for cowards and good-for-nothings, when at that very moment the local peasants were hastily putting together a detachment of several dozen men, armed with axes, pitchforks and shoddy rifles, led by Veritelnikov, a worker from the great Putilov plant in Petrograd, albeit born in Guliaipoli, they went off in search of the whites. 
they were cut down by sabers where they stood while defending their land and liberty, while seeking to avert violation of their wives, sisters, or mothers, not that that counted for much with Trotsky. But such statements of position represent an indelible blemish for their author. Skatcho was replaced as head of the Second Army renamed the 14th by Voroshilov, to whom was also entrusted the task of seizing Markno and his staff. Alerted in time, Markno sent a rather lengthy explanation to Trotsky, Lenin, and Kaminv on June 9. He repeated his request to relinquish his post to someone else, he protested against the press campaign unleashed against him and tarring him with the same brush as Grigorov. He refuted the charges ventilated by Trotsky concerning the Maknavists' hostile intent towards the Soviet Republic, he reaffirmed his belief in the inalienable right of workers and peasants, a right won by revolution, to themselves organize congresses to discuss and decide upon their private and general affairs. That is why the central authorities' prescription of such congresses, and the declaration pronouncing them unlawful, Order No. 1824, are a direct and shameless infringement of the workers' rights. Markno realized that he himself was the target, and, given the overall situation, rather than set up an anti-Bolshevik front he preferred to step down. It is interesting here to look at the later explanation that he was to give of this evolution in the military alliance concluded with the Red Army. Quote, the Makhnovskina concluded an alliance with the Bolsheviks, in 1919, under which they were to supply it with arms and munitions, in return for which the Makhnovist movement was subordinated to the supreme command of the Red Army. That alliance was broken by the Bolsheviks on the one hand, through their police tactics towards the working population of the Makhnovist region which had set about freely constructing its social and economic life while dispensing with the oversight of Bolshevik party and the Bolshevik state, and, on the other hand, through their sabotaging of arms and munitions supplies which often led to Maknavists throwing themselves into the attack against Denikin with only five cartridges per rife, and, in the event of success against the enemy, to their seizing his munitions, or in the event of failure, to sustaining countless losses and beating a retreat, leaving behind thousands of wounded as hostages. The Maknovskina opted to combat this Bolshevik cynicism by one, temporarily withdrawing from the high command of its armed forces, beginning with myself, and two, placing all its armed forces back under the supreme command of the Bolsheviks, three, painstakingly monitoring closely and from afar all their operational activities, the object being to verify that these are compatible with the great tasks of the revolution. And so Markno stepped down from his position of command and handed over to his successor, appointed by Trotsky, all divisional papers and documents and then, along with his closest colleagues, the ones most compromised in Bolsheviks' eyes, as well as with personal escort, he quit the front while expressing his intention of harrying the whites in their rear. En route, an odd incident occurred, Trotsky was so delighted during the first few days after my departure from the insurgent movement, that he was at a loss to know what to do next. When he regained his composure, he ordered Voroshilov, commander of the 14th Army to seize Markno, no matter what the cost, and to bring him alive to headquarters. Unfortunately for Trotsky, in the Red Army there were some divisional commanders, Bolshevik ones who, as soon, as they had read this order, reported the matter to me immediately. And so Voroshilov was unable to lay hands on me. Indeed, he and his gang of Czechists came within an ace of perishing themselves. Denikinists surrounded their armed train, the Rudnev. It was I who had to dispatch for machine gunners and a squad of cavalry to them in order to rescue my would-be executioners, at a time when I had already resigned my command and was en route to the front along with a small detachment. And so Voroshilov's armored train and his band of Czechists were extracted from that danger. I can remember just how happy Voroshilov was about this, and how he thanked me through my aide de camp. He also had delivered to me a message in which he expressed his esteem for me and insistently urged me to come and see him so that, together, we might look into a whole series of plans with an eye to the struggle ahead. My reply to him was, I am aware of Trotsky's order and the part assigned to you, comrade Voroshilov, but that order is a matter for your own conscience. Which is why I regard it as impossible that I should come and examine with you what you have suggested, plans for the future struggle. Let me tell you mine, 
it is my intention to strike deep into Denikin's rear and cause havoc. This is extremely important now that he is engaged in a great general offensive. Your old friend in the struggle for the triumph of the revolution. June 15, 1919. Back home Mark no. The following night, this same Voroshilov issued orders for the arrest of the members of my staff, Mikhailov Pavlenko and Berbiga, and had them shot the day after that. End quote. Some people may find Markno's devotion to the revolution excessive, if it led him to rescue the killer squad dispatched to capture him. In his defense, it might be said that he did not then know Voroshilov and could not but doubt that Voroshilov would be capable of having Mikhailov Pavlenko and Berbiga put to death. As he had said, he had had dealings with honest Bolsheviks who had tipped him off about what was being hatched against him and he was not yet in a position to generalize. Also, he was not the sort to make Olympian pronouncements like Trotsky, as a simple man, he was committed body and soul to the social revolution. For him no alternative was conceivable, Denikin's hordes had to be contained. Trotsky was unscrupulous, he had Osarov, Markno's official chief of staff and a one-time Cossack officer and non-party revolutionary appointed by Antonov Ovsinko, arrested. Ozerov was to be tried before a Czechist court on July 25 with the sinister Latsis, presiding and was shot on August 2, 1919. Active member of Markno staff, Mikhailov Pavlenko, an engineer and dose friend of Markno had, as we have seen, been arrested and shot on June 17. On the same day the Kharkov Extraordinary Court Martial sentenced six Guliai peasants, Berbiga, Olesnik, Korobko, Kostin, Polyun and Dobra Lubov, to the same fate on charges of having sought to convene a counter-revolutionary congress. The last three named had already been executed, so the sentence merely placed a formal seal upon the fate accompli. Markno's conduct had been improvised, in view of the circumstances, he had not had time to consult all insurgents. The latter, as soon as they learned of his having been outlawed and of Trotsky's attitude, insisted that their commanders take them to Markno so that together they could determine what to do next, to remain under the command of these red imbeciles, outright traitors to the revolution, or to wage against these criminal red cretins a struggle every whit as fierce as that against Denikin. Even other frontline divisions and brigades, including the Lenin Brigade, once they learned of the outlawing of Markno demanded in resolutions passed at general assemblies to be placed under Markno's command, for around them they saw naught but traitors to the revolution. Trotsky, who was charged with treachery, could devise nothing better than to openly promise impunity and reward to whoever would kill Markno. Throughout this whole campaign against the Maknovists, he had overlooked one essential factor, the scale of the Denikinist threat. Soon it was too late to react, as the whole of the eastern Ukraine fell into the clutches of white generals. Ekaterinoslav fell on June 12, Kharkov two weeks later. Thus was the front, so valiantly held for over six months by Maknovist insurgents that the cost of heroic sacrifices, sabotaged and delivered to the enemy by Trotsky and his cronies. 17. Grigoriev, Dybets, Yakir, Slashev and the rest. In the small detachment accompanying Markno were his comrades from the early days, militants from the Guliaipoli anarchist group and founders, along with Markno, of the insurrection in September 1918, men who never left his side, men such as Alexei Mochenko, Semyon Koretnik, Petya Lyuti, Fedor Schuss and Nestor's brother, Grigory Markno. There was also the Black Sotnia, sometimes called the Kropotkin Guard or the Devil's Sotnia, comprising of between 100 and 150 intrepid horsemen and some expert machine gunners mounted on some tachankas, all of them utterly dedicated to the cause. When they reached the outskirts of Alexandrovsk which was threatened by Denikin's outriders, the local Bolshevik boss, although a U fate with the breakdown between his party and the insurgents, besought them to defend the town and the sector of the front between there and Melitopol so as to let Dibenko's Crimean army extricate itself from the trap and take refuge on the right bank of the Dnieper. They refused, for on the one hand, they did not have enough men, and on the other, they wanted a formal request from the Bolshevik leadership, acknowledging their own stupidity in having outlawed the Maknovists. 
Their refusal earned Markno and his companions further denunciation as outlaws and enemies of the regime. At this point Markno's little band was joined by some groups of insurgents who had found themselves cut off following the capture of Marupol and who had had to carve a passage for themselves across white-occupied territory. In this fashion, he put together a new insurgent contingent several thousand strong. The Denikinists committed outrages, putting the Guliaipoli region to the torch and the knife, butchering recalcitrant peasants, violating the women, 800 in Guliaipoli and brought back the former estate owners and kulaks thirsting for revenge. Thus began the exodus of a huge number of peasants along with their families, with their meager belongings in tow. A vast cortege snaked across dozens of kilometers, runaways making towards their natural defenders, the Maknavist insurgents. Meanwhile, incapable of resisting the Denikinist onslaught, the Bolshevik leaders decided to give up on Ukraine and concerned themselves solely with pulling out their troops with as much of their supplies and equipment as possible, back to the light bank of the Dnieper. They seized the chance to carry out a purge among the Red troops, they hunted down Maknavist units, disarming them, shooting certain individuals and then reassigning the rest to more dependable units. Faced with this situation, Markno gave up on his initial plan to infiltrate into the enemy's rear he decided to retreat towards the west, to the Dnieper's right bank. This brought him into the territory controlled by the Ataman Grigoriv. The Ataman had been sorely tried by the battles with Dibenko but still retained several thousand men and successfully conducted harrying operations against the Bolsheviks for whom he thenceforth nourished an implacable hatred. He accused them of deceiving the people, to be sure, but arguing on the basis of the many Jews belonging to Soviet bodies, he systematically equated Jews and Bolsheviks. His units were credited with several pogroms, massacres, against Jews and, to a lesser extent, against Russians, especially in the Elisavetgrad population. 76,000, a third of them Jewish, where 3,000 people perished. He was careful not to make any formal statement or to criticize such killings, he stood idly by. What made the thing even more complex was the fact that there were some Jews among his troops. The Maknavists tried to skirt this new reef, Grigoriv enjoyed the support of the poor peasants, which is to say, of the same social class as they did. Secretly they set up a commission of inquiry into the outrages and the contacts which they suspected he had with Denikinists. In July there was a meeting between representatives of the two movements. After a day's discussions, a draft agreement was reached, the two contingents would amalgamate. Grigoriv would assume military command whereas Markno would see to the political leadership of the new army. On July 27, a great meeting in Sentovo drew 20,000 partisans from both camps. Grigoriv was the first to speak, he called for all-out war against the Bolsheviks and hinted at possible alliance with the Whites. Alexei Chubenko, one of the members of the Maknavist staff, spoke next and publicly damned contacts with the Whites, for the Maknavists had meanwhile intercepted some Denikinist emissaries and thus had the proof. Next, Chubenko accused Grigoriv of responsibility for pogroms against Jews before closing his address by violently condemning the counter-revolutionary aspect of the activities of this warlord. Grigoriv demanded an explanation, the two staffs withdrew to the hall of the local Soviet. There Grigorov made to draw his revolver to shoot Markno but was beaten to it by Chubenko who gunned him down with a pocket revolver concealed in the palm of his hand. The Maknavists then explained and justified what they had done before an assembly convulsed by this brutal denouement. Some of Grigorov's partisans were recruited by Markno. Grigorov's death was reported by telegram to the Kremlin. Kubanin comments that with this act, Markno's political actions earned themselves very great prestige in the eyes of the left social revolutionaries and anarchists. The revolutionary honor of Ukrainian petty bourgeois circles was satisfied. In any event, as far as the Bolsheviks were concerned, Markno had removed a real thorn in their sides. Here again he had not had much option, for in the short term, Grigoriv would probably have betrayed him in favor of the Whites. Some of the Ataman's troops were later recruited by the Red Army and were to prove implacable adversaries of the Maknavists, exacting revenge for the death of their former leader. As for the Bolsheviks,
they persisted in keeping a judicious distance between their positions on the right bank of the Dnieper and those of the Whites. Their main preoccupation was with disciplining former Machnavist units renamed the 58th Division and comprising three brigades, which is to say nearly 15,000 well-armed men in all, representing a tremendous unused fighting force. The former anarcho-syndicalist Dybets had his work cut out as political commissar, then took it into his head to enforce order on the insurgent units, although he had absolutely no experience of combat against the whites, having been content to watch the outcome of engagements from a distance. From then on he committed himself to his neo-Bolshevik activities. Finding the Melitopol regiment unduly independent and rather too Zaporog for his taste, he spent a week looking for troops to bring them to heel and disarm them. All the other regiments in the division refused, of course, to take on their brothers in arms. Finally in Kherson, Dybets located a detachment of sailors and Spartacus Germans, in all some 700 heavily armed, machine guns and artillery, men whom he dragged along without actually explaining the aim of the expedition to them. Once they were in place, he gave them to understand that a mutinous regiment had quit the front and was refusing to fight. Whereupon the detachment fell upon the Melitopol insurgents who were in battle readiness but in the last analysis reluctant to shoot their own. As a result they were disarmed and redeployed, and some were shot. This sensational action stopped right there as far as Dybets was concerned, for the Red Army's high command decided to cut its losses on the Ukrainian front and ordered the division to fall back to Kiev and central Russia. The Kremlin opted to recall these troops, for redeployment in its own defences, for Denikin's push against Moscow was developing apace. The ex machnavists found this retreat unacceptable, they had no intention of abandoning their native districts to the whites and indeed were itching to liberate them. According to the policy prescribed at the time when Markno had resigned his command, several machnavist ex-commanders had remained at their posts, people like Kalashnikov, Demensi, Budinov, Klein, and seeing that the Bolsheviks were not acting in the revolution's interests, they reasserted the freedom of their movements, arresting the Bolshevik commanders and political commissars, including Dybets, before delivering nearly the whole division to Markno at the railway station in Pomoshnaya. En route, the punitive detachment of sailors and Spartacists was routed, thus settling that particular score. At the end of August, Markno's 700 horsemen and 3,000 infantry joined up with dissident units from the Red Army in Pomoshnaya. The Machnavist insurgent army was reconstituted into three infantry brigades mounted on Tachankis, one cavalry brigade, under Schuss's command, an artillery division, a machine gunner regiment and Markno's Black Guard, in all, some 20,000 fighters. Many of Grigoriev's former soldiers were discharged for insubordination, for they had been infected with antisemitism and were bereft of any revolutionary consciousness. Dybets was sentenced to be shot by the Machnavist staff, but Markno, under pressure from anarchists who had joined his movement, pardoned him and sent him packing along with his wife Rosa. Among the anarchists who had thrown their lot with the insurgents were members of the Nabat Confederation, including Volein who had been taken prisoner by the Petli Eurists and had been rescued by a Machnavist detachment specially dispatched for the purpose. A contingent of whites put ashore at Odessa had put the Czechists and Bolsheviks to flight, the latter had so distinguished themselves by their sinister practices that they could expect no support from the populace. They linked up with the 45th Infantry Division commanded by Yarkir who intended to fall back towards Kiev, over 500 kilometers away. However, many local insurgents joined Yarkir who thus had considerable strength at his disposal, in the 45th Division 7,500 infantry, 500 cavalry, 81 machine guns, and 34 cannon, the remnants of the 58th Divisions and various units 6,500 infantry, 48 machine guns, 14 cannon, and 400 cavalry, a total of nearly 17,500 well-armed and equipped men on the run before the 34th White Infantry Division which had just 1,500 infantry, 300 cavalry, 12 cannon and 43 machine guns. In his memoirs, Yakir explains that he had to fight his way through, being surrounded by enemies on every side, whites to the south and east, petli Eurists to the west, and Markno, whose influence he feared might disintegrate his troops. It was primarily the proximity of Markno that worried him, 
for he wanted at all costs to avoid the misadventure that had befallen the 58th Division. In fact their two most of the Red Troops who came from the region could not understand this part of Ukraine's being surrendered without a fight, and their sympathies were with Markno. One of the Bolshevik leaders, Golubenko, called Markno on the telephone and suggested that they fight alongside one another, but under the command of Red officers of course. Markno answered him, you have broken faith with Ukraine, and more seriously, you shot my comrades in Guliaipoli. Your units will be defecting to me in any case, and then I will deal with all of you officials the same way that you dealt with my comrades. That being the situation, Bolshevik officials sought the best way of avoiding all truck with the Maknovists, while saving themselves from their vengeance, especially since, quite, apart from Czechists who had every reason to be fearful, their ranks included party militants and red military chiefs of some renown, like Fetko, Kotovsky and Zatonsky. And there were several military experts, Tsarist ex-officers who had gone over to the Leninist regime, like Readmiral Nemitz, one-time commander of the Black Sea Fleet, Nyagnitsky, Karkovy, VV Popov and many another. All had something to reproach themselves within their dealings with the Maknovist insurgents or the Whites, unable to rely upon their troops to fight Markno, the only option left to them was flight. On Nemitz's advice, the decision was made to effect the retreat through open countryside keeping clear of the railway tracks and usual routes. To this end, all of the division's armoured trains were dynamited in Nikolaev and Berzula, in spite of the opposition from their crews who wanted to join Markno. Military equipment and even spare shells were destroyed, not without difficulty as Yaku notes. It required a campaign of explanation and agitation conducted intensively by the party organization and followed up by recourse to extreme repressive measures to ensure that every red soldier clearly understood his task and applied all his will to the accomplishment of this duty. Oddest of all was the presence within this red army of the 3,000th strong partisan detachment of the anarchist A.V. Mokrasov who thus blithely accepted this shameful fact when it would have taken only an arrangement with the Maknovists to mount a powerful joint counter-offensive against the Whites and to drive them far back again. One appreciates the extent to which Bolsheviks had already identified the interests of the revolution with their party's dominant and uncontested position in the conduct of operations then they managed to attract to them anarchists and revolutionaries of other denominations by exploiting the bogeyman of reaction in order to contrive a closing of the ranks. We have another telling illustration of this obnoxious policy in the mutiny by the commander of the Army Corps of the Red Don Cossacks, Mironov, at around the same time, in August 1919. Mironov could not stomach the fluctuations and dictates of Moscow and decided to take on both Denikin and the Red Army. In an order of the day he announced to his troops that he was assuming responsibility for the welfare of the nation in the battle against the Whites, a responsibility which the Soviet authorities were not in a position to assume, and then he concluded, quote, In order to save the revolution's gains only one course remains now, overthrow of the power of the Communist Party, for the causes of the country's ruination one has to look to the quite villainous actions of the government party, the party of the Communists, who have aroused against them the indignation and general discontent of the toiling masses. All land to the peasants. All factories and workshops to the workers. All power to the toiling people, embodied by genuine Soviets of worker, peasant and Cossack deputies. Down with the autocracy of leaders and the bureaucracy of commissars and communists. End quote. Mironov was well aware that the Reds' military reverses were connected with their exactions against the masses of the people and could envisage no way out other than authentic representation of those masses through freely elected Soviets. His mutiny soon petered out, on the pretext of negotiations, the Chika seized him and tossed him in jail, but the authorities freed him under an amnesty because of his military capability and deployed him against the Whites, eventually having him shot after Rangel was defeated. Yakir's retreat began in mid-August and was to last for 21 days before his army linked up with the 44th Red Division near Kiev. Along the way it fought some engagements against Pediura, against whom those regiments reputedly favorably disposed towards Markno were deployed, while Czechist and other more dependable troops faced Markno. Aside from a skirmish in Pomoshnaya, there was no armed dash with the Maknovists. 
Microsoft saved the expedition by capturing the entire staff of the strongest pediatrist division. This flight by Bolshevik troops left the field to three adversaries, Markno, Putlera, and the Whites. The Whites, in view of the ease with which they had advanced thus far, made a gross strategical mistake, instead of digging in along the line of the odessa nikolaeva lisevetgrad front thereby protecting the vast territories they had occupied in the eastern Ukraine, they took it into their heads to tackle Markno and Putlura simultaneously. Yet they had only 15,000 men at their disposal, well-armed and equipped men constantly resupplied from their bases in the rear to be sure, but not enough, even so for a mission on this scale. The bulk of their forces, 150,000 men, were engaged around Kursk in the main thrust against Moscow. To begin with, the Petlyurists ran from a fight, hoping to come to some accommodation on the basis of independence for Ukraine. Also, all the White Guard units converged on the Voznesensk Elisavetgrad area held by Maknovists. The Denikinist staff was inclined to be dismissive of the latter. Given the collapse suffered by their Marupoluzovka front in May and June, the real reasons for which had thus far escaped the Whites. This is how General Slashev, in charge of operations, was later to sum up the situation, quote. Pediura was playing it cool and sitting on the fence. That left just one typical bandit, Markno, who kowtowed to no power and fought them all in turns. The only thing that could be said in his credit was his ability quickly to raise and to keep his troops well under control, even enforcing a quite severe discipline on them. It was for this reason that engagements against him always took a serious turn, his mobility, his energy, and his flair in mounting operations brought him a whole series of victories over the armies he confronted. This expertise in conducting operations did not reflect the education that he had received and it was for this reason that a legend was created about a colonel of the German general staff, who even had a name, Kleist, who helped him and directed operations. According to this tale, Markno complimented Kleist's military expertise with his indomitable will and his perfect knowledge of the local population. It is hard to tell to what extent any of this is true, but the incontrovertible fact is that Markno did know how to run operations, displayed uncommon organizational capabilities, and was able to influence a significant portion of the local population which backed him and enlisted in his ranks. As a result, Markno appeared as a very redoubtable adversary and was deserving of quite special attention on the part of the Whites, especially if one considers their comparatively small numbers and the scale of the tasks facing them. The White Staffs, however, regarded his liquidation as a secondary matter in spite of all indications from leaders of the units directly engaged against him and at first they devoted all of their attention only to Putlura. This blind spot on the part of the main staff in Taganrog and the one in Odessa was cruelly endorsed several times over. End quote. For the record we may note this legend of the German Colonel Kleist which goes to show just how incapable graduates of the military academy, caught up in their military art, were of suspecting that such gifts could be discovered in a mere peasant and one devoid of army training at that. All the same, let us take note of the especial regard in which he was held by a brilliant staff general like Slashev who subsequently defected to the Reds and became an instructor at the Red Army's Higher Military Academy. The first engagement came on August 20 in the vicinity of the Pomoshnai railway station, when the 5th Infantry Division sent in pursuit of Yakir's contingent which had decamped at all speed, ran into Markno. For the Whites this meant an initial disagreeable surprise. They were beaten back with serious losses, losing a number of armored trains including the famous Invincible. Over the days that followed the front line settled across a distance of about 80 kilometers, ranging from Elisavetgrad to the outskirts of Pomoshnaya. Frequent incursions by Maknavist cavalry wrought havoc in the enemy rear. The Whites regrouped their forces, the 5th Division, put to the test and demoralized, dug in around Elisavetgrad along with the 4th Division and the 30-40th Division's mixed brigade, or a total of 5,000 men, 2,000 of them cavalry, with 50 cannon and numerous machine guns at their disposal. Slashev planned to bypass Markno on his left flank at Olviopol so as to cut off possible supplies of munitions from Putlera, and then on his right flank in order to break the cordon around Elisavetgrad, head off any breach in the front through there and drive Markno back towards the north and west. 
As his spearhead he used the officers' regiments from Simfropol and Lubinsk. The Whites' push began on September 5th, they occupied Arbuzinka and Konstantinovka, without a shot being fired. Markno recaptured them in a counter-offensive. In the days that followed the Whites ensconced themselves in Arbuzinka again and took 300 prisoners. The Maknavists surrendered when they ran out of bullets, rightly despairing for they knew to expect no mercy from their conquerors, the general rule at the time was not to encumber oneself with prisoners. The death of ammunition and shells in these engagements accounts for the success of the Whites, for they were assured of a continual flow of supplies from their base in Voznesensk. Arshinov writes that at this time two out of every three Maknavist attacks were mounted for the purpose of capturing enemy munitions. This was all too obvious on September 6 when Maknavist infantry attacked Pomoshnaya with the support of several armored trains, while Markno himself at the head of his cavalry attacked the Whites in their rear at Nikolivka and carried off their ammunition wagons. The Whites dug in at Pomoshnaya. In the days that followed the Maknavist cavalry repeated its incursions behind enemy lines and inflicted considerable losses. In this way, it pinned them down to their positions, threatening to cut them off from their rear at every attack, it was during these clashes that Petia Lyuti and Nestor's brother, Grigory Markno, lost their lives. Then the fighting shifted eastwards, the other Maknavist contingent attacked and scattered the 5th Division, taking prisoners and carrying off artillery. The White Staff then appointed Slashev to assume sole command of all troops engaged against Markno and ordered him to hold Elisavetgrad at any price. Simultaneously, he launched a two-pronged offensive against the rear of the 2nd Maknavist contingent, thereby rescuing what remained of the 5th Division and against the 1st contingent at Novokrenka. There a Maknavist counter-attack pushed the Whites back as far as their starting positions in Pomoshnaya, the battle cost 300 dead and wounded, all Whites. Slashev writes that at this point the, quote, Maknavists' incursions behind White lines were being mounted with increasing frequency and were sowing panic. The situation became such that attack was extremely onerous, however, the slightest delay in attacking might be fatal, for then Markno would have attacked himself and the white troops, put to the test, would not have been able to hold with the partisans' cavalry in their rear, we had either to fall back immediately in order to capture the Maknavists' forces by night, and thus regain complete freedom of maneuver, or else attack at daybreak. End quote. It was the latter solution that carried the day. Indeed, had the Whites fallen back, Markno would have taken Elisavetgrad and in so doing would have opened up the route back to the left bank of the Dnieper. The next day the Whites attacked at daybreak, their officers leading the way. The startled Maknavists fell back, losing 400 prisoners and three cannon, still short of ammunition. Cognizant of the seriousness of the situation, the Maknavists decided to fall back towards Yuman, to the west and had their armoured trains dynamited. For their brilliant service, men of the 1st Simfropol Officers Regiment received 109 St. George Crosses and seven military medals, their commanding officer, Colonel Gvostokov, was promoted to Major General. Mark Noe himself acknowledged the courage of his white enemies, quote, The Denikinist cavalry was a real cavalry, well deserving of the name. The very numerous cavalry of the Red Army was cavalry in name only. It has never been capable of fighting at those quarters and went into action only when the enemy had been broken up by cannon fire and machine guns. Throughout the Civil War, the Red Cavalry did not once accept an engagement at Sabre Point against the Maknavist cavalry although it outnumbered it at all times. Denikin's Caucasian cavalry regiments and Cossacks were quite a different matter. They were always ready for a sabre fight and always swooped hell for leather upon the enemy, not waiting for cannon fire and machine gun fire to scatter them first. End quote. About this assessment, Arshinov comments, nevertheless, that cavalry came a cropper more than once in its battles against the Maknavists. In their notebooks, captured by the Maknavists, the leaders of the Denikinist regiments repeatedly noted that the war against the cavalry and artillery of the Maknavists was the most horrific and daunting of their whole campaign. According to Arshinov, Markno was particularly impressed by the bravado and contempt for death displayed by the Simfropol and Lubinsk officers' regiments, who fought hardest against him. 
The Magnavists' retreat continued for nearly two weeks, step by step they staggered back, hampered by 8,000 wounded and sick, amid a daily round of fierce fighting. They arrived in the vicinity of the town of Yuman, which was held by petly Eurists who had hitherto remained neutral towards both belligerents. The Magnavists were caught in the middle, so it was with relief that they welcomed the Ukrainian nationalists' offer of neutrality. They evacuated 3,000 of their wounded to Yuman, turned away small partisan groups that lacked any or a sufficiency of weapons, and then dug in in an area 12 kilometers long by 10 kilometers deep, some 30 kilometers outside Yuman. By now the contingent was down to no more than 8,000 men. In order to avoid any equivocation, the Maknavists Military Revolutionary Soviet issued an appeal entitled Who is Petlyura, meant for Petlyurist troops and denouncing the nationalist leader as a champion of the bourgeois classes. The Petlyurists, who knew of what had befallen Grigoriv, took care not to allow their troops to mix with the insurgents. The Whites had stalked the insurgents and resolved to finish them off, they marched on Yuman and denied access to the Maknavists. Thus the latter found themselves hemmed in on three sides, caught in a formidable noose, their retreat had lasted for months and taken them 600 kilometers from their Guliapoli base. This was a critical moment, they were worn down by the incessant battles fought for over a month, were severely short of ammunition, and were outnumbered by a well-armed and supplied enemy who boasted elite troops full of self-confidence and just itching to annihilate them. It was at this point that Markno yet again displayed the measure of his extraordinary gifts as a leader of men, he announced to the insurgents that the retreat carried out thus far had been only a necessary stratagem and that it was now up to them to call the tune. This announcement was a great fillip to the insurgents' lust for battle. On September 22, hostilities resumed. Slashev used his best troops, including the Simfropol officers' regiment, as a battering ram to force the insurgents towards Yuman where he intended to crush them once and for all. This time he was under formal instructions to prosecute the annihilation operation to the finish, no matter the cost. He played all his trump cards, for he was assured of no interference from Putlura. He knew too that Markno was seriously low on ammunition and had been obliged to turn men away, for that very reason. He moved in for the kill, urging his troops to set about the enemy with vigor. Over several days there had been skirmishing around Peregonovka on the very fringes of the Maknavists. The village was taken and retaken by both sides. Markno must have made a thorough study of the battlefield for he had deployed his units in the woods and on the heights around Peregonovka which itself served, as it were, as bait, he waited until the whites had committed themselves before rooting them from behind. The topography lent itself readily to his design, in this part of Ukraine, the steppe is corrugated by rather deep ravines not visible at a distance. The final battle began on the morning of September 26, waves of Maknavist infantry attacked enemy positions to the east, while insurgent cavalry destroyed the Litovsk regiment to the west, before tackling the 1st Simfropol officers' regiment from behind, as planned, routing it. Arshinov, an eyewitness and party to the scene, relates how the battle peaked at 8 a.m. in a veritable hail of gunfire. Maknavist foot soldiers began to give ground and fell back as far as Peregonovka, pursued by the whites who poured in from everywhere. Every member of the insurgent staff, the cultural section and the women from the medical services, took up rifles and began to shoot their way through the village streets, it looked like the end. Suddenly there was a falling off of the enemy gunfire and charges before they petered out altogether. What was going on? It was as if the enemy had been swept away by a hurricane. It was Markno and his black Sotnia who had vanished at nightfall the previous day, outflanked the enemy positions, and, just at the crucial moment, had thrown themselves into an irresistible charge. The Bakko is in front. Bakko wielding his saber, cried the insurgents, hurling themselves upon the enemy with the energy of ten times their numbers. This was those quarter combat of incredible violence, a hacking as the Maknavists would say. The Whites were stunned, made an orderly retreat for some minutes and then broke up in disarray, setting the pattern for other regiments and units. Panicking, they all took to their heels hunters suddenly become quarry as they tried to reach the river Sinuka some 15 kilometers from Paragonovka. The regimental commander, the recently promoted Major General Gvostarkov, 
and the staff of the Simfropol Regiment Plus One Company were the first to reach the river, and they raced on without looking back as if stricken with terror, so that by evening they were in Lyshe Agora, some forty kilometers away, but without the rest of the regiment. One of the escapees, Colonel Allnendinger, second in command of the regiment's 2nd Battalion, testifies, quote, The regimental staff, the 2nd Company, some of the regiment's machine gunners and the battery set out ahead and managed to ford the river at Tenovka, but the regiment's commander did not await the arrival of other companies, but rather made off again with all haste and that evening was in Lyshe Agora minus his regiment. The other companies retreated under heavy pressure from the Maknavist infantry corning from the right and from straight ahead and from incessant cavalry attacks upon the left flank. As we entered the woods, we signalled our people to come to our aid, but there was no response, it was learned subsequently that the regimental commander had indeed seen the signals but had nonetheless decided to move on from the ford without waiting for his companies. The latter marched to their deaths, for they all knew that no quarter would be given. We stuck to the ploughed, fields, avoiding the paths. The sun was beginning to grow warm. The Maknavist infantry was hot on our heels but was not shooting at us because, apparently, they had no cartridges left as we immediately sensed. We too had exhausted our cartridge reserves. The enemy cavalry assailed us on our flanks, attempting to panic us with a hail of grenades prior to employing cold steel. We continually had to stop and fire shots behind us in order to fend him off. Some of us fell, wounded, and they put a bullet into their own brains lest they be taken alive by the enemy. The lightly wounded strove to march with the able-bodied. We reached the Sinuka River but did not know the whereabouts of the ford. The river was deep and quite broad. In the end, some of our number threw themselves into the water, some drowned, others made it back to the bank. The Maknavist infantry halted quite near to us. Still sniping at the cavalry, we went on walking along the river bank, in the hope of discovering a ford. Luckily, some inhabitants indicated a spot where it was feasible to swim across. We crossed. Out of our six companies, no more than 100 men were left. Columns came to meet us, we thinking that they were our side, suddenly they fanned out and began to bombard us. The wounded hoisted themselves onto farm teams and fed into the distance in the direction of Novokrenka where they arrived late in the night. The last 60 men, under the command of Captain Gattenberger, commandant of the 2nd Battalion, formed a line and tried to reach the nearby forest. It was said that they would not make it. With their last cartridges they again repulsed the cavalry but were mown down by enemy machine gun fire. The last survivors were sabred. The captain shot himself. No prisoners were taken. End quote. Almendinger's account corresponds pretty much with Marknos, entitled The Crushing of the Denikinists, as it appeared in the fourth issue of The Road to Freedom on October 30th, except that other regiments apart from his were sabred, hundreds of corpses littered the road for kilometers, as Volein describes. Volein also passed this world-weary remark. That is what would have become of us by this time had they won. Fate? Chance? Justice? Mark no made maximum capital out of the situation, Hunter now and no longer quarry, he sent his entire cavalry and artillery at full gallop in pursuit of the whites, then raced off himself along with his black sotnia along some shortcuts in pursuit of the Denikinists, managing to capture the divisional staff and a reserve regiment. Only a few hundred whites managed to get away. The captured booty was enormous, 23 cannon, over 100 machine guns, 120 officers and 500 soldiers taken prisoner. Many of the Denikinist generals and officers opted for suicide rather than be taken alive by the insurgents. The fields were blanketed in epaulets and braid, the owners of which had fed into the woods. The farmers were to be startled by this mighty odd crop the next day. The Denikinist Expeditionary Corps had been routed. The outcome of the Battle of Paragonovka was beyond reckoning, in point of fact, it determined the outcome of the civil war. That was appreciated by another Denikinist who got away, the officer, Sakovich, he was quite near to the battlefield, but his unit did not intervene, clinging to the belief that the Maknavists were still on their way east where the trap laid by Slashev awaited. 
For a moment, he heard intense cannon fire, followed by silence, he sensed that something crucial had just occurred, quote, in a sky blanketed in autumn cloud, the last puffs of artillery smoke exploded then, all was silent. All of us ranking officers sensed that something tragic had just occurred although nobody could have had any inkling of the enormity of the disaster which had struck. None of us knew that at that precise moment nationalist Russia had lost the war. It's over, I said, I know not why, to Lieutenant Rozov who was standing alongside me. It's over, he confirmed somberly. End quote. Why was it over? How could fighting that pitted two dozen thousands of men against one another have any influence over a war involving hundreds of thousands? To be sure, Markno had smashed the best troops of Slashev, who nonetheless had taken 1,000 Maknavists prisoner, wounded and stragglers, but the white general was in no position any longer to organize a pursuit of the insurgents and was to make do with warring against Putlura's yellows and blues. Now, Markno did not rest upon his laurels, he dispatched the 7,000 men remaining to him in three directions simultaneously, one group headed off towards their homeland on the left bank of the Dnieper, the main contingent of 3,500 galloped off to the most strategic points, while he himself at the head of his black Sotnia was over 100 kilometers away by the morrow of his startling victory. Capitalizing upon the element of surprise, with lightning speed, insurgents occupied all the settlements and towns in their path, defended only by insignificant garrisons, with the exception of Nikopol where they crushed three regiments from Kornilov's divisions, taking 300 prisoners. Within ten days, a huge swath of territory that included the cities of Krivoy Rog, Elisavetgrad, Nikopol, Melitopol, Alexandrovsk, Guliaipoli, Berdyansk and Marupol had been liberated at a gallop. On October 20, an outrider detachment occupied Ekaterinoslav for the first time only to be dislodged before Markno arrived in person with more substantial units to take the capital of the southern Ukraine. Even more serious for the Whites was the Maknavist control of the region's entire rail network, with the important rail junctions at Polagui, Sinanikovo, and Lasovo, as well as their grip upon the ports of Marupol and Berdyansk where the Anglo-French had been putting ashore material needed by Denikin. All of the nerve centers of Denikins thrust against Moscow foundered under the hammer blows of the Maknavists. The Whites were cut off from their food and provision bases. The insurgents even reached the very gates of Taganrog, headquarters for Denikin staff and were only just contained. As a matter of urgency, Denikin was forced to recall his best Cossack troops, led by Shkuro and Mamontov, who had been making ready to take Moscow. Indeed, the Red Army was in grave disarray, the spearhead of the Denikinist offensive lying just then only 200 kilometers outside Moscow, with white generals disputing the honors of being the first to enter the city. As for Lenin and the leadership of the Bolsheviks, they had been on the point of cutting and running for Finland, congratulating themselves for having held out longer than the Paris Commune. Thus Markno had broken the back of the great Denikinist offensive that the Red Army had failed to halt. Seen in this light, the Battle of Paragonovka had been the crucial feat of arms in the Civil War. The Maknovskina's own chronicler thus asserts with some reason that, quote, Keeping to the historical facts, the honor of having smashed the Denikinist counter-revolution in the autumn of 1919 belongs mainly to the Maknovists. Had the latter not made their breakthrough at Uman and followed up with the destruction, behind the lines, of the Denikinists' artillery and supply bases, the Whites would probably have entered Moscow around the month of December 1919. End quote. 18. The Whites' Failures Autumn 1919 was the apogee of the anti-Bolshevik offensives. Increasingly the territory under Bolshevik control was shrinking until it covered little more than the borders of the former Grand Duchy of Muscovy in the 16th century. Moscow was the primary target of the Whites, for seizure of this rail center would enable them to control the whole of European Russia. In the west, from the Baltic lands General Yudinich's 25,000-strong army was on the march against Petrograd, sweeping aside the 7th Red Army to reach the outskirts of the city by October 2. The former capital was directly threatened, the Bolshevik loss of nerve was at its worst, and Lenin was talking about abandoning Petrograd. Trotsky salvaged the situation by resolving to hold it at all costs. 
On October 16, Yudinich captured the Tsar's former residence at Tsarskoy Selo and then Gachina, and his troops could see the gilded dome of St. Isaac's Cathedral on the banks of the Neva, right in the center of the city. Trotsky hastily assembled some loyal units and issued appeals to the workers, sailors, women, and the Kersantis Red Officer Cadets. Barricades and trenches were made ready. Fighting broke out in the city suburbs. For several days, it could have gone either way. In this way Trotsky had gained a crucial respite, for the Red Army now had time to approach and tackle Yudinich from behind, obliging him to retreat. Yudinich had lacked two elements, the help promised by the British squadron lying off the coast and reinforcements from Bermont Tavilov's Army Corps and from the German Army Corps caught up, paradoxically, in fighting the troops of an independent, bourgeois Latvia. Yudinich was obliged to withdraw to Estonia where his army was disarmed. To the north, the British ran up against the same problems as the French had encountered in Odessa, and they called off their support of General Miller and brought their troops back on board on September 26, 1919. So, left to their own devices and bereft of logistical support, the white supporters were defeated after several months with Archangelsk being captured in March 1920. To the east, Kolchak acknowledged a supreme commander by all the white generals had begun his march on Moscow at the start of the year. Essentially his advance proceeded along the railroad lines. In terms of numbers, this was the strongest white offensive, the mobilization had produced unexpected results and 200,000 young recruits, preferred over the experienced soldiery of 1914 to 1917 having in the eyes of the white generals the advantage of never having sampled the disintegration of the revolutionary army, came forward, officers regained their omnipotent status and their old patriarchal methods surfaced once more. Admiral Kolchak, supreme regent of Russia, was, according to his entourage, a constantly simmering cauldron in which the stew is never cooked. He had at his disposal a staff of some 900 officers, 58 of whom dealt with censorship alone. His provisional capital, Omsk, had become a great hive of shirkers, 5,000 other officers there indulged themselves in the most unbridled debauchery and blithely held down lucrative quartermaster positions. All of this wheeling and dealing and corrupt practice worked against his under-equipped troops who were obliged to conduct operations in the height of a winter with the temperature 45 degrees below, leading to many soldiers suffering frostbitten limbs and amputations. Luckily for Kolchak there was the Czech Legion, placed under the national command of the French General Janine. Thanks to it, the offensive spread in March 1919 beyond Ufa and Orenburg across a 300-kilometer front. Towards the end of April, its most advanced point was in Kazan or nearly 600 kilometers from Moscow. In May the tables turned completely, three regiments mutinied, killing 200 officers and defecting to the Reds. Other mass desertions followed. The frontline troops were worn out and suffering from supply shortages, for the simple reason that supplies were at all times prey to grasping corrupt practices behind the lines. The democratically-minded Czechs had nothing but distaste for Kolchak's soldiery which had distinguished itself at the time of the Admiral Scoop d'Etat by butchering several thousand social revolutionary supporters of the Committee for the Constituent Assembly. Their many atrocities against the populace inspired countless partisan detachments that continually harassed Kolchak's army's trains and bases. The Czechs refused to pursue the offensive any further and concentrated exclusively on the smooth running of the Trans-Siberian Railroad. The upshot of all this ineptitude, incompetence and intrigue was not long in making itself known, the initial offensive turned into a complete debacle. Staffs deserted their units which themselves defected to the enemy or else vanished into the countryside. Soon, by October 1919, the Siberian army that was to have liberated Moscow and Russia was no more than a memory. According to General Janine, this melting away of the army has been largely due to progressive alienation of the populace from Kolchak's government, an alienation triggered by its police methods following the murders of the constituent supporters in Ufa in December 1918. So much so that the Bolsheviks who had themselves blithely murdered thousands a short time before in Siberia were now welcomed there as liberators. The Red Army, 
itself prone to serious internal disagreements and blatant underequipment, was unable however to draw the fullest benefit from the white Siberian debacle. It made do with following the enemy's retreat at a distance, capitalizing upon its disintegration and regarding the slightest consolidation as a counter-offensive. The lead in the fighting was taken primarily by the tens of thousands of Siberian partisans, most of them social revolutionaries who bore the brunt of the fighting and hastened the admiral's downfall. Having started off pompously, the adventure of the saviour of the homeland came to a Shakespearean grief. For several weeks he wandered around the Trans-Siberian Railway, escorted by a train laden with gold captured from the supporters of the Constituent Assembly in Samra. Shunned by one and all, he was finally taken prisoner by the social revolutionaries of Lukutsk, brought to trial and shot on February 7, 1920. The most powerful, most dangerous of the white offensives against the Bolsheviks was incontrovertibly that of General Denikin who rallied to his cause the Cossack armies of the Don, the Cuban, and the Tarek. Henceforth known as the armed forces of southern Russia, Denikin's new army was made up of 150,000 experienced and combat-ready men and seized the whole of the Caucasus and Don territory before marching on Tsaritsyn and Astrakhan, the two key cities of the Lower Volga, intent upon joining up with Kolchak. In June 1919, General Baron Rangel forced Tsaritsyn's defences and ousted the Red. Army commanded by one-time Sergeant Voroshilov who was himself attended by political commissar Joseph Jigashvili, subsequently better known under the name of Stalin. The captured booty was immense, two armoured trains, 131 locomotives, 10,000 carriages, 2,085 of them laden with munitions, 70 cannon, 300 machine guns, and 40,000 prisoners taken. To be sure, the losses sustained by the Don Cossacks and the Caucasian Cavalry Corps were enormous, but the officers were no longer the opera booth generals of Kolchak. Here they had to march at the head of their troops and often perished in the fighting. To the west, as we have seen, the Ukrainian front held by Markno had buckled in June. Also on June 20, Denikin set himself the ultimate goal of capturing Moscow. The offensive was to be mounted from three separate directions. The army commanded by Rangel was to march on Saratov and then via Nizhny Novgorod upon the capital. The army of the Don Cossacks, commanded by General Sidorin, was to take the Voronezh Ryazan route while the volunteer army under Mimayevsky's command was to close in via Kharkov, Kursk, Oral, and Tula, all in all, a front some 800 kilometers wide. This was a grievous strategical error made in expectation of easy victories albeit ones that would be politically and militarily insignificant. Rangel made a report on military matters to Denikin, wherein he pointed to the, quote, Perils of extending the front overmuch in the absence of the necessary reserves and a well-organized rearguard. He suggested, digging in for the moment on the Tsaritsa and Ekaterinoslav front with our flanks protected by the Volga and the Dnieper, and then levying the necessary troops for operations in the southeast, in the vicinity of Astrakhan, while simultaneously marshalling at our center three or four cavalry corps in the environs of Kharkov. These troops, when the time comes, might strike in the direction of Moscow. At the same time the rearguard needed organizing, as did the building up of regimental numbers, enlargement of the reserve, and the establishment of operational bases. End quote. The only reaction this drew from General Denikin was a derisory comment of I see, you wish to be the first to enter Moscow. For an honest subordinate, born second-rater become standard bearer like Denikin, the suggestions from the general, a cavalryman who had won his spurs earlier during the Russo-German War, could not but appear far-fetched, being at once too bold and too cautious, when he came down on the side of the view that such a wide front could not be held militarily by only 150,000 men. Moreover, a direct thrust towards the capital by an important cavalry corps might indeed have brought about the collapse of the Red Armies. The best demonstration of that was provided by the raid by General Mamontov a one-time hussar turned Don Cossack. Charged with easing enemy pressure on the Army of the Don, Mamontov thrust deep behind Red Army lines on July 22 with a contingent of 6,000 Cossacks, 3,000 infantry, three tanks and seven armored trains. Within six weeks he had mounted a fabulous incursion some 2,200 kilometers deep, sweeping aside all infantry and cavalry divisions dispatched to head him off during this raid 
which was reminiscent of the Confederate General Lee's raid at the time of the War of Secession in the United States, the communications and supply lines of several Red Army Corps were destroyed. Several tens of thousands of troops in the process of being forcibly mobilized by the Red Army were sent home again. Important cities like Tambov, Kozlov and Tula, the latter lying only 200 kilometers from Moscow, were captured. The Soviet High Command had this to say about the raid. The enemy has seized upon the absence from our camp of an adequate number of cavalry and the poor quality of communications to move with absolute impunity throughout our entire rear, seizing numerous troops, destroying railroad lines everywhere, shooting all our officials who fall into his clutches, arming the population and urging it to wage a partisan war against us. In the course of his raid, Mamontov, at all times in the front rank of his men, distributed all foodstuffs at no charge to the populace armed volunteers, and brought back with him a division made up of the inhabitants of Tula, which was promptly incorporated into the White Army. He also brought back nearly all his men but only half their mounts, which had been decimated by the daily sorties of 60 to 70 kilometers. His cavalry formed a column some 8 to 10 kilometers long, with a 7 to 8 kilometer long convoy of 2,300 cartloads of booty in tow. Several Red Divisions sought to cut off his route home. He feigned a breakthrough at one point, waited until enemy troops had concentrated there and then mounted an attack further away, wreaking havoc behind the lines of another Red Army Corps. He turned up on the other side of the front lines so unexpectedly that Shkuro's Cossack Army Corps, taken unawares itself, made ready to engage him before they realized their mistake. Not wanting to be idle, General Shkuro in turn forced a passage through enemy lines and seized Voronezh. Finding himself now no more than 350 kilometers from Moscow, he sought permission to launch a thrust designed to capture the capital. Such a venture was formally forbidden to him, on pain of court-martial. The White Staff was so confident of the imminence of victory that it steadfastly opposed the kudos of victories going to Cossacks rather than to some unit of volunteer officers. This crass blunder was to prove fatal to the offensive, for several factors, negligible in the short term but consequential. Over a longer period, were to overturn the situation completely. At a time when they had all but been able to hear the Kremlin bells ringing, the white generals were to be induced to beat a speedy retreat. Rangel had had a foreboding of this situation, against the run of general enthusiasm prevailing in the white camp, which at that point ruled over a considerable area 820,000 square kilometers with a population of 42 million inhabitants, quote. General Denikin's armies continued to march, with giant strides towards Moscow. Kiev, Kursk, and Oral were captured. Our cavalry was at the gates of Voronezh. The whole of South Russia, rich in provisions of every sort, was in the hands of General Denikin, and every day brought us news of fresh successes. But to me it had been long clear as I did not conceal from the general-in-chief, that we were building upon sand, that we were taking on too much so as to be able to seize everything. Our opponent, however, adhered firmly to the principles of strategy. After I fell back to Tsaritsyn, my army weakened by three months of bloody fighting, the Red Command realized that it would be a long time before I could take the offensive again and it marshalled its forces at the point where the volunteer army and the army of the Don met. The general-in-chief had nothing to deploy against this new enemy force. End quote. He Red Army had indeed been overhauled, well supplied, and endlessly reinforced by fresh recruits, its total numbers rose at this time to three million, little by little it turned back the Don army and that of Rangel. In charge of directing its operations was a former Tsarist staff colonel. Sergei Kamenev. The Red Cossack Budyeny's cavalry corps began to show its mettle and played a crucial role. But it was behind the White's lines and on their flanks that the difficulties were greatest, to turn again to Rangel's comments, quote. Revolts erupted behind the lines, insurgents under the command of the bandit Markno wrecked cities and looted trains and quartermaster depots. In the countryside, disorder was rampant. The local authorities were unable to command respect. Abuses of power were the order of the day. The agrarian issue was as confused as ever. The very government was none too clear about what its intentions were on this score. Its poorly paid agents were all too often not honest. 
end quote. Concerned with a situation that he assessed as grave, Rangel traveled to Rostov to the Whites' main headquarters. There he met with Denikin, according to Denikin, everything was going for the best and the capture of Moscow can only be a question of time, as, the enemy, utterly demoralized and weakened, cannot resist us. Rangel strove to call Denikin's attention to the bandit Marknos insurgent movement which threatens our rear only to come up against the general-in-chief's complete thoughtlessness, it is not serious. We shall have done with him with a flick of the wrist. In political matters too, Denikin was equally a cipher, he did not want to yield one inch of Russian territory to the Poles and Georgians. What was immediately more serious was that he took the same line towards the Cuban Cossacks who were eager to recover their autonomy. The Roda, government, of the Cuban was in fact becoming increasingly hostile to the whites, its chairman, P. L. Makarenko, even became a target for the white officers because he sympathized with the Maknavist movement. According to the Soviet historian, Cubanin, Cossacks generally sought to set up democratic, autonomous, and independent republics in the Don, Cuban, and Turk, and these would be linked federatively to Putlira's national Ukraine, to Menshevist Georgia, and later, once the Bolsheviks had been overthrown, to a democratic Russia. Cubanin readily acknowledges that the Cossacks were certainly not in favor of restoration of the monarchy, only a handful of Cossack bigwigs had that in mind, but under pressure from the mass, they had had to drop the idea. Denikin opted for strong-arm methods and ordered the hanging of Kalabukov, a leader of the Roda. This led to alienation of and increasing desertions by the Cuban Cossacks. By this action he had also shown that he was fighting, not against Bolshevism but against every one of the gains of democracy in every single area of social life and aspired only to plain and simple restoration of Tsarism and the absolute rule of the landowners, clergy, and police. And that despite his promise that the Constituent Assembly, which became increasingly hypothetical as his successes grew, would settle the land question, the land was meanwhile restored to its former owners or, at best, the peasants who worked it were compelled to hand over one-third of the harvest to the landowners. Now, even if they indicated the best will in the world, white officers, helpless because of their reverence for hierarchy, proved powerless to alter the course of events. One of them, one of the bravest, servicemen in the Russo-German war, Andrei Grigorievich Skuro, did indeed try to moderate the, ruthless, anti-democratic conduct of his superiors. Shkuro was a small, stocky man with a raucous voice, and some of his rivals had nicknamed him Max Linder in General's epaulets. In fact, he had begun to fight the Bolsheviks as early as the beginning of 1918, having tasted their summary methods of justice, only the similarity between his name and another's had saved him from the firing squad, then, along with his detachment of partisans, he had joined the volunteer armies. From the beginning of 1919, when the order of the Pomieskis was restored, his wife was pessimistic about subsequent events, and her views probably reflected those of her husband. He was outraged by the mass executions of Pokrovsky, indeed the latter was nicknamed the Hangman, a nickname amply justified when he had hundreds of peasants hanged for the simple reason that they wore no orthodox crucifix about their necks. Shkuro interceded with Pokrovsky, his superior in rank. To get him to spare the life of the anarchist Alexander G.E., in Kislodovsk, but to no effect. On another occasion, though, he did manage at the last minute to rescue a Jew arbitrarily sentenced to be hanged. Point eight again to no avail, he tried to snatch Kalabukov, the leader from the Cuban, from the clutches of Pokrovsky, F. Bikrovsky being decidedly the door of Denikin's dirty work. All of these interventions only succeeded in putting him in bad odor with the Denikinist staff a shadow that he made up for with brilliant feats of service. Before carrying out his incursion through the front against Markno, he had tried to come to an accommodation with Markno by sending emissaries to put proposals for a joint struggle against the Bolsheviks. Being himself of Zaporog descent, he wanted to be near his distant cousins from the left bank of the Dnipro according to him, were proud of their Cossack name and hoped to re-establish a Zaporog Republic. He acknowledged that the sympathies of most of them lay with Bakko Markno, he does not want Pomieskis and nor do we. They used to say, for the land is ours, let each one take what he needs, that suits us. However, Shkuro, 
had mistakenly believed that Markno was fighting the Bolsheviks and the Jews, and it was on that basis that he had suggested a joint fight. When Markno declined, Shkuro had launched his lightning offensive of June 1919 against him. He relates how, at the time of this offensive, his men were initially welcomed when they reached Ekaterinoslav, quote. Battered by the horrors of Bolshevism, the populace begged us not to hand the town over to the Reds, the Whites' vanguard had occupied it almost fortuitously, and their high command regarded this occupation as premature, the high command then allowed us to hold on to the town. I will never forget my entry into the city. People were on their knees singing Christ is risen and were blessing us and weeping. The Cossacks and their mounts were blanketed in flowers. Dressed in their finest priestly garments, the clergy were celebrating tediums everywhere. The workers resolved to work as hard as they could for the, white, volunteer army. They repaired trains and armored platforms, cannon and rifles. The inhabitants enlisted en masse in our forces. Their enthusiasm was tremendous. How come, that all changed later, once gentlemen of the caliber of the governor Shetin had done their work? The joy of the early days after the region's liberation from the Bolsheviks gave way to incredulity or even hate when the arrival of the white administration and the return of the pack of landlords thirsting for revenge made themselves felt. Certain white volunteers said that at first they were greeted with the greatest goodwill only to meet with curses later. End quote. He also noted the unbelievable vacuousness of the Denikinist movement, quote. Mobilized by force, the workers and peasants were primarily interested in the volunteer army's program. The masses of the people who had had first-hand experience of the crass fossil of Bolshevik promises and who had woken up politically, wished to see in the volunteer army a progressive anti-Bolshevik force rather than a counter-revolutionary one. Kornilov's program was dear and readily understood, as the successes of the volunteer army grew, so its program became increasingly vague and hazy. The notion of the people's rights of self-direction was whittled away to nothing. Even we commanding officers could not now answer the question, what were the essential lines of the volunteer army's program? What was to be said, for instance, regarding the details of that program, in answer to the questions put frequently by the Donetsk miners, how did the leaders of the volunteer army see the labor question? It is amusing to say so, but we had to seek the white ideology. In the conversations and table talk of General Denikin on this or that occasion, mere comparison of two or three of those sources could persuade one of the instability of the political notions of their author who, by his subsequent skepticism and caution, progressively whittled his initial promises down to nothing. There were no draft laws, rumors were current about plans drafted in shadowy offices, but no one ever asked us, who were operating on the ground and constantly confronted with the populace's puzzlement and its disappointments, and they even flew into a rage with us if we raised such issues. End quote. How implausible! The ideology of the whites, of those who would have freed the Russian people of the Bolshevik yoke, depended upon the stomach ulcers or whims of their supreme leader, the son of one-time serfs, Denikin. One ran appreciate why Trotsky feared Mark no more than he did the whites. To return to matters military, when Shkuro was in Voronezh and making ready, in defiance of the prohibition placed on him, to swoop upon Moscow, his superior, Staff General Plyaskevsky Plyashik warned him that the possibility of just such a move on your part has already been examined at headquarters, and in that event, you will be immediately proclaimed a traitor to the state and then, even in the event of complete success, Produced before a field court-martial. Shkuro comments that he had had to submit to this, but that if he had not, maybe then Russia's history might have been different. He adds that, regardless of the many voices which alleged so thereafter, he refused to credit that the general staff had mistrusted the Cossacks and had not wanted the essential role in the liberation of Moscow to fall to Cossack troops. Subsequently the intervention of Bodieni's cavalry and the Maknavist threat behind the lines compromised any further advance by the Whites once and for all and preempted any fresh advance on Moscow. Let us note too that it was one of the best regiments in Shkuro's army corps, the Labinsk regiment, which the Maknavists had crushed at Pomoshnaya and Yuman, thereafter, a savage fight to the death set these Zaporog cousins against one another. Another typical view of the Whites, this time held by some engineers from Alexandrovsk, 
is reported by V. Pavlov, Lieutenant Colonel of the Elite Markov Division. Asked for what the volunteer army fought, the interrogated officer replied, quote, For Russia, one, great and indivisible. That is a cliché without meaning, protested the engineers. The Bolsheviks are fighting for the same. Except that at the same time they resolve, one way or another, political, social and economic issues in order to better the people's existence. So how would the volunteer army resolve those issues say? The officer was stuck for a reply. He could have voiced his own view, but of the volunteer army's policies he knew nothing. He had to extricate himself from his difficulty with some trite and quite offhand formula, but one that could not satisfy anyone. We wage war in order to free Russia. All the rest is none of our concern. The army is above politics. The engineers smiled indulgently, and the conversation moved on to something else. End quote. Later, Pavlov cites the case of an officer serving in the Denikinist propaganda branch, who was called upon to explain to the peasants and workers that it was all the fault of a Masonic conspiracy and of the protocols of the elders of Zion. As Pavlov himself concedes, such a justification of the White's army struggle was nonetheless a scanty explanation of the origins of Bolshevism. His Russian nationalist mysticism impelled Denikin to open hostilities against Putlura's Ukrainian nationalists who wanted nothing better than to come to some accommodation with him on the basis of recognition of their independence. He dismissed Putlura as a bandit, threatened to hang him and ipso facto yet another front was opened up. The commander of the volunteer army, General Mimayevsky, even banned the teaching of the Ukrainian language in July 1919 in parts of Ukraine under occupation of his troops. Another aspect of the power of the Whites did them a disservice as far as the populace was concerned, this was the looting and the atrocities carried out by officers endowed with full powers and representing a caste above all suspicion, one whose criminal activities escaped punishment in which regard they were the worthy successors of the Czechist butchers. We have already seen as much in Gulyai in June 1919 but it was repeated elsewhere in the region too. Here we have the testimony of the Soviet dissident, General Grigorenko, a native of Borisovka, a township in the vicinity of Marupol. Grigorenko, whose older brother was in fact a Maknavist, tells how the municipal Soviet of Nogaysk, another small town in the region, made up of peaceable notables elected after February 1917, was labelled red and then all its members shot by white guards on the basis of that charge alone. Worse still, a certain Novitsky who escaped this execution, donned his uniform of an ex-captain of the Tsarist army, pinned on his highest military decorations and set off in search of the local commanding officer to demand an explanation for this act of barbarism. He received, by way of a reply, this Bolshevik swine, I'll teach you by what right. Dragged outside, he was dispatched with a shot to the back of his head. One officer from Shkuro's corps made a name for himself with his savage repression and boasted of having had 4,000 completely unarmed Maknavist captives executed when Marupol was taken in June 1919. Another white officer had an intellectual tortured just because the latter had absent-mindedly called him comrade. The unfortunate wretch was garroted in the head, the rope was increasingly tightened with the aid of a rod until his skull exploded. A young girl stepped up to the officer and spat in his face, he slew her on the spot with his saber. The crowd was obliged to remain there to contemplate the spectacle under the threat of the knout, a whip used for flogging. Shkuro himself, for all his democratic impulses, recommended his men, according to the British journalist Williams, systematically to rape the insurgents women folk and Jewish women, a thousand of the latter were raped thus in Ekaterinoslav something that had not been seen in the region since the Polyphysian invasions of the Middle Ages. Such excesses went hand in hand with looting of the liberated regions. General Mimayevsky set the pattern by turning his residence in Kharkov into a sale room for costly furniture and precious objects, and later earned a name for his orgies. Rangel was well aware of all such peculation, excesses, and abuses of this power. He drew up a blunt report for Denikin's eyes on December 9, 1919. Quote. The troops had to find what was needed, distribute it and turn the tide of war to use. 
The war was becoming a way of enriching oneself and living off the land degenerated into pillage and speculation. Each unit strove to grab as much as it could for itself everything was taken, what could not be put to use on the spot was dispatched to the rear for sale and conversion into cash. The troops baggage reached exorbitant proportions, there were some regiments towing 200 wagons behind them. A considerable number of troops served behind the lines. Lots of officers were away on prolonged missions, concerned with the sale and barter of war booty. The army became demoralized and turned into a ragbag of hawkers and profiteers. All who were involved in living off the land, and that was virtually all officers, found themselves in possession of vast sums of money, the upshot of this was debauchery, gambling, orgies. Unfortunately, some officers themselves set a dismal example by their revelries, spending money recklessly while the whole army looked on. The populace, which on its arrival had greeted our arm with transport of enthusiasm, after having suffered so much at Bolshevik hands and wishing now only to live in peace, was soon to know again the horrors of looting, violence and arbitrary acts. Outcome, disarray at the front and revolts behind our lines. End quote. For himself, Rangel did try to clamp down and had a captain shot who had committed exactions, and he did restore a semblance of discipline in his army, to no avail, for it was already too late. Denikin, who had meanwhile been appointed successor by Kolchak, tried to reverse the trend by dismissing Mimayevsky and then by publishing a program on December 15, 1919, quote. 1. Russia, 1. An indivisible. Protection of religion. Restoration of order. Reconstruction of the country's productive forces and of the national economy. Improvement of labor productivity. 2. A fight to the death against Bolshevism. 3. Military dictatorship. The government will ignore the demands of all political parties. All resistance to authority whether from right or left is to be smashed. Only thereafter can the form of government be chosen. The people itself will determine it. We must march in step with the people. 4. Foreign policy is to be national and above all Russian. Despite prevarication among the Allies, we must continue to march with them. Any other collusion is morally objectionable and impracticable. Slav solidarity. In return for aid, not an inch of Russian soil. End quote. In this vague, ambiguous hotchpotch of patriotism, there was not a single concrete proposal, nor any response to the aspirations of the toiling masses. How kind of him still to be inclined to continue to march with the Allies, when it was the Anglo-French who were keeping the white troops up in arms and equipment. As for hostility towards Georgia, Armenia and Dagestan, Transcaucasia, it denied the whites assistance, or a fallback area which they were soon to need, and how. A paper government was established on December 17, its ministers were named managers but were puppets of the general staff. Denikin had fallen into the same bad habits as Kolchak as a French diplomat then on secondment in Russia concluded, Fernand Grenard states, quote, What goes for Kolchak goes many times over for Denikin around whom the generals, officers, civil servants and landowners most attached to the old regime had gathered. In this entourage, Denikin was suspected of liberalism, and himself looked upon the political centre, a gathering of the most respectable props of a moribund society as a revolutionary. Just as Kolchak had the Czechoslovaks, so he alienated the Cossacks, his essential resource, closed down their rodder and executed one of their deputies. On both sides the most absolute arbitrariness, unknown under the Tsars, reigned supreme. Rights and freedom were no more. Disturbances and revolts erupted all over. Repression struck out blindly, people known to all as enemies of the Bolsheviks were hunted down, arrested, banished. There was burning, hanging, shooting, looting. Not only was the agrarian question left unresolved, but landlords trailed in the wake of the advancing armies, snatched back their belongings manner military, and wrought vengeance on their peasants. Small wonder that the populace, in occupied areas and in areas yet to be retaken, turned against those who sought to deliver them and who taught them to see in the Bolsheviks the only true defenders of the cherished gains of the revolution. End quote. 
Noting everywhere they showed up the unpopularity which the Bolsheviks had left behind, the Whites had a tendency to believe that the road to success would lead them right to Moscow. On the one hand, they did not even bother to synchronize their offensives, and on the other, they promptly set about settling old scores with democracy and reviving a bygone age, the return of which was sought by none among the population. An underlying democratic tendency was attested by John's ideas, an objective witness if ever there was one, quote. Neither Kolchak's entourage nor Denikin's included representatives from democratic circles, nor from the socialist parties, however moderate. Now, although a resolute opponent of socialism, I am nonetheless obliged to concede that in 1918 to 1919, when the Russian people were still under the spell of revolutionary maxims, no government desirous of speaking, not in the name of some caste but rather on behalf of the whole nation, could dispense with the contribution of the socialists, in that the latter still enjoyed rightly or wrongly the confidence of the populace who feared, above all else, the return of the ancient regime, and the social counter-revolution. Now, as we said, Kolchak's and Denikin's entourage comprised precisely only of people to whom one French general who had spent some time in Russia vocally applied the old Napoleonic saying, they have learned nothing and forgotten nothing. End quote. So, in a sense, the Whites had counted their chickens before they were hatched, having prepared everything for the succession to Lenin, everything that is, except the people's support for their cause. Therein lay the essential cause of their defeat. Thus the Bolsheviks were to triumph, not so much on their own merits as due to the shortcomings of their white opponents. Also, it was this widespread popular resistance and the countless bands of partisans, the Greens, who, like Markno, whose crucial role is universally acknowledged, were to harry and ravage the rear of all white offensives, thereby rescuing Lenin and his party. A large proportion of these partisans were to be incorporated into the Red Army, for whom, all in all, the Whites were to prove the best recruiting sergeants. 19. The Fortunes and Misfortunes of Freedom Regained In the wake of the June 1919 buckling of the front, the eastern Ukraine had thus found itself for four months under the jackboots of the white soldiery, and in strict subjection to all the stalwarts of the old established order, who returned to reclaim their properties and station. The medium and big landowners, Kulaks and Pomieski, the squires, police, magistrates and other officials from Tsarist days. All of these, snugly ensconced and believing that their privileges had been restored permanently, had taken pitiless revenge on the peasants, and other miscreants for the trials and tribulations through which they themselves had been put, at the time of the revolutionary upheavals that followed the withdrawal of the Austro-German troops. Now the shoe was on the other foot. Like a whirlwind, the Machnavists swept aside all resistance, punishing those behind repression, informers, and judges, and destroying all remnants and symbols of slavery, prisons, police and gendarmerie posts, were blown up with dynamite or put to the torch. The social heat was turned up again, the peasants rallied en mass to Markno who by October had a reconstituted insurgent army of some 28,000 infantry and cavalry, with 200 machine guns and 50 cannons. These insurgents crushed several enemy regiments, completely blockading Volnovaka, the main railway junction servicing the Denikinist front, obliging white headquarters to recall the best Cossack troops from the front against the Bolsheviks as a matter of urgency. These troops, the Don Cossack Brigade led by Mamontov, the Turk Division, Chechens, and other assault regiments, in all about 25,000 men, were to be sorely missed when Budiani's Red Cavalry in turn fell upon Voronez and drove the Whites back. These substantial white reinforcements obliged the Machnavists by the end of October to give up the shores of the Sea of Azov, the ports of Berdyansk and Marupol among others, as well as the Guliai, Poly region. Instead they captured Pavlograd, Sinelnikovo, Chaplino, and above all Ekaterinoslav. While retaining control of the Lower Dnieper, Melitopol, Nikopol and Alexandrovsk. In every district, townland or city taken over by insurgents, the local residents recovered all social and political rights, they were invited to proceed with the election of delegates from their trade associations and local Soviets and then to call a regional congress to determine what policy to follow in the business in hand. And that without interference from the insurgents. On the eve of the occupation of Alexandrovsk and Berdyansk, 
the central organ of the Makhnovist insurgent army, the Military Revolutionary Soviet, issued an appeal address to all insurgents and specifying their role in great detail. Comrade insurgents. Day by day the insurgent army expands the theater of its revolutionary actions. Soon we shall go liberate such and such a city from Denikin. It will be a city liberated from all authority by the Makhnovist insurgents. It will be a city where free life ought to begin to bubble under the protection of revolutionary insurgents and the free organization of workers built up in full-blooded union with the peasants and insurgents. This appeal stressed that there should be no violence or looting, nor questionable searches, for the whole success of the building of free communes essentially depended on the Makhnovists, the matter of how we conduct ourselves in the areas that we shall occupy is a life or death issue for our movement as a whole. The insurgents made do with appointing one of their own to command of the town, albeit without any civil or military authority, and for the sole purpose of liaising between themselves and the agencies freely elected by the working population. The contrast between the backward-looking conduct of the whites could not have been starker. Yet the Bolsheviks did not take this view. Thus, scarcely had Alexandrovsk and Ekaterinoslav been liberated than they created ready-made revolutionary committees, comprised exclusively of their own supporters, whom they tried to pass off as representative of everybody, then sought out Markno and proposed to him a carving up of spheres of activity, he would look to the purely military while they would see to the administration and running of the cities. Even then, in their befuddled mentality, they mistook him for the movement as a whole, and, what is more, coldly proposed that he be as it were, the arms of a body of which they would furnish the head. This was a complete repetition of what had gone before. This time his response was even more violent against these parasites upon the workers' lives, he forcibly ejected them and forbade them to commit any authoritarian act vis a vis the working population, on pain of being shot, and he strenuously recommended that they take up a more honest trade. Two workers' conferences were held in Alexandrovsk, these elected representatives for the regional congress that met on October 27th to November 2nd, 1919. It drew nearly 300 participants, 180 of them peasant delegates, in the proportion of one delegate per 3,000 peasants, about 20 worker delegates, and the rest were delegates from left-wing revolutionary organizations and insurgent units. The agenda included the following items, 1. Organization of the insurgent army, 2 reorganization of supply arrangements, 3. Organization of a commission to convene a subsequent congress and conferences on the questions of social and economic construction, and, 4. Business in hand. The congress took the most urgent military steps, it determined upon voluntary mobilization of 20 classes, between the ages of 19 and 39, with those under 25 to be dispatched directly to the front while the rest would take care of local self-defense. This call for a voluntary mobilization seems contradictory, and Soviet historians have not been slow to stress that, in fact, it meant that an appeal was issued to the revolutionary consciences of all concerned so that they might defend their rights and freedom by force of arms, without their being obliged to do so, as was the systematic practice among the Bolsheviks, whites and Petlyurists. The Congress also decided that provisioning of the insurgent army was to be ensured on the basis of war booty, requisitions from the bourgeoisie, and, above all, through contributions from the peasants, for the insurgent army was still an essentially peasant army. A panel of peasants, workers, and insurgents was appointed to prepare further conferences and congresses bearing on the region's social and economic reconstruction. That left, finally, any other business the delegates wished to raise. Everything went swimmingly up until November 30 when the anarchist Volein, who chaired the Congress expatiated upon the Makhnovists' theses regarding free Soviets, as drafted jointly by Markno and the movement's cultural branch at a general Congress of Insurgents. On October 20, these theses had been issued in pamphlet form and distributed throughout the liberated zone as a draft theoretic declaration by the insurgents. Markno, who was present, took over and spelled out the theses. The assembly decided to vote on the following resolution, to support this view by every means while calling for the universal and speediest possible creation of free local social and economic organizations in coordination with one another. At this point, several worker delegates, actually, 
Menshevik and social revolutionary militants spoke up against this idea, in its place they cited the legitimacy of the Constituent Assembly elected in November 1917 and dissolved by the Bolsheviks in January 1918. Mark no lit into them in no uncertain terms, even labeling them counter-revolutionaries in cahoots with Denikin. Outraged, 11 delegates from the Soviet of Trade Unions, from the Union of Restaurant Staff, Printers, Bank and Commercial Employees walked out of the hall and made a public protest at Markno's charges, insisting in the name of the city's working class that these be withdrawn. The Congress saw no point in replying to this, for, had Markno not spelled out to them a few home truths, then unquestionably, he reckoned, the assembly would have done the job a day or two later. One Bolshevik official, Levko, participating in the Congress also spoke out against the Maknavist view while caricaturing it crudely, quote, you tell us, he said, that the Soviets can organize anarchy, the absence of authority and that we will be able to live with such Soviets, but you yourselves do not implement this, pointing to the presidium of the Congress. And anyway, who are you? Are you not an authority? You preside, you call speakers, call for silence, and, if you so desire, deny some the right to speak. How will it be under anarchy? If there is a bridge linking two villages, and it is destroyed, who will see to its repair? Given that neither village will want to do so, nobody will do it, and so we shall find ourselves bridgeless, and unable to go to town. End quote. The argument was too puerile to cut much ice, especially among peasants for whom solidarity is a natural law but it is illustrative of this ongoing tendency among supporters of authority to take people for children incapable of assuming control of themselves without lapsing into idiocies. By way of contrast to the lines above, Pavlov, whom we have already cited, reproduces the peasants' profession of faith. We are not Bolsheviks. They promised us much, but already we have everything, the land. What about power? We live very well doing without it completely. In any event the Bolsheviks at the Congress did not insist, and they even designated one of their number, Novitsky, to join the insurgents military revolutionary Soviet elected by the Congress. Unity was the theme of the day, and it was enough for them to follow events, well placed and awaiting their chance to intervene. Markno responded to the Mensheviks' protest by specifying that his accusations were addressed solely to them and not to the workers. This he explained at some length in an open letter published by the Maknavist organ, The Road to Freedom, quote, Can it possibly be that the workers of Alexandrovsk and its environs, through their Menshevik and right social revolutionary delegates, support the idea of the Denikinist Constituent Assembly as against any free congress of workers, peasants and insurgents? When they fled from the congress like craven vulgar thieves when confronted by the justice of my charges, is it possible that you decided to protest alongside them? Is it true that these puppets of the bourgeoisie are charged with representing you so as to hide behind your proletarian honor and call for support for the old ideal of the constituent assembly? I think not, that the workers of Alexandrovsk cannot possibly have awarded full powers to these people for that purpose. These impudent individuals who betrayed your interests by addressing Congress in the language of Denikin. I am certain that you will keep faith with the ideas of the proletariat and peasants, with the idea of social revolution. Death to all constituent assemblies and other snares of the bourgeoisie. Long live the freedom, equality and justice of the toilers. End quote. Such a posture could not help but gratify the Bolsheviks, it was grist to their mill in their politicking against the legitimist social revolutionaries and Mensheviks. Markno's violence of language is understandable, especially in light of the vicious battles he had just fought on behalf of his cause, nonetheless, it needs to be noted that he was mistaken in lumping the constituent assembly with Denikin's goals. Denikin was as far removed from that as he was from the free Soviets advocated by Maknavists, as we have just seen. Also, if the, so-called right, social revolutionary and Menshevik delegates were really representative of Alexandrovsk's workers, and there is every chance that that was the case, that merely signified that the working class was less radical than the poor peasantry. Markno grasped that well, enough when he occupied Ekaterinoslav for one and one half months from November 9, 1919, the railway workers had turned to him, 
taking him for an authority in short, a boss, as it were, to ask him to pay the wages that they had not had for the past two months, he answered them along the same lines as what he had published in the Macnavist paper, The Road to Freedom, on this very subject a short time before, quote, with the object of restoring normal rail traffic in the region liberated by us, on the basis of the principle of the free self-organization of workers' associations and peasant unions in respect of their existence and activities, let me propose to railway worker comrades that they organize themselves vigorously and themselves arrange the traffic, levying a suitable sum for passengers and cargoes transported aside from military convoys and transports, by way of payment for their labors, and then organize their budget on the basis of fair principles of comradeship, and finally enter into close relations with other worker and peasant associations as well as insurgent detachments. Commander of the Revolutionary Insurgent Army of Ukraine, Alexandrovsk, October 15, 1919. Bakho Markno. End quote. This the region's railway workers did do. Insofar as they were able in the light of the military situation, there was another characteristic incident with workers from the Berdyansk workshops, they prepared some artillery pieces captured by the Maknavists from the Denikinists, then demanded payment for their trouble when payment was not always the practice among Reds or Whites. The insurgents were shocked at this attitude since they themselves did not shrink from sacrificing their lives for the common cause. One cannot generalize, for it is probable if not certain that with time all these frictions and misunderstandings would have been dispelled, but these examples are, all the same, illustrative of the revolutionary minimalism of certain workers. It was on these grounds and in order to avoid any mistakes that Markno was never thereafter to cease emphasizing the fact that the insurgent movement that bore his name was essentially the emanation of the impoverished peasantry. On November 2, a district congress met in Nikopol. It unanimously sided with the Maknavist movement, and it too called for voluntary mobilization of men aged between 18 and 25 for immediate dispatch to the front, those between 25 and 45 were to form a local self-defense regiment. The congress set up a commission to aid the families of those mobilized and then delegated three representatives to Ekaterinoslav in order to liaise with the insurgent army staff. At that time the insurgency was at its highest point, numbering almost 80,000 fighters and controlling nearly the whole southern Ukraine. Let us note also that at the Alexandrovsk Congress a stringent resolution was passed on the question of drunkenness, any who thus weakened or contributed to the decomposition of the army of the proletariat now risked the firing squad. By contrast the Bolshevik militant Konyevets testifies that he had heard Markno arrange with the head of the insurgent army's intelligence branch, Lev Zadovsky Zinkovsky to have 30 barrels of alcohol, pure alcohol, supplied to Shkuro's Cossacks for the obvious purpose of sapping their fighting spirit. The Alexandrovsk Congress also passed a resolution on the sum to be levied from the bourgeoisie and banks. Alexandrovsk's bourgeoisie was hit with a levy of 50 million rubles but was to cough up only 10 million. A levy of the same size was imposed on Ekaterinoslav but raised only 7 million. Only 15 of the 25 million levied against Berdyansk was collected. Nikopol's contribution, set at 15 million rubles, was in fact to amount to 8 million. 100 million rubles were seized from the Ekaterinoslav banks, of these 45 million were made available to the insurgents, 3 million were distributed to the needy, to combatants' families, and to ex prisoners. All this was done through the good offices of a social assistance office which, initially, sat twice a week and then on a daily basis. According to the evidence of one city resident, published in an official Soviet magazine, such assistance was starkly at odds with the behavior of the whites, and, it is implied, of the reds, quote. This distribution of monies to the population was fairly extensive. It was announced in advance that the poorest could apply to the headquarters of Bakko Markno's insurgent army for material assistance. All that anyone was required to bring with him was his passport so that the social situation of the applicants could be authenticated. There were lots of unemployed and needy in the town, and despite the comparatively moderate cost of living, a pound of white bread then cost five or six rubles, compared with three or four under the whites, thousands waited every morning outside the headquarters. Applicants filed one at a time into the social assistance office. There, one of the members of the Military Revolutionary Soviet, 
an anarchist intellectual, apparently a school teacher, scrutinized the applicant's passport, put a few questions to him to establish the measure of need, prescribed the amount of aid, and entered this in the name of the beneficiary in a ledger. A cashier, seated at another table dipped into bags strewn on the ground for bills and handed over the money without asking for a receipt. Sometimes, if the applicant, male or female, in the latter case only the wives or widows of working men, made a convincing case, the amount allocated could add up to a considerable sum for those days, up to thousands of rubles which could keep a whole family in comfort for upwards of a month. This distribution of help to the poorest of the population was kept up by the Machnavists right up until their very last day there. Help was similarly afforded to the town's children's homes, nearly one million rubles were allotted to them, plus many products, flour, lard, and sausage. One has to give credit to the Machnavists, the children's homes were kept supplied for over a month however, while handing over money for the children's homes, the military revolutionary Soviet declared that the insurgent army was not a charitable organization, and that it would give out no more money. We're only an insurgent army said the military revolutionary Soviet secretary, the anarchist intellectual, to the agent of the children's homes, we only came to defend you against violence from any authorities, be they Bolshevik or Denikinist. The rest is up to yourselves, up to your own actions. Organize yourselves as you wish. The military revolutionary Soviet expressed the same viewpoint in an appeal to the populace to summon a conference that would take charge of the running of the city. A conference that would assemble the working personnel of the city, excluding their exploiters. End quote. This practice on the part of the insurgents is a good illustration of their approach. They took the lead in eliminating state power used by whites, reds, or any other hegemony-seeking faction before inviting workers to get on with self-organization. To begin with, using money levied from the bourgeoisie, they made do with getting the machinery of solidarity underway before stepping back into their purely defensive military function. They handed over another million rubles to the city's hospital which had not been able to function up until then for lack of fines. In fact, the financial issue was secondary for them, they had a clear preference for a natural economy, i.e., direct exchange of goods and services between different worker and peasant associations, their needs allowed. That said, the townsfolk were not yet up to that, as far as they were concerned, they had to get hold of some money. Here too the Machnavists found a very simple solution. All currencies were, to the great annoyance of Soviet historians taken as equally valid, whether they were Nikolivkis, rubles from the days of Nicholas II, Kerenkis, Rubles issued under Kerensky, Putlura's Karbovansi or any other coupons or vouchers all were welcome. Another remarkable achievement of their occupation of Ekaterinoslav, complete freedom of association and expression for leftist organizations and mouthpieces. The Machnavists announced this the moment they arrived in the city, quote. 1. Complete freedom to express their beliefs, ideas, teachings, and opinions, both orally and in writing is offered to all socialist political organizations without exception. No restriction on social freedom of speech or publication can be tolerated, and no persecution along such lines should have any place in the life of the city. Note. Communications of a military nature may only be published provided they have been supplied by the editors of the revolutionary insurgent's main organ, The Road to Freedom. 2. In offering total freedom of expression to political parties and organizations, the army of the Machnavist insurgents warns them at the same time that the cultivation, organization, and erection by constraints on their part of any political authority hostile to the laboring people, which has nothing to do with freedom in expression of ideas, will in no ways be tolerated by the revolutionary insurgents. The Military Revolutionary Soviet of the Army of the Machnavist Insurgents Ekaterinoslav November 5, 1919. End quote. And so, for the first time since February 1917, great freedom of speech, association, and press were introduced in the capital of the eastern Ukraine. During the Machnavist's six-week sojourn, the following publications appeared, unmolested, the, so-called right, social revolutionaries people's power, the left social revolutionaries banner of revolt, the Bolshevik star, the Menshevik's Bulletin, 
the Anarchist Confederation of Ukraine's Nabat, and the two editions, in Russian and in Ukrainian, of the Maknavist Insurgents' Organ, The Road to Freedom. In their publications the insurgents spelled out the meaning of all these achievements, the meaning of the events in progress fits in with the third great insurgent revolution, bringing to the toiling masses emancipation from the yoke of all power in all its forms and manifestations, Nabat wrote in its December 1, 1919 edition. On October 16, the road to freedom asserted that, quote, the difference between Bolsheviks' economic policy and the economic construction proposed by the new course lies in the fact that the Bolsheviks, like all authorities, connect that building closely with the policy of state power, adapting it to the existing battery of state machinery, for its part, the new course, which rejects all state power calls for free organization of this economic construction by anti-authoritarian groups of peasants and workers, unaided. End quote. It should be stressed that this new life was trying to establish itself against a backdrop of continual war. The city was under constant bombardment from Denikinists dug in on the opposite bank of the Dnieper, a factor that accounts for certain restrictions on the rights on the local bourgeoisie. Likewise, the whole region was prey to raids by Mamontovs and Shkuro's Cossacks, whose invasion undid nearly all of the decisions and resolutions reached in Alexandrovsk. Delegates had barely returned to their villages and townships before these were reoccupied by white troops. The situation became even more tense in Ekaterinoslav when a Bolshevik plot was uncovered. For several months past a number of Bolsheviks had been sharing in the Maknavists' struggle, some of them had capitalized on this in order to establish clandestine liaison with one another and to pack the command positions of given regiments. Then they decided to act which is to say mount a coup d'etat against the insurgent staff, to that end, their primary aim was to do away with Markno. On some pretext, they invited him to a soiree, where the plan was to offer him a poison drink. Tipped off by one of its members, the Maknavist intelligence service quickly seized the plotters, the informant had wormed his way into the clandestine Bolshevik liaison, arrested them, and after a speedy trial, had the five main conspirators shot on December 5th. These five were Polonsky, commander of Insurgent's Iron Regiment, his second-in-command, Semchenko, his mistress and actress who was to have played the role of Poisoner, Vayna, a former president of a Red Army court-martial of sinister repute, plus another confederate. Another regimental commander, Lashkovich, who had been later the first man to enter Ekaterinoslav, was also shot for embezzlement and that in spite of his tremendous popularity among the insurgents. Some Denikinist agents, most of them ex-officers, met the same fate. On December 22, Ekaterinoslav was attacked by Slashev at the head of fresh and heavily armed troops. After several days of bitter fighting in an effort to cover the evacuation of several thousand sick and wounded insurgents left behind in the city, the Maknavists were finally obliged to give the place up. As a result, the fourth regional congress scheduled to be held in Ekaterinoslav at the end of December 1919 was unable to proceed. There was a single and principal reason for the weakening of the insurgent army, an epidemic of typhus, an enemy worse than any faced thus far. The whole force and gains of the insurgent movement struggle were thus to evaporate in just a few weeks. By late October many Maknavists had succumbed, on December 11, the insurgent army was already down to 25,000 men, with more than 10,000 wounded or sick. Many were sent home in order to reduce risks of infection, others were hospitalized and perished by the thousands for want of appropriate treatment. Markno and several members of his staff also contracted this ghastly disease. By the end of December, only about 10,000 insurgents were left, and these had fallen back in the direction of the Guliaipoli, Melitopol, and Nikopol area. It was at this juncture that the third party, the Red Army, showed up to reap the benefits of the Maknavists' successes. Especially as the Whites too had been decimated by Typhus and, following the failure of their push against Moscow, the Whites were beating a slow retreat towards their bases in the Caucasus. 20. The New Enemy, the Bolshevik Party State the disintegration of Denikin's rear beneath the concerted blows of Markno and the Greens singularly simplified the Red Army's task, it made do with shadowing the Whites as they retreated step by step in an orderly withdrawal under the command of Rangel and Shkuro. 
The latter beat all records for slowness as he retreated the 80 kilometers from Voronezh to Kastanaya over a three-week period. On the other hand the Red Army made all haste in occupying the terrain cleared by local partisans and in establishing Soviet authority there. Thus came true the allegation by the Maknavists, as reported by Dybets, to the effect that, when there is fighting to be done, the Bolsheviks are nowhere around, and there is no point in looking for them on the front, but as soon as a town is taken by partisans, up they pop and immediately proclaim themselves the new authorities. There, sole aim is to ride to power on the backs of the insurgents. Despite the widespread typhus epidemic and its heavy losses on the field of battle, the Red Army's numbers had constantly grown, by autumn 1919 they had reached the considerable figure of 3 million men. These were reinforced even further by incorporation of partisan bands and white captives. To be sure, only a tiny number of these troops, about 1 in 10, actually saw frontline service and that on different fronts. Confronting Denikin it had only 150,000 troops, regularly relieved as the casualty rate or falling morale of the fighters dictated. Indeed, the whole army represented a rather flabby military potential, the men having been forcibly conscripted, also the Red Army's command had been concerned above all with training them and with grooming them ideologically, then held them in reserve or else used them as occupation troops in the less dependable areas of the country in order to stabilize the Bolshevik order there. The Maknavists made the serious mistake of underestimating this new peril. According to Arshinov, the movement ought to have been strengthened militarily in every area of Ukraine, as far as Oral and Poltava liberated by insurgents under Maknavist influence ought to have been directly occupied in order to forestall the Bolsheviks' intentions. Instead, it was insurgent detachments, like those of Bibik and Agarkin which occupied Poltava and Oral that sought out the Maknavists as the Red Army forced them into retreat. Arshinov accounts for this oversight by citing on the one hand ravages caused by typhus, and on the other dash, the exaggeratedly optimistic outlook of the Maknavists, convinced that the Red Army would never dare come and lay down the law to them, in view of their crucial contribution to Denikin's defeat. The insurgents reckoned that as they had borne the brunt of the fighting and liberated the whole of Ukraine by their own unaided efforts, Moscow simply had to take that into account. The Maknavist High Command had given consideration to whether priority should be given to military reinforcement of the region or to the positive ventures in social and economic construction by the workers. It had come out in favor of the second option, on the basis that through their revolutionary work, the toiling masses would easily see of any attempted interference by any parry. There was another consideration also. The Maknavists had no wish to end up as the new authorities but wished to leave things up to the self-organizational ability and foresight of the workers themselves, and were content merely to let them know how the Maknavists saw things. The following handbill which was circulated at this time is a good encapsulation of this intention, quote. Declaration of the Insurgent Revolutionary Army of Ukraine, Maknavist. To all peasants and workers of Ukraine. For transmission by telegraph, telephone or courier to all villages, all rural districts, all cantons and provinces of Ukraine. For reading at all gatherings of peasants and workers of factory and workshops. Brother Toilers. The revolutionary insurgent army of Ukraine, Maknavist, was set up as a reaction against the oppression of workers and peasants by the power of the bourgeoisie and of big estate owners and by the communist Bolshevik dictatorship setting itself the goal of fighting for the utter emancipation of the toilers of Ukraine from the yoke of those two powers and the creation of a genuinely socialist Soviet order, the army of the Maknavist insurgents has fought doggedly on several fronts to achieve that objective. At this very moment it is bringing to a victorious conclusion its fight against Denikin's army. Liberating region after region and eliminating all power and all organization rooted in violence. Many peasants and workers ask the question, what is to be done now and how? What attitude should we adopt vis-a-vis -vis dispositions taken by the authorities which have been eliminated? And so on. The Pan-Ukrainian Congress of Workers and Peasants will furnish a precise and full answer to these questions, a congress that will have to meet immediately just as soon as it is feasible for the workers and peasants to get together. That Congress will indicate and resolve all the fundamental questions of the life of workers and peasants. 
But given that this Congress will not be able to proceed for some time, the army of Machnavist insurgents regards it as indispensable that the following statement be made on the fundamental issues of the life of workers and peasants. 1. All dispositions taken by Denikinist authorities are rescinded. Dispositions of the communist authorities which conflicted with the interests of the workers and peasants are likewise rescinded. Note. As regards those dispositions of the communist authorities injurious to the workers, it is incumbent upon the latter themselves to identify these and to take decisions at peasants and workers' assemblies in villages and factories. 2. All the landholdings of great estate owners, monasteries, kulaks, and all other enemies of the toilers pass, along with all their livestock, into the hands of peasants who work for their living. This whole transfer should be effected in an organized fashion, by decision of general assemblies of peasants who should be cognizant not only of their personal interest but also keep in mind the general interests of the entire toiling and oppressed peasantry. 3. The workshops, factories, coal and mineral mines as well as other instruments and means of production become the property of the entire working class as a whole which, through its trades unions, takes all enterprises in hand in a concerted way, organizes production there, and moves towards uniting the whole industry of the country into one all-embracing organism. 4. It is proposed to all peasant and worker organizations that they make a start on construction of free Soviets of workers and peasants. Only workers participating in work vital to the people's economy should be elected onto these Soviets. The representatives of political organizations have no place in the Soviets of workers and peasants, given that their participation in a Soviet could turn it into a Soviet of party political deputies, thereby leading the Soviet order to perdition. 5. The existence of Chakers, party political revolutionary committees, and other institutions of constraint, power, or discipline will not be tolerated are non free peasants and workers. 6. Freedom of speech press, association, organization, etc., is the inalienable right of every worker. And all limitations upon that right would appear as a counter-revolutionary act. 7. The state's police, guards, police, militia, are abolished. In their place the population will organize its self-defense. This self-defense cannot be organized other than by the workers and toilers themselves. 8. The workers and peasants Soviets, the self-defense of the workers and peasants, as well as each individual peasant and worker, will not allow any counter-revolutionary action by the bourgeoisie and officers. 9. Soviet and Ukrainian currencies are to have the same value as other currencies. Those who violate this disposition are to be liable to revolutionary sanction. 10. The exchange of the products of labor and trade remains free until such time as the workers' and peasants' organizations shall take charge of that themselves. But it is proposed at the same time that the exchange of the products of labor take place only between toilers. 11. All who shall intentionally obstruct circulation of the present declaration are to be regarded as counter-revolutionaries. January 7, 1920 the Military Revolutionary Soviet and Staff of the Insurgent Revolutionary Army of Ukraine, Maknavist. End quote. This proclamation is of high revolutionary tenor but is suggestive of an overestimation of the potential of a population at that time bled dry and bereft of everything. And the only language that Bolsheviks understood was the language of the balance of military might. Just as they had done a year earlier, they entered Ukraine from the north, and in the absence of power, at least as they saw it, for a free and spontaneous organizing of workers through their grassroots organs, free Soviets federated from the bottom up could not in their estimation be deemed a power worthy of the name, they imposed their own. At the close of a meeting held in Ekaterinoslav on January 1, 1920 following their occupation of the city, they pushed through a resolution that was eloquent and closed with these words, Long live the worldwide Bolshevik Communist Party. Long live the Third International. Down with anarchy. The first encounter between units from the two camps, at the beginning of January 1920, was amicable if not fraternal. Kubinin, the Soviet historian of the Maknovskina reckons that, for the Red Army, Maknovists seemed like allies who had conducted a ferocious struggle behind the lines of the common foe, helping to disorganize him and thereby hastening the shared victory. 
It went without saying that Machnavist units had to subordinate themselves to the overall command of the Red Army. And so the Red Army began to conduct itself as the master thereabouts, intercepting bands of Machnavists then absorbing them into its ranks while dispersing them through its regiments or disarming them and dispatching them home to their hearths. For the reasons indicated earlier, Markno and his staff had fallen back towards the Gulyaipoli region and Alexandrovsk, i.e., they had in fact abdicated all control over the region. Markno, beset by an acute form of exanthematic typhus, was at that moment deep in a coma and would not emerge from that for a good ten days. This was the moment chosen by the 14th Red Army's command to order the Machnavists on. January 8 to surrender on the Polish front where the Bolsheviks were preparing to launch a war of conquest with the aim of achieving a common frontier with Germany, the fatherland of proletarian revolution, according to Lenin prior to Bolshevizing the whole of Europe. Kubanin notes this order while explaining that it was dictated by the need to oust the Machnavist insurgent army from its home territory and thus convert it into a regular army unit. What Kubanin did not know when he came to pen those lines was that the object of the order was to contrive a rift with Markno. Indeed, in an article published some months after Kubanin's work, Levinson, a Ukrainian Bolshevik military official, offered a quite different explanation of the order by reporting the conversation between Yuborovich, commander of the 14th Red Army, and Yakir, commanding the 45th Division. Yuborovich stated that Markno's attitude towards that order will furnish us with definite grounds for our subsequent treatment of him. While Yakir replied that, knowing Markno personally, I know that there is no way he will accept it. Yuborovich acquiesced and concluded, this order is quite patently a political gambit and only that. We do not even expect a positive response from Markno. Further to this individual's cynicism, let us note that several days previously on January 4, he had issued a top-secret instruction for all steps to be taken to disarm the population and wipe out Markno's bands. The most sizable Machnavist detachment, some six regiments strong, that is, about 9,000 infantry and cavalry and stationed in Alexandrovsk at first objected indignantly that there was no way that it was answerable to the Red Army and that it had not needed it to liberate Ukraine and then that Markno and most of their fighting men were still bedridden typhus victims, and finally that it did not feel that war against Poland was any of its concern. Such a response was music to Bolshevik ears in that it furnished them with an excuse to declare Markno and the insurgents outlawed yet again on January 9th. 1920 and openly to fight them. The Red Army High Command sought in this way to avenge its discomfiture of August 1919 at Pomoshnaya when its troops had gone over to Markno. The communique declaring Markno outlawed developed this fallacious line of argument, quote, Decree from the Pan-Ukrainian Revolutionary Committee on the Outlawing of Markno and the Machnavists. January 9, 1920 to all workers, red soldiers, and peasants of Ukraine. Comrades. At last, after incredible losses, our valiant Red Army has been able to crush the capitalists, the Pomieskis, and their confederate, Denikin. But the Ukrainian people's chief enemy, the Polish lords, have not yet been defeated. Coming to Denikin's rescue, they have occupied a whole succession of towns and districts in this country of ours and in Russia alike. The military command is trying everything to achieve a union of all forces fighting against the common foe of the toiling people, Pomieskis and capitalists, and to that end has proposed to the Machnavists that they join the fight against the Poles, thereby assisting the Red Army to liberate our villages and towns from the yoke of the Polish lords and spare workers the enslavement of capitalism. Markno has been unwilling to bow to the will of the Red Army, he has refused to fight the Poles declaring war instead on our peasant and worker army of liberation. In this way, Markno and his band have sold the Ukrainian people to the Polish lords, as Petlura, Grigoriv and other traitors have done. Which is why the Pan-Ukrainian Revolutionary Committee now decrees, Markno and his band are hereby outlawed as deserters and traitors. All who support and assist in the concealment of these traitors from the Ukrainian people are to be ruthlessly annihilated. The toiling populace of Ukraine has an obligation to support the Red Army by every means in its pursuit of the annihilation of Machnavist traitors. This decree is to be read compulsorily by all of Ukraine's revolutionary committees in front of workshops, factory and mine works assemblies and everywhere else. 
The Pan-Ukrainian Revolutionary Committee, Chairman, G.I. Petrovsky, Members, D.Z. Manuelsky, V. Zatonsky, G. Grinko, Kachimki, Kharkov end quote. Not the least startling aspect of this document is the revelation that the main enemy of the people of Ukraine was the Polish lords absent from the area for centuries past. Furthermore, the Polish government was headed by the socialist Pilsudski. Finally, the Bolshevik satraps did not call a halt at such trifles. Any pretext would do, just as long as it justified outlawing the Maknavists. The Maknavists knave it was all too obvious, they reckoned that they had fulfilled their role as revolutionaries so well that the Bolsheviks surely would not dare use calumny against them. But that was to reckon without the hegemonic logic of the Leninist cliques. The decree signaled the beginning of the hunt for Markno. He, unconscious and on the brink of death, was saved only by the devotion of the peasants of the Guliapoli region who took him in and, when his hiding place was discovered, bought time for the ailing Markno to be removed to somewhere safer. The members of the Maknavist staff and the insurgents' main commanders managed to slip through the net and strove to contain the Reds' attacks. The insurgents' military revolutionary Soviet disbanded, its members going underground or, like Volein were picked up by the Bolsheviks. A secret operational report from the 13th Red Army, dated January 31, 1920 notes that the remnants of the Maknavists had been liquidated in the Guliapoli region. The captured booty was enlightening, 13 cannon, 8 machine guns, 120 rifles, 300 prisoners, 60 horses, 50 saddles, 1 field, telephone 4 typewriters, 100 sabers, 50 machine gun ammunition belts, 500 cartridges, and 3 sackfuls of sundry silver items. In fact this operation was a surprise attack directed against the Maknavist staff, during which Nestor's second and last brother, Savili, a quartermaster, was shot merely for his relationship to his leader brother. When this punitive expedition was thought not to have been exemplary enough, the 13th Red Army's commander, Yegorov, ordered the commander of the Estonian division on February 6 to crush the Maknavists from the Guliapoli region once and for all, as well as pitilessly repressing the Maknavists and the population harboring them. He even stipulated that in the event of resistance in Guliapoli, it will be necessary to proceed in the most severe fashion, should circumstances so require. It seems that not all of these efforts were crowned with success, for on February 9, another urgent and secret operational report from the 12th, 13th, and 14th Red Armies reported the capture of the black banner of the Maknavist staff, of three machine guns, 38 rifles, 14 horses, and the recapture of the 42 ND Division's heavy battery, seized a short time before by the Maknavists. For added security, the Red Army Command used Latvian, Estonian, and Chinese riflemen, most of whom spoke neither Russian nor Ukrainian, having no local ties, they were easier to manipulate. What successes were registered in the Guliapoli region led the Red Army Command to believe that the Maknavist movement had been, as they would say, liquidated, it decided thereafter to turn its attention to controlling the territory. They began by having each home painstakingly searched with a view to confiscating all weapons still at the disposal of the population which was, consequently, regarded as potentially hostile. The dissident Soviet General Grigorenko, who has already offered us a description of the abuses of the whites, this time turns his attentions to those of the Reds, quote. Thus, we hated the whites because they had gunned down the first Soviets in 1918. That hate was well justified. Now, it was in 1920 that troikas of the Chika began to raid villages to confiscate weapons remaining in the hands of the populace. We too earned our visit. The president of the Chika, dressed entirely in leather and armed to the teeth, addressed the village assembly, his address could not have been more laconic, he read out a list of hostages, comprising seven notables from the village, and announced that they would be shot unless the population had handed over to the Chika all weapons in their possession by noon the next day. On the following morning, a few hunting pieces, revolvers, and daggers were found outside the premises of the village Soviet. After the midday meal, troops from the military detachment accompanying the three Czechists conducted a search of all homes. In a vegetable garden, indeed, it seems, in the meadow beyond the vegetable garden, they discovered an old blunderbuss. 
the hostages were shot, and the Troika selected seven more. End quote. Oddly enough, these hostages were to be spared, to the amazement of the populace, as the president of this particular Troika had the reputation of never shooting fewer than three batches of hostages. Grigorenko continues, quote, For a long time there was a lot of curiosity and talk about the massacres that the Chica was committing in other villages in the region. There was no end of bloodshed. In one of these villages Novospasovka, the Czechists had even, so it was said, carried out mass shootings. Witnesses claimed to have seen the blood run in spates, forming rivulets, down the slopes of the ravine atop which the executions had been carried out. I did not believe these tales. In 1918, Novospasovka had revolted against the whites and had held out heroically against them for eight months until Markno's army broke the encirclement. And the village, in an expression of gratitude to the Bakko, had supplied him with two regiments of well-armed and battle-hardened infantry. I could not bring myself to believe that the revolutionary authorities could have worked out the sort of people who had fought for them so well. Now, as I learned subsequently, those witnesses had told the truth. In Novospasovka, the Chika had shot down one in every two able-bodied men. Men, who had been capable of insurrection against the whites might very well have rebelled someday against the Reds, that, at least, was the thinking of our leaders, and through the massacre, they had cynically preempted that possibility. End quote. This amounted to outright genocide against descendants of the Zaporogs, a genocide mounted knowingly by the Bolshevik leadership. Pyotr Arshinov, chronicler of the Maknovskina and eyewitness to this war of extermination, reckons, at the most cautious estimate, that for 1920 the number of peasants shot or mutilated by the Bolshevik authorities stood at nearly 200,000 and a similar figure for those deported to Siberia and elsewhere. The white sinister record had been beaten out of sight. Let us also quote the testimony of an anonymous old Bolshevik, published recently, which places on record another aspect of this terror, with the Chika abetted this time by Army Commander Jloba, a Donetsk miner who had become a party stalwart. Faced with resurgent Maknavist activities in the spring of 1920, in the Sinelnikovo region, I-00 hostages were taken from among the well-to-do kulaks, priests, businessmen, etc., of which in fact none too many could have been left by then, and they were handed over to the chica, quote. After questioning, they were led out into the prison yard, and it was demanded of them that they should reveal who the band leaders were who were hiding out somewhere, in their homes, in their barns, and elsewhere. The hostages were warned that, should they refuse, 25 of them would be shot on the spot as responsible for murders and looting. The hostages said nothing. The first 25 in alphabetical order were led 20 paces away and gunned down as the others looked on. Their next of kin were immediately informed, and the corpses handed over to them. End quote. On the second and third days, the scene was reenacted with the same result each time. The last 25 hostages remaining were exhorted to betray Maknavist agents after consideration. The hostages gave the names of Maknavists who had wormed their way into the organs of Soviet power and into the local party leadership. In particular, the chairman of the town Soviet and the secretary of the town's party committee who had gathered around them enemies of Soviet power. These agents were promptly shot. The author of these memoirs, though, never poses the question of how these allegedly well-to-do hostages could have been so well informed about Maknavist infiltration of the Soviet apparatus. It is more than likely the first of them had said nothing because they knew no real Maknavists, and that these last hostages had sought to save their lives and also to work a cruel revenge on the authorities by singling out genuine Leninist supporters whom they misrepresented for the occasion as Maknavists. What bears out this thesis is the insurgents' absolute opposition to having any involvement at all in any state authority as the following address testifies, quote. Address to the peasants and workers of Ukraine, peasant and worker brethren. For upwards of three years you have been fighting against capitalism and thanks to your efforts, your staunchness and your energy, you have now all but concluded that struggle. The enemies of the revolution wore themselves out under pressure from you, and you, sensing the imminence of victory, were nearing success. 
You thought that your constant and often unequal struggle against the revolution's enemies would afford you the chance road make a reality of that free Soviet order to which we have all aspired. But, brethren, you can see who triumphs in our place, they are undesirable masters, these communist hangmen who triumph, they who showed up here when it was all over, treading soil liberated with your blood, by the blood of your brothers and sons who made up the revolutionary insurgent movement. These new lordlings have grabbed all of the wealth of the country. It is not you, but they who do with it, what they will. And you peasants and workers have become their shield, without which they cannot call themselves a worker and peasant government, in which name they are the assassins and hangmen of the people and which allows them through their party rule to tyrannize the people. The people's name allows them all that, and it is for that alone that they have need of you workers and peasants. In every other instance you are nothing to them, and they pay you absolutely no heed. They exploit you, draft you, command and administer you. They destroy everything about you. And you, being oppressed, patiently bear all the horrors of the repression, violence and arbitrariness perpetrated by the communist hangmen, things that can be eliminated only by your widespread protest, only by your revolutionary justice, by a revolutionary insurrection. It is to that you are summoned by your brethren, workers and peasants even as you are, who perish under the gunfire of the red, assassins who, by force of arms, carry off your wheat, livestock and every other foodstuff for a shipment to Russia. It is your own brothers who, taking their leave of life and of the whole radiant future to which we all aspire, call upon you to rescue the revolution, independence and freedom. Think, peasant and worker brethren, that now if you no longer feel freedom and complete independence in your hearts, you will be all the more powerless in the future to determine your fate, and you will not be the shapers of your own happiness and will not yourselves be the masters of your country's riches of the fruits of your very own labor. All that will be done in your stead by new masters invited in by no one, the Bolshevik communist intruders. In order to rid themselves of these undesirable masters, every peasant and all of their best efforts have to be applied to the summoning of clandestine peasant congresses at district and regional levels, at which they should debate and decide upon all of the vital problems of the day, brought about through the unaccountability and dictatorship of these bandits. The interests of the country and of the very toilers of Ukraine require that these new, unwanted lords and masters not be allowed to devastate the country completely, in Ukraine there ought to be no place either for them or for their red killers who tyrannize the people. Without wasting a single day, all peasants should organize themselves through clandestine congresses. Organize clandestine combat units in every village and township, and organize a combat agency to lead them. All peasants should once and for all deny all aid to the communist hangmen and their craven mercenaries, denying them horses and grain and crust of bread alike. The workers in turn should, in town as in countryside, refuse to join the communist party on the supply detachments or in the chica, withhold all participation from communist institutions. The people of Ukraine should declare to the world at large and translate into action, away with white and red killers and hangmen. We pursue the common wheel, light and truth and will not tolerate your acts of violence. Long live the international social revolution of workers and peasants. Death to all white guards and all commissars. Death to all hangmen. Long live the regime of free Soviets. March April 1920, the staff of the insurgent army of Ukraine, Maknavist. End quote. The insurgents set about putting these vengeful intentions into effect on the ground. At the end of February, the division of the Estonian mercenaries which had been so impudent as to ensconce itself in Guliaipoli no less, was suddenly attacked and crushed, all of its military and political officials were executed by firing squads, as for the ordinary soldiers, those who indicated a wish to do so were incorporated into the insurgent units, whereas the rest were stripped of their army uniforms and sent packing. In the months that followed, there were ongoing and scattered clashes on the left bank of the Dnieper. The Red Army's strategy was to track down insurgents, encircle them and if possible, wipe them out, for it took no prisoners. It forgot that the Maknavists were on home ground and moved like the fish in the water, well informed as to the movements of the opposition, they wove between the different enemy units, attacking and scattering the smallest while swooping out of the blue upon the rear of the others. In short, 
they waged a war of harassment without let-up. A high-ranking Red official, Yefimov, in March 1921 when the fight against Markno was still at its height, narrated his whole experience of the war against the insurgents in 1920. First of all, he explains the Red Army's failure to come up with resounding victory by reference to its social composition, essentially peasants, the soldiers and even the officers had little heart for the fight against the Maknavists, implicitly on grounds of class solidarity, for the Maknavists stood for, at best, the local population's aspirations of dispensing with all power, the state being regarded as a burden, a restrictive supervisor. He reckons that the insurgents had learned how to fight against a regular army thanks to Denikina's troops, which of itself speaks volumes about his ignorance of their earlier fighting against Austro-German troops and divines an analogy of sorts between the white strategy and the red strategy against Markno, even in terms of results, which is to say the lack of success by both. He makes out that the main Maknavist detachment relied on numerous small local detachments which from time to time supplied its reserves and which enjoyed every latitude in striking at Czechists and the authorities' requisition squads. According to him the Maknavist movement's cohesion could be put down to its Soviet structure, provided Soviet meant free Soviets which is to say initiatives emanating from the local grassroots. According to Yefimov, all of these reasons lay behind the reverses and lack of success of the Red Army during the first half of 1920 in its dealings with Markno. With the way ahead apparently open, the Bolsheviks introduced into the countryside what Lenin was emphatic in describing as war communism. This innovation was directly inspired by the war socialism of the capitalist states' economies during the 1914 war when a measure of rationing and a degree of socialization had been introduced into the populace's consumption and into industrial production. In Lenin's case, it was concerned only with rationing of consumption, since industrial output was negligible, there could be no barter with the countryside and so it was a question of commandeering all produce and foodstuffs for the benefit, first, of the regime's new class of privileged and of the armed forces, and bottom of the list, the starving city dwellers. Of necessity everything was to be channeled through the state apparatus. The absurdity of this whole system can be grasped if one knows, say, that private individuals were forbidden to fish or hunt, for on pain of punishment, they would then have been required to surrender the product of their endeavors to the state. The same held true for wood, even if everybody was shivering in the winter cold, nobody could go out and chop wood in the forests, for the forests were state property and thus untouchable without risking a charge of stealing state property. In the countryside, what was euphemistically termed requisitioning was in fact nothing more than systematic pillaging of the peasants, they were stripped of everything wheat, seed, pigs, livestock and were generously issued with a receipt. If they demurred and rebelled, they were shot down and their homes put to the torch. Whole villages went up in flames. Such was the practice of communism from above, contemptuous of the most elementary rights of peasants who were labelled kulaks for the occasion. What exactly did these famous kulaks amount to in 1920? Official statistics offer the following figures for the distribution of land among the peasantry. In 1917, 71% of peasants worked less than 4 hectares, while 25% had between 4 and 10 hectares, and just 3.7% owned more than 10 hectares, by 1920, these same categories of peasants amounted, respectively to 85%, 15%, and 0.5% of the whole. So it is quite obvious that even in 1917 the number of well-off peasants and that only comparatively and according to Bolshevik definitions, was quite small, while by 1920 it had become quite negligible. Let us bring into the picture another, even more eloquent criterion, ownership of horses. According to the self-same source, in 1917, 29% of peasants owned no horse, 49% had one, and 17% had two horses while 4.8% used over three horses, by 1920 the respective figures stood at 27.6%, 63.6%, 7.9% 9 and 0.9%. To conclude, the circumstances of peasants had leveled out, and there were so to speak no more kulaks, which is to say well-to-do peasants, save in the Leninists' fertile imaginings. Also, for all their ideological baggage, the latter had always been incapable of coming up with a precise definition of what a kulak was, 
in fact, as far as they were concerned, the word was merely an incantation applied to any peasant independent of the Bolshevik state and thus, according to their paranoid reasoning, hostile to their all-embracing powers. An interpretation that might even be applied to nearly the whole of the peasantry. The worst thing was that strictly speaking, this systematic looting and all of the ghastliness it involved served no purpose at all. Cuban in himself quotes instances when half of the forage collected rotted where it stood and where livestock, seized and dispatched in wagons, perished along the way for want of water and food. All the same, the regime did modify its agrarian policy a little, the number of SAF causes hastily set up in 1919 and which, for the most part, were promptly on course for collapse, fell in 1920 from 1185 to 640, their size shrank even more from 1,105,000 hectares to 341 by 1920. The authorities preferred creating clients for themselves to redistributing these lands among their supporters. As for the diehards, their land was also seized land, wrested from the former Pomeshik at great cost. Kubanin concedes that for the bulk of the peasantry, the Soviet economy was a new and abhorrent form of rule after the fashion of the Polish lords and one which in reality had merely set the state in the place of the former big landowner. The Ukrainian peasantry did not remain passive in the face of this bloody counter-revolution. During the first nine months of 1920, upwards of 1,000 plunderers and Bolshevik agents paid with their lives for their misdeeds. The Maknavists showed them no mercy so much so that soon there were scarcely any more volunteers ready to venture into these areas. Let us note here that out of 10,576 agents mobilized by this regime to carry out these plundering raids, there were only 323 communists, most being dubious elements, members of the criminal fraternity or other parasites attracted by the prospect of easy pickings and the law of a few grams of power. The regime was later to have its work cut out offloading onto the latter all of the excesses committed in its name. Let us also note one subtle ploy on the part of Moscow, the death penalty had supposedly been abolished on February 2, 1920 in Russia, but not in Ukraine where the main conflicts took place. Up to now this fine distinction has escaped the bulk of Western historians of this period. 21. Between Whites and Reds what had become of the Whites while all of this was going on? Following the failure of Denikin's great offensive against Moscow, their retreat had been made in three directions, the Army Corps of General Bredov and Martinov withdrew in a westerly direction, when the Romanians refused to let them cross the border, they followed the Dniester and crossed into Poland where their troops were interned. General Slashev's units withdrew towards the Crimea and dug in behind the Perkop and Henichesk Isthmuses. But the bulk of the anti-Bolshevik forces retreated behind the Caucasus, closely pursued by the Red Cossacks of Jumenko and Budyeni. In view of the collapse of the Denikinist venture, 150 representatives of the Don, Cuban and Turk Cossacks assembled on January 2, 1920, as the supreme circle of Cossacks to draft the constitution of a federative Cossack state. So the break had finally come between the Cossack Gironde and the Denikinist command the Cossacks were no longer willing to serve as cannon fodder of the ambitions of reactionary white soldiery but were content merely to hold their territories against the Reds while hoping to agree to a de facto neutrality with them, but the Reds did not want to know and brought heavy pressure to bear on the front. The incoherence of the White High Command and the increasingly blatant incompetence of Denikin who contrived to have Mamontov and Rangel removed from their posts, they were his most able generals, plus the internal dissensions and the Cossacks' unwillingness to fight, quickly turned this withdrawal into a rout. Taganrog, Rostov, and Novokokask, the main cities on the Don, fell to Red Cossacks. Denikin then decided to fall back into the Crimea, the army of the volunteers and a few thousand Cossacks scurried aboard some Russian and British ships at Novorossiysk in February 1920, abandoning the Cossack armies to their fate. 100,000 Cossacks were taken prisoner by the Reds at Novorossiysk and 22,000 others at Kabardin, on the borders of Georgia, which had denied them asylum. It was a shambles, without really having been defeated militarily, the Whites, thanks above all to the Denikinist High Command, had beaten themselves through insistence upon their political contradictions and their discriminatory conduct towards the Cossacks. 
What remained of their troops were thus in the Crimea, which became the last bastion of the White Movement. The bulk of captured Cossacks were redeployed by the Red Command on the Polish front or elsewhere in the country in order to give them the chance to make amends for what Bolsheviks saw as their straying from the righteous path. No longer willing to be the Whites' cannon fodder, the Cossacks now found themselves between the Devil and the Deep Blue Sea, becoming the blind instruments of Moscow's expansionist designs. Shortly after, Denikin was forced to step down, he left pathetically for exile in Constantinople where his chief confederate and eminence Grise, General Romanovsky, was murdered as soon as he arrived by a white officer. Sensing the same fate stalking him, Denikin quickly moved on to England. On March 22, 1920, a general assembly of the White High Command appointed Baron General Rangel head of the White Movement. Rangel, a German squire of Baltic origins, consented to accept the position of commander-in-chief and set about the task with vigor. Although profoundly imbued with a sense of his own importance and with rather monarchistic views, he was a lot more competent and intelligent than his predecessor. He strove to break out of the isolation of the movement. By attempting a rapprochement with the Poles, Romanians, and Serbs, with some success as far as the latter were concerned. The Serbs handed over to him huge consignments of Russian arms deposited with them during the 1914 war. He renamed the Volunteer Army the Russian Army, restoring its discipline and unified command, and court-martialed General Sidorin, commander of the Army of the Don, and his chief of staff, General Kalchevsky, for irredentism and banished them. Yet he had scarcely any illusions about the likelihood of his enterprise succeeding and prudently paid attention to his rear, making every provision for a speedy evacuation of his entire army from the Crimea, if need be. A sharp customer, he also appreciated that economic and political measures were necessary if his national venture was to have even the merest prospect of success. To that end he announced to press representatives in April that he was working on measures that will allow him who works the land to secure the largest possible tract of land as his personal property. In the future the small peasant proprietor is to be the master of Russian agriculture, landowning on a large scale has had its day. Betterment of the material well-being of the workers and satisfaction of their professional needs represent one of our prime concerns. Unlike Denikin, Rangel also grasped that one should not pursue several quarries at once, he decided to make overtures to all who were fighting against the Bolsheviks, with an eye to union with them. On May 13, he issued the following secret order to all commanders of his units, quote, Should we take the offensive along the way towards achievement of our dearest goal, the eradication of communism, we may come into contact with Markno's insurgent bands, Ukrainian troops, i.e., Putlura's troops, and all the other anti-communist units. In the struggle against the chief foe of Holy Russia, the communists, we are on the same path as all other Russians who aspire as we do honestly to overthrow the gang of Bolshevik aggressors who have seized power through trickery. I hereby order all commanders in touch with all of the above-mentioned groups to coordinate their actions with those of the troops belonging to said groups, with an eye to our basic mission, to topple communism and help the Russian people rebuild its great motherland. End quote. The ulterior motive in this is clear, come what may, the intention was to make use of all anti-Bolshevik forces. Just as the Bolsheviks on their side promised as much and more, once the war is finished, that is, so Rangel proposed to drive them out and then we shall see. The populace placed little credence in blandishments from either side and when unable to take up the fight itself for its own interests, remained, insofar as it was able, indifferent and passive in the face of these power lovers' quarrels. For his part, Markno was not as yet in fate with these speculations, as soon as he was back on his feet, he personally led an implacable fight against the Czechists while simultaneously tackling the plunderers and the Red Army units sent to track him down. Also, he adopted an approach that varied, according to whether he was dealing with officials, Red Army commanders and political commissars. These being cut down immediately, or rank and file soldiers enlisted by force. For the benefit of the latter, the Machnavists organized meetings setting out the motives behind their struggle, before inviting them either to join their ranks or to make their way home, as we can gauge from the following handbill, quote, To the comrades from the Red Army of the Front and Rearguard. 
The Ukrainian people which is oppressed by your commanders and your commissars and sometimes directly by yourselves under the direction of those commanders and commissars, protests at such oppression. You were awaited as the toiling masses liberators from the yoke of the packs of Denikinist executioners. But after your arrival in Ukraine, the groans, weeping and cries of the poor sounded even louder. On every side there were executions, burning of peasant homes or even of whole villages, everywhere plunder and violence. The people are exhausted and cannot put up any longer with the arbitrary. They exhort you all while giving you notice. Are you going to pause before this nightmare and realize whom you are shooting, whom you are tossing into the Chica's dungeons, with whom you are filling the prisons by obeying your commanders and commissars? Are they not your brothers, fathers, sons? Apparently so. And you subject them to all this, without noticing how the bourgeoisie stands back and rejoices, how the officers and generals of the old regime manipulate your freedom and your blindness, comfortably ensconced in their armchairs as they order you to oppress poor folk. And you, comrades, without a second thought, blindly carry out those orders. Has it escaped your attention that they have you persecute poor folk whom they dub counter-revolutionaries because of their protests against the dictatorship of Trotsky's gentlemen and the pack of communists in his entourage, a dictatorship exercised in the name of the authority of a party which is strangling the revolution? Can it be that you cannot see that the Ukrainian Muzik will not bear that yoke and, in spite of worse repressions, that he straightens his bowed back destroying every obstacle and aims to see the task of emancipation through to its term. And it is his belief that there is among you, in the very ranks of the Red Army, a majority of his brothers, themselves peasants, who are oppressed as he is oppressed and who will ultimately understand his protestations and will march with him against the common foe, equally against the Denikinist pack on the right as against the commissarocracy decked out in the people's name on the left. Comrades, examine for yourself what the Chika and the punitive detachments are doing in Russia and particularly in Ukraine. And who abets them? You red soldiers, you and only you. Can your heart remain insensible to the complaints and wailing of your brothers, your fathers, your mothers, and your children? Are you so deceived by the spectral political freedoms they have promised you as to be prevented from ridding yourself of the commissar, that new master, so as to liberate the whole people in this way? in close concert with the workers and peasants, from every yoke and all oppression? Can you possibly be blind to those in your ranks who have at the price of your blood, your lives, hoisted themselves above you and seized power and the right to tyrannize the people so disgracefully? Does your heart not contract when you go into the villages and countryside at the direction of these oppressors to repress toilers who protest against the arbitrariness and oppression to which they are subjected by your leaders? We believe that you must come to your senses and realize that your shame is in remaining silent. That you will protest against the oppression and the yoke visited upon these poor folks. That you will not let your commanders and commissars torch villages and shoot peasants who rise up in defense of their rights. Let the peasants organize themselves as they see fit, and as for you, let you continue to wipe out the Denikinist pack and, along with them, the new master, the commissar. Do not quit the front. Carry on the fight against the wearers of gold braid and exterminate your commissars where they stand. The revolutionary peasantry and the workers will in turn wipe out, behind the lines, the parasites about their necks who exploit them. The revolutionary peasantry and workers will not forget you, and the day will come when you all close ranks together and then let all the parasites and their accomplices watch out. Remember, comrades, that the people have seen through the faucet of the government that you support. The people are in revolt against it, and no army will be able to contain the open-eyed insurgent masses who are fighting for their complete emancipation. Join them, they will welcome you as brothers. Remember that among the insurgents there are your peasant and worker brothers, and if you should encounter them, do not take the initiative of a bloody clash. Let the commanders and commissars march out themselves to do battle with the insurgents. Let them cover themselves in the blood of the workers and peasants, then all of the blame will fall on them, and they will pay dearly for it. Down with the pack of gold braid wearers. Down with those who draw their inspiration from them, the autocratic commissars. Down with artificial laws and man's power over his fellow man. Long live the union of all workers, red soldiers and the insurgent peasant and worker. Death to all braid wearers. Death to the commissars and hangmen. 
Long live the social revolution. Long live the authentically free regime of the Soviets. May 9, 1920 The staff of the insurgent army of Ukraine, Maknavist. End quote. The Bolshevik press regularly carried reports of Markno's death as well as of the final liquidation of the remnants of Maknavist detachments, all the same, their readership was dumbfounded in the long run at the continual reappearance of the Maknavist phoenix. As for the Maknavist prisoners, their fate was settled immediately, they were shot out of hand before the assembled red troops, probably with the intention of deterring potential defectors. In the spring of 1920, Admiral Kolchak's venture petered out, and the foreign expeditionary forces, as well as the Czech Legion, gradually took ship from Vladivostok. With every white front smashed, Lenin decided to concentrate his best troops against Poland as the first step in a Bolshevik crusade in Europe. The Polish military commander, General Pilsudski, anticipated invasion so he launched a preemptive strike in Ukraine himself at the end of April. He quickly scored some successes and seized Kiev. On May 14, the Red Army under Tukhachevsky attacked from the north and drove the Poles back some 100 kilometers, whereupon the Poles brought up their reserve army, seizing back the initiative, and their former positions. The situation remained like that up until the beginning of July 1920. It is worth noting that the Ukrainian nationalists who had been driven into Poland at the end of 1919 fought on the side of the Poles. For their part, the Maknavists mounted some large-scale operations, there were 4,000 insurgents split into two contingents, one of 500 cavalry, 1,000 infantry on 250 Tachankis and with eight cannon, and another of 700 insurgents, i.e., 200 infantry, for cannon and a large array of machine guns. They pressed forward in a highly mobile way, mounting two extraordinary raids through the Red Army's lines. In the first they covered over 1,200 kilometers between May 20 and July 10, setting out from and returning to Guliapoli through the provinces of Kharkov and Poltava in the north of Ukraine. The second raid lasted a month, from July 10 to August 9, and this time was launched over a distance of 1,520 kilometers through the very same regions. The outcome was impressive, 13,400 red soldiers taken prisoner, 26,000 to 30,000 rendered horse to combat, 2,000 of whom were political and military officials who were executed. And the booty recovered was significant too, 5 cannon complete with 2,300 shells, 93 machine guns, 2,400,000 cartridges, 3,600 rifles, 25,000 military uniforms and greatcoats, the 13th Army's field hospital, the 46th Division's entire transport, as well as a ship and an airplane where were set on fire since they could not be put to use. And to this must be added the systematic destruction of bridges, railroad lines, and two armored trains. These large-scale raids were complemented by numerous commando raids against sundry nerve centers, towns or rail junctions which were sometimes attacked several days at a time, leading to panic in Red Army ranks. For instance, on June 21, 1920, a band of 140 Maknavist horsemen launched a surprise attack on the garrison in Guliapoli and carried off 24 cartloads of cartridges. The next day, another band of 200 cavalry and mounted infantry again attacked Guliapoli with the support of six artillery pieces, routing a unit of 300 red soldiers and capturing the 46th Division's transport in its entirety. On June 24, the Maknavists again attacked red units in the vicinity of Guliapoli. Such harrying operations took place simultaneously in different locations, often with significant impact and made the whole region insecure as far as the Red Army was concerned. By this point the Maknavist insurgent army consisted of a core of 3,000 to 4,000 partisans, divided up into 700 to 800 cavalry under Schuss's command, 1,500 to 2,000 infantry mounted on Tachankis, a regiment of machine gunners under the command of Thomas Kosin, an artillery unit commanded by the indefatigable Vladimir Shirovsky and Markno's black guard of some 200 elite cavalry and swordsmen along with a few virtuoso machine gunners. There were also a hundred medical Tachankis, a doctor, and a cultural section whose task it was to publish handbills, appeals and the movement's new mouthpiece, the voice of the free insurgent from a mobile press. 
This section also, when the contingent halted, laid on entertainment, conferences, and meetings. At these, there would be intense propaganda in favor of free Soviets. All of the property and foodstuffs seized from the Czechists and plundering agents' depots were distributed free of charge. Flour, sugar, cloth, wire, leather, iron, furniture, and even gramophones and pianos were distributed in this way to the population. Local insurgent bands sometimes arrived to bolster the core group, but normally they appeared independently so that by September and according to a Petlierist estimate, the Maknavist army had been able to muster upwards of 35,000 men. Point nine. Let us conclude this examination of the manpower by noting that the seriously wounded were left behind under the protection of the populace. Scrupulous about explaining to Red Troops just what their struggle was about, the Maknavists circulated appeals designed for their perusal, quote. Comrade Red Soldiers Your commanders and your commissars deceive you by persuading you that we Maknavists kill captured Red Soldiers. Comrades Your chiefs have invented an unspeakable lie in order to Have you slavishly protect the interests of the commissars lest you surrender to us Maknavists and discover the truth about our worker and peasant Maknavist movement? Comrades, we are in revolt against the yoke of all oppressors. For three years now our blood has flowed on all fronts. We have driven off the Austro-German aggressors, we have crushed the Denikinist hangman, we have fought Petlira, and now we are fighting against the rule of the Commissar's power, against the Bolshevik Communist Party's dictatorship. It holds in its steely grip the whole life of the toiling people, the peasants and workers of Ukraine groan beneath its yoke. In the same ruthless way we shall exterminate the Polish lords who come to stifle our revolution and deny us its gains. We fight against all power and all enslavement, regardless of the quarter whence they come. Our most sworn enemies are the big landowners and capitalists of every land, the Denikinist generals and officers, the Polish lords and the Bolshevik commissars. We chastise them all ruthlessly, executing them as enemies of the toiling people's revolution. But you, comrade Red Soldiers, we regard as our blood brothers with whom we should like to wage, together, the fight for real emancipation, for a genuine Soviet regime free of the oversight of parties or of any authorities at all. Those Red Soldiers whom we take prisoner we release immediately to go where they will, or else we welcome them into our ranks if they indicate any such desire. Already we have freed thousands of Red Soldiers whom we had taken prisoner in countless engagements, and many captured Red Soldiers are currently and selflessly fighting in our ranks. So do not believe, comrade Red Soldiers, the tall tales of your commissars to the effect that Maknavists kill Red Soldiers. It is a sordid fossid. When they dispatch you against the Maknavists, do not, comrade Red Soldiers, stain your hands with brother's blood. When the fighting begins, kill your commanders yourselves and without turning your arms against us, come over to our side. We will receive you as our very own brothers, and together we will create for the workers and peasants a free and equitable life, and together we will fight against all who attack and oppress the toiling people. Long live the fraternal union of the Maknavist revolutionary insurgents with the peasants and workers, Red Soldiers. June 1920 The Maknavist Onurgents End quote. Such active counter-propaganda on the Maknavists' part sometimes brought spectacular results, the 522nd Red Regiment defected to them in its entirety which fact Cubanin disguises by speaking of their capture, for it was not seemly to acknowledge such a dismal failure of Bolshevik indoctrination. Happily, we have here a refutable proof in the shape of the appeal issued at the time by the Red soldiers of the 522nd Regiment themselves, quote, Appeal. On June 25, 1920, we, the Red Soldiers of the 522nd Regiment, defected without a shot fired and with all our equipment and arms to the Maknavist insurgents. The Communists have harassed us and ascribed our defection to the Maknavist insurgents to a brainstorm and a tendency towards banditry, all of which is merely a squalid craven lie on the part of commissars who had hitherto used us as cannon fodder. During our two years' service with the Red Army, we reached the conclusion that the whole social regime of our lives relied wholly upon the rule of commissars and that in the last analysis it would lead us to a slavery without precedent in history. Because they conduct an implacable fight against the wealthy and the lords, 
because they stand for free union and Soviets among the workers and peasants, without the dictatorship of any party, because they fight so that the workshops, factories, and land may pass into the hands of the workers. And peasants, because the Machnavists fight for all these goals, we also find ourselves at their side. Because of these very same aspirations, we, yesterday's Red Soldiers and today's Free Revolutionaries. Comrade Red Soldiers. Follow your comrade's example. We reckon that the spirit of revolutionary struggle for the self-determination of toilers has not yet died in you. We hope that the commissars have not yet extinguished once and for all your determination to fight all plunder and oppression. Heed us and let not your brother's blood be shed in vain. Stand firm. Be heroes and follow our example. Our fraternal embrace awaits you. The Red Soldiers of the 522nd Regiment, now Machnavists. End quote. Other Red Soldiers deserted or defected to the Machnavists, and this created increasing anxiety among the Bolshevik leadership. The Ukrainian Chika complained of being unable to find any more competent Czechists and volunteers to serve on requisition squads or even to work in local Soviet organs. Even more characteristic was a report from the Donets Chika which acknowledged that to the populace the Machnavists appeared as natural defenders against commissars and communists. So much so that the supreme head of the Chika, Jezinsky, arrived to supervise the campaign against Machnovia personally and drafted an address in a very special tone aimed at the peasants of Ekaterinoslav province, quote. Baron Rangel makes no secret of his being an enemy of the people. Markno is a thousand times more criminal and cowardly. He styles himself defender of the workers and peasants. This upstart has the effrontery to charge the worker-peasant government of Ukraine with failing to adequately defend the workers and peasants and to offer himself as their sole genuine defender while he lives in luxury off his booty, exclamation point, he does not hesitate to have railway bridges blown up and supply trains to the Donets miners sabotaged. It is true that decent, conscientious peasants have long since turned away from him, but there are still some who lack conscience and let themselves be misled by him. To these we declare that he has openly allied himself with counter-revolutionaries and Pomieskis. We say that, not as a hypothesis but as a proven fact, as shown by recently seized documents. End quote. Jerzinski noted Markno's liaisons with the Petliurists, which is to say, according to him, with the Polish lords, from this he deduced that Markno is an agent of Petliura and the Polish government. This allowed him to lump Markno with Rangel, Pilsudski and Petliura, thus making him a supporter of restoration of the power of the accursed Pomieskis, Tsarist generals, and the Hetman's Varta. This sinister, deadpan comic suffered from an all too visible surfeit of information and in this regard was well behind his party colleagues who were nothing of the sort. However, he did not shrink from closing his text with an incredible call for the tracking down and extermination of the Machnavists like savage beasts. All assistance to these bandits is to be regarded as the greatest crime against the revolution, any found guilty of that would deserve the severest punishment by the worker peasant government. These Machnavist bandits must be deprived of all assistance in manpower and supplies. They must be driven from the peasant catters. The village that allows any of its residents to collaborate with Markno is to be leveled and will incur the severest punishment measures. This latter appeal to people to turn informer was nonetheless followed up with a promise of clemency for repentant Machnavists who would go and expiate their sin against the revolution on the Polish front. All the usual police ploys were there with just a touch of religious inquisition in expiating. Sin. That would be worthy of any church father of a bygone age, were it. Not that Jerzynski was the son of a Polish squire, a convert some twenty years previously to the cause of social democracy a man whose bloodthirsty fanaticism inspired the greatest fear even in his own party colleagues. Carried after his death in 1926 following a stroke during an angry speech, Rodek, one of the stars of the party, was, to declare that Jerzynski had died just in time. He was a methodical sort and would not have hesitated to redden his hands with our blood. Unfortunately, methodical types of that sort were plentiful in the Chica and had no hesitation in tracking down and exterminating the Machnavists like savage beasts or in leveling Machnavist villages. The insurgents preferred to urge the Red Soldiers, 
used as the doors of this dirty work, to reflect upon what it signified, stop. Read. Reflect. Comrade Red Soldier. You have been sent by your commissar and commander to persecute Macnavist insurgents. At the instigation of your leaders, you are going to bring peace-loving people to ruination, to search, arrest and kill folk whom you do not know personally but who will be pointed out to you as enemies of the people. They will tell you that Macnavists are bandits and counter-revolutionaries. Without consultation with you, they will tell you, will order you, and will send you like a slave subject to your officers, to search and destroy. Who? Why? To what end? Think on it, comrade red soldier. Think on it, peasants and workers as our red soldier brethren. We have rebelled against enslavement and constraints, and we fight for a radiant better future. Our ultimate ideal is to arrive at a non-authoritarian community of toilers, free of parasites and commissar officials. Our immediate goal is to install a free Soviet regime without the power of the Bolsheviks, without the predominance of any party. Because of that, the government of Bolshevik communists dispatches punitive expeditionary corps against us. It hastens to reach a reconciliation with Denikin. With the Polish lords and other white guard scum, the better to crush the popular movement of the revolutionary insurgents who have risen up against the yoke of all authority. We do not fear the threats of the white red leaders. We shall return violence for violence. When necessary, we put any Red Army division to fight at top speed merely by applying some slight pressure, for we are free revolutionary insurgents, and the cause we defend is a just cause. Comrades. Think, whom are you with and whom against? Do not be a slave, be a man. June 1920. The Macnavist Insurgents. End quote. This appeal did not address itself to the base instinct as Jerzynski did but rather to the genuine revolutionary consciousness of the individual red soldier who had been swept willingly into a fratricidal combat. During this period of raids, in June-July 1920, a Soviet of revolutionary insurgents of Ukraine, Maknavists, saw the light of day, it was made up of seven members, elected by the partisans. This was the leadership body of the movement, and its decisions had at all times to seek endorsement from the rank and file. Essentially, it had oversight of three branches of the insurgent army, the branch in charge of military affairs and operations, the branch in charge of organization and control, and finally the educational and cultural branch. The fight against the Bolsheviks was conducted in the name of the Third Revolution, namely the one that came after the first one, directed against Tsarism and after the second, whose target was Kerensky's bourgeois revolution, and which was now targeting the Bolshevik autocracy and party dictatorship. Henceforth, this was to be the banner that was to rally all revolutionary supporters of free Soviets. This dogged and, above all, successful struggle against the Red Army aroused Rangel's attention. The Baron General had himself scored some notable successes with the seizure of the Northern Tavrida in June 1920. He had, in particular, literally pulverized the 30,000 men of Jloba's army corps, the very same Jloba who had been so at ease in repressing the unarmed populace. An initial emissary, a captain, reached Markno near Marupol on July 9 and passed on a message bearing the signature of General Shatilov, Rangel's chief of staff. It proposed that Ataman Markno cooperate in the fight against the communists and fight them even more energetically ravaging behind their lines and destroying their transport so as to crush Trotsky's army once and for all. Rangel's high command proposed, in pursuit of this goal, to supply material, the requisite munitions and send him specialists. Kubanin notes this proposition, stating that the proof of the pudding was in the eating and noting that the whites based this military cooperation on a remarkable evolution in their political and economic principles which they strove to effect in territories occupied by them while acknowledging their past errors, quote. Land was transferred to the peasants without buyback from former landlords and through the regional peasant congress's good offices, all local self-management agencies were afforded the widest democratic autonomy, and regions of specific ethnic culture were declared autonomous of Russia, while remaining federated with her. End quote. The Maknavists had no truck with military advice, 
nor with laws and decrees running their lives as they had never looked to anyone but themselves for resolution of their own affairs. Outraged, they had the unfortunate emissary shot out of hand. A little later, a second envoy from Rangel, a colonel this time, arrived among them to repeat the offer of collaboration between their two camps. He was hand with a placard reading, no agreement between Markno and white guards has been or ever will be feasible, and all white emissaries will share this one's fate. Whether because this had not been reported to him, or deliberately, Rangel went on conducting an intensive campaign of misrepresentation, inside Russia as well as abroad, concerning his alleged alliance with the Maknavist insurgents and the Ukrainian peasantry. Truth to tell, he was greatly abetted by the floods of calumnies gushing forth from the Bolshevik press. For their part the Bolsheviks' leaders were conspiring at several levels, incapable of bringing the insurgents to heel, they resorted to more subterranean methods, some anarchists, or individuals reputed to be such, and common criminals, ready to tackle anything if the price was right, infiltrated Ukrainian libertarian organizations and then, having picked out the most active militants, lured them into the clutches of the Chika. Brandishing the threat of execution, the Chika then did its best to force them to work for it. One of the latter, Fedya Glaushenko, a member of the insurgent movement's intelligence branch, was thus commissioned by the Kharkov Chika to assassinate Markno. Joining Markno on June 20, he repented at the last minute and aborted the assassination plan. Despite his having reneged, Glaushenko was shot the next day, along with a Czechist killer, on the grounds that a revolutionary may not, no matter what the reasons, serve in the secret police, as was announced by the Soviet of the revolutionary insurgents, Maknavists, in a track disclosing the details of the whole affair. That attempt having foundered, the Bolsheviks resorted to another destabilization plan, they remotely controlled a member of a minority in the Social Revolutionary Party into persuading insurgents to interrupt their struggle against the Bolsheviks and instead to join forces with them against Rangel, who was portrayed as the greatest danger, as the minutes of the June 23, 1920 meeting between this curious delegate and the insurgent Soviet testifies, quote, Comrade Mick, reporting on behalf of the, minority, Social Revolutionary Party of Alexandrovsk, states that, in view of the Whites' terrifying offensive, it is crucial that all revolutionary forces unite in order to make a concerted effort to halt the Whites' progress. The, minority, left Social Revolutionary Party's committee has delegated him to Markno, with the agreement of the Bolsheviks who suggested that he act as a go-between in arriving at a general compact against the Whites he calls upon the assembly to cease all conflict with the Bolsheviks until such time as the enemy has been beaten. All political differences and hostilities against the Red Army must cease until victory is assured against Rangel and the Poles, the quartermasters of a monstrous counter-revolution. In his view, a libertarian society is not practicable in the short term, and he proposes that support be given to the idea of a worker's power. He points out the differences of opinion to be found existing within the Bolshevik Party and the Social Revolutionary Party. Comrade Polevoy responds directly and dearly to him regarding his propaganda in favor of a worker power. He states that we Maknavists have experienced all sorts of authorities on our backs and will not let ourselves be snared by a change in the name of the authority. The nature of all authority, whether it be Rangel or the Bolsheviks, is essentially identical. He puts two questions to Comrade Mick, one, is he delegated solely by his organization, or is he also delegated by the Bolsheviks who, on several grounds, are unable to send their own delegates? Two, is he aware that the Bolsheviks who do not aim to annihilate Rangel alone, have just sent us a special delegation? One that was armed and was supposed to assassinate Comrade Markno, is he aware of that? Comrade Mick, apologizes for his propaganda on behalf of a worker's power. His organization has decided to have no truck with the unlawful communists, to wit, the Chika, who harm their party's cause. His present mission has the full endorsement of the Bolsheviks, he gives assurances that our, Maknavist, delegation, sent to a general assembly involving all organizations in Alexandrovsk, would have every necessary assurance from the Bolsheviks relative to its security. Comrade Viktor Popov, by whom and to what end Comrade Mick has been sent, I do not know. 
But on one point only there can be no doubt, thus far the Bolsheviks have set no traps, without quite furnishing proof of their good faith, when they have sought to use us for their purposes. Moreover, can we have anything at all in common with communists who dispatch punitive detachments into our villages and savagely gun down our parents? Of course we are going to fight Ranjul and, if need be, we will take them all on simultaneously. Alliance with the Bolsheviks would do great prejudice to the cause of revolution. Comrade Markno, I insist that the greatest attention be paid to Comrade Mika's mission. It has been wholly Bolshevik-inspired and without question they have set him very specific objectives. Comrade Kurilenko proposes that a dear and unequivocal answer be given to the delegation. Already there are rumors circulating in the region regarding the arrival of a Bolshevik delegation, which may have serious consequences for our front's combat capabilities. Comrade Belash, in spite of the talks with Bolsheviks, proposed that our fight against them be carried on. Comrade Popov, remember how the Bolsheviks presented an amiable face whenever they were six in dire straits and what black guards they turned into again once they had regained power. He offers to look thoroughly into the proposition and to devise a speedy answer to it. Comrade Taranoxi, the Soviet should give an answer to the Social Revolutionary Party's request. Comrade Mochenko, comes out against any alliance with the Bolsheviks who merely seek to use us. Comrades de Menci, Belash, and Agarkin are of the same opinion. Comrade Budinov, we shall provide a written reply wherein we shall declare that as revolutionaries we are going to fight Ranjul but wholly independently. End quote. The object of the exercise was plain, either way the Bolsheviks would come off best. In the event of a refusal, Machnavists were to be depicted as the objective allies of the whites and adversaries of a sacred revolutionary unity in the face of the reaction. In the event of an acceptance and since the proposal had not emanated directly from the Leninist authorities, the insurgents would then be presented as having sued for it, acknowledging the Bolsheviks as the rallying point for revolutionary forces and thus as the workers' legitimate defenders. In any event, availing of the formal services of a satellite organization, they retained a free hand to pursue their war of extermination against insurgents. But the latter instantly grasped what this gambit was about, even so, it did manage to sow confusion in the minds of some. 22. The Second Alliance with the Red Army In the summer of 1920 the main focus of the Moscow leadership's attention was the position on the Polish front. On July 4, having marshaled 600,000 men, a third of them in the front line, the Red Army commander-in-chief on that front, Tukhachevsky, launched a fresh and powerful offensive from Russia. Attacked on their left flank, the Polish troops who had ventured into Ukraine and far from their bases, were forced to effect a spectacular, 600-kilometer withdrawal which brought them to the banks of the Vistula within 40 days. The chancelleries of Europe became alarmed, for the professed aim of this thrust was to export the Bolshevik Revolution to the Old World. So much so that at the end of July, France dispatched a military mission headed by General Weygand, Fokker's chief of staff to lend a hand to the Poles. The membership of this mission included a certain Captain de Gaulle. Warsaw prepared for its own Battle of the Morn. The Red Army chiefs were confident of the success of their undertaking and comforted by their previous victories over Kolchak and Denikin. However, they had not properly analyzed the roots of those successes, in particular, they had neglected to take account of the decisive contribution made by Greens and local partisans, as well as of the loss of stomach for the fight on the part of the Cossacks and simple soldiery of the White Armies. The Poles were a quite different kettle of fish, their country had been under the heel of Russian Tsarism for over a century and a half, as far as the populace was concerned, the Red Army and the Bolsheviks were the worthy successors of Tsarist expansionism and were perceived as invaders not as the liberators the Leninists, blinkered by their formal proletarian dialectic, imagined themselves to be quite the contrary, Poland's working people lined up with their national socialist leaders. This nationalistic factor played a crucial role. Inferior in numbers and indeed militarily, dressed and armed, in makeshift fashion, but galvanized by extraordinary patriotic zeal, 100,000 Poles with Pilsudski at their head embarked on August 16 upon a fantastic push, 
they drove the invaders right back and in less than six days covered 200 kilometers, smashing every Red Division in their path. Under this tremendous battering the Red Army disintegrated, with its units fleeing in unbelievable disarray, some were decimated or wiped out, others surrendered in their tens of thousands while still others were forced to seek refuge in eastern Poland where they were relieved of their weaponry and interned. It was the greatest military disaster of these war years, 250,000 Red soldiers taken prisoner and 100,000 of those interned in Poland. The panicking Kremlin authorities scurried to open peace talks with Warsaw, regardless of conditions. Meanwhile, Rangel had dispatched Piotr Struve, the man who had introduced Marxism into Russia and who was now a disenchanted liberal, to Paris to sue for French backing, or, failing that, support from the British. Indeed, in view of the collapse of Kolchak and Denikin whom they had assisted on a huge scale, the British Prime Minister, Lloyd George, saw fit to wash his hands of the whole business, the consideration at the back of his mind assuredly being preservation of Britain's Asian possessions India included from possible revolutionary contagion. As for the French, what prompted them to help Rangel was, first of all the desire to support those who had never recognized the shameful Treaty of Brest-Litovsk and also the urge to ease pressures on the warring Poles as far as possible. The French believed themselves bound to the Poles by long-standing affinities and also by the prospect of being able to jock their sworn enemy Germany in a vice of which Poland would be the other pincer. As for Struve, in a letter to Prime Minister Miller and on June 20, 1920, he spelled out General Rangel's underlying motives, quote, Rangel, is far from believing that, the re-establishment of order and liberty in Russia can be secured through a merely military effort. He appreciates the necessity of a protracted pacification campaign designed above all to meet the needs of the peasants who account for the vast majority of the Russian people. That population seeks neither restoration of the old order of things, nor communist tyranny. To cater for the interests of the peasant population, to cleanse the moral life of the country, to rebuild its economic life, to unite all orderly factors, these are the goals that the commander-in-chief of the armed forces of southern Russia has set himself and which should, he reckons, lift Russia out of the condition of anarchy into which she has been plunged by the communist regime which has turned her into a testbed for monstrous social experiments without precedent in history. End quote. Having thus received assurances regarding the Baron General's democratic intent, the French government afforded de facto recognition on August 10 to the government which he had formed. This was help of a quite platonic sort, but it was useful, for it allowed Rangel to recover the arms stock stored in Romania and in countries under Allied influence. Stimulated by this support, Rangel launched a sweeping offensive along the left bank of the Dnieper that August. Despite heavy losses every one of the officers commanding battalions and companies of the White's 1st Army Corps was rendered hors de combat Rangel's troops pushed the 13th Red Army back onto the right bank of the Dnieper and drove the front back as far as the Alexandrovsk Bergensk line. For the Reds, this was Black August, as all their counter-offensives were smashed one by one. However, the balance of numbers was still tilted in their favor, they lined up, 250,000 men, a third of them in the front line, against 125,000 whites of whom 25,000 to 30,000 were in the front line. The latter made up for numerical inferiority with the courage of their fighting men and above all with the inspired deployment of some 25 aircraft. 100 tanks and the armored trains at their disposal. Their greatest problem was the question of reserves, they were desperately short of the manpower needed if they were to develop their offensive further. True, there were the thousands of captured Red troops and officers upwards of 30,000 captured during August who voluntarily enlisted in their ranks until, towards the end, they accounted for nearly 90% of the Whites' manpower. But whereas they fought their former colleagues in arms with a good heart, these defectors were not sufficiently battle-hardened nor politically reliable enough in the long term, this despite Rangel's recourse to a certain equivocation about his campaign's ultimate objectives and his adoption of a language with democratic overtones. Thus on July 5 in an interview with the newspaper Velikaya, Russia, Great Russia, he declared, quote, Why we fight? To that question, General Rangel declared, there can be but one answer, we fight for freedom. On the other side of the front, to the north, arbitrariness, oppression, and slavery prevail. 
One may entertain the most diverse notions as to the suitability of this or that system. One may be a Republican, a radical, a socialist, a Marxist even, and yet recognize that the Soviet Republic is merely the expression of an unspeakable, sinister despotism which is eating away at Russia and indeed its self-styled ruling class, the proletariat which is oppressed just like the rest of the population. By now this an open secret to Europe. The veil has been snatched away from Soviet Russia. It is in Moscow that the reaction has its nest. It is there that tyrants who treat the people like livestock reside. As for ourselves, one would have to be blind or malicious to call us reactionaries. We are fighting to release our people from a servitude the like of which even the darkest days of their history knew not. For a long time there has been no understanding in Europe, though it seems that such understanding has begun to develop of what we so clearly appreciate, the universal significance of our domestic struggle. End quote. Such soothing words and the socio-economic reforms introduced in the occupied territories came too late, however, the impression prevailing among the laboring population was that, in spite of everything, the whites would sooner or later bring back the old order, at any rate in Ukraine, for Rangel's posturing and campaign would certainly have enjoyed greater success in Russia where the populace had not sampled the executions of the Denikinist occupation. This psychosocial political factor is an essential one but was quite redundant after 1919, since when sides had been chosen once and for all. Rangel's strategic plan consisted of attempting to develop his offensive in two directions, in the west, towards Poland, so as to ease the pressure from the Red Army, this at the beginning of August, and reach the 45,000 men of the 3rd Russian Army of General Bredov in internment in Poland, and in the east to reach the Don territory to join up with remnants of the Cossack armies of the Caucasus who were fighting on against the Bolsheviks. He also made provision for disembarkation in the Cuban of a 5,000-strong Cossack contingent commanded by General Ulagai. Mounted at the start of August, this landing at first took the enemy unawares. Ulagai met with success after success as he marched towards Ekaterinoda, but made the mistake of dallying somewhat along the way affording the Red Army time to regroup its forces and halt his offensive. Three weeks later Ulagai boarded ship again for the Crimea along with his reinforced army of 10,000, which had grown to that size despite the heavy losses sustained. On the other hand, the thrust eastwards was making headway and by September the Whites had reached Ekaterinoslav, Marupol and the borders of the Don. White propaganda about peasant support and regarding their alleged alliance with Markno was continually taken up by the Bolshevik press. This crossfire of misrepresentation eventually led to belief that this was indeed the case. Some fell into the trap, including some insurgent detachments cut off in the region under occupation by Rangel. Some of these did indeed join the White Army and formed a division bearing the Bakko Markno name, curiously flying a black flag bearing the Maknavis device with the oppressed, always against the oppressors. Alongside Rangel's for Russia won and indivisible. The Maknavists tried to give the lie to this rumored alliance by going off to fight the whites, but every time they tried to move up to the front, they were attacked from behind by red troops. Also, they were aware of the rout inflicted on the reds by the Poles and believed a complete collapse of the red front against Rangel to be imminent, and were induced to wonder about a suspension of hostilities with Moscow. A bitter argument raged inside the movement Soviet of revolutionary insurgents, a narrow majority emerged in favor of a military alliance with Moscow. According to Kubanin, Kirilenko and Belash were for this, while Viktor Popov and Semyon Koretnik were against and Markno was torn both ways. A general assembly of insurgents was called and after lengthy deliberations came out in favor of a compact. Telegrams to this effect were sent off to the Kremlin. Not that the fighting ceased, Though, on August the 24th and 25th there was a serious clash with the Red Army. Early in September, two Red regiments of Don Cossacks were routed, the Maknavists then captured the town of Starobelsk, north of Ekaterinoslav and not far from Kharkov. There they seized four machine guns, 40,000 cartridges, 180 horses, and dispatched home some 1,000 deserters who had been confined to barracks by the Red Army. One piquant detail is that according to an article in the Moscow Izvestia in 1962, the Maknavists were allegedly indirectly responsible for the death of the journalist John Reed, the victor surge of America. 
On the return trip from Baku where he had attended an Oriental Congress of sympathizers with the Communist International, he was forced to fire on insurgents who attacked his train. After the bandits had fed, he greedily drank water from a spring near an embankment, and most likely polluted, being shaken and parched. Upon arrival in Moscow, John Reed was stricken by a severe bout of typhoid fever and died on October 17. Having initially feigned lack of interest in talks between the Machnavists and its emissaries, Moscow now determined to intervene directly and on September 20 selected as plenipotentiary the one-time seminarian V. Ivanov who had embraced the new Leninist doctrine. The military leaders were not yet au fait with the vault farce of their political head, for the commander of the Ukrainian front, Sergei Kamenev, an ex-colonel of the Tsarist army's staff who had transferred his loyalty to the new authorities, ordered his troops on September 21 to liquidate Markno's bands once and for all. That same day, a secret political directive from N. Gorbunov, chairman of the 13th Army's Revolutionary Soviet explained that, quote, Victory over Rangel will free Red Army units presently operating in the south, for deployment in the speedy and complete eradication of the banditry of the Makhnovskina and other groups, and will install a solid revolutionary order throughout the whole Ukraine. Banditry and the Makhnovskina are extensions of the civil war and are deliberately organized by Rangel's white guards. Let but Rangel vanish and Markno will vanish along with him. End quote. For the time being such bellicose intent was put on the back burner by the political leadership. The Ukrainian Communist Party's Politburo meeting on September 29, 1920 with Rakovsky, Kosha, Chubar, Ivonov, Drobnis, Yakovlev, Teplevsky and Blakitny in attendance, decided to direct the party's clandestine organization in the Rangel-occupied zone to assist the Makhnovists while centering its intention on the strengthening among these Makhnovists of discipline and the spirit of revolutionary unity, to bring red units into contact with the Makhnovists in operational terms if the need arose, without seeking to amalgamate with them, and finally not to oppose the release of anarchists and Makhnovists from Chika custody. The pact was concluded on September 30. Franz, the new commander of the Southern Front, formalized it on October 2, announcing that a cessation of hostilities had been decided at the request of the Makhnovist Army, on the basis of its acknowledgement of Soviet power and of its subordination to the Red High Command, whilst retaining its own internal organization. A Makhnovist delegation of Kurilenko and Popov journeyed to Kharkov to thrash out the fine print of the clauses of the agreement. This was completed, not without problems, towards the middle of October and published shortly afterwards in the Soviet press in two parts, the military and the political, with the overall implications being thus obscured from the view of the readership. This agreement was widely reproduced in Soviet works as well as by Arshinov, so, we shall quote only the essential passages. I. Political part. 1. Immediate release and cessation of all future persecution in the territories of the Soviet republics of all Makhnovists and anarchists, excluding those who might wage armed struggle against the Soviet government. 2. Complete freedom of agitation and propaganda, both oral and written, of their ideas and conceptions for the Makhnovists and anarchists, exclusive of calls for the overthrow of the Soviet government and with military censorship being observed. For their publications, the anarchists and Makhnovists, as revolutionary organizations recognized by the Soviet authorities, may use the whole technical apparatus of the Soviet state, while submitting to the regulations on the publishing technique. 3. Free participation in elections to the Soviet, with Makhnovists and anarchists being entitled to run for election and freedom of participation in the preparations for the convening of the forthcoming Fifth Pan-Ukrainian Congress of Soviets due to take place in December of this year. By order of the Soviet government of Ukraine Y.A. Yakovlev, plenipotentiaries of the Soviet and command of the insurgent revolutionary army of Ukraine, Makhnovist Kurilenko, Popov. 2. Military part. 1. The revolutionary insurgent army of Makhnovists becomes part of the composition of the armed forces of the Republic, as a partisan army it is subject in operational matters to the supreme command of the Red Army and retains its internal structure, free of the intrusion of the foundations and principles of the Red Army's regular units. 2. The Makhnovists insurgent revolutionary army, 
in moving through Soviet territory in the direction of the front and across France, undertakes not to accept into its ranks any Red Army unit or any deserter from the latter. End quote. Other, additional points concerned the obligation upon the insurgents to brief all of their supporters about this agreement so as to secure cessation of all actions hostile to Soviet authorities. Finally, the insurgents' families were awarded the same rights as those of Red Army troops. This second part bore the signatures of the Commander-in-Chief of the Southern Front, Franz, of the members of the Front's Revolutionary Soviet, Belakuan, and Guzev, and of the Maknavist plenipotentiaries themselves. Point four of the political part was, for the moment, left in suspension, for it related to the unhindered organization, in territories controlled by the Maknavist army, of economic and political self-managerial agencies. While autonomous, these were to liaise with the organs of the Soviet Republic. Kubanin assesses this agreement as crucial for both sides. The regime of free Soviets could not, in his view, but be wholly unacceptable to the dictatorship of the proletariat. Thus, the accord could function only as long as a common enemy existed. In a report on the domestic and foreign situation which came to light only after publication in 1959, Lenin declared on October 9, 1920, that, according to Comrade Trotsky, the Mark No question has been very seriously discussed in military circles and it has emerged that there were only advantages to be expected of it. This can be explained by the fact that the elements grouped around Mark no have already sampled the Rangel regime and what it has to offer does not satisfy them. By concluding an agreement with Mark no, we have secured a guarantee that he would not march against us. This declaration fairly encapsulates the Bolsheviks' intention of neutralizing the threat that Markno posed behind their lines, especially as, after nine months of all-out warfare against him and despite communiques regularly announcing its liquidation, actual or in prospect, the Maknavist movement, which was still strong and active, was able, according to Yakovlev's estimates, to field a core detachment of between 10,000 and 12,000 partisans. Also, since the turn taken by the war on the Polish front, where they had been so sure of victory, the Bolsheviks no longer underestimated Rangel's offensive, thus back up from insurgents who were familiar with the region and had already been broken into the fight against the whites was very precious to them. They knew too that this agreement was going to reconcile the local populace to them and that this would have a knock-on effect upon Red Army morale which had plummeted since the Warsaw disaster. They had everything to gain from this very fortuitous windfall and agreed to nearly all the Maknavists' conditions, granting an amnesty for past acts of war and freeing imprisoned insurgents and anarchists. At the instigation of the Maknavists, they went so far as to carry in their newspapers a scathing refutation of all the calumnies which they themselves had been peddling up until then, quote. Communique from the People's Commissariat for Military Affairs of the Soviet Republic of Russia on the conclusion of a politico-military compact with Markno. October 20, 1920. As we know, the French press has often spoken of an alliance between Rangel and Markno. The Soviet press in its turn has also published documents testifying to a formal alliance between Markno and Rangel. This information has now been shown to be false. Without any doubt, Markno did, objectively, abet Rangel and the Poles by fighting the Red Army simultaneously with them. But there was never any formal alliance between them. All of the documents recording that had been forged by Rangel. A certain bandit from the Crimea, going under the name of Ataman Volodin, operated under orders from the White Command as if he were an Ataman subordinate to Markno, but in fact had no connections with him. This whole campaign of misrepresentation was mounted with the intention of misleading Markno's possible protectors, the French and other foreign imperialists. Some weeks ago, Rangel made a genuine attempt to reach an alliance with Markno and sent him two emissaries. As the delegates from the Red Army of the Southern Front were able to confirm, the Maknavists not only did not enter into negotiations with Rangel's agents, but had them hanged publicly a short time after their arrival at their headquarters. It was precisely this Rangel's attempt to court them that showed the Maknavists how perilous it was to fight against the Soviet authorities. Shortly after, they approached the command of the Southern Front with a proposal to wage a common struggle against Rangel. This proposal was accepted on the basis of certain conditions. 
At present, the Maknavis detachment is performing its military assignment under the immediate direction of Comrade Franz, commander of the Southern Front. End quote. What could have brought the Maknavists to this, with the image of the massacres and destruction carried out by the Red Army and Czechists still fresh in their memories? Hundreds, if not thousands of their colleagues had perished either in the fighting or as a result of the repression, for the most part, captured Maknavists had been executed by the Reds, they were well aware, too, that Moscow's ambition was simply to wipe them out. In their mouthpiece The Road to Freedom they wrote around this time that the Bolshevik communist counter-revolutionaries are, objectively, a greater danger than Rangel. Furthermore, they had already had the experiences of June 1919 and January 1920, when the Red Army had declared them outlaws, disarmed some of their units and shot a number of their colleagues. One may wonder to what extent the ploy of June 23, 1920, with the pseudo-delegate from the Soviet Republic as go-between, come to admonish the insurgents about their fight against the Red Army. And to exhort them to join forces against Rangel, could have inspired a belief that there were differences of opinion inside the Communist Party regarding them. In their newspaper, they scrutinized the diplomatic actions of the social revolutionaries, preceded by talks between representatives of these latter and those of the so-called Soviet power, in the shape of Zatonsky, a Ukrainian Bolshevik leader, as well as with members of the Bolshevik Communist Party's Central Committee. From this they deduced that the latter would never have allowed anybody to conduct negotiations with them unless the Communist Party had been directly involved itself. In conclusion, the insurgents stated that they stood ready to come to an accommodation with all who placed the interests of the revolution above all else. If the Communist Party's desire to reach agreement with us is this time quite sincere, in the name of the interests of the revolution, we shall meet them provided we are given serious assurances. Thus, contrary to what Soviet historians say, the ones who sued were not the insurgents, these in fact had only acceded to formal overtures from the Bolsheviks. Arshinov subsequently accounted for this pact by arguing that even if the Bolsheviks were enemies of the toilers, they nonetheless had great masses of the toilers on their side, quote. The communists' dictatorship is quite as hostile to labor's freedom as that of Rangel. However, the difference between them consisted of the fact that alongside the former stood the masses who believed in the revolution. It is true that the communists cynically misled these masses and exploited the revolutionary enthusiasm of the toilers for the advantage of their own power. But the masses who opposed Rangel believed in revolution and that counted for a lot. End quote. There are also several other possible explanations for this unnatural agreement. The Maknavists must have been misinformed as to the true situation on the Polish front and the real threat posed by Rangel. Their sources of information were quite limited, Bolshevik newspapers, the local population and the alarmist statements of the SR delegates. They should not, for instance, have been abreast of the well-advanced negotiations that the Bolsheviks were conducting with the Poles, in the wake of which a temporary peace had been signed at Riga on October 1. Something about which the Bolshevik leaders were unable to crow you on the one hand to the requirements of secret diplomacy and above all to the punishing conditions imposed by the Poles on the other, Lenin justified these concessions as necessary to induce the Polish political parties and their allies to understand, his, bona fides, and to realize, that he, did not seek war. For the same reason, the Maknavists overstated the drama of the situation in the southern Ukraine just a little, they should not have known about the failure of the disembarkation of Ulugai's contingent in the Cuban and they probably thought that the Red Army could not stand up effectively to Rangel, like the previous year against Denikin. This time, they were convinced that it might be a lot more serious and that with the Bolsheviks collapsing those meager revolutionary gains not yet extinguished would be extinguished beyond all recovery by Rangel. They were also greatly concerned with getting back to their home ground which was presently under occupation by the Whites with resting up and having their wounded tended, and then with having the Red Army restock them with arms and munitions. Another far from negligible factor which may have had a part in what they did was the enormous campaign of misrepresentation jointly waged by Moscow and Rangel concerning an alleged alliance between Rangel and them. That rumor had not been without impact upon the morale of many isolated insurgent groups, it called seriously into question the ideal on whose behalf the insurgent army was fighting 
and played into the hands of the reaction in Russia and internationally. It is also certain that the Maknavists hoped to win over a lot of red troops to their way of thinking as had happened several times, by demonstrating their absolute fidelity to the revolutionary cause. The item in the agreement relating to possible deserters or Red Army soldiers desirous of joining the Maknavists and whom the latter undertook to send back to their Red Army units, was illustrative of the scale and substance of this phenomenon. As they saw it too, showing themselves to all and sundry as the best defenders of the social and political gains of the populace would also forestall any backlash against them by the Bolsheviks in that their loyalty would have been thoroughly acknowledged. If need be, they were also probably counting upon being strong enough to successfully resist the Red Army militarily, just as they had done over the previous months. All of these considerations together prompted their decision. Editorial by Markno in the movement's mouthpiece. The road to freedom of October 13, 1920 spelled out the limits of the government, quote. Military hostilities between the Maknavist revolutionary insurgents and the Red Army have ceased. Misunderstandings, vagueness and inaccuracies have grown up around this truce, it is said that Markno has repented of his anti-Bolshevik acts, that he has recognized the Soviet authorities, etc. How are we to understand, what construction are we to place upon this peace agreement? What is very clear already is that no intercourse of ideas, and no collaboration with the Soviet authorities and no formal recognition of these has been or can be possible. We have always been irreconcilable enemies, at the level of ideas, of the party of the Bolshevik communists. We have never acknowledged any authorities and in the present instance we cannot acknowledge the Soviet authorities. So again we remind and yet again we emphasize that, whether deliberately or through misapprehension, there must be no confusion of military intercourse in the wake of the danger threatening the revolution with any crossing over, fusion or recognition of the Soviet authorities, which cannot have been and cannot ever be the case. End quote. In objective, historical terms, this agreement might have looked favorable to the Maknavists, for it blatantly enshrined the existence of their movement, they dealt as equals, even if they were integrated into the Red Army and regarded as answerable to the Soviet Republic of Ukraine, they nonetheless retained a certain autonomy. This was an unprecedented agreement and one never repeated in the whole history of the Leninist regime from its origins up to our own day. That the Bolsheviks should have conceded such conditions is ample proof of how badly they needed the Maknavists, as well as the relationship which the latter had been able to force on them. It goes without saying that it was also a fundamental concession on the Maknavists part 4, despite all their explanations, by this accord they were acknowledging the indubitable legitimacy of the Soviet government and its Red Army. Let us say, in conclusion, that, like many members of the Bolshevik party itself, or of the Red Army, the insurgents were gambling that, once the white counter-revolution had been swept completely from the national stage, the Bolsheviks would be obliged to honor a measure of democracy and tolerate the rights of all who would have fought for the revolution, albeit not wholly sharing their own views. In a subsequent piece of writing, Markno was to mention that this had been a grave error. One initial and not negligible outcome was the release of Maknavists held in Czechist jails, Pyotr Gavrilenko, a gifted insurgent, Alexei Chubenko, the man behind the insurgent army's ethos, and Volyne, the former chairman of the Military Revolutionary Soviet in 1919. Another positive result was that the Maknavist movement wounded received treatment from the Red Army's medical corps, Markno in particular, whose ankle had been torn by a dum-dum bullet, was entitled to the care of the finest physicians and surgeons sent by Moscow. Bizarrely, the Red Army's high command, which was in the throes of marshalling 500,000 men to face Rangel, was none too pleased with this agreement with Markno, arguing that it was too advantageous for him, quote. After the signing of the agreement, Markno acquired citizenship rights de facto. The peasants who sympathized with him by virtue of their social class and who were afraid to say so, could now do so openly. The Maknavists' lifestyle beguiled the Red Soldier, he thought that among them there was more freedom, diversion, and food and whereas hitherto the Red Soldier had not joined Markno, aware that he was the enemy of the workers and peasants, he henceforth began to have his doubts and instances of voluntary defection by Red Soldiers to Markno's side became more and more frequent. The same author adds that the presence of many women among the insurgents was a not inconsiderable factor in the Red Soldier's choice. 
End quote. 23. Victory over Rangel Following the agreement with the Red Army, relations between the Maknavists and the Bolshevik leadership became more friendly, Belakuan and other Red dignitaries came to visit Markno and offered him more than 100 photographs and postcards showing the members of the Third International's Executive Committee. This curious gift was accompanied by a splendid declaration made out to fighter of the worker and peasant revolution, comrade Bako Markno. It was a question of gaining the insurgents' confidence and convincing them of Moscow's sincerity. Belakuen especially distinguished himself in this and upon his return to base was to brag about having really put one over on Markno. It is true that he already had a well-established reputation as a treacherous rogue and that he had not finished with exploits of this sort, for, according to Victor Serge, he had to make up for his pitiful showing at the time of the Hungarian Soviet Revolution, as well as for his continual idiocies which led to Lenin's referring to him upwards of a dozen times at a single meeting as an imbecile. Victor Serge's wife, who was the official stenographer there, had her work cut out to minimize this in her minutes. Be that as it may, the impact of the agreement was soon being felt. The Maknavists were assigned their own, white-occupied, home ground of Sinelnikovo, Alexandrovsk, Guliaipoli, and Berdyansk as their theater of operations. Once they had engaged with the enemy along that stretch of front, they had to tackle the problem of alleged or genuine Maknavist insurgents who had gone over to Rangel. In particular, they would be looking out for Ataman Volodin and his 6,000 partisans who were ensconced near the waterfalls on the Dnieper, not far from Alexandrovsk. Volodin was an anarchist who had indeed been a member of the Maknavist movement and especially been involved in the Battle of Paragonovka, then, cut off from the main insurgent body and disgusted by the abuses of the Bolsheviks, he had established operational liaison with Rangel on the basis of the notorious rumors of a joint alliance. Immediately on learning of the agreement concluded with the Red Army against Rangel, he prepared to turn on them, but the Whites, tipped off by their listening posts, were one jump ahead of him and seized him and his staff, executing them and relieving his partisans of their weapons. After two attacks the Maknavists liberated Guliaipoli, then forced the enemy front at Orokov where they smashed an elite Rangelian regiment, capturing an entire battalion. Markno gave this account of the circumstances peculiar to this victory, quote. Nikita Chali, a Maknavist from a poor family from the Mergorod region, was a fine partisan and accomplished with brilliance all of the tasks allotted to him behind the white lines by the insurgent army's staff, both in Denikin's day and in Rangel's. However, he went astray and ended up in Rangel's camp as commander of the 10th Brigade called after Bako Markno but organized by the Rangelian command in the wake of the provocation mounted by the Bolsheviks and by Rangel himself regarding a supposed alliance between Maknavists and Whites. We straightened that out, for whenever he was present at an engagement between us and White troops in October 1920, he realized his mistake and immediately came to see me to die like a Maknavist at the hands of another Maknavist by way of paying for the offence that had taken him into Rangel's camp. Well aware of the interests of the revolution and being above all else a military leader, I could not shoot him and instead assigned him the task of returning to Rangel's people and bringing back to me every one of the officers commanding the brigade, these had been appointed by Rangel's staff. And so Chali rejoined the white camp and then, on the night of October 17th to 18th, he fetched all of the white officers to my headquarters, a colonel, some captains and some lieutenants. These were all interrogated by my aide Semyon Kermik in front of me and in the presence of Bolshevik representatives from the Red Staff of the Front, Vasiliev among them, these officers briefed us on the disposition of the white forces, especially that of the invincible Drozdov division and, without waiting for any joint offensive with the Red Army, I ordered the units from Petrenko's band, made up of mixed units of infantry machine gunners and artillery, as well as Mochenko's cavalry, to attack these famous Drozdovians who had thus far never failed to put to fight the 23rd and 42nd Red Divisions, even though outnumbered by them two to one. The insurgents attacked this division, Rangel's pride and joy, with the help of Chali to guide them through the enemy deployment. They smashed this elite white unit as the Red Army had never managed to do. The Red Army Command, the Drozdovians, and Kuchepov and Rangel most of all, are very well aware of this. End quote. 
A communique from France dated October 24 bears out Markno's account since it acknowledges that on October 22 the insurgent army had smashed the enemy's flanks not far from the Dnieper and Alexandrovsk, taking 4,000 prisoners from the Drozdov division. The Maknavists now retreated towards Guliaipoli in order to snatch some rest, but the Red Command ordered them to carry their offensive behind the enemy's lines. Markno requested a three-day rest period, but a second categorical order, complete with the threat to tear up the agreement, forced him to comply with this directive. He himself, wounded and unable to mount his horse, stayed in Guliaipoli along with his black guard, he dispatched some of his men home to rest and then marshaled a strong expeditionary corps made up of the insurgent army's finest units, namely, the famous undefeated cavalry commanded by Mochenko, and the no less famed machine gunner regiment led by Thomas Kozhin. This expeditionary force was placed under the command of Semyon Koretnik, assisted by Pyotr Gavrilenko, the very same Gavrilenko just freed from Bolshevik jails, as his chief of staff. On October 23, the insurgents took Alexandrovsk. On October 29, a military dispatch for the attention of Franz, originating with a certain Karatijin and countersigned by political commissar Andreev, both of them on secondment to Koretnik, reported the capture of Bolshtokmak. The insurgents had skirted the town on the western side, near the Heidelberg German settlement, then stormed the enemy trenches, virtually wiped out the 6th White Infantry Regiment from Samursk and taken 200 prisoners and captured four cannon and machine guns. Then they seized the town of Melitopol and the strategically important railway station at Akimovka, again taking great booty. Koretnik's detachment continued on its way, Franz having intimated to him that he should seize the Crimean Isthmuses, and smashed another enemy cavalry regiment, cutting a path as far as the Savash, near Perkop. Rangel's attempt to force a passage along the right bank of Dnieper had failed, and now it was the Red Armies that crossed the Dnieper and, capitalizing on the Maknavists' victories, stepped up the pressure on Rangel's army, albeit extremely slowly and cautiously, for they were afraid of being lured into a trap and meeting the same fate as Globa's corps which the Whites had pulverized a few months before. This was the motive behind Franz's using the Maknavists as the spearhead of his offensive. Forced eastwards, the Whites were afraid of being cut off from their rear in the Crimea, and gradually they fell back towards the isthmuses of Perkop, Salkovo, and Henichesk which commanded access to the Crimea. The Whites had lost the decisive battle of the northern Tavrida, they had been forced to quit all of the territory wrested from the Reds over the summer of 1920. In addition they had lost a very high number of armaments and especially weak carrying trains which they had been planning to sell or barter in return for weapons and munitions supplies abroad since France's aid was for the moment quite platonic. The fighting in the second fortnight of October took place in temperatures of minus 20 degrees, Celsius, the water in the reservoirs along the railroad lines had frozen and thus the trains could not be got moving in time. Rangel gave this estimate of the booty and gains taken by the Reds. Quote. Five armored trains, 18 cannon, nearly 100 wagon loads of shells, 10 million cartridges, 25 locomotives, trains loaded with food and munitions, nearly 2 million poods of wheat, nine in Militopol and Henichesk. Our troops had sustained heavy losses in terms of killed, wounded, and frostbitten. A huge number of prisoners and stragglers were still in enemy hands, for the most part. These were Red Army soldiers whom we had incorporated into our units in several installments. There were some instances of mass capitulations. Thus an entire battalion of the Drozdov division surrendered to the enemy.10 but the army as a whole had been salvaged, and our own troops had taken 15 cannon, nearly 2,000 prisoners, lots of arms and machine guns. But if the army had been salvaged, its combat potential was no longer what it had been. End quote. Indeed, the Rangelian Russian army's psychological buoyancy had been broken by the successive defeats, it had lost its reputation for invincibility, built up over several months. Thus, in two weeks the Maknavists had done what the Red Army had failed to achieve over six months. This assertion would be untenable were it not endorsed by the most official documents of the Red Army recording the engagements. Already, nearly all of the published breakdowns and maps relating to the subject indicate the Maknavist army's situation, in this instance Koretnik's expeditionary force, 
flanked by the 23rd and 42nd Red Infantry Divisions, and testify to its being positioned in the front lines. Then there are the orders and official dispatches to which we have just referred, but in addition there are the allusions to its major role. For instance, we have the editorial in the first edition of the very official Red Army Review Military Science and the Revolution which appeared in July-August 1921, at which point the Maknavist movement had not yet been dismembered in Ukraine, which reckons that Rangel lost his campaign in the Nikopol region, which, is to say, in the Maknavist's theater of operations. Furthermore, it is specified that the chief characteristic of these encounters was the fact that they were not at all part of the projections and plans of the Red Army, which is why they had not even been anticipated by the High Command. In the huge work on the Russian Civil War published in 1930 by a team of the most high-ranking Red Army officers from the period, namely S. Kamenev, Bubnov, Yuritsky, Eidman and others, the article devoted to the liquidation of Rangel is even more revealing. It explains first of all that the pact with Markno was justified, self-evidently in the view of any historian, by its operational and strategical import, the strength of Koretnik's detachment was estimated at 4,000 infantry, 1,000 cavalry, and 1,000 machine gunners and other fighting men, giving a total of 6,000, with access to 250 machine guns and 12 cannon, as against the Red Army's total strength of 188,771 or more than 500,000 including the reserves and rearguard, fighting men, against the Whites 44,000. Mention is made of the crucial role played by the front around Pologui, the very place whence the Maknavists were coming, and of the fact that Rangel had to cut his western defences, the ones preventing the bulk of the Red troops, positioned on the Dnieper's right bank, from crossing onto the left bank, by three divisions of Don Cossack cavalry, Rangel's best troops, claim the authors, which were thus deployed in the direction of Pilagui. What is more, the fortified town of Melitopol was regarded by the Whites as the securest possible bulwark, and we have just seen what became of it. Obviously, the authors took care not to call by its right name the mysterious unit which had overturned all the plans of the Whites, they prefer to allude vaguely to the Red Army, the 13th Army, to which Koretnik's detachment was seconded, or, if pressed, speak of a mixed cavalry and infantry division, avoiding further detail. One can appreciate their annoyance at having to explain how a few thousand resolute insurgents had done more to defeat Rangel on the left bank of the Dnieper than the 500,000 red soldiers massed in the region, whose fighting ability obviously left something to be desired. So let us re-establish the exact truth of the matter. It was the hammer blows of the Maknavists against Orokov, Bosch Tokmak and their capture of Melitopol which forced Rangel's troops to retreat towards the Crimea. On October 28, Franz denied Koretnik a respite of four or five days rest and reorganization, and let him know that, if he failed to abide by instructions, this would be tantamount to a refusal to participate in the liquidation of Rangel. One can appreciate that, quite logically, he was keen, on one hand, to make maximum use of such an effective unit, even at the cost of letting it be used up or destroyed in battle, while on the other hand he had to keep it ahead of him rather than behind him, and above all, as one Bolshevik leader, Kosha, has spelled out in detail, it had at all costs to be kept isolated from other Red Army units lest any contamination occur. As a result, the detachment, initially seconded to the 13th Army, was suddenly placed under the command of the 4th Army on November 4, of the 6th Cavalry on November 5th, of the 2nd Cavalry on November 11th, and again of the 4th Army on November 17th. The detachment was either regarded as the Red Army's dog's body or, likely, this merry-go-round is indicative of the Red High Command's panicky fear at leaving the Maknavists in contact with other Red Army units, lest these be unduly infected by their revolutionary order. The memory of Pomoshnaya in August 1919 must still have been haunting the Red military leaders. On November 3, in a direct line conversation with S. Kamenev, Franz declared that the Maknavists had arrived by evening November 2 near the Sivash Strait, which it was their mission to force in order to take the white fortifications at Perkop from behind. On November 5, he issued them with formal instructions to attack by that route. He was well aware that in so doing he was dispatching them to slaughter, for they would have to cross the open ground of the stagnant marshes of the Sivash. 
Also, S. Kamenev, commander-in-chief on the front, had no illusions about the outcome of this attack upon the fortified white positions. In a telegram to Lenin, he estimated that there was one chance in a hundred of capturing the Pear Cop Isthmus. The 6th Red Army's commander, A. I. Cork, gave this account of what ensued at a military science conference on November 11, 1921, quote. The attitude of the Maknavists to the Red Army was none too dependable, and it might have seemed inadvisable to leave Koretnik's detachment in our rear, which is why the front commander set himself the task of moving Koretnik's detachment up into the front line. As the Sivash seemed traversable, the chance arose to throw this detachment ahead to establish a bridgehead on the Litovsk Peninsula. This order was passed on directly by the commander of the 6th Army to Koretnikwe was to have carried it out on the night of the 5th to 6th, November, since the launching of the general offensive was scheduled for the 7th. Koretnik's detachment moved forward into the Sivash, but turned back before reaching the Sivash Peninsula. Koretnik declaring that there was nothing but marshes that way and that traversing the Sivash was out of the question. On the 6th, November, a further reconnaissance revealed that Koretnik's report was false and that the Sivash was quite passable. However, the ground reconnaissance had not yet been completed, and the offensive was to begin on the morning of the 7th, due in part to the belatedness of the 52nd Division which was scheduled to take part in the operation. It was obvious that the crossing of such flat and open ground covering a distance of nearly 10 kilometers could not be made in daylight without very heavy losses, so it seemed more appropriate to make it on the night of the 7th to 8th, after 10 p.m. hours. An order to this effect was issued to Koretnik's detachment and to the 15th and 52nd Divisions. End quote. Cork estimates the strength of Koretnik's detachment at this point at 1,000 infantry and 700 cavalry with 191 machine guns and 6 cannon. Nevertheless, he is very discreet as to the circumstances of the Sivash crossing. In fact, some local peasants pointed out the best crossing point. The Maknavists led the way across under heavy fire from the Whites and sustained some losses but managed to reach the Litovsk Peninsula by driving back General Fostikov's Cuban Cossacks. Whereupon they were followed up by the two divisions mentioned one of them made up of Latvian infantrymen. This maneuver was an historical reenactment of the maneuver by Field Marshal Larsi of the Russian army that had also crossed the Sivash in 1737 to cake the Crimean Tatars from behind. In fact, the Perkop Isthmus had always been reputed impregnable, and so Kamin's pessimism had been understandable, especially since Perkop was now defended by 750 machine guns, 180 cannon, and 48 tanks, as well as by some armoured trains standing off some distance behind the lines. Also, several thousand elite white troops were dug in behind three lines of trenches and barbed wire. Over a period of several days, some 22 attacks were mounted by red units to no avail but incurring very heavy losses. Thus the perilous manoeuvre carried off by Koretnik was decisive, for it enabled a solid bridgehead to be established so that other red troops might be brought across to tackle the white fortifications from behind. The whites were cognizant of this danger and put up a ferocious fight to push their assailants back towards the Sivash. They managed to shove them back into the northern extremity of the peninsula by November 9. Let us return to Cork's narrative, quote. At 3 p.m. hours on November 9, on the narrow isthmus located between the Sivash and Lake Bazimiani, Barbovich's white cavalry went on to the attack. The 15th Red Division began to back up. At this point, Koretnik's detachment helped out by deploying to meet the enemy cavalry with lethal gunfire from its machine gunner regiment. Barbovich's cavalry were hulled back. Thanks to the help supplied by the machine gunner regiment from Koretnik's detachment, the 15th Division's left flank was quickly repaired. End quote. Another more recent Soviet source provides further detail about this crucial engagement. Barbovich and his Cuban Cossack cavalry attacked the left flank of the 15th Division, Latvians, which began to scatter, and it was Koretnik's detachment which salvaged the situation. Mochenko's cavalry then counterattacked only to fan out at the last moment to leave the enemy cavalry facing the Tachankis of Thomas Cohen's machine gunner regiment. A hail of gunfire from the latter soon dampened the order of Barbovich's Cossacks. The author of this description, which has been lifted from a book on the history of the Latvian infantry, 
stresses the major role which the Machnavists also played in the crossing of the Sivash under enemy fire and testifies that they were the first to set foot upon the Litovsk Peninsula. Another Red Army bigwig, Karkarin, a former Tsarist colonel, writes in a classic work on the Civil War, that, on the night of November 8, units of the 6th Army assigned to the capture of the Litovsk Peninsula crossed the Sivash, smashed the white General Fostikov's detachment and dug in on the peninsula. Enemy counterattacks met with no success, so the 15th Infantry Division and then the 52nd also arrived to dig in on the northernmost part of the peninsula. Then, come the morning, the 153rd Brigade of the 51st Division showed up, along with Krylenko's Cavalry Brigade. Let us note the discretion about naming the Maknavist detachment which is described only as, units, assigned to the capture of the Litovsk Peninsula, whereas every other unit is given a specific name. Meanwhile the Red Military Commander's obsession with the notorious contamination by Maknavists led them, in a bizarre move, to subordinate them on November 11 to the 2nd Cavalry Army. They were assuredly still afraid of a comradeship of arms growing up between them and Red Army soldiers. Caught from behind and seeing that their cause was lost, the Whites scurried in a forced march towards the Crimean ports where the Russian fleet, which Rangel had chartered some time before against the eventuality of evacuation, took them on board in orderly fashion. On November 11, Franz put it to them that they should surrender, and he guaranteed the lives of them all and assured them zero fa complete amnesty. Any who wished might stay and work in socialist Russia, as for the others, they could leave the country if they gave their word of honor not to fight against Russia and the Soviet authorities. Lenin immediately amended this, reproaching Franz for having been too generous in his concessions which could stand only if the enemy agreed that all the ships would be handed back, he ordered him to make no more such offers and to crush the whites unmercifully if they rejected this proposition. In fact, a large number of white soldiers and officers, who were above all else patriots, decided, to their great misfortune, to believe these fine promises and stayed behind. As for the Red Army, stunned by this quick success and by the even quicker flight of the Whites and perhaps still wary of a trap, its progress was painfully slow. Again it was Maknavists who were first to strike deep into the Crimea and who captured Simfropol on November 13. The Whites went blithely on boarding the ships, and when the first Red units reached Sebastopol, Feodosia, Kerch, and Yalta, the Crimean ports, they found only a few stragglers and a host of distraught civilian refugees. Nearly 100,000 soldiers, 50,000 civilians, 3,000 of them women and 7,000 children, had thus fled this last corner of their homeland aboard 126 Russian ships. Rangel had successfully averted his armies being overtaken by disaster and saved its honor, but it was the end for the whole white movement right across Russia aside from Ataman Semyonov and the crazed Baron Unjernstrombrug who were to hold out for some months more in Siberia on the borders of Manchuria. Franz ordered Koretnik's detachment to camp at the mouth of the Katya River, at Saki, on the western shores of the Crimea. The author of the history of the Latvian infantry bluntly admits that this was in order to isolate the Maknavists and prevent them from leaving the Crimea. To that end, they were further cordoned off by the 52nd Division the 3rd Corps of Cavalry and the 2nd Latvian Brigade. On November 13, Franz informed Kaminv by telephone that he had left the 42nd Division in the Guliaipoli area with an eye to possible complications from that quarter. Asked by Kaminv how the Maknavists had acquitted themselves, Franz replied that they had acquitted themselves reasonably well during the most recent fighting and had noticeably avoided missions involving the risk of heavy losses. Here Franz was displaying a touch too much presumption, probably regretting that the Maknavists had not taken heavier losses, although it was not for want of his exposing them as much as he was able to the most perilous positions. When they do not gloss over in silence the Maknavists' decisive action in the operations that determined the outcome of the war against Rangel, Soviet historians acknowledge their brilliant performance. Rudnev, for instance, author of a 1928 monograph on the Maknovskina, writes that the Maknovist units took part in the Red Army's celebrated offensive on the Crimean Front. They pulled off a highly important action by striking, and this was of capital importance in strategic terms, behind the lines of Rangel's army and then, on November 13, 1920, 
occupied the town of Simferpol, shortly after the capture of Perkop. Cork, the commander of the 6th Red Army, also stresses the important part played by Kuzhin's machine gunner regiment at the time of Barbovich's assault. He adds that one of the consequences of this victory over Rangel relates to the Soviet governments becoming the sole legitimate representative of Russia and able, as such, to negotiate peace and trade treaties with the capitalist countries. At the time, as far as the Bolshevik leaders and their soldiery were concerned, the priority was to settle the question of the thousands, tens of thousands of white soldiers and officers who had swallowed the promise of an amnesty and surrendered to the new authorities with every confidence. Lenin's order to crush them unmercifully now took effect in the most barbarous fashion. Bela Kuhn arrived on the scene after the battle to display his expertise. Woe to the vanquished, the dictum goes. Well, he was going to put it into full effect here. Drawing their inspiration no doubt from the French terror of 1793, Bela Kuhn, the Czechists and the other doors of dirty work mowed down the prisoners, like Fouché had in lions or sank barges, fully laden with officers bound hand and foot, in the Black Sea, like carriers drownings in Nantes. According to Victor Serge, these massacres took a toll of 13,000 victims. According to Grenard, a French diplomat well informed on the question, the real figure would have been upwards of 50,000 victims, and this butchery was all the more horrific because the whites who had naively stayed behind in the Crimea were probably the ones least involved in the abuses and excesses of their movement. Just as the Bolsheviks had promised them they might, they had hoped to make reparation for their offences by taking a hand in the peaceful, socialist reconstruction of their country. Ill fortune denied them the opportunity. While all this was going on, Markno was tending his wounded in Guliaipoli. Most insurgent units had been sent home to their native villages and districts, there to rest up and make up their numbers again. Other units were stationed in Melitopol, Borshtokmak, Malaya Tokmachka and Pologui. In the belief that the agreement concluded with the Bolsheviks was a guarantee against any surprise attack, Markno turned his attention to constructive endeavors along with the local anarchist militants. Between the 1st and 25th of November, the inhabitants of Guliaipoli came together seven times to determine the program for the reorganization of social and economic life which had been completely hobbled over the past year by the dozens of successive occupations of the town. Around mid-November, a Soviet had been set up, and in concert with the insurgents revolutionary Soviet, a draft of the basic ground rules of the free Soviets of toilers had been worked out. He had also proceeded to organize schools independent of both church and state and involving supporters of the libertarian school founded by Francisco Farah. Literacy classes were laid on for illiterate adults, followed by courses in politics and economics given by insurgent peasants and workers who had some grounding in the subjects. Here it is interesting to look at their syllabus, a. Political economy, b. History, c. The theory and practice of socialism and anarchism, d. The history of the French Revolution according to Kropotkin's book, The Great French Revolution, e. The history of the revolutionary insurgent movement in the Russian Revolution. Not that cultural activities were neglected, daily there were shows staged in the local theatre. The insurgents and their womenfolk took part in these, not only as spectators and actors, but also as dramatists narrating episodes from recent local events and from the insurgent struggle. For all too, short a time, alas, a free and creative existence sprang again from the ashes of civil war. A Polish libertarian, Kasimir Tesla, who was staying in Guliaipoli at the time, offers this description of the place, quote. The exemplary order and cleanliness which reign everywhere are striking. I have been in Guliaipoli in winter. The countryside and town were covered with a deep blanket of snow. In every courtyard stood the famous Tachanka, this was a sign that each home harbored some Machnavist insurgents. Upon entering the town, I was struck by the sight of the abandoned trenches which ringed it. When I pressed on into the center, I was impressed by the horror of the war which had passed that way, leaving deep traces. The finest houses had been destroyed while others, a large number of others, were half demolished. In one such, I found the premises of the Guliaipoli Toilers Trade Union. The walls were marked with dark cracks and holes. Everywhere the traces of projectiles and fire could be seen. 
If you go to Guliopoli, children will escort you to the spot where the Austrians burned down the little wooden house where Nestor Markno was born and where his poor old mother was living when the Austro-German troops entered the town. They will also show you other burnt-out homes, burned by the whites or the reds, the homes of Anacho Maknovist insurgents. On one of the main streets a black flag fluttered in the breeze. On it one could read, Staff of the Maknovist Insurgent Army of Ukraine. End quote. During his stay, Tesla often saw horsemen, Tachankis, and bands of insurgents gallop past, noisily making for the steps for maneuvers and to accustom their young mounts to the noise of their weapons. He had difficulty imagining that this apparently so peaceable town was freedom's stronghold and that the people under arms lived there. He noted that the street games of the children aping battle scenes recalled recent and unfortunately all too real events.